Hello, ladies and gentlemen and other distinguished guests. We are we're back. You're not gonna believe it. You're absolutely not gonna believe it. For another one of these. That's right, it's another episode of the Slice of Life podcast hosted by yours truly, No Thank You. Uh, available here on youtube.com where you're probably watching this or less likely also available on nothankyou.neocities.org under the sounds tab on my website welcome 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 back uh if you've not been here before these are 12 hour long roughly give or take uh solo podcasts i record over the course of about a month um and I just sort of ramble. I just sort of ramble about about whatever whatever's on my mind. Whatever's on my mind in the moment. The idea behind these podcasts is to essentially function as white noise content. Uh, you know, when you're walking the dog, when you when you're playing video games, when you're falling asleep, when you're studying, you know, when you just need uh, a voice in the background that is just barely interesting enough to keep you from being bored, but not anywhere near interesting enough to hold your full attention you can put on one of these when you're making breakfast maybe in the morning doing some chores you know it's the perfect at least you know the the design is my intention is that it's the perfect content for that because you always need more of it than you have this is what i've always found right is that there's never enough of that content that stuff that is like just interesting enough that it's you know you want to listen to it but not so interesting that you want to stop what you're doing and really pay attention. You just need something in the background. And I feel like, you know, no matter how much of that I find, it's never enough. And so I decided that I would be the one to do this for other people. Um, and just, just make as much of it as I physically can. So here we are, back for the Slice of Life podcast. It's No Thank You in the Build, and here we are, available here on YouTube or on no thank you near cities dot org. And uh, let's get straight into it. Normally, I start these off with uh, some comment responses, uh, but we're going to do a brief segment before we get into uh, the comment responses for a couple of reasons. Uh, firstly, I just want to—I just have something on my mind that I want to talk about, and secondly, because I haven't even finished uploading the previous episode yet. I'm, I'm starting recording this while the previous episode is still uploading. And normally I respond to the comments on the previous episode, so obviously there are no comments yet because it's not even up on YouTube, although it is up on my website. Uh, it will generally be there early, by the way. If you want to subscribe to my RSS feed for my website, you see my new blog posts and new episodes a few hours early. Uh, but anyway, so I made this video recently, my most recent video. It's called um, Bandcamp is Dying, and it's not a surprise. I'm pretty proud of the thumbnail for this video. I think it came out pretty, pretty, uh, pretty good. I don't know. But, uh, in case you didn't watch that video or hear the news, uh, in, in brief, uh, Bandcamp is a platform that musicians use to host and sell albums and records and so on. Uh, and it used to be an independent platform. It was bought by Epic Games, the creators of Fortnite, who I already have an adversarial re relation to because, um, they also the guys that make Unreal Engine and Unreal Tournament. Now, I, I'm a fan of Unreal Tournament, um, and they were working on Unreal Tournament 4, and I was playing the beta and enjoying myself, and then, when Fortnite popped off, they cancelled Unreal 4 and moved the entire development team over to Fortnite. So, Unreal Tournament 4 never happening, which is a, a damn shame, because it's a good game. Unreal Tournament's good. Um, great soundtrack, especially the the original Unreal Tournament has some of the best fucking soundtrack of the of the 90s. Uh, oh, I probably swore too early in this video, so we might not be getting monetized, guys. We, we might be getting no monetization. Who cares? Uh, we're four minutes in. We can swear. We can we can give a little a little bit of swearing. I think we're fine. Um, Okay, so uh, Bandcamp got sold to Epic, which was already worrying, but they didn't actually do anything that bad, as far as I can tell. Um, but then Epic has overhired, because Fortnite was very successful, and nothing can be successful forever. Uh, it's, it's, Fortnite is slowly losing some money, because, as I understand it from the news articles I read, um, uh, the original Fortnite business model was based on people buying cosmetics and 
brand deals that they were doing with with other companies, sort of business to business kind of stuff or direct selling stuff. But now a lot of the reason people play Fortnite and use Fortnite is for user generated content, which Epic obviously has to rev share, give the people who make that content some cut. Uh, and that's what's keeping people coming back to Fortnite, which is a good business model because it means you don't have to do all the work, right? You offload all of the work onto to your user base. Classic tech company move, offload all of the actual productive work onto your user base and just rake in half of the money they make. But it means that they have to rev share, so they make less money. And because of that, they fired 16% of their workforce and sold Bandcamp. Now, they sold Bandcamp to a... Uh, platform company called oh fuck I've forgotten the name let me double check my description uh, Song Trader now Song Trader is a company they they seem somewhat shady uh, <laughs> it's a company that deals with digital digital rights distribution for for songs for 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 music so they they sell they're a business that sells the rights to music to other businesses. And they now own Bandcamp, which is worrying because, uh, well, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, when a website that you like or a platform that you like gets sold, it's almost never good news. So obviously people are just generally scared of that, especially to a company no one's ever heard of that doesn't seem to have much experience in this department. Uh, And then the second thing is that because SongTrader is a, a, a company that makes money off of rights owning... Uh, that a lot of people are worried they're going to crack down on sample-based music because Bandcamp is one of the last bastions where uh, you can use hev- you can heavily use samples in your music and not get penalized. Um, and a lot of people are worried that that is going to go away because that might threaten song traders' business model. Uh, they might give in to pressure on that level. It's not looking good. So yes, my video might be titled a little alarmist. Bandcamp isn't literally dying, um, which I've, I'm thinking of changing the title to like "Epic Sold Bandcamp" or something. I don't know, a little, little bit less clickbaity. Um, but a lot of people are making out like Bandcamp's dying, even though it's not literally dying. We don't have any evidence. Although something I didn't mention in the video is um, the. CEO of SongTrader was asked in, by an interviewer, like, do you have any plans to make any changes to the platform? And everyone from SongTrader just declined to comment, which is worrying, right? Because you would hope that they would just say, nope, we're all good. Uh, so, yeah, it's not looking good for Bandcamp. So the point of the video was to basically say, look... This sort of thing is just going to keep happening. Uh, this is just how the internet and big tech megacorps work. You can't put your trust in these sorts of organizations and just get mad when, you know, capitalism runs its course and they get bored and, and shitified. Um, the solution uh, is to create our own community-run, community-driven platforms, um, you know, decentralized and outside of the their, this big tech sphere of influence uh and often that solution involves just doing it yourself diy just you know there's no reason you can't host you can't just make, have your own website where you host mp3s and i say in the video that you have to deny them profit and property because because the reason the Bandcamp got bought in the first place the reason that big tech will will buy up all of these things and then shitify them is because they see they they see a, a, a potential to to rake in profit for their shareholders and to own a bunch of new IP intellectual property, and so you can deny them profit and property by simply freely sharing your art and then taking donations. Uh, because I, I this is me just sort of really going over the stuff I said in my video because I want to clarify it, like. You're, when you upload your music, when you're a musician and you put your music on the internet, right? It's not hard. No one, no one, doesn't know how to get that MP3 file for free, right? It, the idea that the paywalls that you put up actually work is insane. Okay, anyone who wants to put in, you know, five minutes of effort can can have that MP3 file on their computer. Right, you just go to Google and search Bandcamp downloader or YouTube downloader or you know anything. You can find it top results. You know it's it's so easy, and so it's clear 
that anyone who's giving you money for your music is doing it because they want to support you, right? It, it, because it's so easy for them to just not do so that they are willingly... It's essentially a donation already. So the idea that people won't donate to you is just not true. This is the thing I want to get get clear, is that like the reason that people are downloading your albums on Bandcamp and paying for them is because they want to give you money, not because uh, they want to take the paywall down from in front of the file on Bandcamp, because they can get that file easily. Um, and so when you put your music on another platform and distribute it for free, if you ask for donations, I promise you people will still give you money. This is the thing, right? This is, this is, this is, that's it, that's it. That's, that's the argument. And it works, I want to say, because this is my business model. I, I may not make a lot of money, but I'm also, I think I make about as much money. In fact, I know I make about as much money from my music as other people who have a similar size fan base make off of their music, right? Like, I don't make any less money than other people of my, you know, in my wheelhouse that you would expect. And yet, all my music is free, and all of my music is released under a Creative Commons license. Because I still make money through streaming services like Spotify and so on, and I make money through Patreon, and I make money through merch sales, and I make money through physical release sales. Um, which is the same way pretty much everyone else makes money, by the way. Uh, but but I didn't have to sacrifice my soul for it. You know, I, could, I think Creative Commons is an extremely important part of this recipe. Okay, I'm not going to just go on a rant about Creative Commons now. I wanted to actually talk about the thing I wanted to say. Um, well, firstly... I think I have very little respect for artists who choose not to release their work under Creative Commons. Um, there's no reason to. You're just essentially stealing out of the Commons. You're denying the public access to your art uh, for no reason other than greed. I mean, yeah, it sounds a bit absurd to call independent musicians greedy because uh, they're not really making much money anyway, right? But you, it doesn't change the amount of money you're going to be making. Like, this is the thing. It's just, it's, I don't even know what to call it. Is it greed? It, it's, it's hubris. Because it's not about money at that point. It's about, I want control. It's just about control. I want total control over my art. This is, this is to me, like, pretty... I, 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 it, it, it's, it's, it's not a very sympathetic position to hold, in my opinion. Right? Like, I, I think that there's not really any excuse to, to not release all of your art under a creative commons license even a more restrictive one where you can you can use a attribution share alike non-commercial no derivatives for all i care but as you know something other than a goddamn you know standard copyright license give me something in the copy left realm it doesn't have to be creative commons i know there's other cop you know non-copy copy left uh, licenses but you know what i mean yeah there's not really any excuse so that's the first thing I have, I have very little respect for people who, who choose to release their art non-free. It's, it's pretty disgusting to me. So I watched some post on my Discord. Um, oh, I'm getting, I'm getting pinged. Who's pinging me? Oh, okay. Uh, someone posted on my Discord a link to this DEF CON talk, which is called An Audacious Plan to Halt the Internet's Enchitification, uh, by Cory Doctorow. And I thought this was a great video, and this guy has has really understood a lot of the problems from a policy standpoint that have led to the ability for these megacorps to uh, monopolize huge parts of industry uh, and and our lives, frankly. Uh, you know, and and he understands the law that that has allowed them to do this. And understands that this is a relatively recent change to the law, uh, serving from the Reagan era, as everything does, um, of deregulation. And he understands exactly what regulations need to be changed and implemented in order to, you know, put an end to their tyranny, uh, as he puts it. And I, I'm definitely going to be using this phrase a lot because this is such a good, this is a, such a good little slogan. But the same five websites, each of which is full of nothing but screenshots from the other four websites. It's so true. That's such a good way of describing the internet as it exists right now. It's the same five websites, and every website is just full of screenshots of the other four websites. It's so fucking true and insane and needs to die. So his solution is the one that will actually work, right? That's the, his solution of legislating this stuff out of existence is the way to actually stop this from happening. Um, 
to, 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 to halt the insidification of the internet um, and, and de insidify it. Uh, however, it relies on policy. It relies on a bunch of laws getting passed. And, you know, as he says in the video or in the talk, it took like over 60 years to break up AT&T's monopoly over telecoms, right? Do you have any faith that any of these laws are going to get passed anytime soon? Because I know I personally do not. I just don't think it's going to happen, you know, especially in America. Like, the EU is much better at this. Obviously, the UK has now left the EU, so uh, fuck me, I guess. Uh, But the EU is better at this, but still, you know, slow, very slow. It's all very slow, you know, like, I don't see any of these laws, these policy changes that he mentions, as great as they would be, being implemented in at least the next 20 years. Like, it's, 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 the process is so bureaucratic and slow, and there's so much lobbying power on the other side, and no one cares. Like, this is the, maybe, maybe the biggest thing about it, is that, like, 99% of normies, they don't care if their data's being harvested. They don't, they don't care. Like, they don't even understand that things could be a different way. They don't know what a computer really does, or, like, what a phone really, like, like is, what an operating, you know, they don't really know. They don't know that, like, when you click the Twitter button on your phone, a program runs, and well, really, a, it's just a website, <laughs> you know? Uh they don't they don't know any of this and so then like you're not going to get any mass campaigning around it because most people just don't care enough to learn like it's not oh you know they're just ignorant they just aren't aware it's the all the information is freely out there they just don't care to learn it because it doesn't it doesn't matter why why should i care if my data is getting you know fucking harvested by some third party tech company it doesn't doesn't bother me it doesn't you know as long as i don't see it it's not happening that's how most people see these sorts of things. Or like, oh, what do I care if, uh, you know, Facebook or whatever, Instagram, I don't know, whatever Google website I use, uh, is it, what if it's all owned by one person? You know, it's free when I use it, so I don't care, even though, of course, if it's free, you're the product. Um, so I, I have very little faith. You know, there's not enough public sentiment really around around, around this sort of thing, in my opinion. Um to, to get it pushed fast and politics is very very slow and although I think these policies might you know I hope that these policies be implemented at some point I don't have any faith that they will I don't have time to wait I don't have time to wait I want the internet back now <laughs> and so this is why I advocate for more of a, an anarchisty approach of creating parallel infrastructure that can uh, serve as a backup for when when all of these tech giants implode, as they tend to do, like Twitter and Facebook are doing right now. Uh, now, I want to say a couple of things about that, because I actually think that Blue Sky, of all things, has has implemented something that I think is really valuable, and I think every other decentralized or federated um, platform should take this heavily into account. Uh, so if you don't know, uh, Blue Sky is like a decentralized or federated Twitter alternative run by or started by the guy who founded Twitter, Jack Dorsey, as a competitor to Twitter, which is a bit odd. Um, in terms of post quality, it's pretty mid. Um, and in terms of design, it's quite minimal. It runs much better on my browser because it's, you know, less heavy with JavaScript and tracking and nonsense, which is always good. Um, but there was already a decentralized federated Twitter alternative called Mastodon. Um, and, you know, Mastodon and the Activity Pub protocol have been, you know, we've had, me, me, and, me and Mastodon have had a uh, rocky relationship. I've always had some big problems with it. I've talked about it at length in a few blog posts as well. Uh, but, but one thing Blue Sky does, which I think is, uh, at first, you know, I was like, oh, this is just kind of a minor thing. But the more I think about it, the more I realize how important this is, is to keep uh, a lot of stuff about your account migratable. I don't really know how to, what the correct word would be, but but basically your account isn't tied to one instance. Your account just exists. And if one instance shuts down or bans you, you know, or something like this, it doesn't mean, so obviously this is a Twitter alternative, so, like, it doesn't mean you lose all your post history. It doesn't mean you lose all your follow- followers. 
you know, you can make an account on another thing and everything transfers over. And I actually think this is super important because I think this, this is actually a problem with a lot of decentralized protocols. Like Invidious, for example. If you don't know what Invidious is, it's a alternative front end for YouTube that doesn't have any of the bloat or tracking or ads or anything like that. And it's free and open source and anyone can run their own instance of it. Uh, but, you know, there's a few popular instances... Um, but they're not all reliable because this is a network that is, you know, entirely hosted for free by by hobbyists and and you know random people who just want to help. And so sometimes these they go down. You know, sometimes the, the certain instances go down. And the thing is that your account. So if you want to import your subscriptions or anything like that, you need to make an account. But the accounts only operate on a per instance basis, right? They don't. So so you know, I have an account on a, one called like u2.be um which i found is like the most reliable one um the most reliable nvidia's instance so that's that's where my account is where i have all my subscriptions imported um but you know sometimes even though it's pretty reliable it does sometimes go down like they got a dmca uh, from youtube not too long ago and went down temporarily but YouTube's DMCA was nonsense, and so they just, you know, reinstated everything. Um, but, you know, if, if YouTube.be is down, or particularly slow, because it has a lot of traffic, is, which is a much more common occurrence than it being fully down, um, you know, I don't... I can still use NVIDIA on another instance, but my account doesn't migrate. I don't have my subscriptions, um, which is annoying. So it would be really nice if there was, you know, a similar protocols everywhere to what Blue Sky does, where your account is sort of hosted locally and uh, every, um, you know, all, all of the other instances know how to, to read it, to read that language, I think is a much better way of doing things. Um, so yeah, that's something I'd like to see implemented more widely. I don't really know enough about programming to do it though. You know, if I was a fucking tech genius, you know what I would do? I would make, here's what I would make. I would make a website that would be called something like tip.jar. You know, I'm sure that URL is taken because it sounds way too obvious, but something like that, right? Tip.jar. And what it would be, it would be like like Invidious or something like this, you know, or Peertube or, or any of these, you know, decentralized free open source type things. But it would be a payment platform like PayPal. Um, or sorry, not like PayPal, like Patreon, I mean. So it would be, you know, there's something similar to this already exists. It's called LiberaPay or LiberaPay. I think it's probably pronounced LiberaPay. I actually have an account on LiberaPay, by the way. If you want to LiberaPay me some, a, don a one-time donation, you can find me. No thank you on LiberaPay. Um, but, you know, I, I think LiberaPay is really good. But I, the problem with it is that it's, it's not decentralized. It's still featured entirely it's still focused entirely by just one guy or one one um you know company i don't know i don't know what it is that runs this thing but one one entity one firm um it would be really nice if everyone like if if it was so so simple that like there was some protocol for this sort of thing that everyone could just host their own version of you know it almost makes me think about crypto but obviously crypto has way too many flaws to be usable in this state because, you know, of price fluctuations and because, you know, even if you, even though the crypto part of the economy is decentralized and works, at some point you still need to use an exchange to convert your crypto back into real money, uh, which, you know, just, it's just shipping the centralization off somewhere else and kind of ruins the entire point. Uh, and also crypto is too slow to actually buy anything with. And, you know, it doesn't work as an actual currency, uh, except for very niche situations where Monero is pretty much the only viable cryptocurrency and nothing else matters. Uh, and some Monero forks, I'll give them that, I'll give them that. Uh, but it'd be really nice if there were, if you could just host your own donations platform for real money. I mean, I'm sure the tax stuff with this and legal stuff would probably be too impossible to ever make it run, but, but it would be really cool. It's it I don't know, it seems like a cool idea to me. I think it's probably a better way to do this. Like you could just you could just um have a situation where where you just have like a band uh, sorry, you have like a PayPal button, PayPal.me button on your website. You know, I'm sure that works too. Although, yeah, whatever. But you know, just make the better than all of these platforms is just to make your own website. Like this is why I'm I'm a bit more of a radical. 
this is why I'm a bit more of a radical than than all of these people who are like, we need to make a new thing to do. That. Like, yeah, in some cases, I agree. We need to make new platforms to do certain stuff. But in most, like, I think in many, many cases, um, you don't need to do that. What you need is your own fucking website. Like, there's three things that you want from a social media platform, really, at least in my opinion, which is you want a place to post your own stuff, which would be your own blog, personal website. You, you can just run a simple static personal website. There are many ways to do this for free or extremely cheap. Uh, you want a way to follow other users, which already exists to follow other people's websites. It's called RSS or Atom. And then you want a way to DM people, which also already exists. It's called email or XMPP or Matrix, you know, but email is the one that everyone has uh, already. Although XMPP and Matrix are good for other reasons as well. Um, and so, you know, since we already have different, we already have everything you would need. The internet is already set up like a social media site. You know, once RSS exists, you know, you don't need anything else. You already have the feed of everything you want to follow and you have the ability to make your own post and you have the ability to DM other people. You know, what else do you want from a social media platform? You Like, literally, nothing else happens in a social media platform. That's that's all that they do. So why did not just do this? Why not just host your own website and, uh, you know, set up an RSS feed? It takes, it's, it's not even difficult. It's, it's not even difficult. And it's free. Or at least extremely cheap. This is why, yeah. So I'm a bit more of a purist on that. And also, maybe even the website is too, free. you know, maybe Gemini. Gemini is cool. I like Gemini. I really think we need to get off of the web at this point. Like, I'm kind of disillusioned. Like, I was listening to a podcast the other day from, from like, a few years ago. And the guy was talking about how, like, like, oh, man, something about PewDiePie. I don't remember how it came up, but mentioned, like, oh, PewDiePie has, like, oh, what is it now? Like, 30 million subscribers? As if it was this insane number. And the same this podcast, this guy was talking about, like, uh, uh, clickbait prank channels at the time. Uh, like, oh, and how, how, like, oh, they just, they'll just do, go wherever the money is. Like, to them, there's no, like, level of creativity or artistry. Like, it's just, they see it completely as a business. And, like, how can I make this video that will do the most numbers and make the most money? And that this is, like, an alien thing. You know, there's these corporate YouTubers like that, and then the real YouTube, right? But this made me, like, like this video is not that old. But it's so crazy how, like, YouTube has completely changed since then to the point where now, you know, all of those clickbait prank channels that were, you know, derided for just being algorithm bait have been replaced with Mr. Beast and his clones, which are, like, very openly and brazenly algorithm bait and, like, widely celebrated for being this. And, you know, obviously PewDiePie's 20 million subscribers at the time was nothing compared to however the many fucking subs Mr. Beast has, I don't know or care to find out, but it's a number that is too big. Um, You know, like, the fact that these what used to be YouTube prank channels that were derived... I mean, even with reaction content, you know, I'm a defender of react content because I hate copyright law, uh, but, like, I'm a defender of it from a moral and legal standpoint. I don't think it's good content. Like, I don't enjoy watching it. I don't generally watch it. I'm just a defender from, like, an ethical perspective. I just... I think, like, I don't... I don't personally watch it, but I think it has a right to exist. That is my opinion on react content. Um... Yeah, but but it's bad. It, it's bad content. It's very bad. I, I do not enjoy watching it. Um, and, you know, in the past... I, sometimes I enjoy watching it when it's someone who has something genuinely to say, right? Like, if it's an expert in a certain field reacting to something that is related to their field, then, you know, that's interesting. But, you know, you know the lazy React content. You know that... You guys know the one I'm talking about. Hassan's chair. Again, I mean, this has been talked to death, but the fact that this used to be massively derided and is now, like, super popular and widely accepted... I think Mr. Beast is the most egregious example of this, right? Like, just... His videos are all just dangling, flashy colours in front of toddlers, and somehow he gets praised as, like... I mean, I think anyone who... I don't know. I, I can't be mad that people are hating on Mr. Beast, you know? He's a fucking, like, multi-millionaire. I, 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 I don't don't care how much hate he receives I, I i can't possibly feel sympathy for him he's his life and brain is so alien to the way that that i experience the world that it's impossible for me to even relate to him and empathize 
I'm sure he's doing fine. <laughs> I'm sure he's doing completely fine. But yeah, that just made me, like, listening to this podcast where this guy was talking about that and, and like, how this was shocking somehow uh, that someone would use YouTube just to make money cynically without, you know, trying to actually make artistic videos. And, you know, just where we're at now, it's just, it just like, there was a period where it could be said the internet is dying. And, like, at this point, it really just hammered home how dead it is. How it's just the same five websites all of which are full of screenshots of the other four websites and nothing else. Like, it's it's just depressing. It's it's really just, like, it's over. Like, this thing that I loved so much is just over. And I really think it's time to just, like, abandon ship and start from scratch on Gopher or Gemini or something like this. Like, it's, I really just get tempted to do this. Like, I really want to be one of the people who is trying my best to get away from the corpo net because it's just it's one of the greatest evils in the world it, it physically disgusts me that this is what the world is like now it's so shocking that, that we let this happen and something really needs to be done like if i'm if i'm going to dedicate my activism time to one cause it would definitely be this cause like getting away from these privacy violating corpo retards and getting on our own platform not platform right but like you know getting getting on our, getting on our own parallel platforms that are run by the community for the community with without property and profit playing the only major role in them which is one of the reasons why i shill cybergrunge.net so much but i'm planning you know i've i've been a bit worried like one of the things that's a problem with the corpo net is the fact that any of these corporations can just decide to do whatever they want with your shit at any point and there's also a problem with federated platforms it doesn't solve them or they don't solve this which is that like you know most people aren't hosting their own versions of some federated software because it's quite complicated to do so um they're using whatever instance is most popular and it's or you know instances that are even maybe less popular but at any time any of those can go down and disappear without warning and you lose everything that's on them whether it's, you know, videos on Peertube or tweets on Mastodon or, you know, whatever. Uh, if you're hosting everything on some third-party site, you have no idea when it's going to go down. This is what's, you know, this is why I think DIY and self-hosting is so important. And I really like and appreciate projects that are making it easier to host your own website from your own home. Which is why, you know, right now I'm in Estonia, but when I get back to London in, uh, well, I'm going to be in a week or so um i'm gonna be one of the first things i plan to do is to set up a freedom box which is something i finally found out about i've been planning to figure out a way to host my website you know myself rather than on neo cities as much as i love neo cities look there's nothing wrong with neo cities okay it's a great service but if it goes down one day or gets bought one day by some you know tech company and that ruins it you know if something happens then I'm helpless. My website's not... I'm not hosting it. They own it. They And they also can put limitations on me about, like, what sort of files I'm allowed to upload without paying them, which is fair enough. You know, they're offering a service for free. Um, it's not necessarily a problem that they want me to pay them uh, to do certain things. And, you know, I also own a, a domain on sdf.org, uh, which I don't use for anything, and I could easily host my website there. But really, you know, and this is something that uh, I actually have a problem with it. Do you guys remember Luke Smith? I know he just makes videos about how based he is for being Christian now. But back in the day, he used to make technology videos. Um, and he, he was obsessed for a while with this idea of becoming a quote-unquote internet land chad, which just means owning your own website. Except that his version of being a land chad was running a website on someone else's VPS that you're renting. Which is... I don't understand how he thinks that that's owning your own website because it isn't um if you're not running your own website from your house then you're not doing it you're not you don't really own it you're still relying on someone else's infrastructure and the thing about the internet is you're always relying on someone else's infrastructure right because a lot of the like big undersea cables are owned by like google and microsoft you know you're always relying on someone else's infrastructure but the less that you're dependent on it the better because that i don't know it's just it's just better and if you have your own infrastructure, you can help your friends, which is really what it's all about. You know, like, this is the thing about anarchisty praxis type stuff, is that it generally happens on a local level, 
And so digital versions of this also happen on a digitally local level, right? Like, like it's not a situation where you can make your own platform and it's going to compete with YouTube or Google in general. But it can compete with YouTube and Google or whatever the fuck you're trying to compete with in a local, digitally local level, you know, on in whatever particular group that you are a part of. Do you, you, you understand? Like, um, I, I don't know. Let's say, I mean, this isn't, this isn't, this is like a very bad example because it's not really the sort of thing I'm talking about. But like, think about Nico Nico, right? Like, for a while, um, the, you know, YouTube had a total monopoly on video, except for the small niche of Japanese otaku who predominantly use Nico Nico. Now, of course, eventually they all ended up moving to YouTube, but the point still stands. Like, that's the sort of thing that you can be doing. And the fact that it didn't last forever is fine. Like, you wouldn't expect these these alternate platforms to last forever. Um, hold on a second. So I think it's important for these uh, this parallel movement to operate in spaces that aren't um, able to be recuperated by uh, <clears throat> megacorps. And that means purposefully not making that much money, uh, which sucks because you need money to live. But that means people like me who have the money to live already, uh, you know, people who, who can afford to run these sorts of things should be the ones running them, which is why I really want to uh, you know, or at least supporting them. You know, this is why I donate to cybergrunge.net. This is why I do, you know, well, that's only one thing. But hopefully, I'm going to be expanding stuff. I'm going to be expanding stuff, hopefully. I've got a couple of ideas, but this stuff's early stages. And I need to learn more technical knowledge before I can really implement. I don't want to talk about it because the more I talk about it, you know, I'm building hype for something that may or may not ever happen. Um, but anyway, uh, that's one thing. And it also means getting involved in stuff that scares companies away. Stuff like vulgarities and copyright infringement. Those are the two main things. Companies, they're terrified of copyright infringement because, you know, as again in, in the talk, that uh, copyright infringement is a uh, uh, criminal contempt of business model, right? It's like, no, you, you're, you're making my business model, you're revealing that my business model doesn't work. That's, the, that's what copyright infringement really is. So um, we need to be infringing those goddamn copyrights and not giving a shit. And uh, we need to be hosting vulgar material because that scares off advertisers. We don't want any advertising, okay? I, I will never be supported. Well, I mean, I guess I am in some sense supported by advertising, but, like, fuck advertising. I'll never host the advertising, except, like, you know, advertising similar community-run projects. Let stuff be small. This is the thing, right? Like, people, the internet these days has blown people's, you know, perceptions of, of what counts as success in terms of audience size out of proportion, right? Like, the fact that we regularly see YouTube videos with a million views, right? Like, think back. Think back, like, 10 years in YouTube history. Like, getting a million views was, like, insane. Can you? And everyone had still seen them. Everyone you knew had still seen the popular YouTube videos, even when they got, you know, 20,000 views. Isn't that crazy? It is crazy. And it's real shit. It's real shit that's fucking real, man. Like, don't worry too much about view count. I mean, obviously you need an audience to sustain yourself in terms of donations, but you don't have to get too crazy with it. Keep it local. That's the real decentralization. Keep it local. Um, and interoperable. This is obviously. Yeah, you want everything to be able to communicate with each other. Web rings. Web rings. Promote each other. Lift each other up, right? Local but into intercommunicable. Everything connected. Everything connected. Low integration, high interconnectivity. That's what we're talking about. Like software, like good software, right? Like 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 suckless software, right? Everything should take standard input and output standard output, okay? Um, and and expand that metaphor to mean whatever you want it to mean. At this point, I'm getting tired because I've been talking for like 40 minutes straight, but I want to say one final thing on this before we get into comments, which is um, identity. You know, the internet was in, supposed to revol revolutionize the concept of identity. If you have only one internet identity, you're not going to make it. I'm just telling you right now. If everything you do on the internet is centralized in one name and one identity that is consistent, you're not going to make it. You need to be maintaining at least three alternative identities at all times, okay? I myself am in, like, at least three 
different communities that are completely disconnected from each other. Some of them know the other ones exist, and that's it. Right? They are completely disconnected, and this is good, and they should be they should be like this. Don't use the same username for everything. Don't use the same you know persona for everything. Switch it up. Keep yourself fluid. And, you know, keep yourself fluid in, 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 in interesting ways, right? There's no reason that you have to be your gender on every website. You can switch that up. That just confuses the bots more, which is what you want to confuse, right? Keep them, keep them guessing. Change your name. Have, like, 20 different email addresses with different providers. Have 20 different usernames. Switch every, every detail up about, you know, your date of birth and your located. Switch everything up, Okay. Switch it all up. Keep it moving. Keep it keep it flowing. Uh, you know this is freedom, baby. Okay, that's it. Uh, now I'm gonna take a break and play some TF2, and then I'll come back and we'll respond to some comments. Okay, we're gonna do some comment responses. Uh, hopefully, I'm not responding to comments that I've already responded to somewhere else. But we're just gonna go on every video I've ever made from most recent until I reach a comment that I feel like I've talked about before. On the tour of my knee otaku room, brackets Itabea, uh, Forrest Wittigatopa says, what the fuck, how did you film my room? Question mark, question mark, question mark. You see, you're one of us. We are of the same kind. Boom69634 says, the Spider-Verse on Mr. Beast Souls World Bombs in a podcast for 12 hours, says, the Spider-Verse movie is not that good, and the second one is worst. But the new TMNT movie is great. I haven't seen it, but I've seen some clips. They look decent. Uh, they also ask, what text would you recommend to learn about Collapse? Um, I would probably recommend reading Desert uh, by Anonymous. I think if you just look up Desert Book, you'll find it. Uh, Lazik or Lazich 36 says, Mr. No, thank you. In the last cast, you talked about being confused how people in the past ate so much more than people do today, even though the obesity epidemic is unique to modern times with people seemingly eating far less? Question mark, question mark, question mark. I recommend the book Ultra Processed People. It put forth some arguments about why that is uh, that I think you may find interesting. TLDR basically is the fact that people are eating large quantities of ultra processed foods that didn't exist back then. I'm skeptical of this idea of processed foods. Okay, because what were people eating in the past? All of that food was also processed. Bread, processed. Noodles, processed. You know, and even rice, you, you dehusk it, you polish it, it's processed. You know, like I'm, I'm not convinced that this processed food stuff is as bad as, as it's made out to be. I think the problem is not eating whole foods rather than like, it's it's not just that the foods are processed. It's, it's what the processes do to them, right? Like, uh, well, whatever. You know, if you, if you, a lot of the processes, uh, some of them are just like, we're going to put some preservatives in this so it doesn't go moldy by tomorrow, which is probably pretty good. You know, I, I've, I don't know if you ever made fresh bread, uh, very fun, very tasty, highly recommend you make your own bread from time to time. Um, but it goes stale by the next day, by the end of the day, like it's, it's like a brick by the next day. You leave it overnight, the next morning you can't even do anything with it, let alone leave it for like a few days. Like you basically have to eat the whole loaf on the same day you bake it. Whereas like, you know, as much as people shit on modern factory processed bread for tasting worse, which it does, don't get me wrong, uh, it lasts like a week, which is crazy. So like, that's a that's a good thing. There's also a lot of foods that are processed to add nutrients that wouldn't naturally be in them, fortified foods. That's also good. People before fortification, but after industrialization, ended up with a bunch of like thyroid problems and stuff from not getting enough iodine and things like this. So fortification is good. Um, you know, that's a lot of the processing that's done. So I'm not convinced that like, I mean, I'd have to see what the definition of ultra processed is by this person. Uh, but I mean, I think it's probably a valid point because like people are eating a lot more refined, refined carbs and refined sugars than they used to. Right, which is going to be like increasing the glycemic load of of these sorts of things, which I, yeah I think is pretty reasonable. Um, Unim says I think waifu was popularized in the outside of Japan after spreading through the chans because Kimura from Asmongadayo says my waifu. 
Lazich36 says on, oh look, it's another 12-hour podcast. Maybe I'm just unperceptive, but I didn't even realize half the stuff that you mentioned about Half-Life was even going on. And I've played it like four times. Maybe this means I should delve into the lore, because what you described with Gordon Freeman being injected with meth and all the body horror stuff I didn't even notice sounds absolutely sick. I feel like I've already responded to that. I think we're back to, I think we've we've gone down to the stuff that I, I've already responded to. Anything held, you know, I never get any comments held for review. Okay, no one ever says any fucked up shit on my channel that gets held for review. I always see this tab, but there's never anything in it. It's, it's always a bit disappointing. Like, I want to see the edgy shit that people are saying, but no one's saying anything edgy. It's a, it's, a, it's a shame. It's a shame. No one's no one wants to say anything edgy. Well, we will definitely get more comments as soon as uh, the twelve hour podcast to listen to while falling asleep, walking the dog, gaming, um, up finish uploading, which is gonna take like an hour more. I've already, by the way, it's been like two hours since I recorded the last segment. So you know, this is how long it takes me to upload these twelve hour videos. Just just so you know, uh, it's like. It takes like four hours to upload and process, um, and sometimes it just fails because YouTube is buggy as shit. Um, okay, well I think I've done. You know, it's a shame I never finished the 2005 series properly. Well, I was reviewing anime from 2005. There was just too much bad and really boring anime. Like I can, I don't mind like marathoning shows, but it's when the shows are really boring. But I still have to come up with something to say about it. That's what's difficult. It's like, like a lot of the shows that I ended up watching, they were bad, but mostly in the sense that they were, yeah, you know what I mean, right? Like, it's hard to really come up with anything to say about it, which is one of the main reasons that I stopped the series. And there's just so much anime. Like, it's crazy when you actually try and watch all of it. <laughs> there's a lot. Good morning, guys. I pretty much just woke up, got in one quick game of cough underscore harvest, and now I'm going to make breakfast, uh, which is going to be pasta, because... I want pasta, and the idea of breakfast food is a scam. But before we do any of that, I'm going to do some comment responses, because we've now had a, about 18 or so hours of the previous 12-hour podcast being up, and uh, there are comments, there are comments to respond to, real comments to respond to, not my fake-ass bullshit comment response that I already did. The the real comment, this is the real comment response now. Okay, we've got, we've got, um, uh... BLK Frey with the Kinamoto Sakura profile picture who says thank you for your service. Much appreciated. Uh Jayco four seven oh three says you gotta stop chaptering these to be honest. Um it would be really good if I could do that, but that is simply too much labor. Like I'd have to listen to the entire twelve hour thing after already making it once. Um like that's it's just too I mean maybe if I could train an AI model to do that for me, it would be viable, but I just don't necessarily think it's viable. The only other way to go about it would be to, like, mark chapters as I go, like, mark the timestamp, but that gets broken if I decide to truncate the silences in the Audacity file to make it more listenable, which I often do, so it's it's kind of, unfortunately, as much as I, I agree it would improve the experience of watching the videos a lot, and I've thought about it, I just can't think of a way to actually, like, pull that off viably, you know? Um, Kyla gives a big, long response to Marxism stuff, which we're going to deal with at the end. Um, Kodai Demivi, 1256, says, Wee! Sunset Inn says, I like the 12-hour-long podcast because it means less videos in my subscriptions page, so please keep it that way. I I think that's something I hadn't thought about. That's a good, that's a good point. People don't like it when you spam their sub page, so keeping it, yeah, you know what, that's a good idea, that's a good, I'll keep that in mind, and uh, now on some other random videos, we got Alice Quintanilla 3718, who says on, uh, how is it possible that I can lack energy, open source, okay, and same person comments on Aftermath 1, uh, that the doobly-doo was invented as an in-joke of the Bulk Vlogbrothers circa 2011-2013, yeah, that's, that's correct, um, I don't even remember what it was. That video is like a year old. I, I don't remember. Okay, let's talk to let's talk to Kyla now about Marxism stuff. Okay. Melo Kyla says, re-Marxism stuff. Yeah, that's fair. Me taking issue with stealing was kind of nitpicky. It was clear what you meant about exploitation. I just wanted to push back on a criticism of capitalism being that it doesn't fully compensate workers with the value of their labor. The main trap not to fall into is to say, I deserve the full proceeds of my labor as a worker. 
meaning that workers should be allocated both their reproduction value and surplus value. Co-op firms and artisans tout their ability to do this, but as Marx talks about in uh, the critique of the Goethe program, I'm not going to read the German because I hate the German language, um, the allocation of the undiminished proceeds of labor is impossible. Replacement, reinvestment, insurance, administrative costs, social programs, and provision for non-workers are all required for social reproduction and will come out of that value that workers are allocated. The whole way of approaching the problem is flawed because it maintains the value form, the commodity form, markets, and the rest of capitalism, except workers are now just self-exploiting. Yeah, I think this is very true. Um, this reminds me a lot of... Um, this this is this is something that the I the YouTuber and streamer Destiny um he doesn't understand any of this obviously but then neither do the people who talk to him about socialism that like people who talk talk to Destiny about about Marxist theory and to explain the concept of like worker democracy to him they always you know he always sort of shuts them down by just saying like firstly you can create a co-op under capitalism and then implicitly capitalism is a meritocracy the better businesses will always survive. This is the, the the implication of what he says, right? And then, you know, you can create a co-op under capitalism, people do it, and they're never that successful. Therefore, you know, um, why would you care about worker democracy when it, you know, it makes a, it, it's actually a worse way of doing production. Um, and, you know, a lot of people get really stuck debating him on this because, um, I mean, he's, other than the, the meritocracy stuff he's kind of way right about that like there is nothing stopping you from just making a co-op and many people do um you know he's obviously there's well there's a lot to talk about that i'm not gonna not gonna get into it but you know that a lot of people get get trapped in this this debate uh sort of chokehold that he brings up this gotcha um but you know i think y you've pretty much explained why actually that argument is not valid but yeah, this is just theory sell nonsense, and to be honest, I don't think you're vulnerable to that trap. Really, really big fan of your the visceral malice of, malice of all of this video, because it expresses the sentiment that minor organizational reform is not sufficient to meaningfully change the phenomenology of oppressive systems. I think the only point of difference is that I would say it doesn't change the basic mode of production at all, because of things like the above discussion on the exploitation of value. It's hard, though, since a lot of Marxists are idiots and think co-op capitalism or state capitalism or communism and make it hard to talk about. I like to think that my reading of Marx is not just removing the sprinkles of shit on the sandwich and is rather much more in line with all that exists deserves to perish. Sorry for the long comments. It's kind of embarrassing. Um, I mean, it isn't, Marx isn't supposed to be the real movement that changes the present state of things. Uh, oh, and about mud pies socially necessary labor time, use value, and quantifications of human life, I broadly completely agree. It's impossible and undesirable to try to objectively measure value in the real world. And nonetheless, I do think Marxist concepts explain real processes in relative or theoretical terms. After all, use values are necessarily qualitative. Trying to quantify them is a fool's errand. It's actually subjective theories of value that try to quantify use values with utility. I 100% agree with that. That is like the most bullshit thing about, you know, all of the fucking... Austrian economics is their obsession with, like, utility. It's nonsense. Yeah, no, I agree with you on that. The point is not to administrate value. The point is to abolish it. Fuck scientific socialism and goofy poor cockshot types. Um, the tricky bit about social necessary labor time is that it's the measure for abstract labor, which is predicated upon generalized commodity production. Marx's labor theory of value is not a transhistorical ontological theory. And concrete labor is merely the manifestation of abstract labor. Okay, you're kind of losing me here. I'm not quite sure I understand what you're talking about. The only reason why concrete labor takes place at all is to be mediated, the mediated form of abstract labor, which is the way capital gets valorized. Abstract labor is necessarily oriented towards creating marketable use values. Otherwise, the capitalist would not be able to ultimately realize surplus value in the sphere of circulation. In this way, random expenditure of human powers, i.e. mud powers, isn't even concrete labor as such because the expenditure is not the manifestation of abstract labor, therefore no valorization and no exchange value because no use value. Postone in time, labor, and social domination is good on this subject. Post literates, medium articles are great supplements if you want something shorter. I'm sorry, this is ridiculous. I won't go full autismo in your comments again about Marx. No, it's fine. We have some fun discussions. I'm sure the rest of my audience loves hearing stupid Marxist discussions. Uh, I'm I have I'm going to be honest with you. 
I have absolutely no fucking idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck abstract and concrete... I don't know what the distinction between abstract and concrete labor is. I don't understand that. I'll have to read the thing that you linked because I don't even understand what you're saying to be able to respond to it. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I don't know, man. I, I, I mean, I agree, fuck the goofy Paul Cockshot types. Um, and I think the people can... Like, obviously, the origin point of, of the term scientific socialism, it's kind of... A, it has a good part and a bad part, in my opinion, right? Because it was obviously a response to the utopian socialism, which I think it's good that there was a response to that, right? It's sort of like... You know what it's sort of like? It's sort of like cyberpunk's... Scientific socialism is kind of like cyberpunk's response to the sort of high fantasy sci-fi, right? It's like, like here's a more grounded and realistic version of the thing that you guys want, right? Um, but, you know, there's obviously also a, a lot of other historical context in terms of its position in the Enlightenment and, like, how, uh, you know, at that time uh, that Marx was writing, the, there was a lot of, I, I, you know, this is a very Foucault type of thing to talk about, right? That, like, um, Europeans were having a, a, a great time cataloging the world. They were having a great time looking at looking at the natural world and uh, p- putting it into categories and being able to do a whole bunch of really useful shit with that, right, in terms of engineering, science, material science, you know, like being able to biology, you know, medicine, being able to, to look at the natural world and uh, put it into these sorts of categories and models allows you to do all sorts of great stuff. That's basically what science is. It's making models that describe the world. And so it was only a matter of time until people started turning their attention to, well, can we do this for human stuff? And that's kind of the the era that Marx comes about in, right? Is turning that eye of um, scientific modeling and scientific categorization into towards human activity. Like, can we categorize the broad trends in human history into historical materialism? Um, you know. But this is also the same time, this is the same exact attitude that produces, you know, race pseudoscience, right? This is the same exact attitude that produces um, the current oppressive mental health system, you know, categorizing people as, as mad. This is the same, this is the same strain of thought that produces the criminal and the prison. It produces a lot of problems in terms of Um, the oppression of children in society, in schooling, uh, right? Like this kind of thought pattern, I'm not saying it's bad, okay? This is, that would be insane, that like that would be way too far. It's not bad, but it is dangerous. It's like, you know, like deep frying, okay? Deep frying stuff can make stuff taste amazing, right? It can taste great. It's a little unhealthy. This is basically, you know what? This is a fucking amazing metaphor that my brain instantly come up with i'm such a genius it's it's like deep frying something okay Uh, doing doing like applying uh you know these sorts of scientific enlightenment methodologies to to human activity is is very much like deep frying (laughs) because it can make stuff taste really good you can have great outcomes even though those outcomes are a little bit unhealthy you know in moderation as long as it's not the only thing you eat it's it's fine and, and delicious, but it's also much more dangerous than like any other cooking method because if that oil spills, you're gonna have a gap. You're gonna you're gonna have a a, a grease fire, which is which is uh, you know very problematic to deal with, and your house is gonna burn down. So like you gotta be careful when you're deep frying stuff. It can come out with some great, albeit slightly unhealthy results, uh, but it's also you know comes with a big danger. That's basically how I see it, feel about like all of these sorts of Enlightenment era applying uh, the, the ideas of categorization and modeling to human society. Because so the, the reason it becomes problematic is this like uh, fundamental issue I think people have with models. Right? A lot of people don't think about the concept of a model very hard. Right, like a model does describe reality, but it really approximates reality. Right, even scientific models, physics models, you know, like like Newton's laws of of, of thermodynamics or, or or Einstein or anything like all of these, they may be accurate. They may produce accurate results that are reliable and and make accurate predictions. Right, but they're still only approximating reality. 
Like, this is kind of a hard thing to wrap your head around. Even these laws, which are true every time, they are only descriptions of reality. They are not the same thing as reality. Uh, like, I, I actually disagree with a lot of the way scientists frame this, that, like, that these mathematical laws are the laws that govern reality. I don't believe that's the case. Like, if you really want to be accurate, I think you should say these are a set of mathematical descriptions of reality, rather than these are the, the, the laws that govern reality. And I think the fact this causality problem, where people get the, the model confused with the real thing, it's really common in, like, every field, even the hard sciences, but especially the soft sciences. Because in the hard sciences, where the models are, like, 100% accurate, it doesn't really matter. But the softer your science is, you know, economic sociology, these sorts of things, the more likely you are to have models that just only vaguely approximate reality. And these models can be good, right? Like, I hear a lot of leftists talk about, oh, economists think we're all rational actors that are perfectly rational all times. No economist actually thinks this, but modeling the world, modeling an economy as if everyone is perfectly rational is surprisingly good at making predictions. This is why people do this, right? It's that, like, if you model an economy as if every person is making a rational decision at all times and, you know, utility maximizing or whatever, it approximates a real economy surprisingly well. But it, it's not, like, the idea isn't this is what people are actually like. The idea is... It's sort of like, you know, when you're doing mathematics and you assume that a cow is a perfect frictionless sphere, right? It's like, here's a simplified model so that we can, you know, do maths to it. Um, but no one actually thinks a cow is a, fr a frictionless sphere, you know? It's like, this is this is just an abstraction in order to, to for, for academic purposes, basically. Uh, but the problem comes when people get those two things mixed up, Um and it often happens in very subtle ways. Like, people will deny that they think that humans are actually rational actors, you know. But they don't realize that even their model assumes something about reality. Like, the, you may have heard the term rational idiot, right? Like, a lot of these models where it's like, oh, well, perfectly rational actors will end up, by only doing the thing that maximizes utility for them perfectly rationally, actually, well, they'll end up, you know, fucking themselves over in some way. There's a lot of little, like, economics or... Um, game theory puzzles that work out like that, right? Where it's like, okay, you have two perfectly rational agents, and each each perfectly rational agent, by only acting perfectly rationally, will end up doing something that screws them over. Well, if you actually think about that, then they're not acting perfectly rationally. They are rational idiots. They're rational enough to, you know, be stupid, but not rational enough to understand the problem that the game theorists are talking about. Like, why wouldn't they? Do you, do you understand? Like, if they're perfectly rational, they would also understand the next level of, like, well, if we both act like this, eventually we're both going to screw ourselves over. There's a whole bunch of different game theory and economics, you know, models that work like this. And uh, even, you know, I, I watched a, a few uh, Economics 101 lectures. They're kind of nonsense, but, you know, even in those lectures, like the MIT Econ, Econ 101, like Microeconomics 101 class, um, like, he says that these models are about 70% accurate. Uh, I think in, like, lesson one or two, he, he says this. He's like, remember, we're talking about models here, and that these models are about 70% accurate, which is, you know, good enough that it can make 70% accurate predictions, which is better than nothing. But, yeah, I think a lot of people get this stuff mixed up on the other way around, that even though they will claim, oh, they're just models, whatever, in reality, they've spent so much time attached to these models that they you know, really, they think these are the governing laws behind reality, and especially behind human activity, and that anything that varies from that, this is where a lot of libertarian economists go wrong, like, anything that varies from these models is wrong, because these are the, really the, the mathematical laws that govern everything underneath the human activity, and it's human activity that's fucking things up. But, you know, obviously that's not true, because these these models were invented to describe the human activity in the first place. So I think, I think a lot of people get this stuff very confused and it happens on in every field right like it happened and I, i'm focusing on economics here but especially soft sciences are so so susceptible to this like psychology is also so susceptible to this like every aspect of psychology and psycho psychiatry especially psychiatry it's just the worst like the amount of people who don't even understand how the dsm works like the dsm is just like like five guys it's not like a democratic system or a scientific system like the way new conditions are put into the dsm is just a bunch of like hand selected guys who are like 
you know, psychiatrists come together and they don't have to present any like evidence uh, or or anything or because obviously there are no biological markers for most of these mental health conditions. In fact, for all of them, there are never any biological markers because, um, you know, if there were biological markers, you would consider it brain damage rather than a mental health problem. Um, so, you know, they, pre- they, they, they go to this meeting and there's like 20, or th- I don't even know, there might be less than 20 of them, I don't remember, but there's not that many of them, right? And they're just sort of random guys who have been given authority. Um, sometimes they're not, you know, sometimes they're experts, but anyway, they each come up and, and they just say their shit and then it just gets put in, right? They, ju- they just have a vote on it within these, this small community of people who contribute to the DSM. And that's how it gets in. They vote on the symptoms and whatever. But it has, there's at no point does anyone have to present any scientific evidence that these things exist, right? And then, even though the DSM is just a catalogue of, you know, it's then used as a diagnosis criteria for, for something that didn't exist until the last issue, you know? The way this stuff works is insane. Like, that's just a... The, the DSM is, like, one of the worst examples. But, I mean, like, they freely admit that, like, they put stuff in the DSM based on vibes exclusively. Like, there is no burden of proof that these that these conditions have to exist or that the symptoms, uh, you know, or the diagnosis criteria are what they say they are. Like, they, they basically just make shit up. And then it gets taken seriously by, you know, tens of thousands of psychiatrists and psychologists and even random people on TikTok as if it's the gospel, as if it's got some sort of scientific backing to it, which it doesn't. But basically every you know, model of reality is just like the DSM, but slightly better, right? But then you're never going to actually, you're, I mean, to get, this isn't, to, to bastardize Kant for a second here, you you know, these are only a representation of reality. You're never actually getting at reality, even with a very accurate model. Um, so yeah, this is the thing about economics, <laughs> is that even, you know, historical materialism, even if you like it, you still have to remember that, uh, you know, it's de- you're, you're playing with, with very hot frying oil here. You're playing with very hot frying oil here. And you don't want to spill it because it will hit the flame and you'll, you'll catch on fire. I've got a couple more things to cover here. Um, first of all, while it's still fresh in my mind, I just finished the anime Daima Hotoge, which is a four-episode OVA. <clears throat> I would say that it's probably in the class of otaku-oriented magical girl. I've added it to, um, you know, the otaku-oriented magical girl list. Um, have I even talked about that? Okay, you don't, you guys don't need to know about the list, okay? You guys don't, you can, you, you don't need to know about the list. Anyway, Daima <laughs> Hotoge, um, it's a four-episode comedy magical girl, although even calling it magical girl, I mean, it, it's, like, it kind of forgets what the fuck it is by the end. It's only four episodes, and yet somehow it has, like, an identity crisis halfway through. Like, the first two episodes lean stronger on the magical girl element, and then it kind of forgets about that as the time goes on. And the gimmick initially is, uh, like, they're magical girls, but they're, like, vulgar. It's not a raunchy magical girl parody, like something like, you know, uh, Papillon Rose, but it is a, I, I would say it's pro, it's a parody, um, but it's not raunchy, there's no fan service or anything, it's, and it, it's not, I mean, it's violent, but it's comedy violence, it's, I would call it vulgar, I think is the best, like, they swear a lot, I mean, obviously there's no, like, swear words in Japan, they speak very informally, you know, they're, they're constantly insulting each other, and smoking, and stuff like that, um, <clears throat> but, you, you know, with cute, cutesy magical girl persona stuff. Like, for example, the the magical girl transformation uh, sequence includes the line in English, Kill them all. She's like, kill them all. And then transforms. Which is, like, I guess kind of funny the first time you see it. Um, but mostly, the show is like, like, after the first episode, which I feel like is just mainly vulgarity... It kind of is a bit more of an absurdist comedy. And when it works, I think it's pretty good. But because it's so short, it mostly doesn't work. And because it's so short, even the bits that do work, it's like not that much, right? It's like, you know, just not much. If a quarter of the show works, that's one episode, right? And, yeah, you know, it's just, it's very meh. Like sometimes I find that the, 
the, found that the comedy was was hitting, and I the bits that were funny I thought were actually pretty funny. But like I don't know, like I have memorable funny scenes from the anime that I can think about and be like, yeah, that was funny. But the rest of it is just a slog. And this is the problem when you talk about comedy anime is that there's only so many times that you can say it's a comedy that isn't funny. Like this is the problem I always run into when I try and describe comedy shows that I don't like is comedy, you know, you can't really explain very well why jokes work or don't work. I mean, in this case, I would say some of them, they don't work because they're too they're too obvious. They're too obvious of a gag. Like, they don't subvert my expectations properly because it's exactly what I would expect the show to do in that situation. But most of the time, it just doesn't work because it just isn't funny and there's not really anything else to say about it. Um... And because of that, it's very boring <laughs> a lot of the time. It took me like three days to slog through this. And again, it's only four episodes long. So, uh, yeah, a bit of a slog. Normally, I would have dropped it. If this was a, a, a full-length 12-episode show, I would have, or, or, you know, even longer, I would have dropped it. But the, the fact that there was only four episodes, I was like, I may as well just blast through it. <sighs> Definitely a shame. Because, like, some of the scenes were, like, genuinely funny. And I feel like if it was just those scenes, it would have been great. But unfortunately not. I'm actually, you know, I'm, I don't know, I could, I could almost recommend this show just because it's pretty unique. I mean, obviously, if you want a, like, absurdist comedy anime that plays on some of the tropes of, of, maybe not Magical Girl, but, like, you know, high school girls, probably better off watching Take You or Plastic Nissan, or maybe even, if you do want Magical Girl, probably, like, Puni Puni Poemi, or maybe Ryofuko Chan, um... It's not a, by any means a highlight of the genre. I think I'm going to give it a 4 out of 10. Maybe, I don't know. I can't quite give it a 3, even though... Oh, it started raining. Even though a lot of it is very... I would class a lot of it as very bad. There's enough good stuff in there that it's just, it just barely ekes out into the 4 out of 10 territory for me. Uh, but yeah, because it's so short, I can almost recommend it. I don't know. If you're, if you're, if that sounds interesting to you... it. I will say, like even though I can compare it to a bunch of other shows... In terms of tone, it is quite different from those shows. Um, it, like, it is pretty unique in terms of its style of comedy. I just don't think that the, the style works most of the time. Uh, so you might want to check it out. I don't know. Okay, so that's the first thing I wanted to talk about. Um, the next thing I wanted to say is, while we were doing comments, um, there's another thing which is sort of a comment, which is uh, my, my viewer, The Good Student, uh, actually messaged me on Discord to see if I wanted to react to this long, this this playlist called The Story of Psychedelia, which uh, I don't know if they want their exact message read out publicly, but, you know, basically saying if I wanted to react and respond to this playlist in one of my podcasts. And this is a YouTube playlist uh, that seems to be sort of a documentary series about the history of psychedelia, psychedelic art and music. Um, and uh, frankly... You know, no offense to the good student, but no, I don't want to do that. This is like 10 hours of content, uh, and it's just, I'm not particularly interested in psychedelic rock or psychedelic music anymore. I mean, maybe if this was, you know, five years ago when that was more my thing, when I, you know, was smoking a lot more weed um, and, li- you know, listening to a lot more 60s psychedelic stuff, this would have been more up my alley. But even then, I mean, this is a stretch. <laughs> So no, I, I'm afraid I don't particularly want to do that. Uh, I think we have some more comments, though. No, we don't have any more comments. Never mind, that was a fake notification. Okay, and there was one more thing I wanted to say, but I, you know what? don't remember what it was. I thought I had something else that was like, oh, and also this, but nope, don't remember. There's another OVA I'm trying to watch, which is Happy Lesson. But this show is also very bad. Oh yeah, I wanted to talk about Denpa. That's what I wanted to talk about. The 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 term Denpa. Um, there's like okay, so the term Denpa I feel like is used in two very distinct ways. You know, I already made a video called Denpa, but it'd be nice to make another video where I like explain like because I just want to know. I just want to research it. Like try and look back at the origins, history, and usage of the term Denpa. Because like if you go on my anime list. Dot net and you search for a denpa in the interest stag- stacks um, area, you'll find like two different complete types. Like the, some of the more popular ones, you know, that, that are called denpa, 
and have have the word done put in them. They they get you know, it's it's Lane, it's Ava, it's Techno Lies, it's Paranoia Agent, it's Haibane Renmei, it's Ergo Proxy. What else? Shin Sekai Yori, Fuli Kuli, Higurashi, fucking School Days. What are you talking about? Uh, Alien Nine, Dead Dead Demons, Dead 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 Destruction. I don't know. See, Alien Nine, I'm much closer to accepting as Denpa, but and maybe even Dead Dead Demons, Dead 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 Destruction. I don't really think that counts as Denpa, though. I mean, like a lot of these, I wouldn't count as Denpa. Like the closest, I don't think any of these fit my definition of Denpa. At least the way I see it, um, it has to be more. Maybe Lane. Maybe I don't know. I don't know if I'd really go as far as to say Lane is damper. Uh, yeah, these are just sort of, this is just terrible. But then anyway, so that's the sort of shows you see on there, right? Um, the sort of pretentious, and I say pretentious lovingly, okay? I, I love pretty much every show I just listed. Um, like NHK, I would call, I would say is, is more close to damper. And Chaos Head, it, that definitely fits the damper. You know, maybe Akunohana, maybe. Maybe Ak- Akunohana. But that's one form of Denpa. It's a sort of psychological horror, conspiracy thriller with like uh, a lot of stuff about delusion, uh, delusional main characters. That's 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 a, a lot of like how the word Denpa is used. And if you go on VNDB, right, and you go on uh, the Denpa tag on VNDB, um, which is where the term originates, you know, a lot of those are... You know, we're talking Higurashi, although I don't agree that Higurashi should be classed as Denpa. Tsubahibi, Chaos Head, uh, you know, Sayano Uta, Gore Screaming Show, Chaos Child, Euphoria, Kimigo Kanajo to Kanajo to Koi. Um, I, I could have sworn um, fucking... Ah, uh, whatever. So, you know, a little more psych- psychological horror with regards to... Anyway... But then, the, so that's how a lot of the term "damper" is used. But then there's another whole usage of the term "damper," which comes from damper music. So if you go on YouTube and you search "damper," uh, well, actually, if I search "damper," I just get a bunch of Amelie Doré videos, who is a, a good YouTuber. Um, but I guess they're the only person that talks about damper. Uh, I guess if you search for damper music or damper song, you're going to get a bunch of like mosaic web type shit you know stuff that sounds like this hopefully hopefully i don't get copyright strike for this stuff that's like you know stuff that sounds like like the squid girl op or whatever you know stuff with anime girl moe moe singing type styles right that sort of stuff and i love this style of music a lot but Trying to relate how that links to the usage of Denpa in other mediums is is very complicated and strange, right? And I want to try and understand the lineage there. Because the, the original usage of Denpa for music was um, that it's, like, strange but catchy, which I think a lot of those Denpa songs are. Like, they have an element of weirdness and, like, overly cutesiness. Kind of like what is perfected by the the pura 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 din theme from NHK, um, but then so so you go on it on Mao and you search for Denpa and, and most of them are these you know people not really understanding the term in my opinion just thinking it means anything like broadly philosophical with some like psychological uh, elements which I don't agree with as a definition, but then you'll find one which is just Denpa all caps by Incel Man sixty eight plus one which is a very funny username. And this is like Denpa in the in the sense of Denpa song. You've got like Moe Tan, Digi Charat, Cosplay Complex, Handmade Mai, uh, Nurse Witch Kamugi Chan, Galaxy Angel. You know, this is much more along the lines of the Denpa. This, see, I don't have any problem with calling this Denpa. For some reason, this, this works perfectly fine for me, even though maybe uh, that's odd because they're two very different usages. Um, but yeah, and so I'm trying to work my way through some of these shows. The problem is most of them aren't very good, but that's kind of the appeal, right? Or you would assume that was the appeal if, if they were not good in an interesting way, but I don't know. I'm struggling. <laughs> I'm struggling, man. Like, out of the the ones that exist on this list, 
um, you know, I've also seen Mori Tan, and I, I think Mori Tan is amazing. And I've seen Digi Chariot, which I think is great. And, uh, you know, some of these other ones, like Rokusatsu Tenji Dokoro Chan, I don't really like. And then Daima Hotoge, I just explained, is kind of bad. Yofuko Chan is good. Galaxy Angel, I need to give another shot. I didn't really like it the first time I watched it, but I don't know. I think that there's potential in there. Um, and then, you know, there's some other ones. Koharu Yori, I didn't really like. Um, but some of these are stuff that I really want to watch, like Penguin Musume Heart, probably really good. And there's shows on here that is like, no one fucking knows this exists, like Yuru Mates. No one has watched Yuru Mates. It's a great show. You should watch it. Um, or fucking Yutori Chan. Yutori Chan is like, kind of sucks, but like, it's got pop, art style by pop. And I guess Tenshi no Drop, which is famous for being Tenshi no Drop. Like, putting Dead Leaves on here, I, I don't know about that, but, um, like, Dead Leaves is a good movie. I like Dead Leaves. I wouldn't put it... And putting Mawaru Penguin Drum on here is also really weird. Like, I don't really know what this person was thinking to, with some of those choices, but I understand what they're getting at. Like, Denkin Sankyu Magical Pokkan, a little bit of Akihabara Den no Gumi, you know, P- Puri Sami, Kaito Tenshi Twin Angel, Shake-chan... And then it's like World of Golden Eggs. It's like, what's that doing on there? I don't know, man. Some of these are weird. But nonetheless, um, for some reason, I feel like making my way through some of these shows. Like if I was, maybe I should make the true Denpa stack. Maybe I should make the true Denpa stack. No, I'm, I can't be bothered to do that. <laughs> but yeah, they're cool, I guess. Um, but yeah, there's there's a bunch of shows on here that I am kind of interested in. Um, some of which I've already, like, for example, Handmade Mai, I already have downloaded on my ThinkPad X60, and I'm, like, watching it on that. And some of these shows I've been meaning to watch for ages, like, I don't know, but it's weird, it's a weird fucking thing. Anyway, I'm gonna watch one of these next, which is, um, Haitai Nanafa, which is a short episode, like, three minute episode show, so hopefully I can just blast through that. Um, oh, I also need to watch the last... Fuck, I need to watch the last episode of Vending Machine Isekai as well. Hope you guys don't mind when I talk about anime on here, okay? I don't, I don't have very many interests, right? I'm also kind of burnt out on TF2. Because I've been playing, like, like fucking eight hours of TF2 a day. Maybe a bit less than that. No, pretty much. I mean, pretty much about, like, eight hours of TF2 every day. Which I know isn't, like, that crazy. But I'm getting kind of burnt out. Um... Like, even switching up, normally it's like when I burn out on one class, I just switch classes and play something else. But, like, even with that isn't really helping. Like, I just feel kind of burnt out. Um, Which is fine. You know, it just means I need to take a break. But I need something to fill my time during that break. And, you know, TF2 is my one interest. Anime shit, otaku shit is my other interest. And then, like, computer shit is my other interest. And that's kind of it. I just sort of rotate around those three. And I can't really do any computer shit here because I only have my Mac. Which, while efficient, is sad. I miss my ThinkPads. Um, I miss them so bad, man. I miss my desktop. I miss my ThinkPads. I, w- I, w- I really want to make a uh, Freedom Box once I get back to the UK in, like, a few days. I'm very excited to, to try and set up this Freedom Box thing. Um, I, think it, I think it has so much potential. And I could even host my own website on it. Although, it'd be kind of annoying. Like, there's nothing objectively bad about it. I could also host a goddamn Matrix server, like a Synapse, Matrix Synapse server, which would be great for um, my own privacy and security. But I don't know how much you can afford to run off of one thing. Um, But I should have a Raspberry Pi somewhere in my house. I don't know which kind. I don't know if it's supported. But yeah, while I'm here, there's not really much computer stuff I can do. Um, So it kind of leaves me with TF2 and Amnime. I also need to... Man, I have so much stuff to do. I need to finish Keen Koi, which I said I was going to do, like, months ago. But then I came here, and so I stopped reading it for some reason. But I could so... I, I mean, I could be reading it here. I'm just, like, lazy. I don't know. I don't know, man. My brain... My brain don't work. You know, this is the thing. My brain... It really don't work. Uh, like... Like, I don't know if I have ADHD or something. But, you know... I used to say, go around saying, like, if I could change one thing about myself, like, if there's one big flaw I have, 
is that I can't stick to things. That's the way I would describe it. I would say I can't stick to things. But more recently, I've realized that what I actually mean by that is that I am incapable of forming habits. This is the very strange thing to me. Like I can't, I can't form habits.、Um, or like, I just assumed. I always assumed that everyone was exaggerating when they talked about habits, and like that everyone else was also kind of like me. But I've, I'm, I'm now starting to think that actually I'm, I'm like particularly bad at this habit forming thing. That like I have to think actively about doing everything, right? Like it's even stuff that like is very mindless to most people, like brushing your teeth every day or something. Like I still have to remember to do that every time. And I forget sometimes. Like there's no like, oh, it feels weird. Like obviously I have some. Like I always, you know, wash my hands after I go to the bathroom or something. Like there were some habits that I, I guess I just built when I was young enough. But like I don't know. I don't really have like any habits that aren't chemical. <laughs>、uh, like I can't. And it, it's not just that I haven't tried. Like even if I stick to something for months. It just goes like the second that I stop actively thinking about it, it just goes away. There's no like, it never becomes automatic. I guess I'm just autistic or something. But、uh, autistic people are supposed to like routine. I do like routine to some extent, but I don't know. Like for example, I tried to make a habit out of cleaning for 15 minutes every day, and I did this for like three weeks, you know, and it was successful. Every day I cleaned for 15 minutes, and the apartment got clean. And then one day. I had to go somewhere. I was like, and I woke up late. I don't even remember what it was for, but I had to. I think I had to meet my dad or something, and I had to leave the house because、like, my habit was the, the the idea was I would wake up and I would keep my caffeine in the other in, in the other room, and so when I'd get up to go get my caffeine, I would then start a fifteen minute timer while I was in the kitchen, which is where most of the mess is, and start cleaning for fifteen minutes, and then you know. That way, it would force me to do so. But you know, the second that I was interrupted, it just went away. <laughs> like there's no, and this always happens with with like dieting. There's I don't know. I guess things are supposed to become easier. For working out is another one. You know, people say like, oh, just sticking to it for the first two weeks is the hard part, and then it becomes easier. This is not the case. Sticking to it for the first two weeks is the easy part. It's not easy. There's no easy part. But sticking to it for the first two weeks is no easier or harder. There's no difference in difficulty. It's constantly difficult. It's really like after three weeks that I start to get the inability to, to just keep doing the same thing. I don't know. It's annoying. Whatever. Who cares? I'm gonna go watch some probably pretty bad anime now. So I I just read a very interesting Twitter thread、um, about、uh, changes in the Japanese tax law,、um, which it's a bit complicated. And honestly, the thread doesn't do a great job of explaining, like the specifics.、Um, but effectively, they're ra- like it's, it's, they're raising taxes on、uh, artists, artists who are like contractors, basically.、Um, so this is gonna affect the anime industry because a lot of animators and voice actors basically operate under this kind of deal, right? They're they're freelancers. Who are contracted by by anime studios to 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 work for them,、um, and the bigger studios like Mappa, for example, have already、uh, responded to this new law, the tax invoice law,、uh, or tax invoice system, by raising wages. But the smaller studios can't afford to do that, and so you know a lot of animators and voice actors are going to be struggling. To deal with these higher taxes, and the thread I read, I mean, starts off with literally today might be the beginning of the end, not only for the anime industry but Japanese entertainment as a whole. Now, this to me is kind of fear mongering. I don't think this is the beginning of the end for Japanese entertainment as a whole, right? Because I don't. See the East Asian entertainment industry going anywhere anytime soon.、Uh, the anime industry is like the one part of the Japanese economy that's doing,、uh, still doing pretty well at this point. Because like the reason that the government's doing this is that Japan is currently, as I understand it, the most indebted nation in the world. They took on a bunch of debt during COVID and are now dealing with the consequences of that.、Um, 
so you know the Japanese economy is going to be shit for the coming like decade or whatever, and obviously that's going to have some effect on anime. But we have to remember, okay, even like I I'm not convinced that this is the worst thing ever. I'm not convinced this is the worst thing ever. Um, it might be bad specifically for me, but I don't think this is bad for like the general anime watching audience. And I'm willing to sacrifice myself um, because. You know, as the thread states, the bigger studios can afford to raise wages and so on to deal with this new tax system, um, and they can take on the burden themselves. Uh, and the thing about the anime industry is, you may have noticed over the past like five, ten years, about a billion tiny fucking anime studios you've never heard of, especially the past five years, have just been popping up out of nowhere and making bullshit on the cheap, uh, you know, it's quite possible that this new law makes it impossible for these tiny studios you've never heard of to continue to exist. And if we go back to, like, you know, what many people consider to be the golden age of anime back in the 80s, there were only, like, five studios, and they all came from Tezuka Productions except for Gainax, uh, which is a bit later, but... Uh, you know, the to me, it's, if it's the smaller studios that are going to be affected more, obviously this is bad for animators. But, you know, in an ideal world, this is the economic push for the anime industry to to consolidate. Because it's, it's way too diverse. Like, I think everyone agrees at this point. Like, there's way too much anime being produced. There is just too much. Like, there is simply too much fucking anime being made every season. It's an, it's, it's, it's an obviously unsustainable state for the industry to be in. I think anyone can see this. So this this is, you know, maybe the trigger. And obviously it's not good that animators are going to be out of work if that's the case. And they're going to be losing money. You know, obviously, in no way am I glad to hear about that. But calling this the beginning of the end of the Japanese entertainment industry, that sounds a little absurd to me. Right. If you're also stating, well, yeah, but the bigger studios can easily tank this. Well, then all that means is that the, the industry is going to consolidate back into, you know, the bigger studios again. And it's not like those smaller studios are making, you know, artsy, experimental, risky projects. They're pumping out the same isekai adaptations. You know, I don't, I'm not going to call them lazy. You know, obviously a lot of people, I mean, some of them are lazy, but a lot of them, you know, are just run under a tight time crunch and budget they don't really have any option but if they you know they they frankly probably shouldn't exist these sorts of shows you know as much as i might enjoy occasionally right like i I liked vending machine isekai well the last ending the last episode i thought the the the, that kind of sucked because i watched that today bit of a disappointing final episode but you know it's whatever but no one's making you know risky shit Right, like you'd expect in an industry with a bunch of like low oversight small studios that can make weird shit, you get the occasional weird shit, like like pig isekai airing next season. But a lot of it is just like relatively safe sequels and isekai adaptations. Um, not you know interesting artsy stuff. It's actually the bigger studios that are making the interesting artsy stuff. And actually, most of the interesting art, like, 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 you know, um, Tengoku Daimakyo from a couple seasons ago, um, or uh, Sunny Boy from, like, last year, which I didn't even like that much, but at least it had, at least it was trying, you know. And maybe that means a, a little less of my trashy isekai stuff that I enjoy from time to time, but frankly, there's always, there is too much trashy isekai stuff. A little less trashy isekai stuff is actually perfectly fine by me. It is it is perfectly okay for there to be a little less trashy isekai stuff. And, like, maybe maybe I'm underestimating the severity of this new tax law, but, you know, I'm just trusting the person who wrote the thread that if the bigger studios are going to be okay, then what's the problem? What are we worried about? I, I don't really understand. Like, again, I mean, l- let me just be... Like, let's go back to, like, 1987, Okay. 1987 on Mao. Here, spring 1987. 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight anime came out that season, and that's this is the, they're all two core at, or the, actually the, it's fucking City Hunter, which is fifty one episodes, a show I've never heard of called Kimagure Orange Road, which is forty eight episodes, Hokuto no Ken season two, which is forty three episodes. You know they're all long as shit. Every single one of these is like well over forty episodes. Okay, not all of them, but over twenty eight. Or 26 episodes, right? Longer than a normal Tuko anime. Because they, they were just more consolidated. That's how an anime used to be. Or full 1980s. And then, obviously, let's, like, in the, the OVAs, you know, you had, uh, well, actually, nothing good came out in full 1987. Let me let me see. Anything, any good OVAs in 1987? Oh, Bubblegum Crisis. Bubblegum Crisis is... Uh, massively overrated and not very good, but you know it's a thing people have heard of. Uh, what else? Oh, Devilman OVA, the 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 one episode Devilman movie thing. That's a thing. That's a thing that happened. Wait, Dirty Pair? Wait, is this the the real Dirty Pair? Was I don't know much about Dirty Pair. No, this is. Wait, this is this is maybe prequel. Dirty. No, okay, this is some sort of weird sequel to Dirty Pair. Some OVA sequel to Dirty, Pear, which I haven't seen. It's too 80s stuff. This is not my... This is not my era. Oh, even fucking Flying Luna Clipper. Now, that's a weird-ass fucking anime, bro. Now, Flying Luna Clipper is a weird-ass anime. Ain't nobody know about fucking Flying Luna Clipper, okay? Only the absolute... Only the realest of the real ones know about fucking Flying Luna Clipper. Holy shit. Um... Anyway, what I'm saying is, there was less anime back then, and it was fine. And no one, I mean, it wasn't that great. Maybe let's go to, like, a more reasonable year. Like, 1997, good year for anime. Right, 1997, winter, four shows. Spring, one, two, I mean, you had Utena, Slayer's Try, Shin Tenshi Muyo. Fucking, I mean, there's a bunch of good shit. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve... 13, 14, 15 TV anime came out. That's quite a lot. But one of them was Utena, okay? Um, and most of those are really long. They're long as shit. This is what the consolidation... I don't know. I'm okay with... The, it, to me, this just seems like this tax law, it feels like the thing that is just going to be a, a nudge for the anime industry to consolidate. And, like, I can't... Because cause I, I mean, I think it's quite possible that the smaller studios you know, won't be the ones that are able, you know, they won't be able to tank the extra costs, whereas the bigger ones will. Wait, 1998 was a really good year for, spring 1998 is an incredible season. I've never looked at this before, holy shit. Spring 1998, Cowboy Bebop, Trigun, Cardcaptor Sakura, Initial D's first stage, Yu-Gi-Oh! All, like, all, all of the first four shows are all, the first five shows are all classics. Cowboy Bebop, Trigun, Cardcaptor Sakura, Initial D first stage, Yu-Gi-Oh, Neo Ranga, Silent Mobius, Akihabara Den no Gumi, which sucks but is interesting to watch, and then a bunch of shit I've never heard of. But uh, damn, that's a lot of good ass shows in one season. Be- people were eating back in the day. We don't know how bad we have it these days. I'm telling you, we actually don't know how fucking bad we have it in the 2023s. Right, there's no, there's no, I mean, I was about to say there's no effort to make a new Card Captor Sakura tier show, but there literally was fucking Clear Card Hen, like, not even that long ago. When did Clear Card Hen come out? Um, hold on, I got a, Clear Card Hen was 2018? Damn, that was fucking that long ago? Time passes, man. Time really does pass. I don't know, I heard good things about Clear Card Hen. I heard good things about it. But nothing could be as good as the original show. <sighs> Fucking Sakura is so good, man. But yeah, I don't know. I just, I'm out here. <laughs> I feel like I don't really have that much to say. Like, on the one hand, I feel bad for animators who are going to be out of a job. And I don't feel that bad for voice actors because they already get paid too much in Japan. Well, they don't, it's not that that was my Discord beep. It's not necessarily they get paid too much. It's just that they're too much of the goddamn budget. Too much of the fucking budget goes to... Uh, you all, you've all seen the images on 4chan and shit about how much of the budget goes to voice acting talent. But then again, uh, whatever. I don't know. They do have much better voice actors than the West, so maybe all the money's well spent. 
Look, it's just a weird situation. It's a weird and bad situation. But also, the anime industry as it currently exists is, like, objectively unsustainable. And, like, something's going to come along and shake things up and force consolidation at some point. Like, we all know this is going to have to happen. Um, and it's just a matter of when. And if this is the thing that does it, then this is the thing that does it. But it was going to happen anyway at some point. We're going to be doing a couple more comment responses. <clears throat> so, uh, excuse me. Um, Juice says that they don't want to buy my hate shirt because they haven't tried any of those drugs and don't want to. Good, good for you. They then proceeded to get really mad about the fact that I said I didn't like an image on the internet and, um, said, which is the, the, the bimbo pilled lane image. I'm not going to spend any time on this because this is stupid. Quote, for anyone nuanced enough to have two ideas in their head at the same time, it's separate from SE Lane, and I like them both. So I think if you, if what you got out of my speech about that image was that I have trouble keeping two ideas in my head at the same time, I think you need to work on your listening comprehension a little bit. And uh, that's the stuff saying on that. So Yumbream says, this is assumedly in response to me talking about playing Warfork. The main three weapons you need to bind comfortably in an arena shooter are the rocket launcher, lightning gun, and railgun. You cover 90% of situations with those three weapons, and the rest of them are for style points. Brackets. Woo Gunblade. Uh, th- this is true. I figured this out pretty quickly <laughs> playing Warfork. Uh, yeah, you pretty much just need those three weapons. <clears throat> but I haven't been playing Warfork that much recently. Mainly, it gets kind of samey. Like, I think the two reasons I haven't been playing Warfog much recently is, firstly, yeah, it just gets kind of samey. Like, the gameplay isn't all that strategic or nuanced, so it's just kind of kill box, you know? Um, and then the second reason is uh, that, personally, the game's not very fun with full servers, like, with servers with quite a few players on them. It's only fun with, like, small servers with, like, you know, two or three people per team, um... And once it gets up to like five, six, seven, ten people per team, it just becomes too chaotic. Then you just sort of die out, and, and it's just not kind of less fun for me. But I did play <coughs> CS2 today with some friends, and uh, they've, they've, there was a new update which fixed the audio issues on Linux, um, at least partially. So I managed to get it to run with audio and play a few games. And look, the game's not terrible, but. You know, I have to completely backtrack on everything I've said. You know, as, as a member of the CS community for a long time, I'm very used to Counter-Strike players freaking out over anything and complaining about how any change of the game make, is, is ruined it. So I assumed that was the case that everyone complaining about CS2 was talking about, but they were actually all right. The game really does feel like a... It does kind of feels like a mushy knockoff of CSGO. Like, the controls feel very mushy. I don't really know how to explain it other than that. Which, you know, I was just playing very casually with some friends on Nuke and Office, so it wasn't bad, you know, I had a a pretty good time. But if I was taking the game seriously, I mean, I would fucking, this would kill me. Like, this is not a game that I would want to play competitively in in any aspect. It just doesn't feel good. Uh, Yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say about that. It is crazy how the muscle memory of, like, corner peeking and crosshair placement and all of this stuff never goes away you know i haven't played cs in like a year i load back up within one game yeah, i wasn't fagging out or anything but i was playing it like a proper guy that's about all i have to say on that subject so anime summer says i disagree that lane being recently popular in the anime community like post 2015 to me lane has always been hailed and praised as one of the greats the weird thing is how similar anime like Paranoia Agent, Ergo Proxy, and Textilize haven't yet been blown up, revisited the same way. But like Alien, excuse me, but like Alien 9 has, so maybe it's literally just the cute girls thing that people like. I, you know, on the, on the one hand, I agree with you when I said the lane, I'm, I'm talking about like outside of the people who are really into good anime, like, like people who are into like the artsy, you know, people who know what Angel's Egg is, people who maybe know what Pat Labor is or something like that, you know. Like, there's people who get into anime and they want to look for the greats. Like, Lane's always been known to to, to those sorts of people, right? Um, Alien 9, I'm not so sure about. Like, I feel like Alien 9 isn't that popular. Yeah, it only has 38,000 uh, members on Mao, which, you know, isn't that much compared to Lane. Like, Lane has, I'm pretty sure, like, way more than that. 
Yeah, Lane has like 300,000. So I don't know where you're getting this Alien 9 is popular thing from. Alien 9 is like still criminally underrated. Um, but you know what anime really gets? That, like a lot of this, like fucking Paranoia Agent is super popular. I don't quite know what you're talking about. Technolize I agree with. Like Technolize is, is under under appreciated. Ghost Hound gets the short end of the stick. Okay, I haven't even seen that. And and let me tell you what really gets the short end of the stick here. It's fucking Malice Doll. No one watches Malice Doll. Like, Malice Doll is a super important anime if you want to follow, like, Yasuyuki Ueda or whatever. And everyone, no one watches it. No one knows it exists. It's great. I fucking love Malice Doll. Your yeah, Malice Doll's amazing. No one, no one's ever seen it. <laughs> it's like, what did, did he do in between Lane and Technolize? He made Malice Doll. And no one's ever watched that fucking show. It's a great show. Like, Malice Doll really gets the short end of the stick here. But I'm not quite sure what you're talking about. Because, I, yeah, I feel like Paranoia Agent, it's Satoshi Kon, so it's, like, always been hyped up as long as I can remember. Same as Lane. Argo Proxy has also always been pretty well known. And Technolize has always been, like, oh, you like Lane? You should watch Technolize. The that guy, same guy made that. Either Technolize or Haibane Renmei has been that. Alien 9, I feel like, is a lot more obscure than the other two. Um, but none of those, including Alien 9, well, maybe maybe Paranoia Agent, but I don't feel like any of the others have really made it into the mainstream the way Lane has. Like, Lane's really attained meme status with, like, normies. Like, uh, what I mean by Lane is, like, super popular now is, like, Lane's popular with TikTok Zoomers rather than just otaku. You know, like, Lane was always well-known and praised on, on the boards and, and within the community, of course. Of course, it's, a, you know, always been considered a classic. But now it's, like... Evangelion, where it's it's both, you know, it's considered a classic by the community, and it's also, you know, got wide-reaching popularity outside of the community, which I feel like it already had to some extent, but I think it's just more now than it used to. Um, whereas, and I think Paranoia Agent is also in, included in that, but I don't think Ogo Proxy and Textalize have, but and maybe Haibane Renmei as well. I, so I don't think it's just the cute girls thing, although it might be. Because, yeah, I don't I don't really know what you're talking about with regards to Alien 9. Uh, but it could be. I mean, I think it's definitely, maybe not necessarily the cute girls aspect, but Lane's character design being so striking, I think definitely plays a part in it. Like, Lane's silhouette, her little hairpin, and the, the long lock of hair on the left-hand side. Like, yeah, 100% that, that design plays into the mimetic contagion of, of Lane as a meme. Like, yeah, for sure. Um, but I, I don't, maybe, but then you would expect Haibane Renmei to be as popular, which I don't think it's nearly as popular. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Let me talk politics for a minute, and uh, more more radical politics. Uh, I kind of want to turn this into a blog post, but I need to think it through, and so you're just going to listen to me thinking it through in real time. God damn, it's fucking cold in this fucking country. <laughs> it's fucking cold in Estonia, who knew? Who'd have thunk it? Um, yeah, I can't be bothered to fucking... I don't even know how to turn the heating on. I mean, there's a fireplace, but I'm not gonna go and get firewood. That's too much fucking effort. Okay, um, so I have this... This is the thing that I've been struggling with, or, like, not necessarily struggling with, but, like, struggling to come up with a a clean wording of. Um, and that is the, like, what I mean by anarchist, and particularly in the sense that I consider myself to be somewhat of an anarchist but i don't consider myself to be revolutionary right which is i think something that maybe a lot of people will will get a bit mad at because i like there's a lot of nuance here okay uh there's a lot of there's a lot of complicated nuance uh which is why it's kind of hard to to explain in a snappy snappy way um which is that i think capitalism is fundamentally unsustainable and I don't think there's many arguments against this, right? Like, just from an ecological perspective, capitalism is unsustainable. I think once you start, like, looking into ecology, just, like, even a little bit, you you start to realize how, like, fundamentally unsustainable, you know, the way we do things currently is. And that it's not just... There's no way to reform your way out of this. But I don't think... Like, the difference is that I... Well, it's kind of complicated, because what counts as social pressure and what counts as external pressure is, like kind of complicated to like they're, they're, they're very linked things but like like i i don't think that a bunch of workers are going to get together and have a civil war and overthrow capitalism nor do i particularly think that that's desirable 
like I don't really like civil wars. I don't really want to be in involved in a civil war. Like I'm just being honest with you. That sounds like it would fucking suck. <laughs> that's way that's like that sounds like a terrible idea. I mean, maybe you know there's some justifications for it, but like goddamn, that's that's going too far for me to to still be interested in it, right? I'm just I'm just not interested in doing that. That just sounds terrible. I don't want to do 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 fucking war. Fuck that. Fuck war. You know, which is what a revolution is. And you know, also it takes not very long to look at the history of revolutions and realize that most revolutions and peasants' revolts and so on have been failures in the especially in the long term. Most of them don't even succeed in the short term, and even the ones that do don't succeed in the long term. Like, the number of successful revolutions in history is pretty fucking small. So it's like, you'd probably be fighting a civil war for nothing. Um, and, you know, all your friends would die. <laughs> it wouldn't be good. Like, this is the stuff that is like, eh, I don't know, I don't really want to do that. Like, that sounds, we, there's got to be something else we could do other than that. That sounds a bit terrible. Um, you know, not to mention that there are, there are pretty significant differences in technological development that have you know between historical revolutions and the modern day you know in terms of the the level of surveillance and tracking that we're under these days you know just makes it even even just makes the situation even worse um but you know on the other hand you know i think that capitalism is unsustainable right like it's it's gonna collapse eventually it's not going to be able to sustain itself forever and it might be you know from an environmental perspective you know getting closer and closer every day so if it you know and when it does eventually succumb to you know i don't want to say or it's destroyed by its own contradictions but uh you know when it eventually uh runs out of steam uh you know i i think more likely the scenario we're going to see is something more like a a slow and painful decay rather than a you know explosive revolution um but you know there's also the factor that that decay is going to involve social unrest right so like maybe that's what's called a revolution i don't know i've never been in one before <laughs> uh but but yeah i don't particularly consider myself a a revolutionary like i don't advocate for revolution i don't i think you're you know, maybe I'm wrong here. I'm, I'm, I don't know that much about Marxism, because uh, hence why I'm an anarchist. But <laughs> um, maybe that's the point. Like, maybe advocating for for revolution is a bit weird anyway, because like you're supposed to just be scientifically analyzing the way societies develop, um, rather than like advocating for some particular society, right? Like, you you know what I mean? You're not supposed to be going to the ideological supermarket. And um, you know, picking out a set of rules and reg- and uh, you know, fantasy football, whatever, deciding we'll put this here or this here. That, no, you're supposed to be looking at like the broad trends of how societies develop and trying to make predictions um, rather than necessarily advocating for certain things. I, at least that's how I understand it. So may- I don't know, maybe it's weird. But then in that case, so this is one of the reasons why I have a lot of problems with people who are like, oh. How would this work, you know, in in an anarchist society? You know, as far as I'm concerned, the, we're already in an anarchist society. Like there is, there is no society that exists that isn't an anarchist society, because anarchy is just basic. It, I mean, at its most fundamental level, anarchy is mutual aid, right? Like it's just, it's just. I mean, yeah, it's just people helping each other out without the state or markets intervening. Um, but, you know, sometimes with, with help from a bit of states and a bit of markets, at least right now, but there's always, you know, there's an anarchist component. So that's what I mean, right? As like, this is where I've, I've, I've come up with my, my little Mimi term of biophysic anarchism, right? You become the moss growing on the walls of capitalism. That the moss is never going to topple the wall, but the wall can't really do anything about the existence of the moss, right? Um, and they kind of live in parallel with each other, right? And, uh, yeah, so the idea being that, that you can just build up these parallel networks in society, or not society, uh, parallel, uh, I guess networks is the best way to put that, um, you know, within capitalism, but, you know, not dependent on capitalism, uh, just in whatever little, and this is another thing, right, is there's a lot of, like, 
because there's not enough anarchists, <laughs> because there's not enough like people who are ideologically motivated to do certain things, especially in the more niche areas that I'm interested in. Like a lot of people will say, like I'm particularly interested in like the digital realm, right? That like I think we live a lot of our lives in, uh, you know, under the the watchful gaze of, uh, you know, corporate feudal lords like Google, Facebook, etc. Um, and that uh, actually resisting them and building alternative infrastructure is extremely important. Uh, that like that it's not just like oh you're just doing something on the internet it isn't real. Like, you could have said that maybe, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. You could have said that and it would have been, you know, more right. But these days, right, like, so much stuff happens in the digital sphere. Like, it's such an important aspect of society that, you know, it's, I I think, personally, it's equally valid to be, you know, doing stuff with computers and the internet as it is to be doing stuff with other forms of you know other aspects of society other zones zones of social organization um but most people even though they agree that there's a problem uh, aren't interested in any solution which is interesting i'm not really sure why uh like the, from what i understand of it i think it's an issue of like i'm not particularly interested in solving this problem by the way like i don't really care if these people want to keep using facebook or whatever uh, but like from what i understand it's an issue of what they call like homework like the idea that like they would have to learn something like a lot of people don't want to do that they're very used to their interactions with computers and their phones and, and the internet being extremely streamlined and like they never have to to read anything or do any research and so anything that puts up a barrier to that the way it's like okay well in order to do this you need to learn what ssh you know or you, you know to install linux you're probably going to have to follow a tutorial on a on a website somewhere like a lot of people just don't want to do that for some reason. I, I don't really understand why. Because these are the same people who would quite happily follow... I mean, maybe they're not the same people. Maybe that's the fundamental difference. It's like, you know, there's a lot of people who remember following... Like, like I guarantee you, probably hundreds of thousands of people learned about computer file systems by installing, learning how to install mods for, for Minecraft. I guarantee that that is like the number one way that children learned that computers have file systems and that, that video games are made of files that, that sit somewhere in a file system, you know? Um, anyway, kind of got off topic here. But but yeah, my, my point was because there's like not that many people doing stuff. I mean, there's a lot of people doing stuff. There is a lot of people doing stuff. I don't want to discredit it. But um, it's very insular, I guess is what I mean. They're like there's a lot of pressure to do as much as you can yourself, but I don't think you need to. There's enough people that you just need to do whatever you can. You just need to contribute somewhat and, uh, you know, support other people, and you're good in whatever way you can. I think that's the way to go about it. And so this is what I mean, right? It's just it's about just just creating resilient mutual aid networks, essentially, right? Like it'd be it'd be nice, for example, if I grew potatoes on my backyard. Not because, you know, as as Twitter arguments, like, let's remember that, that all the anarchists on Twitter have no idea what they're talking about. No one on Twitter knows anything. Okay, we got to just ignore them. Um, like, they're the sorts of people who get into a debate about, like, so what does an anarchist society look like? How do you plan? How do you make an economy work? How do you distribute goods and services? And it's like, what if I need insulin or whatever, right? These sorts of, of, of things. Uh which already presuppose so much about, like, the world and the future, which we just don't know, that it's just, you know, this is the sort of stuff I used to fantasize about too, until I realized, like, this is nonsense. This is literally just sci-fi. Like, it's not even, it's just fiction. It's complete fiction um, to, to, to fantasize about this sort of stuff. Um, like, this is not... And I, I think a lot of anarchists don't understand it, but then I think a lot of anarchists do understand it, but just don't explain it to anyone. And then this is where it, like, goes wrong. Like, I see green anarchists and, and, and these sorts of people talking about, you know, how to set up a society that is environmentally sustainable. And, you know, then people are like, oh, well, how am I supposed to get, you know, my, my medication, right, this sort of thing. And it's like, what you're really... The real argument here is that actually... The way you currently get your medication is not going to be around soon enough. Like that's like it's great that you can get it now, and we wish we could get keep doing that. 
but like firstly a lot of people can't get their medication because they can't afford it especially in america and in poorer countries it's so weird that you have to specify you know the world's poorest countries and then the world's biggest economy as well <laughs> um but, uh, but yeah like when people there's a famous like meme at, like used to dunk on anarchists where some anarchist on twitter was like ex- like explain anarchist economics with an image that's just like me growing beans someone can i have some beans and then they give them the beans right it's like this is what anarchists think econo- economics is lol, lol, lol. So like, yeah, of course you can't run an entire society like that. But but like that's not what people are. At least they shouldn't be claiming that they can. You know, like the point is right now, you can grow beans and if, and give them to people. You don't have to wait for some revolution to come around. And then you know your neighbors are no longer reliant on Walmart or or, or you know some supply chain to grow their beans for them. Right, you've you've got your beans. You've got it sorted. And then your neighbors who, you know, have their own skills can supply some stuff to you. And it, it's not enough to completely remove your dependence on capitalist economies. It can be. There are communes uh, and places where that are, like, mostly independent from, uh, you know, self-reliant. But this is not really comparable. Like, this is more of a social... Ex- that sort of thing is more of a social experiment than a practical situation in a lot of cases. Um, but... You know, the the point isn't, this is how we can get... It. I don't know how to explain it. Do you see what I mean? It's just like, this is this is not like, oh, post-revolution, after the rapture, this is how we'll all live in utopia. It's like, no, this is a practical way to get by right now. And then one day, when the bean company collapses, or something, you know, uh, or one day when, when you get, uh, you know, you're out of a job and you can't afford beans anymore... Well, you already you already have a place to get beans from, so it's fine, right? And it's it's just a little bit. It's just it's just helping a little bit. Like it's not doing much, but but it's something. And you know, as those networks build out, they become bigger and bigger, and create the parallel movement, the parallel structure, which are there to be resilient. Hence, why they're decentralized, right? Capitalism not very resilient, especially states not very resilient, very centralized. Capitalism actually much more resilient. Like capitalism more decentralized, although you know wealth is not decentralized, but capitalism itself is decentralized, sort of, kind of. I mean, actually, it's all dependent on the state, so it's kind of complicated to even say that question. So maybe, maybe the state and capitalism are equally centralized. I don't know, but um, you know, let's say that this this particular system is not very resilient against a bunch of problems, in particular to me, environmental problems, like ecological problems, are going to pose the biggest the biggest threats to capitalism in the coming times unless we see a hard you know i'm not saying it's going to happen i'm not saying here like like it's possible that a hard pivot to nuclear can happen and that would be based you know if that happened that'd be i'd I'd be pogging along with the rest of you okay but you know i don't know how well the hard pivot to nuclear is going it's not going fast enough i'll tell you that much uh the idea is just to build up resilient networks like that's all it is it's nothing more complicated than that it's not like I'm the king, and I dictate how society should run. This is what a lot of people ask, they're asking for. They're like, okay, you're proposing an alternative to capitalism. Answer my riddles three, (laughs) or I will laugh at you. It's like, I'm not here to answer your riddles three. I'm not not answering your riddles three. I don't fucking know. That's not the point. You've missed the point entirely. It's a bit strange. It's a bit of a strange way of going about things. So I don't know if this makes me more typical of an anarchist or less typical of an anarchist, because I'm not interested in the revolution at all. Like I don't, I, don't, I couldn't care less. I'm, I'm interested in, you know, creating stuff now. And the thing is, right? Like a lot of the internet infrastructure is also fundamentally unsustainable, right? Like it's not going to be here forever. Like, let's not forget that a lot of, like, undersea cables are owned by Google and Amazon and so on. And it's like, and there's also a lot of aspects of, like, you know, let's say ecological problems turn out to be, you know, extremely bad. Let's say it's a worst-case kind of scenario. No one's going to have the resources to maintain undersea cables, you know. This is not going to not gonna be the case. Um, so, you know, the internet is going to splinter, at least, in those sorts of scenarios. Uh <sighs> But there's always alternatives. Like, I, I need to learn more about networking, and as in, like, com- in, in computer networking. 
because uh, I'm still it's such a complicated subject like the more I learn the more I realize I don't know like it's it's way too fucking complicated and it's not helped by the fact that it is like literally too complicated like it's bloated as shit because um, a bunch of people use the internet for stuff that it was never designed for and then they act as if that's what it was always meant to do or they don't realize that that's not what it was always meant to do I don't know it's all very confusing to me but yeah this is essentially what I'm getting at is like it just means doing stuff and making it free. That's basically all it is. Anarchism is when you do stuff and it's, and you and you make it free. In, in in the sense of free as in free beer and free as in freedom. You make the stuff that you do free, and then you then you're doing it already. You don't need to like as long as you're doing stuff that doesn't rely on states or corporations um, as much as possible. You're already doing it. Like you're doing it to all intents and purposes that it matters. Right? Like, that's the bit that, that matters. The rest of it doesn't... I mean, yeah. That's what organizing is, basic. And it's like, I'm not involved in the world of labor. Or, well, I mean, I am, but not, not wage labor. Right? Obviously, I, I'm, all, I'm doing stuff. I'm doing work. I make music. I make, I make stupid podcasts. Like, by some definition, there's labor happening. Especially music. I mean, it's pretty... Let's be clear here, okay? Being a musician is a very easy easily justifiable productive labor right like i'm more closer to a productive laborer than like a starbucks barista is um because there's nothing when i start out and then by the end i've made a something and and it, you know whatever not saying not to insult starbucks baristas okay they're doing they're doing the lord's work <laughs> i mean everyone needs to get a job somehow right? it's not your fault um but like yeah i think that's a thing, but I'm very, but you know, my work is very independent. Like I'm, I'm not particularly reliant on, on you know, a company or anything like that. I just work by myself for myself in music, and so you know, in that level, there's not much organization that I can do. I mean, obviously, there's there's stuff like the musicians' union, and there are a lot of people right now growing who are advocating like. Um, musicians should go on strike like the the actors and writers have in order to pressure spotify and other streaming services to give us a fair fair pay uh, the problem is that that's no, this is never going to happen like let's just be honest you know as much as firstly i don't want to stop making music i don't want to go on strike <laughs> so no like i'm probably just going to ignore you or well, i mean if it depends what the strike would mean if it just meant pulling all your stuff from streaming services but you can still make music that's fine, you know, I'm completely down to do that, um, you know, if I can still publish stuff on CyberGrunge or on my own website or, or anything else like that, that's fine, um, but if it was like, no, you have to completely stop, like, I, I don't know, but that would be kind of stupid, and no one would fucking listen, anyway, this would, like, this is, this is like a pipe dream, I'm just gonna be honest with you, like, this whole musician should strike for fair wages from, from streaming services thing is a goddamn pipe dream, I mean, it'd be it'd be cool if it happened. I would join in if it happened. Um, but I, I mean, I don't even know if it would work. I don't know. Like the, the thing is, the streaming services can afford to pay more. Like this has been well known. Streaming services can afford to pay musicians more, and they don't. Uh, and it'd be nice if I got paid more. I wouldn't I wouldn't be complaining about that at all. But there's also you know the fundamental fact that I've talked about, which is that. If someone's paying for your stuff, it's because they want to support you, because they could get it for free. I don't know. It's an interesting concept. I mean, I'd be interested to see. I'm not this. This is a little. It's the, the problem is right that it's not like Hollywood, right? Like Hollywood is the 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 movie industry. You know, in America, the biggest movie industry, very centralized in one place, heavily unionized. You know, this is like the perfect place for that to happen for a big strike that's effective to to take place. The music industry massively decentralized across the entire globe especially these days the people who are affected worst by low pay rates from streaming services are not the ones who are living in la and you know have a label and so on right it's the small musicians who who can't do any of that stuff so like way to it's just not like there's so much organizing that would have to happen on an international scale like to an unprecedented degree for that to work that it just seems impossible to me like you could get strikes in in certain sectors of the in, like you could be like you you might be able to convince all musicians in one country to strike but it wouldn't matter like i just don't think streaming services would care cuz music is much more international than movies are 
And most people only watch movies and TV from America and whatever country they're in. And so America's, you know, massive central hub. But music, I feel like, is way more distributed than that. Anyway, it seems seems like a pipe dream to me. Like, let me be clear here, right? You're not going to be able to... Like, you can, you can make these mutual aid networks and parallel movements and stuff. But these are only ever going to, like, at least in the world we're in right now, you know, unless something significantly changes, this stuff is going to be small scale, right, and very local. Like, there's a bunch of important infrastructure stuff that could be maintained by, you know, a decentralized or, you know, non-hierarchical group of people doing it, you know, as a mutual aid thing. Like let's say railways, right? You're not gonna you can you can run some you can grow some food for your neighborhood, but you can't run a railway, right? But it's not because it's impossible for these pe- for a bunch of you know people to maintain a railway. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of volunteer railways across the world. Most of them maintain you know legacy like steam trains and stuff like this. Um, I mean, I've been to some; they're wonderful places, and there are enough train nerds that would love to maintain a railway for a living. You know, it wouldn't be hard to pull off. It's just that legally it's never going to happen. Like, who's going to let you onto the tracks? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, but the 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 point is, right, that these business models, like a lot of this stuff is very unsustainable, right? And it's just like when something falls apart, you just have to step in and do it yourself. It's like you always hear stories about like, well, the city was just refusing to fix potholes. So some guy just started doing it. Like, that's the sort of thing that I think it's all about, right? It's just when some guy starts doing it, or some group of guys start doing it. Um, I think that's where that's where it's cool. Like, if you're just on the lookout for when there's a... If you, this is where I think you can, you know, you can be a cool dude. But if you're just on the lookout, you just, you just keep your eye out for when there's an opportunity for you to just start doing it. Don't just, don't force yourself into shit, okay, because you'll just make it worse, probably. But if you keep your eye out, and you're like, hold on a minute, that's not working anymore. Could I just jump in and start doing that? Like, who would stop me, you know? That's what you gotta do. That's the pog, that's the pog moment. That's the moment of poggery. That's what I'm gonna call it. That is the, 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 the moment of poggery. <laughs> like, I mean, this happens all the time with, with digital stuff, right? Like, you know, some some game service goes down or something like this, right? And then the community bands together to to create a community version of it, right? Like, uh, I mean, there's so many examples of this, I can't even begin to name them. But, like, just off the top of my head, I know, like, Fantasy Star Online has a whole massive community server, you know, community. (laughs) Or, uh, I mean, there's so many. It's, It's, you know, you can probably think of some yourself where it's just, like, you know, something's been shut down by the creator's and then the community has maintained it. Like, this is this is not, like, something difficult that you have to really hard, try hard to convince people to do. It doesn't work every time. It goes wrong a lot of the time. And it's not perfect. But it's better than not having the thing. And, you know, right now, generally speaking, society is, like, running okay. Right? Like, we, it's getting worse. Like, fewer and fewer people are... Prices are rising. Fewer people are able to afford homes. Fewer people are able to afford, you know, even food. And fewer people are, you know, so and so on. But, but right now, it's still to the situation where it's like, well, we don't have to be providing this other stuff because capitalism is still fairly working. It, it's not going to be forever. But, you know, right now, we don't we don't have to step in. Um, and so it's mostly the less important stuff, which is good because it means you get practice in, right? Um, do you understand what I'm saying? Is this making any sense? Like, this is my... It's not a... It's like the, a very non-utopian view of the world. Like, I don't even think... Like, I'm not saying... Like, oh, we got to do this because it's going to be better. Like, I think a lot of communists and even anarchists, like a lot of people, they go around and they go around saying society sucks. It would be better if it was like this. I don't even think that. Like, I just think a much maybe a more pessimistic view, which is like society is actually great if it worked. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but it's, it's not gonna keep working like it's it's no it's not going so well like someone's got to step up like we gotta do something so that we can still be alive after this that's basically the vibe i'm on it's like look i I like capitalism at least where i live you know maybe if i lived in a third world country and i was poor i would suck but you know for me i'm doing okay i'm doing perfectly okay right uh <clears throat> i like my life yeah, I'm not miserable because of capitalism. I'm miserable for other reasons. Um, I don't, you know, it's fine. But 
I'm also just looking at these systems and I'm like, that's not going to last. It's like you look at a bolt that's wearing down, right? And you're like, look, it's on a, I don't know, I make these weird ass fucking metaphors sometimes, man. I don't know. I'm like, you're, you're on a roller coaster and you see a bolt that's wearing down and you're like, that's not going to last. But the roller coaster's good. There's nothing wrong with the roller coaster, but the, but, but the bolt's not going to last. And then eventually this bolt's going to break and then the roller coaster's not going to be around. So someone better get on making another bolt, you know, and, and maybe there's something about the, the fundamental design of the roller coaster that means this particular bolt is under too much stress. My fucking metaphors are out of hand lately, I'm telling you. Analogies, out of hand. You know, maybe there's something... Fu- and so maybe the the thing that's fundamental about the roller coaster that puts too much stress on that bolt is going to make the roller coaster worse. Like, and I believe this, right? It's like, look, I love the fact that we can all get, like, free gadgets for everyone. Okay, they're not free, but you can get gadgets for everyone. These gadgets are great. I love the gadgets. The gadgets are not sustainable. <laughs> We're not going to be able to keep having gadgets forever. It's just not going to happen. It's the same situation with the uh, oh, right the roller coaster analogy. You know, maybe this roller coaster is so great because it has such a, a big drop that it's super fun. But that big drop puts too many forces on on the track, and eventually the track's going to wear out. And the only way to make it so that we can still have a roller coaster is if we make the drop less bad, or uh, sorry, we make the drop like less extreme. And maybe that makes the roller coaster suck a little bit, but at least we still have a roller coaster. Yeah, it's better than it, if we don't if we don't try and address it. Then one day the roller coaster breaks and everyone who's riding it fucking dies. <laughs> That's the you know what my analogies are fucking good. Okay, I don't want to hear anyone talking shit about my analogies. They're powerful. My my powerful analogies are, are so good. That's the situation I see it as. Right? It's like look, I'm I don't want to grow my own potatoes. Okay, I like going to the store and I can get potatoes for super cheap. But, you know, and personally, I don't think the store is going anywhere. Right? And I don't think potatoes are going anywhere, at least in the UK. You know, we grow a lot of potatoes here. We grow enough potatoes to feed everyone, at least for now, <laughs> until the topsoil gets depleted. But potatoes are a relatively resilient crop, you know, even in a bad topsoil situation. I, I don't think we're going to have too much trouble with potatoes. I think there's other crops that are more likely to be, be problematic. Um before potatoes fail like if the potatoes fail there's basically nothing you can do to avoid a famine um just ask the irish uh anyway i don't want to be doing that but i'm like one day i'm basically a prepper i'm like a shitty prepper i'm like it doesn't don't it ain't looking too good for this whole society thing i'm just gonna be real with you it ain't looking too good like it'd be good if there was a way to make sure that if this shit goes to fuck whereas you know we don't all die (laughs) Because there's no, like, this is the thing, is that, like, actually, n- none of the, the established um, power structures can possibly, they can't possibly account for them themselves going to fuck. Because that necessarily means avoiding the incentives of itself. Does this make any sense? Like, there's no real incentive for a capitalist to build something that will withstand capital failing. Because it would necessarily have to be unprofitable, right? Or, like, there's no motivation for a, you know, someone in governance to build out networks that reduce reliance on governance because then who's going to vote for them? If they're like, well, we're doing it ourselves anyway, why do we need you? You know what I mean? Like, maybe that's a bit of a bad example, but you, I'm sure you can imagine a better version of what I'm trying to say, <laughs> so I don't have to. This is this here. This is anarchism. Instead of me saying something good, you, I, I'll say a stupid thing, and then you're gonna help me in your own mind come up with a better version of that that makes sense, and then you'll pretend that I said it already, and that's mutual aid. Okay, we did it. Um, you know, it's not possible for these structures to produce stuff to withstand their own collapse. Because, you know, they're dependent on the structure, right? I mean, it, it's... I, I'm saying it's not possible. It is possible, but it's very unlikely. It doesn't happen very often. Um, and so, yeah, that basically means it's up to the rest of us to do it for them. And we're not as good at it. Because we're just not as good at it. We're busy. we got other shit to do. And we're not specialists in every... You know, we can't be specialists in everything. And specialists are expensive. Like, that's the fundamental reality of it. It's like, if you want to set up something that's, you know, mildly complicated... You need someone with expertise in the field. It could be anything, any, even relatively simple. You need someone who knows what they're doing, at least at first, to teach people. But people who know what they're doing are busy doing the thing that they know for, for money, <laughs> you know? They're, they're not going to take time out of their schedule to help you. So the only way to do it is to learn yourself. And that's too much fucking effort for most people. And reasonably so. There's way too much effort. But hopefully, 
I mean, the, the situation is like hopefully they were just like barely enough. It's a pretty it's a pretty weak hope, but that's basically the hope. Hopefully there's barely enough. Hopefully knowledge is barely free enough that there is like enough people who are barely willing to learn the bare minimum to set stuff up in such a such a way that when certain systems collapse, they're alternative. That's basically all it is. I don't like it when stuff I like doesn't happen anymore. I don't like that. Like you ever be watching a YouTube channel and then one day they fire half their hosts and now there's no YouTube channel anymore? You know, that's fucking suck. I like the I like the thing that we had. I don't want it to go away. In that scenario, there's nothing we could do, right? Um, I mean, actually, there was once, but the, I was thinking of Funhouse when it died, which was literally what happened. Like, Machinima fired, they got hired by Rooster Teeth. But then Rooster Teeth, also a fucking disaster. Um, just longer term. But, like, you know, I think, here, let's bring this back around to, to my special interest. Like, TF2. <laughs> It's just like Team Fortress 2. You know, everything in the world, if you think about it hard enough, is just like Team Fortress 2. The fact that it's like, okay, well, Valve's not going to deal with this, the, the botting issue, you know. Um, so, what happens, right? Does everyone just sit there and abandon the game? No. You've got people like Uncle Dane setting up their own server infrastructure as an alternative to, cap- to, to, to capitalism, <laughs> to casual one, man. Um, you've got that one Australian guy who's working on, you know, his own anti-cheat system that, you know, will automatically kick cheaters and bots from the game. It's not perfect, but it's the best he can do, right? And there's a bunch of other people, very smart people, also working on a bunch of other stuff to counter this problem, um, you know? Like, this is the sort of... Th- and it's, it's not working that great right now, you know? It's not It's not amazing, I like this is basically how I believe, right? Like it's not. It'd be better if Valve just fixed casual. Obviously, obviously it'd be better. But they're not gonna. It doesn't seem like they're very interested in doing that. If they do do it, that'd be great, and everyone will be happy. But it doesn't seem like it's gonna happen, right? It, it seems pretty unlikely that that's gonna be the case. And so, you know, we have a slightly shittier version, but at least it's something. That's basically how I see anarchism. It's a slightly shittier version, but at least it's something. We've got a couple more comments. We've got Anime Sama who says. Uh, did you just say that you want the romance to be resolved in a comedy romance anime? That's impossible. You can't dry up the well of comedy you've been milking endlessly. No wonder you disliked Isakawa g san I know why I read that. The Uncle Isakai, you've been bamboozled. I mean, yeah, that's why I don't like it. <laughs> the well is not that deep, and they're milking it for everything they can. If you want romance storylines, you got to read it. Uh, Vinny Contignello says... I like that the concept of adults forming fandoms around media for children comes up sporadically three times throughout the video. The writers of the Slice of Life podcast are getting really good at working motifs into the story. Yeah, I mean, that's what I pay them for. Well, uh, yeah, that's why they didn't strike, because I pay what I don't know, this is a stupid bit. Here's a bit of a, a thing that I've been thinking about just now, and I'm amazed that I've never heard anyone talk about this before. Maybe, maybe I'm not the first person to think about this, but... This seems like a really obvious thing to think about, and it's kind of weird that I haven't... I don't know. I'll just put the idea on, okay? It's related to AI. I know we're all bored of philosophical problems relating to AI. But here's my here's my question. So, specifically, this is a question about super-intelligent AI, okay? So, not just general human intelligence, but what... The, the, this is not... The thing that a lot of people are, we're talking about super intelligent. My question is, what does that even mean? What is a super intelligent? Is it even possible? Is such a like concept even meaningful, rather? So like, what does intelligence mean? It, we don't really know. Like, intelligence is kind of a vaguely defined concept in the first place. It's often related to competency, but even competency is kind of vague. And also very um sp- specialized like if i asked you to think of the most intelligent people in most intelligent person you're probably going to name someone like like isaac newton or einstein or some sort of scientist but being really good at science is not the same thing as a general like it doesn't really make any sense right because being very good at, at, at a certain scientific field being very competent at a certain scientific field is specialization right and it, it firstly relies on building up building upon the existing literature of the field. You couldn't be Einstein if Newton hadn't come before, right? And so on, to a bunch of names you've never heard of as well. Not just the famous ones. I've never heard of them as well, because they're not the famous ones. So even that doesn't really make sense. But then, like, in what sense is being... Like, I don't really understand what it even means to be really good at science. Like, on a practical level, being good at 
science is like, you know, I, it, I guess in theoretical sciences, it's like having some original, unique perspectives on ideas, creative thinking. But creative thinking is also a weird, hard to pin down concept. Like, what does super intelligence mean? What does intelligence, like, obviously we have stuff like IQ, okay? Now, IQ is an extremely flawed system. You've all heard it talk to death about how much of a flawed system. It's an extremely flawed, like, here, let me just preface this. Firstly, IQ is an extremely flawed system. And secondly, I'm not a racist, okay? Just so that everything is clear. However, IQ is correlated to competency at certain subjects, particularly maths. So are we just saying, so if we're judging intelligence by IQ, which mainly judges your ability to do things that are like maths, like in that sort of vein of abstract logic, computers are already way better at it than humans, at least at calculation, right? Surely. Have we not already created super intelligent machines? No human could do the calculations that like your phone does every second. You couldn't calculate the vertex transformations to run a video game manually in real time, you know? Like, okay, but that doesn't count, obviously. None none of that counts. Every time computers do something, it doesn't count. Like, okay, well, if they're good at maths, it doesn't count as being super. If they can beat an S at chess, that's just an algorithm. You know know what I mean, right? A large language models aren't AI because they're just, you know, large language. They're just trying to guess what word comes next. This is the thing. It's every time an AI comes around, it's discounted as not really, and just fine. I don't know if it's fine, but it's just a pattern. I don't really have anything particular to say about that. But, like, okay, so there's a bunch of stuff that computers can already do that far surpasses human ability. Why aren't they considered to be super intelligent? What would it mean? Like, do you, do you understand what I'm getting at here? Like, this concept doesn't really make any sense. And it's taken as a given by, like, a lot of AI people. Even the, like, relatively grounded AI researchers. I know there's not that many of those guys left, but even the relatively grounded AI researchers talk talk about super intelligence as if it's a given, as if it makes sense to say something that will far surpass human intelligence. But we don't even have an understanding of what human intelligence means, let alone can we even conceive of what it would mean to surpass human intelligence. Like, I'm really thinking about this. Like, what would be a test that you could perform to show whether or not something is super intelligent? You can't imagine one because you already you would have to again like iq doesn't work okay iq is a terrible measure of intelligence because intelligence is just a weird nebulous concept that doesn't really describe something precise like i mean just as an example when i said think of like a super intelligent person and i said you probably thought of einstein like is einstein more intelligent than Miles Davis. There's a, there's a cross. Is is Einstein or was Einstein more in, intelligent than Miles Davis? Does that even make any sense as a question? No, it doesn't make any fucking sense. You're telling me there's going to be an AI that is capable of producing Einstein results and Miles Davis results. Not possible. I just simply refuse to believe that that is the case. And here's why: because those both of those measures of intelligence, Einstein less so, rely on human experience like very particular humanity type stuff like it wouldn't be particularly impressive if an ai could like if a machine could be hooked up to a saxophone and play very technically proficient runs arpeggios or whatever because that would just be you know articulated motor and even if it could like you can't just plug music theory into an ai I'm, I'm not saying that an AI could never make expressive music. I think it could happen. But what would it be expressing is the question here. Like, would we even know a super intelligence when we saw it? Because as humans, like, you can't imagine someone smarter than yourself. This is, like, a problem a lot of writers have. Like, a lot of, like, stories suck because they're written about smart characters by people who are trying to write a character smarter than them. And it doesn't work. This happens in anime all day. <laughs> uh... You can't imagine the thought processes of someone smarter than you because, at least not in real time, you can, in hindsight, you can be like, oh, if I'd done this better, then I would have been able to, yeah, but you can't do it in real time because that, otherwise you would be smarter than you, which makes sense. So how can we even hope to imagine what a super intelligent, you can't. So I don't think it makes any sense to even talk about it as a concept because it's fun, it's like definitionally unimaginable. We haven't, we can't even claim to know what a slightly more intelligent version of us would 
be, you know what I mean? Like, there's so many problems with this concept of, like, what does it even mean to be intelligent? We don't know. How would we even know if something was super intelligent? We don't know. Uh, is it even possible to create something smarter than you? Sometimes, but then it doesn't count, right? <laughs> like, it, with computers and maths and stuff like that. Uh, is it just being more competent at calculations intelligence? Maybe? But that's not the skill that scientists and mathematicians really need. They're not, they're not particularly good at calculating. I'm not a scientist or a mathematician, so I don't really know what they're good at. But it's a level of creative thinking, as I understand. Or, like, what does it mean to be a really good musician? That's something that can't be defined. There is no formula for good music, for good art. And I think, you know, science and mathematics are also forms of artistic creativity from what I understand again I'm not a scientist or a mathematician and I don't know much of those fields but from what I understand once you get to the higher levels you know other than the practical side of those fields practical practical physics or whatever which is just about running tests experiments which I suppose is that what you're talking about is a super intelligence and a machine that's able to run tests we already have those I'm very confused by this whole concept, but if we're talking about the theoretical side of it, it's like saying you could create a computer that would make the best music ever. Well, that's a subjective value, you know? Like, what does it mean for a computer to make the best music ever? It doesn't really make any sense as a concept. There is, like, even the idea of the best music ever doesn't really make any sense as a concept, because that's going to be linked to your own personal history. <clears throat> and is, is, is the best science ever kind of the same thing? It's normally like the most important science, right? I mean, I'm just going with science because it's normally what people class as like things that super intelligence is really able to do, science and engineering. And then they, they throw in some arts in there too. But it doesn't really make any sense, you know? Like I think if a, if a super intelligence made music, it would sound like Jacob Collier which is awful. I don't want it to sound like Jacob Collier. Like, you can't get... You can't get Beat Happening or or Dean Blunt out of superintelligence. It comes from circumstances. And a computer can't be in circumstances. So it doesn't... Do you understand what I'm getting at? Like, there's a lot of fields of human intelligence which don't even really make sense to translate to a computer. I mean, I'm not saying that they couldn't emulate similar things, but... When we're talking about competency, it doesn't really make any sense. Like, super intelligence would be able to make music that is incomprehensibly better than any music humans can. What? That's not a concept that makes any sense. That's that's a nonsense concept. Do you understand? Like, the whole, the whole, all of the assumptions about what intelligence means, they don't have any substance to them. They, they're just sort of gesturing vaguely at this concept called intelligence as if we understand what the fuck that means. I don't think we do. So, and if you can't even judge that, then what the fuck does the term super intelligence mean? There you go. This is my, this is my, my thoughts. These are my thoughts. You know what I find kind of funny? I don't know why I just had the random urge to do this to watch this, but like, you know Metallica? You know Saint Anger? Yeah, you know Saint Anger. It's famous by now, okay? Now, as, if you've ever listened to my music, you will know that I love Saint Anger snares. Like, I think they sound good. But the album sounds like shit. Like, anyone who says the album's bad because the snares are too snary, you know, they're retarded, okay? There's, there's a, the, the songs suck. Uh, I do not like, I don't even, like, I'm not the biggest Metallica fan in the world. Like, I like Ride the Lightning and stuff, but, you know, it's not, I used to like it a lot more than I do now. It's not really my taste in metal. I prefer, uh, you know, something a little heavier. Um... But St. Anger as an album is terrible, right? Like, the songs are really bad. Um, but anyway, the song St. Anger, the, 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 the namesake song, if you, if you go watch the YouTube video or the music video, it's really funny because, uh, I mean, firstly, the song is terrible, but they filmed it at San Quentin Prison, and, like, it's really obvious that the camera is, like, trying to make all of the inmates look, like, particularly menacing and evil, but they just look like normal guys most of the time. Like, it's really funny that, like, cl I mean, they they clearly got into this, like, okay, we're gonna go put you in the dangerous place. And the fucking, like, like, prison guard 
at the start of the video is like giving them like some sort of warning speech like if you're taken hostage we're not gonna negotiate with them like it's so over fucking the top and then you actually see them and it's so obvious that they've been like instructed to act menacing or something and the camera keeps showing the same like three guys who are just have lots of tattoos to make it look way more menacing than it actually is but they're clearly just a bunch of guys who are just like listening to this weird ass fucking song and like not really sure how to react it's extremely funny man i woke up today and uh <clears throat> you know i said i've been getting kind of burnt out on tf2 but i still in my brain have wanted to play first person shooter game that you can go with the first person in so i've been thinking uh, i rewatched um all of erin signal's children of doom series yesterday and so I wanted to play Quake, but it, it, it turns out I don't own Quake, and it turns out Quake isn't free, like Doom is. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it is free if I look around a little bit, but um, I, I thought Quake had been open sourced, like Doom had been open sourced. But the engine is open source, but the, the actual Quake stuff, the levels, the sounds and textures and stuff, I don't think are. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but I couldn't find it for free in like five minutes of looking. I didn't look very hard. Maybe I'm wrong, okay? Listen, I'm covering all my bases here. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong, and maybe I'm right, I don't know. Whatever happened, Quake is like, you know, fucking eight pounds on Steam, right? And uh, I would be quite happy to pay eight pounds for Quake, but uh, I don't have that much money in my Steam wallet, and for complicated, annoying reasons, I can't add money to my Steam wallet right now. Um, I have to wait until I get back into the UK to do stuff to fix that. But anyway, um, so I was, but then I remembered, hold on a minute, I own Dust, which is a modern boomer shooter, uh, made by the same guy that made, it's weird, because I know this guy as the guy that made Dust, but then he was like, he put out a little, you know, side project that he, you know, a, a small side project called Iron Lung, and that's now like way bigger than Dust. Because uh, I guess a bunch of YouTubers played Iron Lung. I've never played Iron Lung. I'm sure it's a cool game. Um, but, but I found out about it because of Dusk. I played through the first chapter of Dusk ages ago. And I had a lot of fun. I didn't like... I, I don't really remember what I felt when I was playing through Dusk for the first time. I think I liked it, but I don't think it like... I thought it was anything special. Um, but anyway. So yeah, I stopped after the first chapter last time. Um, so I reinstalled Dusk. And I've been playing through the second chapter. I'm almost finished. And holy shit, that game is fucking good. Like, god fucking damn, that game is intense and good. I think the reason that I never played single player games that much is just because I have the volume too low. Or maybe just none of them have good sound design like Dusk. Like, man, the sound design in Dusk is so fucking intense and stressful. I, if you've never played Dusk, listen, I highly recommend you play it. Okay, I've played through a few boomer shooters classic ones and modern ones. I think Dusk is like arguably the best. I have to replay Doom at some point with like like Brutal Doom or something, like one of those mods that adds some nice uh, gore effects and sound effects and stuff. Um, like I, I like Doom enough, I've, but I've, I get bored, like it's, I always get bored after I finish the first chapter, like I never want to beat the whole game, you know, it's, it gets pretty samey basically. And also, the, a, a lot of Doom is really like, okay, you've, you've killed everyone now, like, where the fuck do I go? That's a lot of Doom, and I really, that's, I mean, this is a problem with every boomer shooter. But yeah, Doom, it's like, very egregious in some levels, but I just don't know where the fuck to go, and it's very annoying. Um, but yeah, I've never played Quake. I've played Unreal, Unreal Gold as well. Um, I've played a game called Age Rot, but I never finished it. I only played like a little bit, like the first like 35 or something. That was pretty fun. Um, but I, I, Dusk is definitely the best one so far. I haven't played Ultra Kill yet, but I don't think it's going to be as good as Dusk. Cause some of the things, like the thing about Dusk is it just looks better than any other, any of the rest. Of, like it looks so good. And I think Quake is like, Quake 1 is like arguably the best fucking game of all time. And Dusk is very clearly like very Quake 1 inspired. Um... So yeah. Oh, and obviously Half-Life 1, if you count that as a boomer shooter. I don't know, it might be more like a tap shooter, but uh, yeah, obviously I've played Half-Life 1 to death. Um, yeah, man, I'm, man, I, I don't even know what to say about Dusk. It's just too fucking good. Go play it. Go buy this fucking game. Like, holy shit. You do backflips. When you press R, you, you spin your gun around. 
You can uh, smoke a cigar. One of your weapon slots is just a cigar that doesn't do anything except be a cigar in your mouth. I don't even want to give spoilers for some of the stuff that's in the game, but holy shit, play it in a dark room with the sound cranked up. Man, you'll have a fucking time. I'm telling you. Whew. I don't, I, it's too intense. Like, I, I could time wise beat the game today, but I don't think I physically, I don't think I can physically beat the game today. Like, I think I can play through a chapter, but man, I don't think I have the energy to play through another chapter after this. Like, it's just too fucking intense. I will say, the game is like extremely cheesable. Like, like there is very obvious cheese in a lot of levels, and the game, does, I mean, I, I support, fully support this. The game does nothing to stop you from cheesing it, right? Like, there's there's a few levels where you can, like, shoot through a window somewhere and take out half the enemies in a room that you don't have the key card to access yet, and then when you get there, it's, it's just, like, trivializes the entire fight. Like, or, like, a boss fight, like, one of the boss fights I just cheesed entirely by... I don't know if it's necessarily cheese. Like, the thing is, this kind of game it breaks the boundaries between what's cheese and what isn't. Like, in a sense, circle strafing is cheese. But you're definitely supposed to circle strafe in the game, right? But, like, you can just, if, like, I, like none of the enemies that can hit you if you're just strafing the whole time, um, for example. But there's, there's stuff like, you know, you can get enemies sort of in an awkward spot in the geometry and keep strafing back and forth and they can never hit you. Or peeking out to, to destroy, to kill a, a certain enemy in, like, a spot where he can't see you but you can see him. Or, you know, all of these sorts of things that are, that are basically cheese, but are built into the game. And on the one hand, I fucking love that. My brain is super cheese-pilled in FPS games. I, I think it's partially because I've played so many, so much more multiplayer shooters than single player. So I'm like, to me, I'm like, the idea is always to cheese every fight. Because that's how you're supposed to play. You know, you never want to take a fair fight um, in a multiplayer FPS. Uh, yeah, I don't know. On the other hand, the negative part is that sometimes you find a cool cheese and you do it, and then it, and then later on in the level, you know, like like I'm thinking specifically, there was one level where I managed to get up to sort of a skylight above a building, and this is clearly intentional. Okay, it, he put this in the game on purpose because there's stuff up there. Like this is it, it's a secret. Like you're supposed to be able to get up there, but you can get up to this place and just kill all the enemies in the next room from up there, and they can't really do much back to you and then later on you know the music swells everything gets intense and then it, you finally get to go into that room and it's just empty because <laughs> you really killed all the people and it's a bit of a anti-climax but it's fun that that sort of stuff's in the game like most devs wouldn't have the balls to like that um yeah honestly i can't recommend dusk highly enough it is such a good fucking game i don't know the first time i played it i remember i enjoyed it but i didn't think it was anything special but for some reason this time it's like man what a good fucking game. Okay, we're gonna do some comment responses. Let's do a couple more comment responses. Uh, I, I saw that I got a really long comment. I didn't read what it said, but oh god, I think I have even more. I think I have even more comments now. Okay, we have a uh, YouTube Studio comments. Skuka says the kunai is like the only spy weapon I think should be reworked or nerfed. Being punished for something you had no hand in because a clueless teammate wasn't paying any attention sucks. It's also just so boring. When I was a spy main a long time ago, I didn't use the kunai because the Eternal Reward and the Big Iron were just so fun and more interesting than health go up. I completely agree. Like, the, 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 the problem with the kunai, really, is that the downsides aren't really downsides, right? Like, the idea of the kunai is, yeah, you can theoretically attain 200 plus health, but you have to start off with only 70 health, which makes you so, so weak. But the problem is, that before you get a kill as a spy, you're already basically dead if you get found out anyway. Like, whether you die from 70 health or more, it doesn't really matter. So, like, the downside isn't really a downside. It's basically just free health. And, you know, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's just a bit ridiculous. The downside needs to be much more significant. Um, okay, then we have three comments from Censored Terminal Autism. Um, imagine a picture of Johnny Bravo, but he kind of looks like could be shaggy maybe and he's wearing a fireman outfit and he says zoinks these are the perks of being fire pilled scoobs sure people seem to really have gotten interested in this section of the podcast 
Uh, so far, one of the funniest podcasts. Anyway, you're focusing too much on popularity when the correct thing to do is to ignore that. Anime otaku are obsessed with anime, not necessarily exclusively anime that isn't popular or only specific genres. Look at how important Gundam is for anime as a hobby and for otaku and how ridiculously popular it's always been. Even something like Ava has only ever been maybe a bit obscure at all in the West. This is a West-centric concern. Hell, it's common for popular shows to be referenced in very otaku-centric shows, and magazines like Shonen Jump even appear in some shows like that. Of course, not all of these shows are popular in the West, like a lot of classics from the 70s and 80s that I'm a fan of, but a few are. The biggest problem with a lot of these newer audiences is that it's going to be the death of anime, China, and the West have already been gradually ruining Japan, and the censorship and dumbing down of anime will only get worse, as anime is made more and more for those markets. Compare the unhinged madness of 80s anime to now. You can't have panties in anime anymore, even that's too much. Uncensored Blu-rays are going away. As far as people go, it's just a matter of being an otaku or not, or being obnoxious or not, and also of being in your increasingly rare right places that have a generally higher level of knowledge and discussion, or just building up your own circle. I don't really like most people in any of my hobbies, and haven't for a while, and I simply don't go to the spaces full of people that annoy me too much. Just allowing people to say whatever they want tends to repel the average human, because they're too offended to stick around. Unfortunately, that doesn't guarantee quality, so even the more niche boards nowadays tend to be ruined anyway. That can be prevented by immediately swinging the ban hammer at people that clearly don't belong, but that can only go too far as well. I mean, I pretty much agree with everything there. Um... I think you're right that I was focusing too much on popularity rather than, like, content and the type of popularity it has. I definitely think you're right about that. Um, I'm not sure about this, like, you can't even show panties anymore. I don't think that's true at all. There's fan service shows, like, every... Se- like, Ishizoka Reviewers was not that long ago. What was that, like, two years ago? A year ago? I don't remember. And, like, Onimai was super popular and super fan service heavy, like, also very recently... I don't think fan service is really going anywhere. It just happens in its own shows, you know? And, like, if you want to talk censorship, you want to talk about, like, how they can't show blood-related incest anymore. Now, that's that's censorship. Yeah, I don't I don't know. Compare the unhinged madness of 80s anime to now is a bit weird, because 80s anime isn't that much more insane than modern anime. Like, obviously, there's some particularly weird stuff, like Rotsuki Doji or something. But then there's also weird-ass modern anime, like Kenshi no Drop or something like that. Right, like I don't really know how comparable that is. I, I, I don't like. I think anime's always been weird, and the weird stuff. It just, it's just that in the eighties you didn't have much of a choice other than to watch the weird stuff. Whereas now there's so much more options. It doesn't mean the weird stuff doesn't get made. The weird stuff just has a lower budget and isn't as prestige anymore. But it's still out there. It often like disguises itself as normal stuff. This is my opinion, right? Like, like a lot of the isekai that look like generic isekai are actually like batshit insane. It's just that unlike the 80s batshit insane anime, these ones are that no one, the author doesn't even realize that he's insane. That's how insane he is. He doesn't even know there's something wrong with him. Okay, I'm going to go um, eat some eggs and then I'll read the final comment. I have completely forgot to read the final comment, so I'm going to do that now. This is again from Sons of Terminal Autism who said, I do not like ratings and people's obsession with trying to quantify art and boil it down to a number. So like the ratings on mouse suck. I don't have an account, but if I did, you know what I'd do about it? I'd make them worse. I'd watch a bad anime and write a review that says it sucks, but give it a 10 out of 10 anyway. Scores can never be separated from popularity. The shows with the highest scores will always be the most popular ones. Also, people don't have the same logic behind their scores, so it's all meaningless. I may give something a 10 just to make the overall number go bigger, not because I actually think it's a 10. In fact, I have done that a lot. Um... Your logic is fundamentally flawed here. I mean, I kind of understand what you mean, but uh, you're saying the highest scores will be the most popular anime, but that's not true. Uh, Like, every season, uh, if you go on Mal right now and you go to, like, the most popular popular anime, uh, sorry, the highest rated anime, you'll probably find stuff from, like, this season or a few seasons ago, because ratings have, like, a massive recency bias. Like, a bunch of people who found some anime recently are going to rate it really highly, but then as time goes on and more and more people watch it, you know, literally the more popular it gets, more and more people are going to be able to judge it fairly, and, you know, so it might be popular per season, and that would inflate the scores, but overall, I think, I would hope that, you know, scores even out in the end. 
But of course I agree with you. Quantifying the quality of art through a number is like, you know, a stupid idea. Um, but I think this is a moment where both of our autisms get in the way of this. Because, you know, any any reasonable autist has had a, uh, a conundrum about scoring stuff at some point. Because we have the, the, the intuition that we want to catalog something. But then also, when someone says to score something, we, we really take that literally. But, uh, which is obviously impossible because art can't be quantified like that. And so it becomes a bit of a stressful proposition. Um, but the conclusion I've come to is, uh, you know, I quite like the My Anime List scoring system specifically for the, the the fact that it gives you a little word next to each number, right? From 10, masterpiece, 9, great, and very good, good, fine, average, bad, very bad, horrible, and appalling, right? Like, I think it's much easier for me when I'm looking at a show to, and rating it to be like, yeah, I think that was a masterpiece, or yeah, I think that was fine, or yeah, it was average, or man, that was horrible, you know, like, I can... Rather than, than thinking that the number means the number, I just it's like the number represents one of those words as a descriptor. Now, obviously, even that, you can't sum up an entire show, you know, with just uh, one word. So, obviously, it's still not very good. So, when I'm scoring shows, the real thing I'm trying to do is to jog my own memory, right? Like, I, I want to I wanna put a score next to a show, mainly so that, I can give a vibe rather than trying to actually quantify the show's quality because because that's that's impossible. It's it's not an exact science which is annoying. It would be nice if there were an exact science way to score shows, but um that such a thing doesn't exist. Um but yeah, it's like when I go back through my list, there's a bunch of shows that I remember, but I've also watched a shitload of anime. Like if I just scroll to a random point in my list. Okay, let's see. We got uh, Maho Shoujo Isekai Keikaku uh, No, Ikusei Keikaku Okay, I don't I don't remember or know what the fuck that is Is that Magical Girl Raising Project? Maybe, probably um, And I gave it a 2 out of 10 So that basically tells me That jogs my memory I mean, I remember Because specifically I really hated that show <laughs> Maybe if I go to something else Okay, New Game I don't remember what I thought about New Game I watched that this fucking ages ago What was New Game like? I gave it a 6, that jogs my memory. I'm like, okay, yeah, I guess I thought it was, like, fine. I guess I thought it was okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And then I can jog my memory and be like, yeah, I remember the show, New Game. Like, it wasn't very funny, even though it was, like, quite comedy-focused. I didn't find any of the characters that endearing. But there was nothing actively bad or offensive about it. The point, you see, like, the point is just to jog my memory rather than to, like, actually give an accurate, you know, idea of what the show is like. It's just supposed to be a vague pointing in 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 a certain direction. Um, yeah, it would be nice if you could make like on Annualist, I believe you can you can do like custom scores, like you could put, give them like a six point five or something like that. That that might be nice. You know, in my mind when I'm rating things, I'm, I I normally give the 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 YMS scaling. So I'm I, I'll say like I'm gonna give it a six. It's closer to a seven than a five, something like that. That's normally how I I rate things in my own head. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with you, obviously, that rating scores are a bit silly um, as a concept. But I don't think that they should be completely discarded, because they can have you some utility. Like, oftentimes for me, rating scores spark a, a bit of a discussion. Like, if I meet someone and they send me their, their mail, I go on their list. Almost always, it you know, it doesn't have to be like, oh, you gave... Like, there's very few situations where it's like, you gave this show a 9, you should have given it a 10, or something like that, right? Or, you gave this show a 7? I can't believe you gave it a 7 when it should be a 6. Like, that's not what anyone cares about, at least it's not what I care about. It's more like, I can look through your list and be like, okay, you liked this show, you, you, oh, you didn't like this show, and I, and then I'm like, what the fuck? How in the goddamn fuck can you give Code Geass an 8 out of 10? That show is dog shit. Right, and then we can have a discussion about it, right? Like that's the point. It's not the the score is the jumping off point for real discussion. It shouldn't be an end point. And maybe they have good a good justification, but the point of the the out of ten score is that it's a universal thing that people can use to just to to indicate roughly 
whether they really liked the show, liked the show, didn't really care one way or the other, thought it wasn't that great, or really hated it. Like, that's all that matters, is just to give a general overall impression on that sort of thing. Is it nuanced? Obviously not. It is massively lacking in nuance and should should be taken as the first part of a conversation, right? You shouldn't... It shouldn't be the the ending of a thing. It's like, I don't like it when when reviews, right? If you're going to read a, a written review of, of any piece of media, okay? The rating should be the first thing in the review because the rating is the beginning, not the conclusion. I don't, I don't like it when reviews... They go through their whole spiel, and then they're like, so in the end, I'm going to give it a six or whatever. I don't like that, because it's like, no, 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 that's not in the end. That's the first thing. Then you tell me the actual nuance and interesting bit about what you thought of the the piece of media that you're reviewing. Um, Yeah, anyway, that's... uh, Obviously, rating scores, like, yeah. Guys, the first episode of 16-Bit Sensation came out. This is crazy. I don't know why. But I feel so seen right now. I feel so acknowledged. Because they, they got the licenses or permissions or whatever to use real properties in this anime, which is crazy and awesome. So, like, you see anime posters in, like, Akiba, and they're real, real anime and shit. And you see you see posters for fucking Fake Go and the, the, the stupid-ass Madoka gacha game. And then you go into the girl's apartment... And she has all the fucking eroge, and it's all shit I know. And I'm like, Pog, I know the, the that's the thing I know. Look, it's the thing I, I I know that thing. This must be this must be how Marvel fans feel when when Spider Man from the other movie shows up in their movie. This must be how they feel. I'm like, that's Senen Banker. That's the Ubisoft games. That's Riddle Joker. I know those. I know those. I know those games. I have. I've only played a little bit of the of one of. Well, I played one of them, but I haven't played enough of them. But I know those games. That's fucking. Um, I don't remember what it's called. That's Higurashi. I know that one. Uh, that's Happy Maha, which I haven't played. Um, uh, that that's a uh, fucking. I know this one as well. I forgot what it's called, but I've seen it around. Uh, this one is fucking, you know, I know them, I know, I'm looking at at the the screen right now, there's a bunch of box art, and I'm like, guys, that's the game, I played this, this is a real game, I read this one, I'm gonna read Riddle Joker soon as well, this is crazy, I don't know why, but it's rare, I don't know, You the, the fact that it's real, the fact that it's real is is crazy, I don't know how to explain it. Okay, so I just beat Dusk. Holy shit. I'm literally... My hands are shaking. The adrenaline. The adrenaline from that game. Holy fuck. That might be one of the best games ever made. I'm just gonna put it out there. Holy shit. I'm reeling. I'm reeling from that fucking gauntlet at the end of the game. Holy shit. I I, I barely even died. Like, I'm pretty proud of myself, to be honest. I was playing on what I what I think is, like, normal difficulty. Like, there's four difficulties. The top two are, like, challenge difficulty. And the bottom two are, like... Like, there's the bottom difficulty is... I forget the name of them. But there's, like, the, the easy baby mode called accessible. And then there's, like, the level above that, which is, like, uh, enemies do less damage and projectiles move slower. And then the middle difficulty is, like, the normal one. That's the one I was playing on. I think it's called I Can Take It. Um... And then the two above that are like extra challenge. So the one above that is like projectiles move even faster, enemies do more damage, stuff like that. And then the one above that, it's like uh, like you die. It's I think it's called I, I don't know what dusk. It's it's the ultra violence mode. Uh, but any damage kills you in the highest difficulty. So I was playing on like the the normal difficulty. And frankly, the game was kind like I don't want to say the game was easy, but I really do think if I wanted to. Maybe not the end. I don't know if I could do chapter three, but I'm pretty sure I could do the first two chapters without ever taking damage. Like, if it would just take ages and be, like, fucking grueling. You'd have to play super safe. Anyway, I shouldn't be talking about that. I beat Dusk on... I beat Dusk, and it was a fucking experience. I will say, the final boss, incredibly cheesable. Like, the f- I don't want to give anything away, but I, I basically figured, like... Let's just, without any spoilers, let's say the final boss, you're fighting him on a, a platform, and the platform has some, like, jump pads, 
And if you get on one of the jump pads, he just can't hit you. So you can just sort of keep jumping up and down. I mean, he hits you sometimes, but he like mostly can't hit you. I, I just found that by, I, I just sort of stumbled into that because I was like just sort of standing on it and jumping up and down. It kind of, he can't hit you. It doesn't really matter because the final boss, there's like four bosses. There's like four final bosses because like they make you do a big gauntlet level where it's like you're on this sort of platform in space and waves and waves of enemies are spawning at you. That's the real final boss. Like, that's the hardest part of the game, probably, in terms of real combat. But it's not actually that difficult, as long as you're good at kiting, which I am. Um, and you've, like, if you've figured out how to, like, properly strafe and the movement in the game, how to move fast, like, none of the enemies can really catch up with you. And then, like, really, here's my tips for beating the end of a dust. Like, for that level, you need to practice with the mortar throughout the whole game. Like, I have a feeling that a lot of people probably aren't using the mortar in the game because it has an arc right it's kind of a difficult weapon to aim but obviously it's the demo man weapon and i play demo man in team fortress 2 so obviously i was like yo fucking iron bomber in this game or i don't know what, what to call it but it's that kind of thing right it's a grenade launcher weapon so i was practicing with it throughout the game and when you get to that final level if you're kiting enemies, they're going to be all bunched up behind you. So if you can just sort of keep strafing, kiting them, circle strafing around them, and then mortaring them, you're going to be able to deal massive damage to big groups and survive. But you want to save your Riveter, which is the powerful weapon in the game, the most powerful rocket launcher. You want to save all of your ammo of the Riveter for the last wave, because the last wave spawns every boss so far <laughs> at once. It spawns all of the bosses at once, and you have to kill all of them. And yeah, you're going to want to use all of your Riveter ammo uh, to take out the strongest boss as fast as possible. Because you can deal with the two horses real, real easy. I just fucking got them with a shotgun and pistol. And then, so that's the big gauntlet. And then you go into a big spoiler alert. Spoiler alert for Dusk, okay? Skip ahead like three minutes. Actually, I don't know. Um, this is like something that's really cool to go in blind. I, I, feel, I feel like witnessing this blind would be way cooler than, than hearing it from me. So maybe skip ahead or something if you don't want to hear the end of Dusk. You're probably not going to. I never do when people tell me to do this in YouTube videos. But, um, yeah. So, you, you, there's, without giving too much away, there's sort of two final bosses. Like, you could say the final boss has two phases, but without giving too much away. Um, and the first phase, um, although the guy moves real fast, like, he moves real fast. He's not that, again, like, the mortar really comes in handy because you can just kite him, predict his movement, and then detonate the mortar, like, when he when he's moving over them. And you can do quite a lot of damage. Um, yeah. And then, the, yeah, again, the last final boss was very cheesable. Not that I really took away from it. Um, it's still cool to witness. But man, what a fucking game. Holy shit, what a game. High intensity, high octane action. Now I gotta play Ultra Kill at some point. But man, yeah, good fucking video game. Go play Dusk. It's not even expensive. I gotta play Ultra Kill at some point. Ultra Kill looks way less fun. Here's the, like, the problem with Ultra Kill is it looks like shit. Like, Dusk also has, like, low poly, low fidelity graphics, but it looks amazing. Like, the, the atmosphere in Dusk is, like, arguably, I mean, it's one of the best atmospheres I've ever experienced in a video game. It's so intense. And then the, when it, which makes it, like, it, because it's so oppressive and intense, and sometimes it goes, like, the really into horror, um, you know, it, like, there's so much variety. But because it's, like, so intense the whole time, when it does a comedy thing, it's just fucking hilarious. Like, when it suddenly d dips into comedy out of nowhere, it makes it hit even harder. So, yeah, man, Dusk has everything. It has everything you could possibly want. It's got your magic, it's got your sci-fi, it's got your body horror, it's got your Lovecraftian horror, it's got your jump scares if you want them. There's an enemy in, in, in the game, the Wendigo, who's, like, invisible until you shoot them, and then it makes a really loud noise when they uh, appear. So there's literally a jump scare enemy in the game, and it works every fucking time. It is terrifying to face those guys. Um, yeah. It has everything you'd want, but then it's also got all the action movie stuff. Like, it's, it's kind of got action as well, you know? It's not just the horror-themed. Got a lot of action themes, thriller themes. There's stuff. There's all sorts of stuff. It's all sorts of great stuff in that game. I'm just kind of gushing because my adrenaline is...
pumping. Like my adrenaline is pumping. I can't play games, man. They're too intense. Video games are too goddamn intense for me. Single player games are too intense. I, I need to go. I, I need to go spend like a whole day as a two for Hoovy in order to recover and recuperate from this gaming session. <sighs> Did I talk about sixteen bit sensation? I think I talked a little bit about it. But 16 bit sensation, the first episode, you know, I think this is the first time that I, I mean, other than, there's a, there's a few other anime that reference, like, certain nostalgic older anime aesthetics, like anime gataris is one that comes to mind towards the end. But 16 bit sensation is the first one that I think is like a direct nostalgia bait, um, anime like i don't think that i think this is literally the first nostalgia bait anime and as much as i like 16-bit sensation i really hope this doesn't become a trend like i kind of in some sense i want it to be popular because i want more people to read the you know pc 98 uh, uh visual novels that it's about and i want more people to be invested in visual novels uh, be sure your game stuff um and i just like it i think it's cool um I thought there was only like three chapters translated, but someone's told me that the whole thing is translated. So I don't know what the fuck I've been reading. Because <laughs> I, when I got it up on manga decks or whatever, there was barely anything translated. I don't know. Maybe I've somehow fucked up, downloaded the wrong version. I don't know. But yeah, as much as I like it, and I think it, it you know, it's definitely in the running for one of the better anime this season. Um, I also hope it doesn't do too well. Because I don't want more people to just make nostalgia bait anime. Although maybe I do, <laughs> you know? Anime was better in the 90s and early 2000s. So if you're, be- if you're gonna make nostalgia bait anime for the era of anime that I like, maybe that's okay. Maybe it's just okay to let it happen. You know what? Maybe it's okay to just let it happen. Hmm. You know that there's like a continuing meme of like Konata from Lucky Star in her 30s? Like, that's still a meme in both Japan and the West. Like, that's the sort of anime we need. We need that. What? Like, they could make that. This is the thing. In no other medium would do that. But, like, anime is the sort of guys that would do that. The anime guys, they would just pull a, like, okay, we're going to make a sequel to some show that was popular in the 2000s where it's all the characters have aged accurately in real world terms that would be really fucking sick i would actually watch the shit out of that i mean i don't think anyone would do it but that would be cool okay i'm kind of just rambling because i'm adrenaline pumped <clears throat> what a game what a video game um there's something else i want to say oh yeah i should catch up on a bunch of the other anime that's airing because i guess the season started now well it looks like nothing else has started that i'm in maybe this one the kaboko majo no oi Oh, this one started. Okay, I'll watch the first episode of this. This will be fucked. This is the worst way to do this. You know, I used to fucking do the videos where I lay around watching every every anime. I don't have the energy to do that today. Um, and it's also too much, just too much goddamn anime for me to do it. Um, but this way of going around it, I'm going to watch the first episode, and by the time this even comes out, the <laughs> season's going to be over. So the Minecraft mob vote is happening right now. Um, not that I particularly care. I haven't played Minecraft in years, nor do I particularly want to play Minecraft, except for the fact that I recently found out there's a mod that adds Quake movement to to Minecraft, which kind of sounds like everything I've ever wanted out of a video game. So I kind of want to load up, play a Minecraft with, with Quake movement. But anyway, other than that, I have no desire to play Minecraft, really. I mean, I don't watch Minecraft videos anymore. All of the Minecraft YouTubers kind of fell off at some point. Like, I used to be pretty into Hermitcraft, and uh, the most recent season, I just kind of completely fell off of it. Like, it got pretty repetitive and boring. So I pretty much unsubbed from every Hermitcraft person. Um, Yeah, Minecraft kind of a boring game to me now, but here's the thing. Okay, here's the thing. Every time there's a Minecraft mod vote, Minecraft's in the news for some reason. Every time you get people who are like, Oh my god, the Minecraft devs, they're so lazy. Other developers, they add so much Minecraft. Oh, what are you, one new mob, right? Like, oh, And then you get someone, some fucking smartass who responding to them. Actually, you shouldn't call the Minecraft developers lazy. I'm almost certain that this is Microsoft stopping them from being able to do more. And that they would love to... The truth is, okay, both of these people are stupid. Because 
this isn't fucking Fortnite. <laughs> this is Minecraft. What do you want them to add? You're like, oh, they don't, they don't really add anything. Yeah, because they've already fucking added everything that you could possibly want in the game. Like, the same people complain, or maybe it's not the same people, but, like, it's a common sentiment these days, like, oh, Minecraft doesn't feel vanilla anymore. Like, they've added too much shit. You can't have it both ways. Like, there's clearly a bunch of people who already feel like Minecraft, including me, by the way. Like, yeah, maybe it would be nice if they added some crazy big new update that added new bosses or whatever, but with a new, new dimension or something. But that's what you have mods for. Like, the fact that Minecraft is such an open modding platform means that, the, like, really, the devs shouldn't even be adding shit anyway. They should just be fixing bugs and generally maintaining the game. The Minecraft is, is complete. It's finished. <laughs> the games, they, they made the game. There's nothing left to add. Like, what do, they, what do you want? They've, they've completely redone world generation. They added, like, like, what do you want? I'm serious. Like, there's nothing else that needs to be added to Minecraft. It's finished. The games, they made the game. They finished making it. They just keep adding shit because, like, they feel obligated to or something. But, like, there's no reason to. They, yeah, they, they, they don't want to add anything that actually fundamentally changes the game. Because they finished the game. They've already done it. They don't want to go back and fuck with the shit they've already made. Because that's what makes the game successful. Because most people like that stuff. Like, what do you want? I'm serious. <laughs> I, I don't understand this attitude at all. Why would you call Minecraft devs lazy or, you know, whatever? Why would you say they're not adding enough? Why, why, like, it doesn't make any sense. They add one new mob a year. It's like, bro. Like, this is why Minecraft is such a valuable game. Because it's it can be maintained by, like, a relatively small team, and yet is worth billions and billions of dollars. Like, that's that's the thing that makes Minecraft good to own as, as a Microsoft. You don't need... To, you, don't, you neither need nor want Minecraft to add a bunch of bullshit. Like, once they added Elytra, the game was complete. I think they should have just stopped developing it there, personally. Because, like, Elytra was like, shit, this should have been in the fucking game the whole time. Um, but anyway, you know, I don't care, it's not like I play the game, but if you want, like, why are you complaining when there's a, anything you could possibly want from the game, there's already a mod for it. It's the most modded game of all time. Like, if you, if there's anything you could possibly desire out of Minecraft, there's a mod for it. You want new bosses, new dungeons, new, new dimensions, new items, you know, anything. There's mods. You could, you would never run out of, of modded content for that. And a lot of it is really good. It's insane. What are you complaining about? I don't understand. And, like, games that actually do this suck, right? Like, Valorant adds a new agent every month that completely fucks with the meta. Like, that's why I don't want to... Well, other than the fact that it installs a rootkit on your computer, that's another big reason I don't want to play Valorant. Like, the fucking agent meta is stupid. All of these, you know... MOBAs and hero shooters and whatever that do this, it's just so annoying. The game, like, TF2 does it right, you know, and CSGO does it right. Valve, as usual, does it right, but by just, like, they never added any new classes to TF2, you know, they don't, they're, they're not going to add new, new items anytime soon, but, you know, for a while, they just added new items occasionally that very slightly change up the meta. That's what it should be. Or CSGO, you don't get new fucking weapons, you don't get new new agents, you don't get, you know, new 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 characters. But you get a new map. That's what you get. You get one new map. Like, that's how it should be. It gives people actually time to figure out the meta and perfect stuff. Like, I definitely have a thousand hours on DE Nuke, right? Like, exclusively in CSGO. You don't have to fucking change stuff up that, that often. Like, I'm, I, I don't understand. What do you want? <laughs> Like, if you do, you can't simultaneously want the game to be good and serious and competitive, because that's what a lot of people want. Spe- weirdly out of Minecraft, they want that. But, you know, I'm talking about the sh- these FPSs and, and MOBAs and stuff, where they add new new characters every 10 seconds. Like, you can't want the game to be competitive and serious and whatever, and also for the everything to be constantly changing all the time. I think Rocket League does this right as well. I don't, I don't think Rocket League has made any major changes to the game since it came out, because it's already good. I've never played it, but everything I've seen about it makes me makes it look like a really good game and a really good eSport. You know, fucking gamers are weird. I don't understand you people. I don't understand gamers. You know one of the great things about Dusk? One of the many reasons why Dusk is an amazing game is the they always... Like, when you're playing Doom, you'll just run out of ammo, right? 
which is annoying. There were many annoying things about Doom. I used to, like, LARP as if it was the best game ever, having never even played more than the first chapter. And But I've gone back to it since then, and, like... Look, it's a very flawed game, but it's also amazing for what it is, okay? Let's let's not kid ourselves. Doom is a good game, but it also has a lot of problems. Um, but Dusk, the thing about Dusk is, it. I don't know if there's some sort of Half-Life style director going on behind the scenes. I imagine there might be. I don't know. But somehow, you always have the amount of ammo that makes you feel like you have to conserve ammo and be kind of careful, but never enough to where you actually run out. Like, sometimes you'll run out of ammo for a specific weapon. It's not even that unusual. And I I don't know how much... Like, there's a particular level in the game, which I don't know what it was called, but it was a kind of a city, and there was a big underwater section with a well, kind of a little town in a cave, and there was a big underwater section with a well. Was it in a cave? It felt like it was in a cave. It was a big underwater section with a well. That's what I remember. It was like wet dry world because you change the water level. In wet dry world level, see, I don't know how much of this was me fucking up, but like I never had enough ammo in that level. But yet I always actually had enough ammo. Like it always felt like, oh shit, if I fucking off this fight, I'm going to completely be out of ammo. But I'd always like just about scrape by and manage to the next ammo pack. But it always felt like it was just by the skin of my teeth. I don't know if I'm just good, or if, but I think more likely the game is just very well designed with like the way the places the ammo pickups are. Like the fact that you're always like just on the edge of having enough ammo, and even if you have full ammo for one weapon, like that is one bad fight away from having no longer full ammo on one weapon. You know, um, but yeah. Fuck, what was I? I was going somewhere. I lost my train of thought completely. I was going somewhere with this. It encourages exploration. Like, there's a good... It, it's It's got a good way of making you, after every enemy encounter, walk around all the rooms and make sure you've collected all the ammo packs because you're like, fuck, I really don't want to run out of ammo. And then you get the really nice rhythm of the game where you go from, like, intense fight to, uh, you know, exploration with no enemies around to build up and then to super intense fight, and so and then the loop repeats, which is the really satisfying loop. And exploring the environments is very fun, because they're all great. Uh, so yeah, shouts out to fucking the guy that made Dusk, because that is pulled off extremely well in that game. The, the ammo, the ammunition and resources, yeah. Well, I'm back in London, by myself, all alone. Waiting for some Chinese food to arrive. Because obviously, I've been away for three months. And so, there's nothing in my fridge. And I could go to the shops and buy some stuff. But I've been traveling all day. And although I ate while I was traveling. You know what's actually really funny? You come out of Gatwick. Which is one of the many airports surrounding London. You come out of Gatwick and literally, like, I know the word literally means figuratively, but not in that sense. In the normal sense, (laughs) literally, the first thing you see is a Greg's. It's a Greg's that says, welcome to London, (laughs) or something on it. And I've never been happier to see a Greg's, because I was so fucking hungry when I arrived. But I didn't get much, um, because I was planning to do this. Which I was thinking, look, I don't, I have a couple of volumes here. I have nothing to eat, so I need to buy food. I don't want to cook, so I'm not going to buy food from the shops. But I'm going to buy food from the shops tomorrow um, to tide me over for the next, like, two days while I do an online shop to buy lots of food to tide me over for, like, you know, a week. And then, boom, we're back into the swing of normal food things. Okay, so that's the thing, right? That's the situation. But I'm like, okay, I don't know when I'm going to fall asleep. I don't know when I'm going to wake up. It's possible that I wake up super early tomorrow, like 3 a.m. or something, and then I just have no food. So I should order takeout. That is the best kind of takeout that I can order too much of to put some in the fridge to have for breakfast. And as far as I'm concerned, the two best cold 
takeout breakfast foods are pizza and Chinese. And believe it or not, I'm actually not in the mood for pizza right now. I don't know why. I ate quite a lot of pizza when I was in Estonia. Because there's this frozen pizza brand that they, I found over there that's just so good. Um, and then there's also a pizza place near Dotsmites that does, like, these massive fucking pizzas that will feed you for, like, a day and a half. So between... Uh, but they suck. <laughs> Dotsmite doesn't seem to know or care about the fact that they suck. Like, Dots is very not food-pilled. I'm going to leave my complaining about Estonia until I'm a little more energized so I can go on a passionate rant and it'll be fun. Um, Because I tried... I spent a lot more time there this time. And I tried to pay attention to the... I don't know. I have stuff to say about Estonia, man. But anyway, I ate quite a lot of pizza. Um, Just a lot of bread. Just a lot of bread in general. You know... Yeah. So I'm I'm not doing pizza. I'm doing Chinese. Also, when I got back... My fucking smoke alarms were beeping. So I guess they ran out of battery or something. Do I have to replace the whole alarms? Or do I just have to replace the batteries? Because I just took them down and took the batteries out. And I just, I'm just going to roll the dice that I don't die in a fire tonight. But then it's like... I know, I have to look this up. When the smoke alarm's beeping, do I have to just replace the battery? Because I feel like I remember... They beeped before, and I replaced the battery, and they didn't stop beeping. But I might be wrong about this. Maybe I need to check. I need to do some Googling. But man, have I missed my fucking ThinkPad. And it's been so long that it's signed me out of everything, which is a good security measure, I suppose. But that's the thing. I intend... I'm too fucking tired from traveling all day to do anything today, obviously. But I intend to become a human content machine. Because I have so many video ideas that I've just been waiting to be back in London alone in my room to blast through. Like, you know what? I'm I'm not going to tell you because if I tell you, I'll never do it. Okay, I'm not going to tell you. But you will have seen them because they will all come out before this. At least most of them will. Man, I've missed my anime girl posters so much. They make me so happy. This is such... This is maybe the best money I've ever spent on anything is these fucking posts. They're such high quality... I've made great choices with all of them. They're brilliant. The only problem with it is that they don't fill up the whole wall. That I still have gaps. So I guess I need to start working on filling in those gaps. I think a lucky star poster would be really nice. A lucky star poster, definitely. Yeah, anime posters. And I miss my ThinkPad. I missed my animes, I miss my ThinkPad. I missed my desktop having actual fucking mouse base. Don't smite has the tiniest mousepad in the known universe and plays like games on the highest sensitivity I've ever heard anyone use. Like, I've never seen anyone use sensitivity as high as Dots does. It's insane. I don't know how they play Sniper in TF2 at that high of a sense. It's it's actually insane. But, yeah... It's gonna. I'm gonna suck at TF2 for a while because I'm gonna be readjusting to actually having mousepad space. But hopefully... Once I do readjust, I'll be hitting pipes like fucking crazy. It'll be like Goku when he takes off his weights. When he takes off his training weights. But for now, I'm just waiting for this fucking Chinese food to arrive. So I can get some food in me. You know, I watched on the flight. I didn't... I kind of didn't plan ahead for the flight home very well, so I hadn't, like, downloaded stuff to watch, but it's not entirely my fault, like, there just hasn't been that much good, because, like, on the way here, or, sorry, on the way there, on the way to Estonia, there happened to be a new Library of Luterno, like, three-hour-long Northern Lion compilation video, and, like, a couple of other video essays that were long, so I downloaded those and, like, sort of alternated them on the the flight there. And I was fine, I was sick, and pot. But there hasn't really been... I mean, there was a long-ass Peloton Northern Lion compilation like a week ago or something, a bit more. But I already watched all that. So I didn't really have anything to like watch on the flight. I, I didn't really know what to do. I was just kind of panicking because I realized, like, oh shit, I don't have anything to watch on the flight. Um, so I just was like, shit, TV show. And I said to Dotsmite, like, TV show. And Dotsmite was like, there's this show called Billions, and it's terrible. But 
I've been watching it, and it's fun, even though it's a terrible show. So I just downloaded the first season of Billions, and I watched like the first two and a half episodes. It's a fucking garbage show. I don't think I find it as entertaining as Dotsmate finds it, because it's pretty fucking garbage. Um, but then I also, like, on the way there, I was like, I kind of want something to listen to, like, to just, like, listen to on my phone, in my headphones, while I'm, like, standing around waiting that doesn't require me to pull my laptop out. And I was just, like, didn't have time to think about anything, so I was just like, fuck it. And I downloaded, like, three episodes of the Decompression Chamber, which, if you know what that is, then you know what that is, and if you don't, then you don't. But I just listened back to the... And I've, I've re-listened to the entire Decompression Chamber, like, all of them, like, three times at this point. Um, but, yeah, I couldn't think of... I just, like, I need a podcast quick, and uh, that's what I came up with. And they're pretty comfy. I mean, they're basically just this, right? They're just what you're listening to right now, but not as good slash better with, with Guts music in the background. But you don't want to listen to the Guts theme for 12 hours straight. <sighs> okay. Next segment, I will probably, I don't know, fuck. Hello, guys. Man, I think I feel pretty bad, and I'm not entirely sure why. This is the, the situation that we're in, okay? So, I've, I've, it's the next day after I've arrived back home in London. Um, and I feel pretty fucked up, but, but I, I, I suppose it's a confluence of various factors. First factor... I ate weird as fuck yesterday because I woke up, I had a sandwich, and then the whole day I was just sort of purchasing little snacks wherever I could in between traveling. And those snacks were not very healthy or nutritious because I had I got KFC while I was waiting for the plane, and on the other end of the plane journey, I got a Greg's, and then when I got home, I ordered Chinese food, as you heard. And then this morning, I ate the leftover Chinese food, which is basically a lot of salt and carbs and chicken all day and nothing else. <laughs> uh, so no wonder I'm feeling a little fucked in the, the guts department. That's that's reason number one. Reason number two is I, I, have no, I think I slept weird. Like, I feel like I might have slept weird. I have no idea. I've completely lost track of time. Um... Yeah, I don't know, but I think I might have slept, like, too long. And then the third reason, and this one is more of a suspicion, is that normally, when I go, when you travel on a plane with a bunch of people, you're gonna get sick. You're gonna get sick, you're gonna get a cold, and I might have picked something up. But I might have already had a cold a little bit before I went on the plane, because I was kind of feeling a little nose blocked. But it might have gotten another cold, which might have weakened me... So I feel a bit fucked up. I've also just been dissociating really heavily, which is kind of rare, rare these days. I don't, you know, I used to dissociate very, a lot. I used to be a very dissociated kind of guy, and it kind of stopped for a while. Um, but I've been dissociating quite a lot, which is a bit of a strange experience. Bit of a strange experience. Been a while since I've been dissociating quite a lot, which is why I have sound a bit nuts right now. And uh, man, I want it. I have all these plans for stuff that I want to be human content machining. Also, I have to m- make sure I go to the shops in two hours. Uh, anyway, I have all these plans of videos I want to make. Um, one of them requires getting drunk, probably. Like, I think the video will be better, but more more importantly, I think I'll have more fun if I'm drunk while I do it. I'll just say what it is, because I'm pretty sure I'm going to at least attempt this is I want to make a laying around watching the entire Nanoha series. I'm not sure if I'm going to split it up into multiple parts, like one video per season, or if I'm going to try and do the entire thing in one video. But either way, uh, at the very least for season one of Nanoha, like that, see, that show is not very good, at least in my memory. And so like I kind of feel like it would be way better to get drunk and watch it and have some fun rather than just torturing myself. But if I'm sick, I can't get drunk, because then it will just make me sicker, and I don't like that. And being drunk when you're sick is not fun, it's just fucking, you know, terrible, it's just annoying, it makes you feel awful. So I have to wait and see if I'm sick or not, um, which means putting that off, but then right now I have no energy. I mean, maybe I just need a couple of days to recover or something from, from traveling all day. Maybe I shouldn't be surprised, um, 
but but yeah like i also want to make a, a like a denpa vlog kind of but then it's kind of like what's the point of a denpa vlog when i have this this podcast you know this podcast is kind of the denpa vlog of the these days but there's some stuff i want to do that i thought like would be more appropriate for a denpa vlog but then it's like how much stuff do i want to save like this is the question right it's like if i'm doing a vlog what do i want to save to say in the vlog versus what do i want to say here in this podcast um i don't know it's a good question it's a good question um i think what i want to do i don't know i think i'll talk about estonia stuff um in this podcast and maybe i'll retread over it a little bit in the vlog but uh so estonia um you know, here's the first thing that's good about Estonia. Other than the fact that my girlfriend lives there and I like being with my girlfriend, which is nice. But other than that fact, the first nice thing about Estonia is that they don't really have, like, summer <laughs> there. And I'm really not a big fan of summer. Right? Like, it's a really nice to be able to just speed run, skip summer. Like, I could just dip over there when it gets really hot in the UK and it doesn't, it's not hot and it's fine. That's a good thing. That's a positive. Um... The second nice thing is everything's really, like, it seems like it's sort of a high social cohesion country. Like, like things are generally clean. No one litters, you know? People are generally, like, I wouldn't say it's collectivistic. In fact, the opposite. Everyone's, like, it's kind of like a a Scandinavia vibe where everyone's, like, silent and looks kind of depressed and completely keeps themselves and keeps distance and doesn't want to talk to anyone. But, like, everyone mutually respects that that ideal. You know, every, everyone already agrees that no one else wants to talk to you and so on, right? Um, so that's nice. And uh, the city that I was in is, like, very nice. It's, t- it's tiny. It's fucking tiny, but it's it's nice. It's, it's pretty. It's got a lot of cool architecture. It's very walkable. You, you know, stuff's cool about that. Um... But this, you know, last time I was there, one of the things that I was trying to sort of comprehend is, like, what does it even mean for a country to be poor? Because Estonia is not a poor country. Like, it's it's the biggest economy in the Baltics, right? Like, it's it's not a poor country, but it's not, you know, an economic powerhouse like any of the major European countries, like, you know, the UK, Germany, and France, basically, uh... Like, in terms of European countries, it's it's an Eastern European country, you know? It's a relatively small economy, even though it's doing okay for itself. And I was trying to figure out, I tried to focus on, like, what does that actually mean? Like, what difference does it make to live in a slightly, you know, poorer country? Um, and I think there's there's some things that, you, that I noticed. So, like, first of all, a lot of the infrastructure that isn't new is, like, old Soviet infrastructure, and that stuff is just, like, kind of crumbling. Like, there's a, there's a lot of Soviet shit everywhere, um, and, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of it is, like, just looks run down. Like, the streets are very cracked. There, there are walls that are just sort of, like, you know, cracked. <laughs> there's a lot of... There's a, I wouldn't say there's a lot of graffiti. There's, like, a normal amount of graffiti that you would expect to see in a, in a place like that. Uh, but, like, a lot of the houses... This is something that really confuses me, right? So a lot of the houses are painted. They're, like, these houses that I suppose are probably, like, split up into multiple apartments, kind of like, you know, they do here in London, where it's, like, old houses that used to be built for middle-class people are now split up into multiple flats for normal people. I'm assuming that's the sort of situation that they have. I don't know. Um, But a lot of them have these, like, painted facades, right? Like, they're painted in these sort of... uh, earth tones i guess like they kind of look like the sort of colors that you see in minecraft like like colored clay i guess is it clay that's colored what what's the thing you know you know there's the biome the like red i haven't played minecraft in ages hold on what the fuck is it called minecraft clay colors is it is this what i'm thinking of yeah 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 like like the sort of the sort of muted muted colors uh hardened clay the sort of muted hardened clay minecraft colors right this is what most people paint there like the, all the houses are painted like this but the thing is that although like every house is painted in a color like this all of the paint is like chipping off on like every house there's always like big it looks very run down even though it's not like there's no damage to the actual you know structure of the house it's just the the, the paint layer on the outside 
but it's all chipping off, and it just makes me wonder, why do they bother? Like, why, why have your house be painted, and then not keep it, like, not upkeep it, or what advantage, like, it's such a weird thing, it, it just makes, the, it just makes everything look run down, even though it's not, just because, like, who's gonna, it, obviously, it's a massive fucking effort to repaint the entire outside of your house, or e- even to just repaint a segment, it's like, when are you gonna get around to doing that, I understand why, why it's like, why it's like that, but it, again, it just makes you think, like, why bother, <laughs> it's just, a, it's, I know, it's just kind of weird, and there is, like, some level of, like, like, chips, chips out out of the concrete and stuff which is a little weird i don't know it just looks a little worse it's just like you know the the pavements they're a little more cracked they're a little more fucked up for lack of a better word um so that's one thing i noticed just the general built environment outside of the city center which by the way is like a five minute walk from the city center because it's a tiny fucking place it's like a gta map everything's just condensed you walk you walk five minutes from the center of the city and you're in the suburbs and you walk five minutes from the suburbs and you're in the countryside. Like, it's fucking crazy. Um, like, it feels like a real city. It's just compressed. Very strange. Um, but, so yeah, that's the one thing. Like, all of the, the, the built environment, just a little worse for wear. Just a little worse for wear. And the second thing is the food. Like, Estonia, this is the worst thing about the country, is that they just don't have good ingredients. Like, Everything is just a little worse. Uh, like, you go to buy vegetables, the vegetables are all, like, a little misshapen. They're a little more misshapen than you'd expect, right? Like, obviously, that's just how vegetables are. Like, it's it's not like... It, like in terms of the vegetables, this is this is not a really a taste problem so much as it is just an aesthetics problem. Like, you go to the store in, in the UK, and all the vegetables are, like, shockingly perfect, because that's what we've come to expect as consumers. But that's not how vegetables actually are when you grow them, right? Like, vegetables are fucking plants. They're irregular. They grow in weird ways, and sometimes they get a little, like, rotten in certain parts, but it doesn't actually... You just cut that bit off, and it's perfectly fine, you know? But in Estonia, they don't do that. I guess they can't afford to do that, or whatever. Like, they don't, they don't select for the perfectly shaped vegetables and you know they don't bother to throw away the stuff that's kind of you know a little off colored or whatever it's just all there like you can't really get vegetables that isn't a, isn't a little weird um which is definitely a difference uh i don't know if it's necessarily good or bad in terms of taste you know i was surprised i, I don't know what this is like the thing that really shocked me was the garlic this might sound weird, but, like, Eastern Europe, they love garlic, right? They, they're they supposed to love garlic. But the garlic sucked. It had no flavor. Like, it, and it was really dry. And I'm wondering if this is, like, a seasonality thing. Because I don't know shit about how fucking food grows, which is bad. I should know about this. It's bad that I don't know. But, like, when do you pick garlic? I don't know. But maybe this is, like, garlic that's been sitting around for six months or something. And that's why it's lost all... Because it looked a bit fucked, and it has lost all its flavor. Um... Like, maybe they just harvest the garlic once a year, and that that's when you get garlic, and if you don't get it then, then you just don't get it ever. But that was weird. That was a weird situation. I don't know. That, that was a little odd to me. Um, but then all the other food is just kind of generally bland and tasteless, to be honest. Like, it just doesn't... Like, there's a there's a wide selection. It's not like, like you go into the shops and there's nothing there. There's full full supermarkets, just like you'd expect to see anywhere, right? You know with a wide selection of foods, but most of it, I don't know how to explain, maybe it's just different palates, you know, the the local palate just selects for stuff that doesn't taste as intense, it just doesn't taste as, I don't know, it's just not as good, it's not as flavorful, it doesn't taste as fresh, it doesn't taste as, when the meat isn't as meaty, you, you know, it's just stuff like that, um, I don't know if this is a matter of the, 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 yeah, just the local palate, you know, a lot of, lot of sour cream. I'll tell you, the selection of dairy products way better than you can find in the UK. The dairy aisle, you know, in most London supermarkets is just sort of like milk and cheese and butter and that's it. Maybe some yogurt. And maybe recently you get one brand of kefir. Um, but in Estonia, the dairy aisle is fucking massive. And this it, it's separate from the cheese aisle. And it's just like all kinds of cr- milks. You know, with you can buy raw milk in the supermarket, and not just one kind. Like you can buy like raw milk from various different farms. You can buy, you know, obviously different brands of milk. But then they've also got like, you know, your cream, and then your sour, big loads of sour cream. They love sour cream over there. Why wouldn't they? 
it's good food. But yeah, they love sour cream. Loads of different sour creams. And then loads of different kefirs as well. Like, yeah, lots of lots of dairy. Lots of dairy. Which is cool, I guess. Um, but then the butter selection was way smaller. Like, they basically just have, like, a couple of brands of butter that are, you know... Whereas here, lots more different variations in butter. I don't know what that's about, but that's interesting. Now, I'm not saying this is the case across the whole country. This is just in the, like you know, a couple of grocery stores that we went to, so it's not like I have a... I'm just I'm just assuming that this is what... This is, like, a, a generalizable view of what Estonia is like. But, yeah, the cheeses, I mean, the, it, it was less good, to be honest with you. Like, it, they had the, the cheeses that you would find in a cheap supermarket, like a little or an Aldi, rather than... Yeah, but this was not a cheap supermarket. This was just a normal, bog-standard one. Like, the... I don't know. It wasn't particularly worse. And there's also this Estonian cheese, which is like some weird Soviet invention that's like artificially sped up fermentation, like chemically fermented cheese. And it, I'm kind of amazed that this shit hasn't made it out of Estonia because while it doesn't taste very good, it's basically just a better version of American cheese in terms of like it melts really well and it tastes like slightly better. And it's super cheap. It's like ridiculously cheap. It doesn't taste really of much. It's good in sandwiches, and it's good in a grilled cheese. Uh, it's probably good in a mac and cheese sauce, although I didn't make one, but I would imagine it would be good in a mac and cheese kind of situation. Uh, but the Estonian cheese is a weird fucking thing, but it's so cheap that it's like, why not, why not buy it, you know? Uh, yeah, so those are sort of the two main things I noticed, really. I mean, I don't go outside much, so I obviously didn't see much, but, like, Estonia has really good internet, like, very fast internet connection, but that's not typical of Eastern Europe, as you would imagine. Uh, uh, but, the, yeah, kind of famously has a very good internet connection. Uh, yeah, so those are sort of the two main things I noticed, is uh, everything's cheaper, obviously, but it's not, like, that much cheaper. It's cheaper, but it's not insane. Um, I, I guess another thing, and this was more of a something I pointed out the first time or noticed the first time I went, was, like, how much people still use wood fire, like, fireplaces. Like, everyone has firewood in the back, like, at a big shed in the back of their house. Like, you go walk through the neighborhoods, every single house has, like, or all of the apartments, they have rows and rows of these wooden sheds behind them that are just stock full of firewood. Um, everyone, everyone has a chimney. Like, you go outside, once it started getting colder, every time I would go out to walk the dog, I would smell burning, like, of, of fires, which is n- not something I'm used to at all. And honestly, not very pleasant. Kind of smoke in the air, you know, not super fun to breathe in. Uh, and another thing, here's another thing. Uh, I'm pretty sure that they're way into smoking meats, or at least have historically been way more into smoked meats than than we are. Which makes sense if you got to preserve your meats or whatever. Um, but you can find, like, lots and lots of smoked, smoked meats, uh, and smoked sausages. But the strange thing, and this is a flavor profile that doesn't really exist here, and I haven't, like, su- I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but it's, it's not very common, but it's very common in Estonia, is smoked chicken. That, like, you don't really get smoked chicken very often, other than, like, your, your occasional barbecue chicken type, type of deal, Right? Which I guess is like kind of smoky, or, or your jerk chicken, which is just Jamaican barbecue chicken, basically. Um, but but there, like any savory thing that comes in a variety of flavors, comes in a smoked chicken flavor. Like smoked chicken is super popular in Estonia, which is I'm not saying it's bad. Like it tastes fine. It tastes like smoked chicken. It tastes like what you'd expect. But I'm I, it's just surprising. Like there's way more of it. Like, as a flavor, there. Like, it's much it's much more common. You wouldn't expect, or at least I wasn't ex- It's not normally something I would expect to find just super, super ev- everywhere, you know, other than, in like, in a barbecue context. But this isn't... We're talking, like, not in a barbecue context. Like, it, like everywhere, there's just smoked chicken. You go, you go to order a, a sandwich. Oh, this is another thing about the food. Like, the restaurants... Like, I, I tried to make an effort to, like, understand... Uh, I, I wanted to try some 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 more of the the restaurants, so I ordered delivery like a few times and tried a few different restaurants. And 
again, they're just not as good. Like, I may, I'm spoiled by London, which has some of the best restaurants in the world, of course. But, like, yeah, they're just just nowhere near as good. Um, I don't... There's nothing else to say. Like, the food just doesn't taste as good. There's, there's not really anything else to it. Uh, <clears throat> there's one more thing, which is there's a company called Bolt. Now, Bolt exists in the UK. Uh, they're kind of like an Uber-type company, ride-sharing company. But in Estonia, Bolt is everything because it's an estonian company bolt is like they have like a monopoly on everything they have like if you're ordering food you get bolt delivery the all of the rental scooters that are everywhere like the electric rental scooters all bolt if you want to get a ride you know it's obviously bolt you don't have any other option it's just bolt and you see these bolt cars fucking everywhere like and they have electric bikes as well everywhere bolt and the, the Bolt electric scooters are super common. Like, they're fucking every... You, you walk down any street in the entire city, and there's Bolt scooters everywhere. Like, these things... And they're fun. We, we got on a couple. Um, they are fun to ride on. And, you know, reasonably practical, I suppose, since they're cheap. Uh, but, like, it's crazy how everywhere they were. Like, any time you're walking anywhere, you're going to be passing some, and at some point you're just going to think to yourself, like, wouldn't it be easier if I just, like, pick this up and just you know, unlocked it with my phone and rode there. I didn't do that very often. I think I only rode on them like three or four times. But they are fun. They're very fast. And uh, they're f- it's crazy how everywhere they are. Uh, and they never get in the way. Like, I know a lot of people, like, in America, like, I think in San Francisco, there was a lot of, like, these scooters everywhere that were causing problems. But they they don't cause any problems. Like, no one's ever, like, riding dangerously or clogging up. Like, for as, for as common as they are, Again, like, it's, I think it's a sort of high social cohesion society. So, like, everyone puts them away in, like, a very out-of-the-way place where it's, like, I, I don't know. No one, no one's, it was never bothering. There was never any moment when it, when it was bothering. Um, so that's, I think that's basically my take on the, the country. Uh, at least what little of it I've, I saw. Uh, but in terms of, it, oh, it also gets, the weather is, like, after it's summer, the weather is terrible. <laughs> like, I know a lot of people shit on... It's it's crazy that British food is the fucking laughing stock of, of the internet when, like, all of the even more further northern Europe places exist and eastern Europe. Like, have you seen what they fucking eat in Finland? Have you seen what they eat in Finland? Have, it's crazy. Like, they for some reason, they're like, oh, British food bad, and then you show them examples of British food, and it's like, everything is just... Something roasted and then some pastry or potatoes or something. And it's like, yeah, I guess it might get a little samey if that's all you ate. But that's because those are like the fancy meals. It's sort of like, I don't really know how to explain the, the social context of that. But, there's, you know, there's some bad British food. But generally speaking, I think the hate is like just a meme. It's it's just like massively overblown for the sake of, I guess, some people find that funny. But it's not actually, like the food is not actually bad here. But if you go up to the Nordic countries, and I know, like, Norway has really good restaurants, at least, so that's what I've heard, but, like, and, I don't know, man, they eat fucking dog shit up there. And then Eastern Europe as well, like, everything is just, like, miserable, because it's so cold and nothing grows. It's just, like, fucking cabbage, every single meal is, like, fucking cabbage with cream cheese, <laughs> no cream cheese, sour cream. Everything is fucking cabbage and sour cream, it's insane, and no one shits on them for it. Like, come on, we gotta get more on the fucking shit it gone. Is it because they're poor countries? So it's like, oh, it's a, you know, Britain, rich country, has bad food, but these are poor countries with bad food. But they're not even, I don't know, they're not that poor. They're fine. Oh, uh, whatever. That's, that's something. But the other thing is this dog. Okay. So while I was staying there, there was this dog staying with us. It's not actually Dodesmite's dog, but uh, they were looking after it. And this fucking dog, okay, so first of all, this dog is incredibly cute. It's a small dog, but not, like, ridiculously small. Not like Chihuahua small. I don't know the breed it is, but small and incredibly cute, okay? Just ridiculously cute. Like, let's just get that out of the way. But secondly, this dog is absolutely fucking retarded. And not just in a meme sense, like, this is a pure breed dog, so it is like, ridiculously inbred, and just 
absolutely fucking retarded. <laughs> like, just consistently retarded. And this has, like, really convinced me. Like, you know, at first, I loved this dog. But as the months went by, I slowly grew to hate this fucking dog. Because it's so annoying. It just constantly whining. Constantly whining all the time and demanding attention. Just fucking all the- And I'm just like, I might be asleep. It'll just go up to me and start fucking getting right up in my face and just whining and waking me up. And or like, I'm trying to fucking play TF2. It's fucking standing next to me and just whining. It's like an alarm that just constantly going off. And it's the most annoying noise just fucking ever. So annoying. Holy shit, I just saw that there is a gigantic fucking spider in my room. That's a little terrifying. I should kill that spider at some point. I don't like spiders. I know it's not going to hurt me, but they're scary, and I don't like them. Uh, okay, i got to figure out a way. How am I going to kill that spider? Um, well, I'll figure that out. Um, anyway, this dog, I still want to say, very cute, but very annoying. And then having to walk a dog twice a day is also very annoying Uh, like it just gets in the way of you're just busy doing something it's like oh dog needs to get walked and this is the thing right is that like you would expect that having to walk for like half an hour every day would make me feel better doing half an hour of exercise every day would improve my mental health or something but it fucking didn't it made no difference like i i had felt no different at all I don't understand what all of the fuss is about. It, may, it didn't make any difference. I, there's nothing else to say about it. It was just kind of boring. And you got to pick up his his shit every time he shits. Like, I don't know, man. This shit's annoying. And dogs, you know, they're, they're walking around and they're sniffing things all the time. And it's fine. Like, I get it. Like, that's just, just what they do. And it's fine if you're you're down to do that. But, like, man, I just don't want to fucking... I, this is confirmed to me that I, I don't think I ever want a dog. I don't think I ever want a dog. Because I don't want to walk a dog twice a day. And I don't want to listen to it fucking whining constantly. Oh, it's moving. Oh, shit, the spider's fucking moving. This is fucking terrifying. Okay, I gotta fucking deal with the spider. I gotta kill it somehow. Because this is... I do not like, I do not like this one bit. I do not like the fact that it's moving. And it's moving fast. It's fucking doing something. What's he doing? I gotta fucking, how, I can't even, he's in a weird place, like, I can't squash him, and he's in a little corner, I, I don't know how I'm gonna fucking kill this guy, and if he's, if I fucking get at him, and he starts running at me, I'm gonna fucking die, okay, I gotta figure something out, I just fucking sprayed it with bleach, <laughs> so, it's gonna dissolve now, okay, that, I think that's pretty much everything I have to say about Estonia, weird place, so no- Nocto H says, The eternal struggle of always being like an entire 12-hour podcast behind, so by the time I actually have something to say, it's already old news or someone else has already commented about it. That being said, don't stop. The human content machine must continue. Uh, well, yes. The human content machine must indeed continue. Um, as far as I'm concerned, this is a good problem to have, right? You, At least in my experience as a stinky neat... You always want more content than you have. You always want more shit than is available. So having too much shit, I think, is a good problem to have. And uh, Simon Plays Gamaze says, love to see it. Well, I'm glad that you love to see it. Uh, that's all. You know, I got one more thing to say about Estonia. Um, I hope those might won't mind me saying this. Um, so the difference between Estonia and the and, and London is in Estonia, there are just like beautiful women everywhere like aryan goddesses okay you know they got the blonde hair the blue eyes no one's fat there's some fat people but there's very few you know like fucking people they if you saw them and um, and they were a model it wouldn't be like that's a weird person who would be a model you know it you know what i mean like it's just incredibly attractive women everywhere and yet they and they all dress like shit <laughs> right like all wearing like, clothes that you would find at a cheap sports goods store, or something like this, right? Whereas London is full of incredibly ugly people who are super (laughs) well-dressed, like, wearing super expensive clothes. You can tell they've coordinated their outfits, they've got designer brands. That's the difference. That's the, the fundamental difference. Estonia full of beautiful people, 
who dress like shit. London full of ugly people who are incredibly well dressed. So I'm watching this show Magicano and uh, they had a uh, a fake infomercial in the episode and the the infomercial like the company in the infomercials line their slogan was Omaiwa mo kateiru which is very funny. I, I I like that joke. It's a good reference. It's a good good joke. Uh, for those uh, not in the Japanese, kateiru means bought it. You've already pu- purchased. So it's like, or, so it's like, there's a play on a famous line from the anime and manga Hokoto no Ken, where the main guy says, Omae wa mo shindeiru, you're already dead. But it's, Omae wa mo kateiru, you've already bought it. Which is very funny. Look, I have a feeling I've done this before, but I am way more confident now than I used to be, and so I'm just going to do it again, because it's, co- it's kind of potent. We're going to do a fast food tier list. Now, this is the UK chain restaurants and fast food outlets tier list on Tier Maker, because um, I have opinions, and also I'm going to have to cut this, like, soon, because uh, my dad's going to call me halfway through, but... Okay, first off, straight away, two things I've never heard of. Beef Eater, never heard of. And Brewer's Fair, never heard of. I assume these are things that don't exist in London, because I, I, I would have seen them. Okay, Burger King. Here's a hot take, instantly off the bat. Burger King is, like, very slightly better than McDonald's. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But th- here's the reason. Simply, I don't know... Uh, I believe I, I like the chicken burgers at Burger King better than the chicken burgers at McDonald's. I don't know why, I just do. Uh, so I'm gonna put it. It's not great, but I'm gonna put it at average meal, right? I wouldn't like voluntarily go to a Burger King unless I was drunk and nothing else was open. But I'm I'm not against a Burger King in any way. I also think I prefer the buns at Burger King to McDonald's. Because obviously, Burger King, you got to compare it to McDonald's. Like, like the, those are the two closest. Uh, then there's... I don't know what that is. Uh, what the fuck? I don't know what that is either. Okay, Domino's Pizza. Now look, I like Domino's. I voluntarily eat Domino's. The problem is, there's many, many good independent, you know, pizza places near me that deliver. So there's not really any reason for me to get Domino's. Uh, because there's, like, three or four different, like, great wood-fire oven Italian proper pizza places near me, uh, that are, that are way better and, and cheaper. Like, that's the fucked up thing, is a Domino's is more expensive for worse pizza. But, it's still good, and I do get it occasionally. Um, it's not great, but it's good in a, like, fucked up way. It's, you know what? It's very good when you're stoned. So, just for stoned, I'm going to put it in Good Eats, but it's going to be right at the bottom of Good Eats, okay? Other things are going to be ahead of it, because it's 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 not really that good, but if you're stoned, it's amazing. we got Five Guys. Now, personally, I used to be a massive Five Guys evangelist, okay? I used to be, like, the biggest Five Guys evangelist. Um, when Five Guys first came to the UK... It was amazing. Obviously, the fries are the best in the goddamn business, okay? Fries are the best in the business. Here's another thing. The hot dog is slapped on. I'm telling you, the hot dog is slapped on. And the burgers are great. There's really not very much to complain about when it comes to Five Guys. However, as I've had more Five Guys in my life, it's the novelty has worn off. And it's so expensive, for what you get. It's so expensive that I find it really hard to justify ever buying it. Uh, but but if we're... I'm, I'm not going to talk about price here. Because we're just talking about food quality. In terms of price, I think this might be... Uh, this might go in the best of the best. Which is the, the S tier. The highest tier on this list. Okay. Uh, what is this? What the fuck is this? Frankie and Benny. Never heard of this. Hold on. Okay, Gourmet Burger Kitchen. Now listen, I've only been to Gourmet Burger Kitchen once. But, I mean, from the name, you can tell what it is. It's kind of a... It's an upscale chain burger restaurant. Now there's another upscale chain burger restaurant that they haven't put on this list. That's way better. Called Byron. Now Byron fucking pogs. Okay? Gourmet Burger Kitchen. Whack! 
I'm putting it in bland or usually disappointing food. I can't say usually because I've only been there once. But I remember when I went there, I was incredibly fucking hungry in the middle of central London with a friend, right? And we were, we were, we'd both been, like, walking all day, and we were super hungry. And we were just like, we gotta go to the first fucking place we find. And I was so hype, because I was like, I'm so hungry, and this is a gourmet burger. Okay, hold on, my dad's calling me, so... Alright, sorry for the interruption. So, gourmet burger kitchen, is that what we're at? Hold on, let me check. Yeah, but gourmet burger kitchen, listen, the thing is, the burger's tasteless. Completely tasteless. There's no beefy flavor. Like, that's the the thing you want out of a gourmet burger, is a strong, beefy flavor. No, none, none beef, <laughs> none beef flavor. It was whack, to be honest. It was incredibly disappointing. The sauce was not on it, and the beefy flavor of the burger patties, they didn't taste of anything. They tasted very, like, nothing. Um, so I'm putting that in bland or usually disappointing food. Okay, next up, next up is Greg's. Greg's is S tier. Greg's might be the top of S tier. The best, the best of the best, frankly. I fucking love Greg's. I'm a huge Greg's fan. Pretty much everything they have is amazing. Obviously, they have the uh, all of the pastries, right? The 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 bakes, as they call it, right? You got the steak bake, you got the chicken bake. Those are the two classics. Those are the two classics. Um, and they're both great. Then there's the cheese and onion bake, which is also good. It's a bit much. It's a bit very cheesy. But it's actually good as fuck. I've had it on many occasions. All three of those, those are like the core items. This is like the cheeseburger of of, uh, of Greg's, right? It's like the core item of Greg's are those bakes. And they're fucking great. Like, the only problem with them is that they're too hot. Like, that is literally the only problem. Is when you get them, sometimes they're fresh out of the oven and they're too damn hot and they burn your mouth. But that's a much better problem than them being too cold. But honestly, I've had them cold as well, and they taste good cold, especially the chicken one. The sauce, this might sound gross, but the, the, the creamy sauce in the chicken bake, when it gets cold, kind of coagulates, but in a good way. I don't know how to explain it. It thickens up. It's very nice. But then underrated Greg's... Okay, so then there's the sausage roll. Now, the sausage roll is massively overrated Greg's item. It's not, a, it's not particularly good, uh, the sausage roll. Ev- everyone understands this fact. The sausage roll is cheap, and it's not particularly good, and it's not particularly filling, but it's kind of... I imagine this is what people who like McDonald's feel about McDonald's. I would normally not get a Greg's sausage roll because there's better things at Greg's. But it's a good thing to get with something else, right? Like, you get a chicken bake and a sausage roll. Because neither of them is really quite enough to fill you up on its own. But a chicken bake and a sausage roll, that's a good size portion. And I, and there's something about the sausage roll, the meat and the grease and the fat... That just works. It's not good. Like I wouldn't eat it on its own. If you know, but if but it it's it's kind of an an icon, which I imagine is how people feel about McDonald's. Like even though it doesn't taste good, there's something about it. Um, you know, I I'm not gonna spend too long hyping up the Greg sausage roll because I'm not saying like I love it or anything. I I don't, normally don't get it, so you know I don't think it's that great. But I'll tell you what is actually great from Greg's, and under I think it's underrated, because it's not normally something that people say when they talk about Greg's, as they also have a selection of sandwiches, and some of those sandwiches are really fucking good. Like, actually, my favorite Greg's item isn't a bake at all. It's the Southern Fried Chicken sandwich that they have. That shit is great. That's my go-to Greg's. It's actually so good. The bread... It's a lot of bread, but the bread is really good, and the chicken is super flavorful. Whatever, like, sweet s- sauce they have on it, barbecue sauce, it's so good. It's seven barbecue chicken, not seven fried chicken. But, yeah, that, that fucking sandwich is great. So, honestly, Greg's is S-tier. Absolutely S-tier. I love Ian and Greg's. Um, next up, KFC. K- KFC, listen, here's the thing I don't understand. Why, wh- where's all the hate from, on KFC come from? Like, I'm serious. I hear Americans constantly shit-talking KFC, and I just don't understand it. Is it because, like, you guys have Wendy's and Popeye's and stuff? Is is that stuff... Sorry, not Wendy's. What's the one I'm thinking of? The homophobic one. You know the one I'm talking about. Is it because you guys have, like, significantly better fried chicken chains, and so, like, on the sliding scale of fried chicken... KFC is there's no reason to ever go f- to it because you already have Popeyes and the homophobic one Chick Fil A Chick Fil A uh, is it is that the reason? Because as far as I'm concerned, KFC is good. 
Like, what's the problem with KFC? The chicken is juicy and flavorful. It's not always the best, but it's generally pretty good. You know, it's pretty cost effective. Like, seriously, what's the problem? The breading is nice and it's crunchy, textured. Like, I don't understand. Why does anyone, like, what's not to like about fried chicken? Like, it's hard to fuck up fried chicken, and KFC is consistent. It's not amazing, but I'm putting it in good eats, above Domino's. I like a KFC. I'm actually a big fan of KFC. I'll, occasionally, I'll get a whole bucket and eat the whole damn thing over the course of a day. It doesn't taste very good once you put chicken, fried chicken in the fridge for half a day and eat it cold. It doesn't taste very good, but I do it anyway, because I sometimes feel an urge to do that. I don't understand the complaints about KFC, I'm being honest. Like, what's the... I, I legitimately don't understand the problem. It's good as fuck. Okay, now for McDonald's. Now, the thing about McDonald's is it whack. It's whack. It's actually, frankly, whack. I don't understand any of the hype around McDonald's. Why would anyone ever go there? It doesn't make any sense. I'm going to put it, frankly, you know, I've had McDonald's. There's the, okay, there's a couple things that are on the McDonald's menu that are good. Okay, I like the McChicken. And I like the fillet of fish. And I like the fries. Okay, the McChicken is decent. Okay, it's not amazing. It's, it's, it's like if you have no other option and you want a chicken sandwich, it's there. Okay, and the fillet of fish is probably the best item on the menu. And even that is not that great. Right? Like, it's not that good. And all of their burgers, the meat burgers, are so bad. Like, they're actually garbage. And at this point, you know, at first, I, when I grew up, I was not allowed to eat McDonald's. My parents never let me go to McDonald's. Good on them, right? They never let me eat fast food, uh, and especially not McDonald's, right? Um, but, so, you know, I only got into McDonald's as a teenager once I started going out myself, right? I only started eating McDonald's then. And I've been slowly exploring the menu and trying to understand the cultural position of McDonald's since then. And at this point, I'm confident enough to say, it's whack. There's no reason to ever get it. And here's the bigger thing. Out of all of these restaurants, McDonald's makes you feel the worst. Like, every time I eat McDonald's, I take poison damage. Like, I legitimately feel fucking awful when I've finished eating. It's terrible. Like, this is the number one reason, really, why I avoid McDonald's is that even if, even though the food is like generally speaking just bland, like it's not disgusting most of the time, it just makes like I I start to feel really bad. Like I I legitimately feel like I've been poisoned after I eat it, which means there's I just don't ever eat it. Especially you know generally speaking the 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 beef burgers. When I eat the chicken and fish, it doesn't give me that feeling, which is why I've gravitated towards it. But also because they just taste better. Like the 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 beef burgers and mcdonald's you get this fucking paper thin patty with no text it legitimately i know this is like an overused phrase but it legitimately has the texture of wet cardboard and the taste of it too like i don't understand why anyone would ever go to mcdonald's or why that place is so successful it doesn't make any sense the the chicken nuggets are pretty good okay you know what i'll give them chicken nuggets in terms of chicken they're fine I, look it's the chicken and the fish the fillet of fish and the coffee that keeps this out of disgusting without fail. So I'm putting it in the bottom of bland or usually disappointing. And the reason is because it's so hyped and it's everywhere. Like if this was a, a restaurant, you know, or a, a, a place where you, you saw like one, you know, sometimes, it will be okay because it's like, okay, well, that's the shitty place that no one goes to, so they're not successful. But the fact that it's literally the most successful restaurant franchise in the world is baffling to me because it's fucking garbage. <laughs> um... Okay, next up is Nando's. Now, I'm putting Nando's in Good Eats, um, slightly above Domino's. Nando's is a British institution. There was a meme about cheeky Nando's a few years ago. Uh, and frankly, there's nothing to complain about. It's good. You go to Nando's, you always get something good. It's a little, it's, it's like a tiny bit expensive, but it's not actually expensive. Like, it's good. The well, service is generally good. It's a sit-down restaurant. You know, most of these other places are fast food places, but, uh, no, I, I'm a fan of that. Honestly, I don't have that much else to say about it. Lots of f flavor combinations that are really good. If you ever get a chance, it, I don't want to hype it up too much. Like, it's not amazing or anything. But it's very reliable, and it's got a good atmosphere. It's, and, it's, and they're, you know, they're everywhere. It's good. It's a very reliable staple. Well, Papa John's. I'm putting Papa John's in average. You know, I, it's not great pizza. It's not great. It's, um, it's slightly worse than Domino's and slightly more expensive. So there's just not really any reason to get it. Like, that's pretty much the, the extent of it. Uh, Pizza Express. I used to go to Pizza Express, like, 
all the time as a kid, constantly as a kid. It was like number one childhood restaurant, Pizza Express. And so I have a lot of nostalgia associated with it. And when I very, very occasionally order a Pizza Express pizza, very, very rarely do so, I get a nice hit of childhood nostalgia. But I very rarely do it, not because the pizzas are bad. There's, the pizzas are fine, but they're expensive. I know I kind of said I wouldn't put price as a part of this, but like, to be honest, you can't really ignore it that much. Like, there's, the pizzas are small for what you get. Like, that's frankly the end or be all. They taste fine. Like, there's nothing wrong with it. They're very flat in terms of flavor. They're very flat, but in kind of a comforting way. You know, there's nothing super adventurous going on in terms of the pizza flavors, but that's nice. You know, a lot of the American style pizza places like Burger King and Papa John's, they're like maximum amounts of meat and grease and cheese and everything. Maximum fucking gluttony at you. Pizza Express, complete opposite. They're like very held back on terms of flavor. They're like, you get a little subtle hint of meat here. You get the nice cheesiness here and that's it. Right, so I gotta appreciate it for that. But, you know, the fact that it costs as much as it does and you get so little in terms of, you know, size of a pizza, um, it's just not worth it. So I'm putting it in average meal above Papa John's uh, and maybe, is it better than Burger King? It's better than Burger King. I'm putting it above Burger King. Um, Okay. Now, Pizza Hut's a tricky one because I've only had Pizza Hut like a couple of times in my life. So I don't know if I can really rank it. I'm gonna put it in, I'm just not gonna rank that one. Okay, Pret a manger. Uh, hmm. The thing about Pret, there's another situation where, where you can't talk about this. You cannot talk about Pret. Of all the places on this list, if there's one place where you cannot talk about it without talking about price, it's Pret. You you cannot talk about Pret a manger without bringing up the price. Okay, so Pret a manger. If you're not from the UK or somewhere where this exists, it's an it's a it's a, it's a very very it's like the epitome of a middle class chain restaurant. Oh, it's not a restaurant. It's like a cafe. Yeah, it's kind of like a Greg's, but not really a Greg's. I don't know how to explain it. It's just a cafe kind of situation. They have a lot of sandwiches, a lot of paninis, wraps, these sorts of things. Right? Um, and it's known for being an expensive version of something that you could get cheaper. Uh, now, I've had Pret quite a few times. Uh, not like that many, but I feel like I've tried enough of their menu that I can say is not worth the price. If you have another option, you should go for the other option. It is absolutely, just just the portion sizes alone, it's not worth the price at all. But price, if you try and ignore the price, the food is just mid. I'm gonna put it in average meal, towards the bottom. Uh, next up is Shake Shack. Now I've only been to Shake Shack once. It was me and my friend, Lil Crazy Bitch, AKA the Plot of Phantom. And we were out in the town once again. We we're hungry as fuck and we saw a Shake Shack and we were both like, damn. I've never been to a Shake Shack before. And this was like slightly after COVID lockdowns. So we went in and instead of having a normal fucking menu, they had a little barcode you had to scan on the table and order online so they can steal all of your data. And this made me extremely mad and we were both very hungry and miserable. (laughs) And so we just spent and the service was terrible. We ordered our burgers and it took ages for them to come. They're fucking burgers. How long can it take for burgers to get made? It took ages, right? And we spent the whole time fucking complaining. We were like, fucking stupid fucking place. Why can't they just take our fucking orders like normal people have to do this stupid fucking online thing? Which didn't work very well. Like the online website, it like loaded super slow. It was like broken. It didn't work. So it was like extra frustrating. We were just fucking grumbling and complaining the whole time. And then finally our burgers came and they were fucking sick. (laughs) And we were like, it shut us up real quick because the burgers were really fucking good. So I'm going to put this in Good Eats at the top of Good Eats above KFC, even though I've only had it once. So that might have just been because we were really hungry that the burgers tasted so good. But man, those were some fucking juicy, cheesy, unctuous burgers. The buns were on point. It was great. All right, next up is Subway. Now listen, you know what I don't understand? I don't understand the Subway hate. This is much like KFC. There is a lot of hate about Subway. Lots of people call Subway the worst fast food place. It's failing as a business because no one wants to go there. Now, look, I think I've talked about this before, but if you live in a place like New York, 
where you can go and get deli sandwiches very easily and way better than Subway, then of course, there's no reason to ever go to Subway. But I do not live in a place like New York. Now, there are places in London where you can go to get, you know, subs, to get, to get deli sandwiches and so on. Of course. And they're much better than Subway every single time that I've been to them. Of course. But they are not everywhere. They are rare and hard to find. And they're also slightly more expensive. For what it is, there's nothing wrong with Subway. It's not amazing. It's definitely not amazing. It's fucking far from amazing. <laughs> but there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Like, um, this goes straight in average meal. In the, mi- in the middle to the top of average. Is an average meal. It's exactly perfectly average. It's what you want from a sandwich. It's just a sandwich. Now, I will clarify. Most of the time, I get the meatball marinara. The cold cuts the Subway has, I agree, are not that good. I agree they're not that good. But that's why there's other stuff on the fucking menu. You don't have to get it. There's a whole bunch of other shit on the menu that's way better. Like the meatball marinara, which I highly recommend as the best Subway item. Alright, next up is Wagamama. I haven't been to Wagamama very much, but the food has always been disappointing. I'm putting it in bland or usually disappointing food. You know what? I'm moving Pret down. I'm moving Pret Amandre down to bland or usually disappointing. The food is bland. Like, that's literally it. And it's disappointing. You pay too much for it and you're disappointed by the portion you get. And the food is bland. I'm sorry, Pret Amandre fans, but it's true. Like, if anything could be said to be bland and disappointing, it's fucking Pret Amandre. Okay, Wagamama is also bland and disappointing. The food has no flavor. Uh, that's pretty much it. It, does, there's no, it doesn't taste too much. It's, it's not, like, disgusting. It's just very boring. Um, and the same can be said, they got Wimpy on here, and I have to try a Wimpy burger at some point, because Wimpy is the UK burger chain that's, like, old, but it kind of died when, like, McDonald's and, st- and the American chains got imported over here and now competed it, but I gotta try a Wimpy, they still some exist, and I, I've gotta try a Wimpy burger at some point, but I never have. Um, Yo Sushi, I haven't been to Yo Sushi for a long time, for a very, very long time, since I was a kid, basically, but it's not very good sushi. I'm putting it in bland or usually disappointing right at the bottom. Just because there's there's no reason to there's you know, unlike like there's there's good sushi places everywhere in London. You don't you don't need to go to your sushi. It's a it's a kaiten sushi, you know, conveyor belt sushi place, but it's so bad. It's just not really worth it. It does it has a good atmosphere, like kind of a neat atmosphere, but it's not very good. Are we got ZZ. Again, haven't eaten here for a long time. But back in the day, me and Young Sai we used to meet up once a week, we'd go to the cinema, and when I say we used to do this, I mean, like, back in the day. Like, this is some of the first times I ever went out to see a friend on my own, was this. This is literally how I learned to go out on my own with a friend, when I was, like, you know, 13 or something. Maybe I was even younger, I don't know. But we'd go out to a movie, we'd see a movie, and then after the film, we'd come back, and right near the cinema, there was a ZZ. And there was also a Pizza Express. And so we'd either go to the Pizza Express, but then very quickly, we decided to try the ZZ, and the ZZ was way better. They have, it's just an Italian chain place, but the pasta's really fucking good. And the pizza's okay, but the pasta, I really like the pasta. At least this is what I remember from my childhood. Now, maybe if I went back there now, it would not hold up. But I remember the pasta being fucking banging. Um, and then, we obviously, we, we, we did this cinema thing for many years, And then one day, a Five Guys opened up near the cinema, and then we switched to going to Five Guys every time. Uh, Because Five Guys is better. But I'm going to put the ZZ at the top of average meal, because I remember it being good. And that's it. That's everything I've actually tried on this list. Um, Okay, now I'm going to go eat some fucking pizza. You know what people don't complain about enough? Uh, That is absolutely fucking bullshit. Like, it's actually bullshit. So... In terms of me making money from music, right, like my career, my job, I make most of my money through Bandcamp sales and Spotify and and, uh, Apple Music streams. Uh, That's where most of my money comes from. But the place where most people stream music from, the biggest music platform in the world, is none of those places. It's YouTube. And I make precisely zero pounds on YouTube. Because, despite meeting the subscriber amount eligibility threshold, I don't have 
3,000 public watch hours in the last 365 days on my main channel, which is fucking bullshit, okay? Because I make music. I can't pump out music that often. Like, do they... Is the reason for this that they want me to be making a hashtag content? Because I could. I could make hashtag content for my main channel. No one would fucking watch it is the problem. No one would fucking watch it. But I could upload a 12-hour podcast to the main No Thank You channel. And maybe that would get me a couple of thousand watch hours. And I can I can actually fucking, you know, make it into the... The, the 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 program to get to get money to get paid for my fucking work because it, it's actually bullshit that this doesn't happen because it's been years that I've been uploading for YouTube I've been past the thousand subscriber threshold for years and I and when I was approaching that you know when I was getting towards the thousand subscribers that was all you fucking needed and now I'm at almost two thousand on the No Thank You channel and I still make zero fucking money from it it's just ridiculous it's actually insulting like i don't know there's nothing we can do about this situation right because because i don't even it's so annoying man it's so fucking annoying what do i do like if i just spam shit people i mean it doesn't matter if like some people unsubscribe but no one's gonna watch it is the problem like i don't know how to hit how do i hit the watch hours how to get let me google how to get youtube watch hours here we go one of the best ways to increase watch hours is to, by organizing live streams. Unlike other YouTube videos, live streams allow real time. Okay, yeah, I know what the fuck a live stream is, you fucking idiot. Um, okay, this is just fucking nonsense. Oh my god, this is absolutely nonsense. Look, if you want to help me out here, I know this is illegal and you're not allowed to say this, but fuck YouTube. Okay, if you want to help me out, like, I don't make any money off of this, so it's not like you're generating money for me. Go on my main channel and just loop some of my albums. Just when you go to sleep, when you go to sleep, just keep your laptop on. Because it, it doesn't count if I do it. It doesn't count if I do it. So I would really appreciate if you would fucking go to my main channel and just, like, pick one of my videos. Like, you know, the, al- the longest, let me see, the longest video I have is if you go go to my channel. Here's what I want you to do. Okay, I'm asking you to do this, please. Please, I'm asking you to do this, okay? Um... Go to my channel on the, the main No Thank You channel. Go to videos. I mean, I have the the. Oh, I I privated the twelve. The I made a one of the first things I ever did on YouTube was I streamed. Um, there's a ten hour long Mersbell album. I don't even remember what it was called, but I live streamed myself listening to the whole thing. The problem is that I leaked my real phone number in that stream. Thankfully, no one was watching. So, but I had to private the VOD after I finished it because I leaked my real phone number. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure you can't find it anymore. Uh, but anyway, if you want to go to my channel, what's the longest thing I have? Let me see. 31 minutes. Uh, probably going to be an album of some kind. Encycle Facility is 46 minutes. Um, Benjamin's Dragon Millionaire is an hour and five minutes. I think Benjamin's Dragon Millionaire is the play. So if you want to go to Benjamin's Dragon Millionaire, and what you want to do is you mute mute your computer audio, and then you want to right click, left click, right click the video, and just press loop, and then just put it on loop for a while. You know what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to set this up in in a fucking different browser. I'm going to set this up in a different browser while I'm not logged into Google, so they don't know it's me. I'll put my VPN on. Actually, I don't know if they'll allow that, but... um, Anyway, I'm just gonna do this. I'm just gonna gonna mute mute the tab. I'm just gonna loop this, okay? Because I need like a few thousand watch hours, it, and anything helps. Any little helps. I'm pretty sure that once you hit it, you don't have to do it again. You just like once once you meet the eligibility requirements once, that's it. You just you 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 just have it permanently. Because it's, it, it's actually fucking non like it's it's actually so annoying and like fucked up that they do this because if you're a small artist how are you supposed to make any money like it's not like i would be and and just to make this very clear okay youtube pays way less per stream than any other streaming platform it's the biggest one and it pays the least uh so like youtube is fucked if you're a musician 
it is actually fucked because you have no choice but to put your albums on there and yet you make nothing on it especially i mean in my in many people's case literally nothing on it and oh man it I, it makes me so mad you want to know my stance on gatekeeping you already know my stance on gatekeeping there's nothing wrong with gatekeeping first of all and secondly gatekeeping is not fucking real like no one's ever explained to me what the term is supposed to mean. Is it supposed to mean not welcoming every single new person into your hobby with open arms? I'm sorry, why is it my fucking responsibility to do that? This concept of gatekeeping, like if you tell someone to fuck off, right? This is all you can do because we're talking about the internet here, right? If if someone, there's there's three levels. Either you can be super welcoming, someone's like, hey, I heard about this thing called anime, can you give me... And then you, you know, hold their hand and spoon feed them everything they could possibly want to know. Even though I don't really care yet, right? This is the problem. You can't really do that because these people don't care about anything yet. Because they don't know about anything. So there's no, there's no, you can't even do anything, right? And then there's like the middle, which is like, you just don't give a shit. I don't, you just don't interact with them. And this by many is considered gatekeeping by just refusing to help randos I know, it's fucking bullshit, right? And then, what's considered gatekeeping is just telling someone on the internet to fuck off. I'm sorry, there's no such thing as gatekeeping because there's no gate. There's no gate to keep. What are you supposed to do? Like, yeah, sure, if it's like a private internet community, right, then then that's fine and good, by the way. Uh, Lurk more is a good philosophy that should be in place everywhere on the internet and in real life and everywhere in between lurk more is a good philosophy uh and anyone who says it isn't is like it doesn't have an argument they simply don't have an argument i don't it it doesn't make any sense it doesn't make any goddamn sense look there's like i see a lot of people weirdly compare this to like real world immigration issues this is like baffling to me as if these things are comparable like fucking no one on the internet pays taxes. <laughs> There's no economy. There's no economy here. Like, the number one thing about immigration that matters is the economic aspect of it. I mean, obviously, there's the empathetic a- 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 aspect. Like, do you do you care about the poor, the, the poor migrants, the poor refugees? Oh, look, help. I don't, frankly, you know, I'm, I'm maybe this is evil of me, but I care much more about the economic impacts of immigration over like uh hashtag no person is illegal or anything okay maybe i'm maybe i'm a bad person for that but it's very hard for me to empathize with these people I, we've, we've lived very different lives we have nothing in common i have no uh, you know i'm not generally a super high empathy person anyway so this is not the sort of thing i care about but i'm not you know anti-immigration because i've seen the economics of it it seems to be economically good to have a a reasonable you know some level of immigration and refugees yeah you know what sure let them in fuck it it's not like they're gonna do anything too bad most of the time except sometimes but whatever the benefits probably outweigh the negatives in terms of economics uh from what i've read right so that's my immigration stance (laughs) has nothing to do with the fucking internet because the reason why anyone would be pro-immigration in the real world in, in terms of emigrating into a country, is that immigrants pay taxes and immigrants work and they contribute to the economy more than they take out. In general, almost all the time, you can look at you can look up this information yourself. If you disagree with me, I don't want to hear it. Don't fucking I, please I do not comment about this. I I do not care. This is not an issue. This is not a political issue that I particularly feel strongly on. So if you comment about it, I'm not going to respond because I don't give a shit. This is not an area where I've done, like, super a lot of research, and it's not an area I particularly care about. So, you know, fuck you. Um, Fuck you for making me talk about this. People on the internet who compare gatekeeping to anti-immigration policies in the real world. It's not the same fucking thing. Um, Because the the internet, there's no economy, right? So all you get is a bunch of people who come in who have no idea about any sort of cultural context and, and what... The, every space to be changed to suit their needs it's insane like not everything is for you why can't people just understand that not everything is for you just go to the places that are for you right and it's going to exist the internet is a massive place i don't know the the the, the only oh fuck
my selfie stick just broke. I've been playing with it. I've been fucking shaking it around and it just snapped. Shit. I gotta buy a fucking new one. Fuck. What brand is this? Because this was a good one. This was a good one. It lasted like three years or something. Which I think is pretty good for a shitty bit of plastic. But it has a tripod and stuff. Fuck. I wanna... That's annoying. Okay. I'm like nine episodes into Magicano. I watch... You may have seen my video that I made called Even Further Still. Um, and in that video, I stated how I was watching this anime called Magicano. And I got up to episode eight that day, which was yesterday. And I'm now continuing to watch the show. And I think it's time to admit to myself and everyone around me that this show fucking sucks. I gotta stop watching anime that's this bad. It's like, no wonder it's painful and hard for me to sit through anime. The show is just, like, boring and unfunny and bad. Why am I watching this? But now I'm like, I'm like... On episode 9, I may as well finish it. Uh, I gotta stop watching terrible anime. I gotta watch better shows. Why am I watching bad shows? Well, I know, because I'm about to watch fucking Nanoha, right? I'm about to give to, to do my laying around watching the entire Nanoha franchise. I guess I'm going to start that, like, soon. <sighs> Which is a lot of bad anime, because I don't think I'm going to like season 1. I might like season 2. But that's a lot. That's like 24 episodes or something. And then I don't think I'm going to like season 3. And I think I might like season 4. Um, but yeah. I saw this as like training. Like I'm going to watch this bad show so that I can train for getting through Madoka. Uh, sorry, not Madoka. Nanoha season 1. Um, but yeah, I don't know what's going on with me. I need to watch better anime is what's going on with me. I need to look through my plan to watch and see if there's anything actually good. Okay, I just finished Magicano. I think I would give it a 3 out of 10. Generally a pretty bad show, but I am glad I didn't drop it. I considered so many times dropping it. But this is the thing that I miss out on when I drop shows. Is that, like, although the show was bad, and even the bit I'm about to talk about was bad. Like, it was not done. It was executed in the worst way possible. Almost exclusively. It was also very unique, or somewhat unique, unexpected. So, because I don't recommend watching Magicano, I'm just going to spoil it. There's nothing much to spoil, because for 90% of the show's runtime, it is a very generic harem, that's it. It's not a comedy, because it's not funny. Maybe it's trying to be, but it fails. There's not a single funny moment in the whole show. Uh, maybe there's, like, a couple, but they're not even, you know, they're not even, like make you snort kind of funny like they're just like i acknowledge that something mildly amusing has just happened kind of funny um but yeah all of a sudden in the last episode i say all of a sudden so the whole show foreshadows the idea that the main character has some sort of hidden magical powers and so you know it's going to happen it's the world's most obvious foreshadowing like it it very heavy-handedly keeps hinting that the main character has hidden magical powers and as you get towards the end it stops even hinting and just starts having characters say it like out loud um and so in the final episode they cram the in well it sort of happens in the second to last episode but then it's mainly the final episode just goes completely tone shift into like a drama into a fantasy drama where the main characters like the demon king unawakened powers and is going to destroy the world and himself unless the girls can team up to fix it somehow but then all of this is like rushed into like the second half of the last episode and it's it's all so fucking rushed and comes like the 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 interesting or unique part of it is how far they go they're like the tone of the sh- it's like a completely different show the tone of the show just completely changes and it becomes like a super dramatic although not effectively dramatic, but, you know, in terms of what they're trying to do, a super dramatic, um, you know, fantasy, like, full-on magical fantasy with uh, world-ending stakes rather than, you know, harem rom-com stakes. Um, Like, this guy's gonna destroy the fucking world with super magical powers. Also, uh, like, there's an entire world of magical, like, beings and, oh yeah... Uh, you know how you've been in high school this whole time? 
That's because we trapped you in a time loop. All of you, including the main character, have been trapped in a time loop, uh, reliving this year over and over again, in order because in order to trap the main character, so his 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 powers don't awaken, which is kind of stolen from Negima a little bit, but it's not it's it's different enough that I'll, I'll allow it. Um, and we wipe your memories every year, or like it, your memories get wiped because time resets, so you don't really remember it. But yeah, you've been doing you've been in a time loop the entire time, every year, doing the same the same year. But this time it's extra special, but it's not that special. But like yeah, basically, and then right at the end, like last five, like you know, normally these sorts of conflicts would be resolved. Like the big final boss stakes of an anime would normally be resolved. Like in the penultimate episode leading into the first half of the last episode, and then you'd have the second half of the last episode as an epilogue. That's normally how anime is paced. In this show, it all, you get, all of the setup happens in, like, the second half of the penultimate episode, and then the last episode is also mostly set up, but with a drastically different tone than the rest of the show, and then, uh, the conflict actually gets resolved in the like final five minutes of the last episode, and then the epilogue doesn't exist because the epilogue is a post credit scene, which is just the first scene of the anime again. It's just the first scene from the first episode again, um, because it's a time loop. Do you get it? Um, now it's bad, like it's very badly executed. I want like. You, you do not care about any of the stakes. You do not care about any of the characters. The way they solve the problem and defeat the Demon King Awakening is stupid. Everything about it is stupid and bad and, and, and not even in an entertaining way, just boring. Um, but the idea is there, and I'll give it credit. And the show, I wouldn't say, is insultingly bad. Uh, it's just mainly boring and generic. And there's no reason to ever watch it. And I watch too much of this sort of show. And it's time for me to stop doing that. So from now on, you know, I've, I've, I've been testing out this idea of, like, I drop things too easily. I, I drop anime way too easily. My dropped list is, like, much longer than most people's. I don't tend to finish shows, uh, like, if I, if I don't like them. Like, I very easily drop shows. And this is probably, you know, is this a good or bad thing? I don't know. This might be problematic. Um, but it's fucking painful to sit through some shit like that, man. Anyway, th- I don't really have much else to say other than that was fucking weird and dumb. You know what I'm gonna watch now? Cause I s- I'm, I'm done watching shitty anime, but I have no way of knowing what the good anime is. Cause I don't wanna watch things from the 80s. Those things are fucking boring, okay? Like, I'm not watching n- Nadesco, I'm not watching Captain Tyler, I'm not watching Pat Labor. I'm not watching... I've already watched Dirty, Dirty Pair. I've, I've already watched Cyber City or Day 0808. I've already watched fucking Bubblegum Crisis. And I didn't like any of them, just to be clear here. And I've also watched the first episode of Pat Labor and didn't care for it that much. Um, the OVA that... Is. I don't want to watch a movie because movies aren't real anime. <laughs> so I'm like, I want to watch something, you know, more modern. Not from the 90s or 80s. Um... And I want to watch something good, but I don't want to watch something that's b- super brain powery. It's like, I don't know. I feel like I've already watched all of those. I'm pretty sure I've already watched every show like that. That isn't like a, an action-y shonen type of thing. I'm like, what do I watch? And somehow I've never seen Sakura So no Pet Nakanajo, um, which I know is popular and it, it's like relatively well liked. I mean, it's pretty well liked, although I don't really see anyone talk about it. These days, but I remember it had a lot of hype back in the day. I know some people who really like it. I think Artificial Nice Guy really likes it, and I generally respect that guy's taste. So in that sense, I'm like, okay, fuck it, I'll watch that. But then I also have another show. I kind of want to watch Soft Tenny. Which I've, I've always wanted to watch Soft Tenny because I really like Take You, which is like one of my favorite shows. And Soft Tenny is similar. It's the most similar anime to Take You in the world. Um, but that one isn't very well rated. But then again, Take You isn't very well rated either. And that show's amazing. And Sakura So na Pet no, no Pet na Kanajo is highly rated, but could be garbage for all I know. But we're going to start watching it and we're going to find out. I, I actually have absolutely no idea what this show is about. 
just from the mal page i haven't even read the synopsis just from looking at it this gives me like saikano maybe vibes like something along those sorts of lines or maybe um oh what's that fucking show called hold on i don't know well whatever i don't care I'm going to watch it and see if I'm right about this, because it gives me those sorts of vibes. And I did not like Saikano very much, um, so, you know, fuck it, we're going to watch it. Alright, I'm immediately pretty impressed with the production quality. I don't know if you want to hear me talk about this, but I don't know if, if it's just because um, I've been watching so much garbage. I've been watching so much garbage anime that is, like, barely fucking animated, but... I think the animation is 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 expressive. There's lots of frames, loads of frames. Um, but but beyond that, you know, the movement is is energetic and uh, 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 yeah, lively, inventive in certain aspects. Um, but the visual design is also nice. The title cards feature the characters. Nice stylization introductions character introductions the background art looks nice i don't know this could have potential i'm very skeptical i'm extremely skeptical but who knows you know what's annoying about my thinkpad x60s now look i want to say i'm i'm like the satisfaction that i'm achieving right now from being back in my room after three months away is just you you can't understate it like i feel so overjoyed and contented to be back in the space that I've built for myself. This is the world that I've built for myself. This, like, this room is my constructed world. Like, the rest of the world is built for other people, for their needs and desires, and not very well, even in that case. Because it needs to compromise in order to suit many different individuals. And so it then, you know, as someone who is everyone is an individual um but anyway this is the world that i've built for myself that only has to accommodate for me and i have spent the last however many years building it in such a way that it accommodates for me in a to a high degree in a way which is very satisfying and that includes the fact that it contains within itself a thinkpad x60s which is a great computer is a wonderful machine created by wonderful people um but it has a problem and this problem is that it is an old machine because people don't make good computers anymore and it being old it is rather underpowered now this doesn't bother me in 90 percent of cases because you don't really need like i'm gonna be honest with you modern modern computers you don't need them for most things like you don't need more than unless you're playing modern AAA games, you don't need, you know, whatever, who cares, you'd, like, people vastly overestimate the amount that they need computing power, especially CPUs, you don't need a modern CPU, seriously, you don't, um, but there is one problem with the underpoweredness of the X60S, which is that it's so underpowered it can't manage 1080p video, and it can barely manage 720p video, anything under that, anything standard definition is buttery smooth perfectly fine no complaints but the higher quality video hd video particularly 1080p 1080p it just cannot handle it just it like it just doesn't play like i mean it plays but it's like stutters so much that it's unwatchable you're getting like one frame per second if even that it it's just doesn't have the hardware to render 1080p video um now this isn't a problem from my end in the sense that I have zero qualms about watching standard definition video. I think HD is, you know, in many cases overkill. Like, I I simply do not care. 480p is good enough for almost every situation, in my opinion. And I I don't know why everyone obsesses over high resolutions. And even at this point, you know, I think everyone has agreed that 1080p is about as high as most people need to go for most things. Anything higher than 1080p is actually abhorrent and just a waste of resources and space. Uh, But, so it doesn't bother me. If I was in control of everything, it wouldn't bother me that it couldn't play back 1080p files because I would just download my anime in standard definition. But the problem is, 
No one shares anime in standard definition. Not anything more modern, anyway. You can find older anime in standard definition only, in fact. Um, but most anime, you know, past... In the sort of era that I'm interested in, the sort of 2000s onwards, is in at least 720p, uh, just wherever you can find it. Like, you, no one bothers... It, there's there's a race to the top in terms of anime quality, right? Like, most people want... Right, if they're torrenting something if in the modern age, if you're torrenting anime, you're doing it because you want a high-quality version, right? Since anime streaming is so prevalent at this point that the people who torrent anime are generally going to be the ones who want to watch that anime in the highest possible quality without the artifacts that come from compression for streaming. But I am not one of those people. I have the opposite use case. You know, I I want I'm on a low powered machine, and streaming a file locally is less expensive than streaming a file inside of a, a web browser. Not that you know, the web browser I use on my X60 is Dillo, which doesn't even support anything that would resemble video streaming. Um, so it basically puts me in a pickle where it's really hard. You know, I have. A bunch of anime that I have downloaded over the years, but almost all of it, not all of it, but almost all of it is in at least 720p, and a lot of it, most of it is in 1080p, which means it is just unplayable on my X60, which is a damn shame. It's a damn shame. And it's weird because I think I have a, a hunch that a lot of these shows are, are like upscaled. I don't even know if some of them aired in HD. I think they're literally upscaled to HD, but the original quality, it doesn't matter, because, it, yeah, it's very annoying. So it means you can't really, I can't really watch that much anime on that machine, which is a shame, because I would rather watch any anime that is in a 4 by 3 aspect ratio on my machine that has a 4 by 3 you know, monitor. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out a solution to this problem. Now, I could go through my entire anime collection on my desktop this is my first option this is this is massively overkill by the way and kind of stupid but my desktop has the most powerful gpu that i have in my my house um and so i could do some ffmpeg downscaling of my entire anime collection down to to standard definition <laughs> Um, it takes a while, and it, actually, when I say that, it takes a long time. This is a very intensive process. It has to re-render every frame. Like, it is a very intensive uh, process to do this this sort of thing. And then have a copy of everything that is specifically for that machine. I don't know if that's worth it. That doesn't sound very worth it to me. That sounds pretty not worth it to me. Um, but then again, that's like the... I mean, the other option is to just... Like, you can't find people, you can't find torrents that actually have cedars for standard definition versions of anime that aired in 720p. Uh, like, this sort of thing just doesn't exist anymore. Um, so, the other option is to purchase uh, this, this, I could get a card that slots into, I don't even know what the slot is called, is it PCIe? I don't know. Um, let me, let me double check this, actually. So I could purchase a Broadcom Crystal HD decoder, which supposedly, I mean, it's a it's a hardware decoder for HD video, um, and it's not it's pretty cheap. It's um, it's yeah, it's pretty cheap. So I might just do that. That seems like the best option. But then I have I I this is the thing is I have no idea if this is gonna work on OpenBSD. Like I see. And this is such an obscure... There's a Linux driver. There's an open source Linux driver for this card. Application open source code. Hmm. A Crystal HD support is available in FFmpeg and mPlayer when compiled with the corresponding option. And MPV is just based built on mPlayer. Um, this is... Yeah, I just don't know that it's going to work. Like, I don't believe that a single other person in the world has gone through this problem before. Um, mm, yeah, I don't know. I think it's kind of fucked. I think we're, I think it's kind of busted. I think we have to just exclusively... I don't know. It, it might be possible 
that it would work. It's the sort of thing I'll try out at some point, I guess. Also, I found my Raspberry Pi. Um, so, but the problem is now that I don't have a way to write to a micro SD. Um, the micro SD that's in my Raspberry Pi is the one that came with the Raspberry Pi. And it comes with a micro SD to SD adapter, but it it might have come with an SD. I don't know where it is, basically. I, like, I, I'm pretty sure that I own both a SD to USB adapter and a micro SD to SD adapter. So I should be able to theoretically chain those, right? So to put the micro SD in the adapter and then put the SD in the adapter and plug that in in order to uh, flash Freedom Box onto it. But I, I have no idea where those are. Um, like, I'm pretty sure I have them somewhere, but I don't know where those are. So I just bought another one, and that's coming tomorrow, hopefully. But then, when I get that adapter, a an SD, a micro SD to USB adapter, I can then flash Freedom Box onto the micro SD, install it on the Raspberry Pi, plug that into my router, and then have a Freedom Box. And then... I don't know what I'm going to do with that. So not like I've played Counter-Strike very often recently, but my least favorite Counter-Strike map is definitely Inferno. Inferno is a fucking garbage map, and I don't, un- like, I've heard people, like, there are, there are some people who love Inferno. I don't understand it at all. Inferno's fucking trash. Like, I actually hate playing Inferno so much. Let me tell you how bad Inferno is, okay? So first, let's start off with the good parts. b site. B site is the best part of the map. B site Inferno is actually it's not amazing. It's not the best site in the game, but it's a decent bomb site design. Um, it feels good to push. It feels good to hold. It feels good to retake. You know, it's it. That's the only good part of the map, really. But but banana leading into B site is fucking stupid. Uh, the fact that like you're, you're it's basically just a one lane rush is kind of your only option. It's not actually, obviously you can split through CT, but like, that's, that's a whole lot of commitment. Like splitting through CT is, it's not like going, you know, on most maps, there are two ways into each site and they're not like one is not incredibly high risk, right? Like there's normally a sort of direct way, like say does to a site, there's like long, which would be like the direct way and short, which would be the slightly riskier flank or Inferno B site, you can go through you know, I don't even remember what it's called. The 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 is, there's not palace. You know what I'm talking about. You can go that you can or you can go on cat, right? You can either rush or you can go on cat. But banana, but like it's not particularly viable to wrap all the way around because you're gonna have like normally the way it works is you only have to fight the mid player and you can normally just sort of smoke them off, right? But in in the case of you know, flanking Inferno B site through CT spawn, you have to go all the way around the entire map and you have to fight whoever's holding top mid and then there's normally going to be another A player at least. At least one other A player, if not two, right? Holding arches that you're going to have to contend with. And which means there's no hope for like a... You can't rush that way because they get all the info on you. Like there's no sneaky flank there. Everyone knows you're flanking they're gonna have follow info on you and be able to prepare and rotate and you're gonna get crushed from both sides because the rotate is from from the cts is so easy because they, if they're playing 2a 2b 1 mid which is standard the mid guy is basically already on a in inferno so you've already fought the mid guy he tells his teammates that you're pushing a or pushing through up mid also remember you're doing a split so at least two of your players are probably pushing banana as well so it's very obvious what you're doing uh, you, <laughs> and then even if you manage to get defeat the guy holding arches as well now the second b player is going to be watching ct plus you're going to get pushed from behind by the second a player so it's just fucking you're just getting pincered and you're dead so it's it's possible but it's unlike all the other maps doing a split b is so inconvenient like it's such a high risk strat. It's possible. It's not impossible. Like it's very viable as a strategy, but it's not like a standard strategy. It has to be something that you pull out, like as a sort of off the wall, special, unexpected strat, because it's not something that you would normally do because it's so risky. And so most of the time, if you're gonna push push B, you're just gonna be fucking throwing yourself at banana. 
which is and you see this in pro matches as well right like most b pushes aren't splits in pro matches most b pushes are uh four players banana and then one locker and banana is obviously so easily held off by one opa one molotov one smoke grenade like it's just as iconic of a part of the map it is like it's just garbage <laughs> to actually push and it's too easy to hold um and it's not necessarily just too easy to hold it's too it's you can hold and fall back so easily and then even if you push through banana holding from coffins is so powerful like yeah so even though b site is a, a is good actually getting there sucks and that's only b right because a is worse because the a site the actual bomb site a is is fucking terrible one of the worst bomb sites in the entire game it's way there's shit everywhere there's so much shit and boxes everywhere there's so many angles that are all fucking weird little head peeking over the boxes awkward angles it sucks like when you're actually like even if you're like let's say it's a 1v1 your T side, your pu- or your retaking or something, it doesn't matter, right? One v one, you're pushing onto uh, A site. Here's the angles you have to check. You're going around uh, the side where where Boiler is, like that side. So first, you have to check Pit, but checking Pit requires doing a fifty fifty because to actually check Pit, you have to turn your back to the entire site. So you know you're fucked if someone's hiding uh, in Pit underneath the balcony. Um, then ch- checking graveyard, and then you gotta go and look in the little alcove where he could be standing on the box right up against the wall, and then he could be behind any of the other like three or four boxes that are in the site at any particular angle, or he could be in library, or he could be in the little corner next to library, or he could be on the side on arch side near library. Like there's just way too many options for CTs to hold from, or for whoever is holding. Like it's just. And all of these angles are super awkward, in my opinion. Like, so many of them just create really fucking weird fights that are in way too close range to be fun. Where you don't see someone until you're right up in their face. Like, CSGO, obviously you want a, a variety of ranges, but close range is the worst, like, matchups in CS. You you kind of want mid and long range for most fights. Close range fights are uh, just kind of shit. Like, they're just kind of spammy, you know? It's just it's it's it doesn't require as much technical aim, a precise aim, which is what the game's all about, right? It's not picking up picking off people from a distance. It's just kind of like who who clicked one millisecond faster. It's just a little boring, uh, and it's awkward to play around because you know when you're up close, you players move so fast relative to each other that it's yeah it sucks. So A site is fucking garbage, and apps is fucking garbage, right? Second mid is literally useless in the game. There's a whole area of second mid that most of it never comes into play. Um, pushing up mid is is always really awkward and fucking weird. Holding mid is awkward and weird because crossing mid as a CT is weird. And smoking off... Uh, I don't know. It's, it, the T-junction T thing at the top of mid is weird because... You have to kind of take a 50-50. You really can't push that without flash ever, which is fine, I guess, to make you use utility. That's not necessarily a problem. But it basically, it's kind of like how you used to, every time you were playing Dust 2 before they changed the sight lines, you used to have to waste a grenade like every single round smoking the cross. It's kind of a similar situation where in order to actually push mid, you have to throw a grenade. Like you don't have any, you can't peek it raw, which it's not necessarily bad. It's not as bad as Dust 2's mid used to be. Um, uh, yeah, I guess it's not that bad. But it just makes the rounds very samey. Because there's really only... Like, a site has way too many places to hold. And so pushing it is always awkward. Because you're swinging around randomly trying to check many different places. And every time you check one place, it leaves you open to the next place. So you can't really clear out the site, like, you know, one angle at a time. Um, whereas pushing through mid, yeah, there's a 50-50. But you're going to smoke off one side or flash... You know, you're going to be fine pushing out if you use your healthy properly. And so in that case, if you're pushing, there's only one place people can hold from. Like, you're only ever going to check one angle. You know exactly where the player is. And you can just pre-fire, and the player knows exactly where you are. So it just becomes very boring. Um, Apartments is way too cramped. Uh, It's way too fucking cramped. The fact that you make so much noise when you're in apartments from the, 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 the wood on the ground footstep noises means that it basically becomes like impractical to push and then so it becomes it's this really hard area to actually gain control of as a T right because it's it's a, a very long 
hallway that's very tight to to hold as a CT, right? And the entire place can be, you know, very powerful for uh, utility. Um, and then if you do actually manage to push into apartments, you get fucking nothing. <laughs> like you go through all the effort, and then actually pushing out of apartments into a site leaves is just like you're just completely exposed. You have no cover to drop into pit. You have absolutely no cover. Like you're you're vulnerable peeking out of apartments to the entire site so that it's basically just luck whether a guy was happens to be holding or not and a good team will definitely be holding and you're never going to be able to push out because they know exactly where you're, you only have one place you can come from right you have but they could be anywhere so you just have to take a gamble even if you manage to flash yourself out you know and get into pit even making your way out of pit is a fucking gamble and a struggle um so it it just becomes and it's not like it's impossible to push onto a site like it's very possible but it just becomes kind of messy like there's no there's not much strategy to it it's just kind of like push <laughs> you know so this map fucking sucks and i don't understand why anyone likes it i actually think that pushing apartments is the worst thing you could like out of any push in the entire game pushing apartments onto a site in inferno is probably the worst push like it, it, to play to, to, to the fear, the way it feels it feels so bad so anyone who pushes a they almost always push arch side like this is how i've generally seen it in games most people generally they'll kill the player who's holding arch side and then they'll push around their past library onto the site deal with the player in pit um which makes the rest of the map fucking useless which is a general theme with inferno where parts of the map are just like really useless um, and then, like, don't even get me started on Pit. Like, Pit, if, when I was playing Inferno, Pit is my favorite place to hold as a CT, if I'm on A. If I'm on B, I hold from Coffins, but if I'm on A, I hold from Pit. And it's pretty powerful, but it's just really awkward. Like, fights around Pit just feel really awkward. I don't really know how to explain it other than that. Just, just the bunch, because there's, like, the weird elevation, and the fact that it's kind of a small cramped corner... And then the fact that you can go underneath a balcony and behind a weird truck that has weird, awkward geometry. Um, like, it's just kind of uh, an awkward place to, to fight around, no matter what side you're on. Um, it often feels like more luck than skill. Uh, but then actually holding from pit, holding... Um, I don't even know what that side of the... What side that... Like, the boiler room apartment side is called. I guess, is it called, like, short? And then arches is long? I've heard some people call it that, but... If you're holding that from pit, like, that's a super powerful position. Which, again, there's another reason why almost everyone pushes arch side. Because they don't have to deal with the player pit immediately. They have a much better fight. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm just not a big fan of Inferno. And I'm especially not a big fan of a site. And I, I don't like second mid. It serves no purpose in the game. Um, but even mid is very boring. Like, most most maps, right, Like that have a mid. You know, I'm talking about Inferno and Dust 2 here. The mid is not just a hallway with nothing there, you know? Like, like mid is supposed to be a way to connect uh, the other, the two sites with, like, a middle, right? Like, obviously, Inferno, you have Cat on one side and you have the stairs on the other side. Um, and then on, on Dust 2, you have lower tons on one side and you have Short on the other side, right? So, but on Inferno... You have nothing on one side, and on the other side, it just leads into second mid, which you could already get to. There's no reason to ever go there, because it doesn't get you any closer to the site. So, it's fucking useless. And then you have the entire, the little, I know they call it Mexico in America, right? The little sewer section, which also serves no fucking purpose. Like, it's, the the little ditch in mid serves a purpose, because it creates a, a kind of a headshot angle. But the actual rest of the sewer serves no purpose. Like, you're never going to need to go from one... Why are you in second mid going to mid in the first place and then you pop out in the most exposed place ever if someone's actually watching it? Or the other way around. It's so... I don't know, man. The whole map makes no fucking sense. Like, second mid is set up as if someone CT is going to be holding it from apartments. Which happens sometimes, but the problem is... You can get, there's the whole T houses on that side, which means you can walk down that way without ever getting exposed. Well, you get slightly exposed when you go on the walkway, I guess, which is probably how the map is supposed, like, if you were imagining how the map would work out of context, how that part would work, 
I can imagine some cool mid fights happening where CT is in the second mid apartments looking down and a T is on the bridge in T apartments and, and peaks and you get an interesting orping battle there or something. But that never happens because no one ever does this. I don't know, it's so stupid. You can't hold there because you have nowhere to fall back on. You're trapped in this tiny little room with nowhere to go if someone pushes you. And you can so easily molly or smoke off that balcony that it doesn't... And even if you do manage to hold it, what do you get? Nothing. Because it's not even an important part of the map. It's the literally the least important part of the map. So the whole second mid is... it's It serves no purpose, but if you got rid of it, you would change the map so fundamentally that it wouldn't be Inferno anymore. So fun, Inferno is just fundamentally a bad map. It's fundamentally a dog shit map. Like Banana, although it's iconic, is fundamentally a bad map design. Because it fun, it's just a mindless rush. Yeah, okay, I'm going to stop ranting about Inferno now. But there, like the other bad maps in the game... Like, I haven't played enough Ancient to... Like, I, the second I played Ancient for the first like five times I ever played Ancient, I was like, this map fucking sucks, and I never played it again. So I don't even know why, like, I didn't even have enough playtime on the map to know why it's bad. I just didn't enjoy playing it. Um, And Vertigo gets a lot of hate, but I think, personally, Vertigo is really bad at high level. It's not really bad, it's just a little boring to watch pros play on Vertigo. um, Because of the problems with sound cues, uh, mainly. But in a normal, you know, pug, it's not that bad, in my opinion. Um, Pub, pug, pub. Do they mean the same thing? I don't know. Pub, I think. It's it's not that bad. I don't think Inferno is... I mean, I don't think Vertigo is... is I think Vertigo is, like, fine. It's not a great map, but it's fine. Obviously, the best map in the game is Nuke. You know, I think I could commit much harder to the... <clears throat> um, avoiding the botnet lifestyle. Like, there's there's ways I could commit harder... Obviously, this freedom box thing I think is going to be cool, because um, it's a very I normally don't gravitate towards stuff that's user friendly, but <clears throat> I've been like completely unable to figure out any of the stuff that a freedom box is supposed to make easy. Not everything, like some stuff I could just some stuff. That the, the problem is the easy stuff is stuff that I'm not interested in doing. Um, anyway, but that's cool. But another thing, what other things are involved in avoiding the botnet? Well, I think the first thing is that, well, I mean, here's a problem right now, is you're probably watching this on YouTube, um, which you don't have to be. These are available on my website, um, and you can just be listening to it on my website, or you can even download the mp3 from my website. Just just right-click, save the mp3, and then you have it locally. Um, but, you know, you're probably watching this through YouTube. I I don't really want to get rid of YouTube, just because hosting video myself is too much effort. Um, so YouTube, I guess, is going to stay, which means I have to continue having a Google account. But you can't really live without a Google account, so I'm not, like, super concerned about that, because I think that at a certain point, when you're just inconveniencing yourself, that that it loses any justification for me, right? Like, I, I hate the botnet. But I also like being able to live conveniently. Um, Like, most of the reasons I hate the botnet are because it makes things worse. Um, And so I, when I look for alternatives, it's because the alternatives are generally speaking better. Now, here's another thing. Here's another botnet issue. The computer I'm using to record this podcast right now. Now, I have a whole host of computers. And yet, I record the podcast on my Mac. Now, I own a Mac for the specific reason that the software I use to make music is Logic Pro. <clears throat> this is what I've been using for, like, I don't know, it's been, like, ten years now. Like, it's, I, I it's called a, a door, D-A-W, right? It's the, the door that I am most comfortable using and I've been using forever. And it's only available on Mac. It's made by Apple. It's proprietary Apple software. Um, and so far... There are zero, as I understand it, decent FOSS doors on Linux, or on any platform for that matter. But I heard, I heard something, that Studio One, which is a door, um, which won't let me into their website right now, okay, thank you. Studio One is a 
a good door like i've heard about it it's 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 legit is now available on linux so i've heard it's not free software i believe but let me look this up studio one linux professional door studio one is now on linux public beta because the two now it's it's closed source okay so don't get excited it's still closed source there do exist uh there does exist at least one open source fully fos daw which is called lmms but it's actual garbage <laughs> it's so bad lmms is fucking trash um so the two like two of the things that linux has always sucked at like it, historically it was gaming was the big problem but gaming has been sorted out now so now the two biggest problems on linux at least from what i see are video editing and music production um and there are uh, there are plenty of interesting music related things and video related things you can do on linux i mean let's not forget that the entire internet's video encoding needs are supplied by ffmpeg which is fos like if you're watching this video on youtube right now it was encoded using ffmpeg on youtube servers everyone uses ffmpeg but you know for video editing there hasn't really been an option there's this software called kden live which is made by kde i believe yep and kden live is it kind of sucks it kind of sucks i mean if you just want to do very basic video editing of just appending clips you can do it like it works it's just anything more complicated than that kind of sucks it just does it's just not very good um but there is a new uh video editing software that is being worked on it's still in it's still very very early i believe but it's called olive um and olive is supposed to have be much more powerful um that, and it, it, yeah it's 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 going it's it's going to be much more powerful than um Kden live and even then then most video editors it's it's going to be a very very powerful thing because it uses a node based compositor um which is allows you to do stuff like you know visual effects stuff more than just layers like you would find in a uh, final cut or premiere i think premiere uses just layers anyway the idea is that it should be extremely versatile and flexible and powerful and so on um but as i understand it it's still it's developed by one guy <laughs> and um who happens to be the youtuber matt kc by the way who is a great youtuber but it's made by one youtuber in his spare time um and uh, that's that's it that's all it is so so one day i think olive will be the premier video i have a lot of faith in olive like i think it's going to be the thing that makes video editing on Linux not just viable but actually you know arguably superior because obviously it's open source so uh you know it's going to be superior than the proprietary alternatives but in terms of music software there really aren't many people working on developing powerful doors for Linux um that are open source which sucks which which sucks um there's this thing called Ardor which I tried and it seems extremely bare bones um you can it, it's extremely extremely bare bones basically um and there's also Bitwig Studio which I don't know that Bitwig Studio is um open source yeah no it's not open source um yeah I don't know I think I think these things all I'm saying is I, I don't know I'm I might Studio One it cost a money, which I don't like. It cost a money. Um, I was going somewhere with this, so I one way to have, so that's why I own a Mac, <laughs> right? That's where I was going with this. That's why I own a Mac, and my Mac also of all the computers that I own, all the laptops that I own, sorry, has the best mic quality um, and the best battery life, uh, which makes. The battery life doesn't really matter for this purpose but the mic quality does because the the biggest design flaw in ThinkPads ThinkPads are generally speaking incredibly well designed but there is one huge design flaw in all the ThinkPads which is that they put the microphone right next to the fan 
Um, and so if the fan spins up while you're recording, um, you get really, really loud noise in the background, which sucks and makes the microphone basically unusable. Um, now, I, I suppose I could buy a cheap USB mic. That's actually very viable. I I bought a super, super cheap microphone, um, but it doesn't even... It, it doesn't even really work. <laughs> um, but, like, it's... This This is just an audio recording. Like, it's super possible to just record in Audacity. And one of the reasons why I like the podcast as a format is that it's such a... Because it's just an audio file, it's very easy to avoid the botnet sharing just an audio file. Um, so that's not something I'm super worried about, but I might try for the next podcast to record on my ThinkPad. I might try recording it on my ThinkPad just to see how it works. Like, how it works out, I mean. Like, if the audio quality is acceptable. I might make a shorter experimental Slice of Life podcast on the X220 just to see how see how it turns out. That's something I'm interested in doing. Because reducing my reliance on this Mac means that when the Mac breaks due to planned obsolescence, uh, you know, at some point, I don't have to buy a new one. But not just because of the botnet, but also because they're very fucking expensive. Um, they're extremely expensive. I don't like doing that, spending that much fucking money on a computer that barely does anything different than a computer that costs 100 quid. Like, there's... Other than battery life and mic quality, and, like, I get... Th- th- those are the only two things that I actually care about that are different between the £2,000 uh, MacBook and the, like, £100 ThinkPad X220. Uh, like, th- really, there is no difference. In fact, the ThinkPad is better because the keyboard is nicer, and obviously it runs Linux, which is nicer. Um <clears throat> I guess there is a problem with it with the the ThinkPad, which is that I broke the fucking audio jack when I got it. Uh, but that's not a problem with the act. That's a problem with me. But I, I I I probably could fix that with like a 3D printed part somehow. But I don't own a 3D printer, and I don't know how to use CAD software. So I don't even really know how I would fix it. How it would go? But I think I think it's just the plastic sheath that snapped, and that if I could fix this is my theory. <clears throat> the real thing about trying to remove myself from reliance on anything from Apple in terms of music is that I know deep down that I fundamentally don't want to because I'm comfortable and fast with logic. Again, I've been using it for like a decade. I am incredibly comfortable and incredibly fast and I have a very efficient workflow with this particular piece of software. And that matters because when it comes to music, I value being able to get ideas out of my head and into the world as fast as possible. And if I can't do that, it becomes incredibly frustrating. <clears throat> that being said, there actually are a whole bunch of ways I could go about this without relying on... <clears throat> without having to wait until a FOSS DAW comes about. Like, I'm pretty sure there is FOSS tracker software, right? <clears throat> um, hold on. Music tracker. These things definitely exist, right? I've seen them. <clears throat> But they only, these only, uh, I want stuff that can do samples. Because with a tracker, I could FOSS the entirety of a Kazi. <laughs> like, I might not be able to FOSS no thank you yet, but I can FOSS a Kazi. Because you can definitely make break call in a tracker. You know what actually killed the internet? And we're literally participating in this right now. You and I and everyone are participating in this right now. We're actively killing the internet. Or, okay, let's be, let's be a little more... Let's, let's give it a little more credit here. It's not about that this concept is bad in itself. It's just that it took there are two there are two kinds of 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 thing on the internet. Some some of it is is content and some of it is conversation discussion. And the internet was originally uh, a, I'd say a solid mix of both. Maybe with a slight lean, especially in the late nineties. And going up to, like, the sort of mid-2000s. Maybe even up to, like, 2010 at a stretch. Um, actually leaned heavier on the discussion side of things. But then, at some point, things got skewed. And content won out massively over discussion. Like, you don't go on the internet to participate in a discussion anymore. 
And you can see this with the kinds of websites that have won out. And I, I don't think this is an accident, right? I think this was this was planned by the powers that be. No, but it was uh, it it was what was um, how do I put this? It was what was incentivized by uh, the sort of you know capitalism, <laughs> basically. Um, that getting having people just talk is less profitable than user generated content. You know, um, so compare something like a BBS or a forum or a, uh, you know, anonymous image board or message board to the modern equivalent. Well, the closest we have is Reddit, right? Uh, but Reddit, aside from in some instances, the main, the main um, part of Reddit, the main, I guess, content of Reddit is the OP. This is very different from a BBS or a forum or an image board or a text board or any of these sorts of things, where the main content is the discussion, the thread, the entire thread, not the original post. Now, there are some places on Reddit where the replies and the discussion are the most important part, but that's not the majority of the website. The majority, it would be very strange... Like normally, the way the way a BBS works or whatever is that, or a forum, is, is that the the OP is just the prompt for the topic, and then you go there to read and engage in the discussion surrounding that topic, which is cool and fun and and good. And if even if it sometimes isn't, it gen, generally is better than just scrolling through endless OPs. This would be an insane proposition on a forum. Can you imagine going to a forum and just reading the OPs, <laughs> just reading the the headers, the the first posts? You would be insane. You would be missing out on the entire point. Um, so that's something. But then you can also, you know, where do people actually have discussions? Well, they sometimes do it on Reddit and they sometimes do it on Twitter. But obviously, I think people at this point have really figured out the fact that Twitter is not a good place to have a discussion ever. Uh, that one should actually disengage from all discussion on Twitter. Never have a discussion on Twitter. If it looks like you want to have a discussion with someone who is also on Twitter, you should take that discussion off of the platform, at the very least into DMs, because it's not a good place to do it. It's just simply not, for many design reasons that I can't be bothered to get into right now, but you already know them, because you, you intuitively know them if you've ever used Twitter. It took a while for people to figure out this, this out, and it, it, it is obviously partially because of Twitter's historical word limit. Um, but it's, you know, Tumblr is also like this, right? Like Tumblr, although there are replies and notes, right? You still, it's, a, it's based on a blog. Now, blogs have always existed and there's nothing wrong with a blog. Like, I'm not saying every website has to be designed for discussion. You know, Reddit is extremely useful in many situations, even though in many situations it's not there you know we all know that if you want an answer to a question on google you have to append reddit right like reddit is extremely useful as a resource and i think that there's some good stuff going on on tumblr even though i don't personally use the website um you know i'm sure that i'm sure some of them are nice people <laughs> um uh and you know i still use twitter sometimes and there's some funny posts on twitter or whatever but that's all you're gonna get because when it comes to content Everything aligns to reality TV and mildly amusing. That's what the human brain really craves. Effectively, the internet, like, TV figured out that there are two kinds. There are really, when it gets down to it, in the, the architecture of the human brain and uh, the, the architecture of desires prompted by modern Western industrial civilization that really... Humans only want two kinds of thing. They want sitcoms and they want reality TV. That when it gets down to it, those are the two things people want. So reality TV on the one hand, for the for the, and then on the other hand, sitcoms for the, the light, very light humor, something that is just mildly amusing enough for you to not realize that it wasn't actually funny the entire time. Because I've gone back and watched some of these sitcoms, including the good ones. <laughs> And honestly, there's a difference between Seinfeld and Big Bang Theory, uh, you know, like one is definitely less funny than the other, 
But Seinfeld is not, like, laugh-out-loud funny. Like, compared to some of the comedy specials that I've watched, or comedy movies that I've watched, or even comedy anime that I've watched, you know, even the best... Like, Faulty Towers doesn't hold up, in my opinion. Um, but, you know, any of the good sitcoms, they're just... They're, they're not supposed to be that funny. They're light humor. They're light humor. And so the internet has also devolved into those kinds of things. It's either reality TV, which is Mr. Beast videos on the one hand, and on the other hand, internet drama, it's e-celeb drama, uh, or not even e-celeb drama, just any kind of internet drama, right, that you're watching as a public spectacle. That's all in the reality TV side of things. It's kind of like you don't, you, you know that watching it isn't healthy for you, but you can't turn away. Uh, and then on the other end is the sitcoms, which is what memes have become. Right, just like you go on Twitter and it's an endless stream of people saying things that are like attempting at least to be mildly funny. And once in a while something is funny enough that it becomes notable. Like the you know, any particular memorable joke from Seinfeld, Soup Nazi or something like that. You know how to take the reservation, you just don't know how to hold the reservation. What's the deal with airplane food? Um, no soup for you. Right, those are my Seinfeld references for the day. Everything just devolves into this. Um, Even, you know, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Listen, hey, I'm not saying that any of this stuff is, like, inherently bad. I know I'm saying it in kind of a dismissive way, but it's definitely not inherently bad. Uh, Like, I like some of the sitcom light humor. Like, I don't, there's a reason that it's light humor. You know, I don't necessarily want to be laughing out loud constantly and have the engagement that I would have to have with something that, like that. Like, for example, the best streamer is a, is Northern Lion, slash YouTuber, is, is Northern Lion. And Northern Lion, watching Northern Lion is, like, the same experience as our parents or whatever had watching Seinfeld. You know, it's the same, it's the same thing, and that's fine. Like, there's, I don't, I don't believe that there's anything wrong with that, personally. Um... But the, the the problem is the imbalance, the fact that, that the other side of things, the, the conversation side of things, only happens in private now, on private Discord servers, um, rather than, and it also only happens in real time. And I think that's actually something that's really lost, is the the fact that everyone has, like, one singular internet identity, which is really cringe, and I really wish people would, like, it's something that's happened really slowly over time, the people it's just become more and more convenient to just keep everything under one identity uh i i don't think i'm strongly against this i think you should maintain at least three completely separate or at least partially separate internet identities um but that aside it the real time thing is very annoying like it would be it, you could you could be on a forum and you or you know some sort of slower image board or message board or whatever and you post something or someone replies to you, and there's no expectation that you're going to get back to them in the next two minutes, you know, that's good. I like that. The non, non-contiguously non temporal conversation. More like more like sending letters to each other. I miss that. we got to bring that shit back. Uh, reply to... This is the thing. It's about control, man. you got to take control, because if you're... If you're... You know, you hear these sounds? You hear these sounds that are popping up on my phone right now? This is the stuff that you shouldn't have. You got to turn push notifications off for anything. You, your, my phone shouldn't tell me when to look at my phone. I should tell my phone when I'm going to look at it. Um, and obviously, that's the biggest thing, right? Is that you, you couldn't reasonably expect real time communication twenty four hours a day because people didn't have phones and they were not on the computer all the time necessarily. But now you, you can expect twenty four hour real time communication, and I don't know if that's necessarily a good thing. Um, but the thing about forums is that they're an interesting middle ground between public and private communities. Like, anyone can join a forum. Like, I mean, Discord is kind of the same in the, the slightly bigger servers, but big disc. this is actually a big thing for me, right? Is I, I, I hate, I mean, I, I, I'm not like, hate is maybe too strong of a word, because it's not like I have anything against their existence for other people, but they are completely incomprehensible to me big discord servers like discord servers with more than 100 people in it what's the fucking point what's the point i don't understand it it, it, it's 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 not something that i'm compatible with uh i i i don't i don't i don't get it uh you know the small discord servers that's just an irc it's the same thing and that's that's fine that's always existed 
But it shouldn't be, like, we need to bring back the goddamn conversation side of the internet that isn't Discord. The, the, you go on a, I don't know. It's still there. I'm saying we need to bring it back. Like, it's there. It's just been massively outcompeted by the content side of the internet. And I think there needs to be a good balance between the two. And right now, there's not enough balance. And that's bad. There should be more balance. There's this vlog from, like, three years ago on Atari Teenage Riot's YouTube channel. Where Alec Empire is like, oh my god, all of these musicians on the internet are freaking out about the fact that the new MacBook Pro costs $60,000. Why are you complaining when the best computer for making music already exists and it's the Atari 1040 ST and it's only 10 bucks? My brother in Christ, I wish the Atari 1040 ST was only 10 bucks. It's like at least 200 quid on eBay, normally more. <sighs> it's sad. He's right. He hasn't been right about much recently, out of this Alec Empire guy. Uh, and I don't really understand how he can have the double think of like being a crypto NFT guy and then simultaneously being like, you know, big tech rips consumers off and we don't need all of this new hardware anyway. It's a little bit of weird, you know, cognitive dissonance, I would imagine, but. Who am I to say what goes on in Alec Empire's mind? Uh, he is right, obviously, um, and I am working towards that. You see, I said in a previous segment that I would try out a FOSS tracker software, and I did. I downloaded Schism Tracker, and I've spent the past, I don't know, four, actually longer, four hours about um, playing around with it and learning the software and making Jungle. And... Oh my god, is it fucking sick. This is by far the best solution I've found uh, for making music on the ThinkPad. And the thing is, this software will run on my X60. I haven't actually tried it yet, but it will. Because this was designed to run on DOS back in 1995. So, you you know, it's going to run seamlessly on a computer from, what, 2000... I don't remember when the fucking X60 came out. I want to say 2006, but I might be wrong. Uh, for once, I'm actually... I, I'm overpowered. It's this and Doom. <laughs> it's the only two times I've ever been like, the X60 is overkill. Uh, but man, it's great. And you can make some sick fucking jungle with it. Break calls a little harder. Um, especially the kind of stuff I make, because I like to use a lot of reverb. And there's no reverb, because it's not a DAW. It doesn't have plugins. You do echo by just copying, like, just having the sample play at regular intervals with consecutively lower volumes each time, uh, which I've tried out and used and that's a fun way of doing things and it's cool but i've been looking for a tracker so i mean literally for years i've been looking for a tracker software that is actually usable and i find fun and this is it schism tracker is the one that i'm actually enjoying using and is actually good like i've tried out sunvox i've tried out um uh, sunvox i i don't I, uh the 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 problem with sunvox what always gets me like is the, the modular synth that comes with Sunvox, because Sunvox is a package of like a modular synth, or like a software modular synth, and a uh, tracker. And I always get caught up in the modular synth, which I don't actually like. Like I've realized now that actually, it, that's the that's not good. That part of the software sucks. The, and, and then it's just a tracker, but if it's just a basic tracker, there's no reason to just not use a much any other type of software. So Sunvox, you know, I'm sure that you could probably do some cool things with that modular synth, but I kind of don't like the node-based UI, and it's just kind of weird. Um, but yeah, the samples, it's just, it does samples, and it does tracker sequencing, and that's all it does. And you're back in the 90s, and you take your, you take your, your drum, you take your arm and break, right? Or in my case, think break. You take your break, and you get a little uh, 808 bass, and then you get a little, uh, you know, maybe a, some ambient, like, synthy pads, right? And then you get get a couple of sound effects, like birds chirping or something, or tit, uh, like a, a drop of water. And that's all you need, and then you're making jungle. Then you're making jungle, and it's sick. And it makes jungle well. Like, you're gonna see, I'm gonna be posting some of my experiments on IDMR. I've already posted one. Oh shit, people are talking in the fucking... I missed a bunch of shit. What the fuck? I looked away for one second, and suddenly people are talking. Okay, never mind. I'm trying to get you... I'm trying to work my way into the SDF uh, 
com com commode com mode com commode whatever whatever uh we're really going back to the 90s today uh computer wise but yeah i don't know i'm i just had so much fun using schism tracker and it's it's fast of course like let's not forget that very important um you know i could definitely see myself making a whole album now jungle yeah jungle is much easier to make than break call on this like not that it would be impossible to make break it, i mean you could definitely i've chopped breaks right like it's not like i'm just using a basic arm and break with no chops like i chop the breaks and maybe it's kind of like the, the the difference is that with a with a door everything kind of happens at once whereas with maybe that doesn't make any sense actually <laughs> I, don't know, I feel like you have to get your mise en place ready when you're when you're working with a tracker. The better you set up your mise en place, then the the smoother everything goes. Um, like actually chopping up samples is a little bit clunky, but that's fine. Like it's not so clunky that it's like unusable or bad. You only have to do it once. Um, but it's definitely not you know modern software that will automatically chop up breaks for you at the you know um, transients. Um, like with with some sort of software detection, you got to do it yourself, which is fine. I've done it myself in the past many times. Um, I don't know. Also, even like the distinction between like ambient jungle that's kind of depressive versus breakcore that's modern, that's the kind of stuff I make as a Kazi, is kind of a weird distinction. It's kind of like, obviously this has been talked to death at this point, but like a lot of stuff that people call breakcore on the internet is like not, it, it doesn't sound, it's not really the same as what people used to call breakcore back in, you know, like it doesn't sound like Venetian snares. And some of it I will, I'm like, yeah, that's going too far to call breakcore. That's just ambient jungle, right? Like sewer slot or something. But then some of it, like, I tend to draw the line just below where I'm at, basically. It's like one of those situations. Like, what I make, I, I'm happy to call breakcore. Although I tend to call it de specifically depressive breakcore, because it's different from, like, your, you know, a Venetian snares or something. Um, whatever you want to call it, I don't know what you want to call it. Um, yeah, there's definitely... Because I've, I've been making jungle, because the thing is, jungle is what's come, what comes natural. Like, the way the tracker software is, is laid out makes it really easy to make jungle, or, or very natural to make jungle, very intuitive to make something that's closer to, like, an ambient, not necessarily, like, super ambient, but, like, you know, jungle. And I'm a big fan of jungle. Let's, don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of jungle, and I make good jungle. I don't know, I gotta spend more time with the software, spend more time making music with it, I'm having fun, I'm having loads of fun. It's a little slow, but I think that's partially just me. I mean, everything is keyboard based, and I love memor. There is nothing in the world that I love doing more than memorizing keybinds. Okay, I love memorizing keybinds. So learning all the keybinds, great fun, but it's going to take me a while to get them all remembered. There's a lot of flip, you know, reading through the help page in the software to to see all the keybinds, and there is no Control F find you have to scroll through <laughs> you know there's that's uh so you know it's gonna take me a little while to get faster with the sort with with schism tracker but i highly recommend trying it out if you're interested in making music with with the tracker software um it's great it's a great piece of piece of software um i don't really have that much else to say about it other than like this is this is i'm kind of pogging about this i feel like i don't know i mean it's not really something you can use to make guitar type music, no thank you type music. Um, like that still, I mean, unless I want to, obviously there is a way to do no thank you type music, right? But that requires buying a bunch of real shit. Because I would have to buy, like I don't own a guitar amp or any guitar pedals. I do it all in software because I'm like, why would I spend money on something that comes already in my software and I can... I'm ex I can make it sound good, but uh, if I'm trying to become less dependent on this software, you know, there's in reality, the real way to go about this would be to have just a recording setup, to have the, the bass, my bass guitar, and then some pedals and an amplifier, like they did, you know, like normal people, and then record that with a microphone <laughs> into like Audacity or something. 
and I could do that. The drums would be a little more difficult, but honestly, some of my favorite albums are from the genre that is sometimes known as gloom or gloomcore. Uh, we're talking about planning for burial. We're talking about have a nice life. We're talking about Giles Corey, you know. Um, I, but I don't take. I'm I'm I mainly like planning for burial, to be honest. Uh, you go I, on the. Uh, hold on, let's see. Oh, it looks like they've changed the. It looks like someone on fucking the internet, probably Tumblr, has has or or what's the Pinterest? They've turned gloomcore into an aesthetic. Didn't used to be an aesthetic. It used to be a genre of music, an obscure genre of music, and now it's an aesthetic. Um, hold on, gloomcore slash new slash no. What about? Because I know there's an essential gloomcore music. There we go. We just typed gloomcore music. Oh god, liminal space music. No, someone's someone's taken this thing and turned it into something different than what it was before. What if I just type gloom in music? No, this is like some sort of weird psytrancey thing. Okay, oh god, what the fuck has happened? New essentials. Because there's that, yeah, no, is this, is this any of them? Use, no, none of this is it. Emo... I remember the chart because I looked at this back in the day a lot. Uh, this is it. This is it. Gloom, essential gloom core. So you've got you've got proto gloom. This is according to this chart. Um, where the fuck did it go? Here it is. According to this chart, proto gloom is closer by Joy Division, soundtracks for the blind by Swans, and Loveless by My Bloody Valentine. And then gloom is three albums it's leaving by planning for burial which is one of the best albums ever made uh death consciousness by have a nice life and good memories are the hardest to keep by sun devoured off which i know i've listened to but i don't remember anything about and then there's crossover slash gloom pop um which is after lives a ticking clock i couldn't stop uh aris or airs sorry gloom lights and Dweller on the Threshold, self-titled. Then there's Black and Gloom. Lone Summer, There Are Few Feeding Our Worries. That's a great fucking album. Nav, Navlar, self-titled, also a great album. And Mamalik, Fever Dream or Kurdaicha. Uh, I, that one's okay. <laughs> and then Ghost Folk slash Gloom Lounge. This is a stupid genre name. Ghost Folk, which is Giles Corey, Chelsea Wolf Apocalypse, and The Human Fly, Everything Feels Bad at Once. Now, I like the Black and... I like the Lone Summer. Lo that Lone Summer album, that shit is fucking good. But anyway, if you don't know what Gloom is, I'm just reading out album names from a chart now. The, the, the point of Gloom is there's one guy, and with a guitar and a loop pedal, and a drum machine. And so you listen to these Gloom albums... And the drums sound like, you know, default drum machine drums. And yet it works really well. Um, like stock drum machine sounds. Uh, and I've tried this before. Like, uh, fucking... Um, yeah, I made an album that was inspired by this. Uh, and it turned out okay. But I made it entirely in Audacity with no effects pedals. Um, anyway, what I'm saying is... The drum machine is a possibility. Like, there are many ways to get... Like, I mean, there's a there's a free GNU slash Linux drum machine program called Hydrogen, which I've used before. Actually, fun fact, Hydrogen is literally the first Linux program I ever used. Because when I was a child, my music teacher had it on their computer in school. Uh, and on a bootable Linux uh, flash drive, a live environment... They had hydrogen. I don't know why, but shouts out to that guy. He was fucking sick. Uh, anyway, what I'm saying here is the drums is something that's doable. Drums is something that's doable. And that's all I need is drums, bass, and vocals. And then sometimes I pitch my bass up for a guitar. And you can get pedals that can pitch things up, but they don't sound as good as the algorithms in a door. But who needs that? Because I want to make, like, I'm, I don't know, I made that stupid pop album if I want to make more pop music, I kind of need a, a door. But if I just want to make more, like, idolatrous music, which I, is kind of what I do want to do, 
then all I need is a bass and some distortion and and some drums and some screaming because I'm more like the band that I'm currently most inspired by in terms of like where I want to take no thank you is the body uh like I fucking love the body uh like noisy doomy gloomy and then a little bit electronic production experimental stuff that's where I'm fucking at in my head right now although I haven't been making much no thank you music because I've been in Estonia that's that's definitely where I'm at in my head right now um and that's something that's doable so maybe I should be make maybe I should be spending money on pedals and amplifiers and trying to actually do this because it's now that I think about it that is something that I mean it's very doable right like it's extremely doable hmm. but it, it's a big money investment it's a big money investment to do something that I already do for free the problem is right that it's not really for free this is where actually my stupid brain is being stupid because I'm like well I already have this alternative for free but it's not free because I have to buy a two thousand pound laptop every five years to keep doing it and you know right now it's it's like free if you don't count the two thousand pound investment that I've made right but at a certain point this laptop is going to break and I need to be ready I need to be ready for that certain point hmm. and then I've got everything done because then I got the 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 the, the, the Akazis on the ThinkPad with the schism tracker and I got and then I'm free I'm literally if I just do this but I don't know I don't know what fucking pedals to buy or amps to buy I mean obviously you want an orange amp this is what I know if if Sun and Boris have taught me anything, it's that you want an orange amp. Uh, but but those are expensive as fuck, right? How much do they, they cost? Hold on. How much does this shit cost? Um, store. We deliver worldwide. Orange box. $336. They sell headphones? Huh. There's a the large or a sm- oh this is a speaker hold on this isn't this isn't right this isn't an amplifier wait where's my where's the proper fucking thing guitar amp combo so I think this is what I'm looking for right wait but you you can't buy shit on this website I need to find a place to buy stuff gearformusic.com that sounds legit um these are the mini micro ones I don't think that's what I want that's not got got bass micro no give me a proper proper one. Oh yeah these are pretty fucking expensive 400 quid and that's just for the amp without a head the head is 400 quid too so that would be 800 quid for the whole package uh that's a lot of money i can buy a cheaper amp i can cheap out on the amp i have an amp but it's that amp is too bad i have an amp at my dad's house somewhere in storage but uh yeah i don't i don't know maybe i can ask i have a friend who's a gearhead who knows more about like Maybe he'll know about cheaper guitar amps. And then I can just buy, what, like, something from Earthquaker Devices? Is that a thing? Is that... That's that's a name that I remember. Earthquaker Devices, they have good distortions. I know they have good distortions. I happen to know for a fact that these guys have good distortions. So I get one of those. You know, they have this... The, the Sun Life Pedal. I mean, come on now. It's called the Life Pedal, and it's by literally Sun O bracket bracket bracket. You can't get better than that. But I just need an amplifier. Hmm. Let me. I'm gonna ask my friend who knows about music gear if there's like what's it, what, what would he recommend as a cheap guitar amp. So today has been a day of technical failures. First, the good news: Schism Tracker going great. I think I'm really getting the hang of the software now, trying to some more advanced techniques in terms of programming and echoes and stuff. Um, it's not crazy advanced. It's pretty simple, really, but. Uh, put up a track on IDMR. I think the, probably the last one I'll do for a while. Um, this one's actually a screen recording instead of me just like using my phone to record the screen um, with real audio, so you can actually hear the bass. Because my speakers can't even get low enough to play a lot of the 808 sub basses. Um, but anyway, uh, so I've made the best track I've made so far in Schism Tracker, which was definitely Pog. Highly, highly Pog. Um, uh, so that's the good news. The bad news is I tried to set up a freedom box today and failed. I found my Raspberry Pi. I bought, I actually spent real money. <laughs> you know, I bought an SD card. Can I even say this? You know, I already bought the, the micro SD to USB 
converter so I could actually flash the, the software. I bought the uh, a um, a fucking Ethernet cord, which I'm not complaining about. It's always good to have more Ethernet cords, so that's fine. Um, installed it, and it did not work. And I don't know why it didn't work. I don't know if plugging in a monitor would even help. Because you're not supposed... Like, it's not designed for plugging in a monitor. It might work. I have no idea what happens. But, frankly, I don't care that much. Because I'm pretty sure I know the problem. Which is that Raspberry Pi has been sitting around in my room gathering dust and grime. And it's probably broken. Like, that's my best guess. Is the Raspberry Pi is probably broken. So I might try... I don't know. I can test if the Raspberry Pi is broken by installing, you know, a normal... Like, Raspbian or something on it and hooking it up to a monitor the pain because i don't know where all my cables are and stuff i had a storage system for all my cables but it slowly disintegrated over the past two years since i put everything in a place where i knew where everything was um but yeah i could do that and then test if i even have a working os or sorry if i even have a working raspberry pi and if not i'm just gonna give up because uh, although the Freedom Box is a cool idea, um, there's nothing I actually... Like, thinking about it, hosting a website on the Freedom Box is, like, maybe... It's not really, like, a great idea. Like, it's not like it's terrible. It'll work, probably, maybe. But there's not really much of a reason to do so. Like, since I already, I already have web hosting solutions, I can host stuff on SDF and I can host stuff on Neosit. So, like, I don't really need, and even, it would just be a worse place to host my website, basically. Um, it would be cool for bragging rights, like, I could put a page on the site that is like, this website runs on this Raspberry Pi with a picture of it, and that would be cool. But that's basically, like, it's cool as a little hobby project or whatever, but I don't know if it's really worth it. It's definitely not worth the money that, it, like, because Raspberry Pi is expensive now. And yeah, there's other single board computers, but they're also like kind of expensive. <sighs> um, once you factor in shipping, like you, you're talking like fifty quid, which yeah, fifty quid is not like that egregious for a computer, even though it's very. Low. But I don't need any more computers, man. Like, just to host a little home server to do what? Oh. Like, this is actually the question. Is like, if I'm not going to host a website there, because I don't even know if I am anymore, because it would be a mass. I would have to... It would be a massive pain to migrate my website. It would be a massive fucking pain. I'd have to change every link ever, and then leave the original website up as, like, and it would just be a redirect link. I don't know. It, it, would, it wouldn't be impossible, but it would be a massive pain in the ass just to have a less reliable website that's worse. Um... But if I don't want to do that, what do I need a home server for? You know, it's a fucking Raspberry Pi. I don't know if you can hook up external storage to it. Because maybe it would be cool to have, if I could hook up, you know, if I could just attach. I mean, I don't know, I'm saying maybe. You definitely can. I don't know how it would work on the website. Like, if I could just have a fucking Raspberry Pi that I can SSH into, and that Raspberry Pi is hooked up to my, like, all of my external hard drives are plugged into it just as storage and then I can just transfer files over the network that might be useful to have I guess maybe but it's probably slower than just picking up the hard drive and plugging it into the computer you know like yeah I don't really have much of a need for it to be honest like the more I think about it the more I think about how I don't need it it would have been a fun project maybe but yeah, I'm pretty sure... Sh- this is me just assuming that it's the Raspberry Pi that's broken. It could be some other aspect. Like, I have another theory. This is my secondary theory. Which is that the installation went wrong somehow. Um, because I think it's possible that the the power cable I was using was broken in some way. Because it was providing power, like the lights were turning on. But then when I plugged in a different power cable different lights turned on and so i'm not sure if that has something to do with it that my my like it's i wonder if it's possible that the uh the installation fucked up because at some point it lost power during the installation and corrupted something or something went wrong um that's also a possibility in which case what do i do reformat the sd card then reflash the iso 
or whatever it is. I don't is it an ISO? It's like some something else. It's not an ISO. It's a different. It's an IMG, I think. Um, yeah, IMG. Uh, I could do that. Maybe I should give that a try right now, because that would be pretty easy to do. But I don't. I mean, it's possible that that's the issue. But I think the most likely. It's just that the, the Raspberry Pi is broken, uh, which it's amazing it hasn't broken up until now. But yeah, I haven't tested it in a while. Maybe, I mean, like, ideally, I would just have another SD card with Raspberry installed, because it's just a fucking pain. Like, having to... Uh, I guess hooking up a monitor is not that much of a pain. I'm probably overreacting to this. Maybe I should just do that. The, pro- the, the problem is that the, the router... I guess I could unplug the, the Ethernet cable from my computer... Oh, but then you have to go through a whole fucking hullabaloo, a whole fucking annoyance. Okay, I don't know if I want to do that. It's probably better to just drag my monitor into the front room. Um, man, it's a pain. It's a massive fucking pain, is what it is. Um, so yeah, I might try, I'll, I'm gonna try flash, like, you know, re, re, formatting the SD card and re-flashing the, uh, the fucking program onto the SD card and then plugging it in again and seeing what happens with a different power cable and if that doesn't work i'm giving up at least for now because i just don't have it's not that important to have a thing like this like uh, i want to like a lot of the reason that i want to do this is that i've had this raspberry pi lying around for like five years and it's never done anything like it's been lying around sitting there doing nothing for years and i've never had any use for it and occasionally I get bored and I plug it in and I mess around with it for a day, but I don't really do anything with it. Uh, yeah, I've just no, and it's like, I've just had this thing that I know is a cool bit of kit, like single board computers, a cool, cool bit of technology that I've just never had anything useful to do with. Um, so that's part of the reason, you know, I, could, I it would probably be more useful to turn this into a, a fucking, what's that thing called? You know, the ad, the, the Raspberry Pi ad blocker. What's that called? Pie hole. Like a, it would probably be more useful to me as a pie hole than anything else. Um, but I haven't done that because I'm stupid. I don't know. So that's the first technology thing that went wrong. And then the second thing is, I was trying. To, I know someone on my Discord server was self-hosting Invidious, and ever since I saw that, I've been like, I should probably give that a try at some point. And then today, I was like, why did I get signed out of my account on a particular NVIDIA instance that I use and then I realized they actually turned off accounts because they don't have a way to store them anymore because they migrated hosts and then I was like this is an excellent opportunity for me to set up my own to in- because in in the blog the, the github post where they talk about why they don't accept logins anymore they say if you're looking to make an account use other instances or install NVIDIA locally on your computer. And when I read that, I was like, install NVIDIA locally on my computer? That sounds like a very reliable thing, way to have NVIDIA exist. Um, and I just spent like two hours trying to do this, and it did not work. Because, almost entirely because, I don't use Systemd, and the NVIDIA installation guide assumes that you have Systemd on your OS. And so I had to try and find many workarounds using Run It, and just could not get this to work. It's specifically this SQL, I don't know what it is, is it a SQL library called Postgres SQL that just does not want to work. Um, so that's not a thing. That's not a th- that is also a failure. Um, so I guess I got a, f- I mean, I don't know. I should find another NVIDIA instance that is reliable, that's up regularly. Because most of them are not up reg- Like, most of them, they go down all the time. Or they're really slow, you know? Uh, which is, that's the fundamental problem. But I guess I find a new one. It's probably a good idea. Uh, but yeah, those are my technical... That's been most of my day, is just technologically failing. In those two aspects. Uh, but, Schism Tracker is fun. The, the other thing about installing NVIDIA locally is I, I was going through their installation guide, and then I was like, maybe I should just check a YouTube installation guide. This was right at the end, after I'd already basically given up. Um, and the YouTube installation guide that I found 
This guy says, and pay attention to this step because this is not in their in the official Nvidia's guide. And I'm like, what the fuck? And he says like, oh, here's something we got to do to avoid errors later, and pay attention because this is not in the. Like, is that the problem? That I didn't do that bit, so I tried to do that bit, and that didn't work either. Which I don't know why, but like the files that they were editing didn't exist for me. Um, I mean, I guess I could try again from the top. If I try again from the top, it might work, but honestly, I don't care anymore. Oh yeah, guys, um, I'm just going to use this as an opportunity to shout out to my tiny fucking audience at six and a half, almost seven hours into a podcast. Okay, by the time I truncate the silences, it will probably be less than that, but that did you guys know that there is a massive, and I mean massive, I don't know how many hours of footage this is like maybe 12 (laughs) like it's insane there's a massive documentary series on which which documents the entirety of the development of psychonauts 2 and it's just free on double fine's youtube channel now i've never played psychonauts let alone psychonauts 2 but i always liked double fine like one of my favorite videos of all time on youtube is there's a, a video of the Double Fine people reacting it live in person. They, like, invited a speedrunner of Psychonauts 1 down to, to their offices who, like, runs the game in front of a big group of them. And it's fucking amazing. It is the the original devs react to speedrun. I know it's, like, now IGN does that, except that when IGN does it, it's always like as promo for a new game that just came out and so the runs always suck because the game just came out um and it's also mostly games that no one cares about except for the valve ones when valve released half-life alex and then we're like hey how come we like hide away and don't talk to don't do anything like don't interact with the public anymore maybe we should do that and then they had like two months where they were very open and interacting with the public before going back to radio silence as usual um in a very Valve thing to do. But they did, you know, Half-Life 2 and um, Portal, which is obviously fascinating. But before any of that, before the IGN things, which mostly suck because, again, they're mostly new games, old games no one cares about. Not all of them. Listen, I'm not, I don't want to shit on the whole thing, okay? I like a lot of them. But the, the, bad, the bad ones are the ones that are these new games that have terrible runs and no one cares about them. Um... But the Psychonauts one's better because they're literally in the room with the speedrunner while he does it live. And it's it's not just like the lead the lead you know, the game game director and the lead programmer and maybe a, like a music guy. It's everyone. It's literally the entire studio in a room drinking with this speedrunner performing the tricks live in front of them. And it's just way better. Uh especially because the double fine people are like genuinely funny. Um so yeah that's a great video so that's my main that's why i'm invested in psychonauts that and the fact that my favorite youtube channel used to be a channel called funhouse which doesn't exist in the same capacity anymore i've gone over the story of funhouse many times but um as a very very brief history of funhouse um there was a show on machinima which was called inside gaming um and it was originally Actually, to go even further back, there was a show on Machinima called Inside Halo, which was a Halo news show, which then evolved into Inside Gaming, which was a gaming news show, and they added more people, and the the main three people being um, Adam Kovic, um, James Willems, and what's that last fucking guy's name? I've forgotten his name. That's how long it's been since I've cared about Funhouse. Um, Green? Am I crazy? What the fuck? Bruce, Bruce Green, I remember. How did I forget that? Whatever. And then they were doing this gaming news show, but then they, like, started to do Let's Plays, and then they sort of transitioned more and more into Let's Plays, and it became the best Let's Play channel on YouTube. Um, Just fucking absolutely hilarious. Essentially, the way that the format worked would be Adam would play the game, and then James and uh, Bruce would be riffing on the game, or just on whatever, behind him. And it was just amazing. Anyway, then Machinima died, and Rooster Teeth just bought them. Rooster Teeth was like, if you want to come over and keep doing what you're doing for us, you can do that. 
So they moved over, and I was watching them back when they were inside gaming. That's when I found them. Um, but then when Machinima shut down, they moved over to Rooster Teeth and restarted as Funhouse, added a bunch of new members, a bunch of new shows, higher production quality. It was amazing. Anyway, James, and then it all went to shit because of like multiple different reasons. People just leaving over the years, partly, but and then partly um, a big scandal. A very big scandal. Uh, it's and the channel still exists, but it's just like completely different people, and it gets no views anymore. But anyway, James Willem's favorite game was Psychonauts, and so he would talk about it all the time. Which is another reason I'm invested in Psychonauts, and he actually has a cameo in Psychonauts too. Anyway, just wanted to shout out. It's called Double Fine Psychodyssey. This documentary series, and I mean, it has a shockingly low number of views. Like, some of these episodes, they have, like, less than 40,000 40, views. Like, this is a fully produced documentary. Like, the amount of... Ad- this could be on Netflix, you know? <laughs> like, you wouldn't think twice if they'd put this out on Netflix. The fact that this is just in... It's just on YouTube for free. Like, it's insane. This is so much... Do- and it's high-quality shit, too. It's very detailed. It's, it's crazy. Anyway, I have a desire to watch the movie Chef for some reason. I've been wanting to rewatch the movie Chef recently, so I think I'm going to do that. Okay, we're going to get in. With, we're going to get into some some of the heavy philosophy part of this podcast, as is traditional. Um, so you know, when I was like more of a, when I was more significantly depressed in my life, and also more significantly interested in uh, believing edgy things, I guess. Like this is kind of in the era of cave Twitter like, weird, like, into, interested in obscure philosophy for its own sake, but without having any philosophical grounding in, like, you know, philosophers that anyone has actually heard of, um, jumping straight in by accelerationism and Nick Land. Um, I was, and even prior to that, right, prior to that as well, I had been interested in antinatalism because I was a, a depressed teenager. And this is something you get interested in when you're a depressed teenager. Is you're like, well, if I feel like this, everyone must always feel like this all the time and no one should be able to. Which I think is reasonable. It's a reasonable response to those circumstances. You go like, this shouldn't be allowed. No one should... Be, it shouldn't be possible for human beings to, to be this depressed. Um, and that, like, when you are severely depressed, it's like a... It's not just... Okay, well, firstly, it's not factually a chemical imbalance. That is a made-up thing, um, which is funny. Okay, let's not get into my anti-psychiatry rant. Um, But it's not also just a Mark Fisher, it's society's fault. Like, this is a fundamental design flaw with being conscious. And so you're going to start to get thinking about that, you know? Um, And yeah, then when I got more into some of the more obscure, weird theory stuff. I started reading Thomas Moynihan's Spinal Catastrophism and Thomas Ligotti's Conspiracy Against the Human Race. Now, I actually finished Conspiracy Against the Human Race. I never finished Spinal Catastrophism because it is ridiculously dense. Um, what I do remember about Spinal Catastrophism is, uh, as, as, is that if you go on YouTube and you look it up, there's like one video talking about it. Let me look this up. Uh, there's like one video about it. And it's this guy, like, who's in a dark room, just with, like, a red light, and he's just shirtless, like, manically talking about this book, which is the most fucking perfect book review on YouTube. Um, but anyway, Thomas Moynihan then wrote on to write X Risk, which I don't fucking care about, and the fact that he wrote X Risk, which I think is a much worse book, um, makes me have a little more skeptical view on spinal catastrophism um but anyway so i've had this sort of antinatalist bent and when i was a teenager and first thinking about it i had the very basic baby's first utilitarian ethics antinatalism uh sort of logical propositions and conclusions right which is um proposition a or you know whatever uh, it's wrong to cause someone to suffer without their consent. Proposition B, um, when someone is born and they have a life, they are necessarily going to experience some suffering. 
therefore it's immoral to ever have children, right? That's the very baby's first argument. Obviously, I'm not a utilitarian, uh, and there's some pretty obvious flaws with that line of argument. But something about antinatalism always stuck with me. Okay, that's the first part of this. Now we're going to jump onto something completely different. So, and this is going to be, it's all going to tie back, don't worry. So Richard Rorty is a philosopher who I really like despite having never read a single word that he's written. Um, I've only watched interviews and lectures he's given on YouTube. But uh, I like listening to him because he has a very authoritative and yet calming voice like go look listen to some interviews with this guy his voice is really nice to listen to but also i think he's a very he seems like an incredibly reasonable guy like his his philosophy his pragmatism is very straightforward no bullshit philosophy that i think like gets gets at the heart of things like what is truth very effectively i i, I he's like to me i mean his talk about time his talk about truth I think is all on point, except for one thing that is like something I've always had a problem with, because he brings this up like very occasionally in interviews and lectures, which, and I'm sure he mentions it in a book somewhere, but I haven't read any of his books. So if I'm misrepresenting him here, that's my own fault for not reading any of his books. Um, But he mentions Darwinism. So he goes through with something like this, like humans never get at truth, right? We never, we don't really know what truth is. We know we can make statements about the world and we know that they can be true or false, but we have no way of knowing really what it even means for them to be that. And we know we can have beliefs and we know those beliefs can be justified. Um, But that's about all we can say about truth. And that like this idea that humans get at truth, capital T truth, or that this construct, or it's not necessarily a construct, but this idea of, of truth is like super important is a bit misleading. You know, he thinks that we can do away with truth the same way we did away with God. Like we don't really need it. We'll be surprised to find out how little we need the idea of truth and we can be fine with just justified belief. Um, we know that b- beliefs can be true even if they're not justified and we know that beliefs can be false even if they are justified. Or no, wait, that's not true. The second part's not true. The second, the second thing I just said isn't true. But the first thing I said is true. We know that be- we know that we can have beliefs and we know those beliefs can be justified and we know that beliefs can be true even if they're not justified. That's all we can say about truth. Okay, so, but let's take a step back and like be Darwinists about this. Like, what really are humans? Humans are just creatures that live in an environment and we are just adapting to that environment and trying to better deal with our environment and over time we get better and better at dealing with our environment. None of that has anything to do with truth. That's really what we do. You know, we don't get out the truth of the world. We just are Darwinian creatures that are trying to get better at adapting to our environment. And this is why I disagree. This is why I think he misunderstands Darwin. And this is a very common misunderstanding of natural selection which is that the idea that the natural selection means you get better at doing stuff actually is not true you don't necessarily get better at doing stuff or like evolution doesn't necessarily produce things that are better at doing stuff um like for example we all evolved out of single-celled organisms and yet single-celled organisms are still extremely successful like there is no creature that is better at doing single-celled organism stuff than the ones that are basically the same as they've always been um you know they instead of getting better we sort of evolve into different niches but really the evolutionary pressure is just like this this is like the fundamental thing that people misunderstand is this phrase survival of the fittest is really wrong like it should be survival of the good enough to reproduce that's really all the evolution is capable of pressuring for. Like, if you're good enough to reproduce, there is no other factor that could possibly influence evolution, um, and that's it, right? So, I mean, just as an example, like, humans are, are good examples of this, right? Where, like, for example, we have, or this is not just a human thing, this is a many different animals thing, massive obvious design flaw with, with the design of people is the tube we used to breathe with is right next to the tube we used to eat with, meaning food can go down the wrong one and we can choke to death, right? Really obvious, stupid thing to do if you were designing a creature, right? That's like a really obviously bad idea. But it doesn't quite kill enough people 
young enough to matter. It doesn't affect reproduction enough, like there just aren't enough people choking to death for it to matter. And so it never gets selected out, because the change of like moving your windpipe away or whatever would be so radical that the pressure would have to be much stronger than it actually is, right? Because it would require a severe mutation or a series of severe mutations over hundreds of years or thousands millions um and so it would never happen yeah of course okay so evolution is not nothing to do with survival of the fittest it's survival of the good enough and creatures don't really get better at dealing with their environment they just get different in order to be able to reproduce effectively um like another example is stuff that happens after you can reproduce doesn't really matter anymore to evolution like, hey, this we're going back to spinal catastrophism here. The human back is fucked, okay? You know what? Let me look this up. What percentage, how many people, how many people have back pain? 540 million people suffer from back pain at any given time. 8 out of 10 people in the United States experience back problems at least one or more times. So most people, like, the human back is fucked, right it's it's clearly a fucked up terrible design because we are quadrupeds that have been like you know twisted into this bipedal form but we're fundamentally not designed from the ground up for bipedalism we're designed from the ground up for quadrupedalism and then twisted and morphed into bipedal creatures and our backs suffer and bipedalism you know, enabled us to reproduce more effectively, but it means that a lot of people live in constant pain for decades, right? But that const- being in constant pain doesn't stop you from reproducing as long as it happens late enough in life, you know, as long as you can still, as long as you can still fuck and give birth, it doesn't matter if you die in childbirth, doesn't matter, none, you know, doesn't matter if you have constant back pain and live in, in torturous conditions, none of it matters as long as you can give birth, right? So, so, so evolutionary pressure doesn't mean you're better at dealing with your environment because being better at dealing with your environment would mean this sort of thing would never happen right um so yeah i think this is like a a misunderstanding of darwin but then we're going to use this to jump off so all of this stuff is to say that we can we can go back to a critique of capitalism here okay this is a very basic critique of capital um this is not not a marxist thing this is more like a slogany internet kind of thing but i don't think it's like necessarily wrong um i guess it's kind of a marxist thing but uh like capitalism has certain pressures and uh incentives right people and firms are incentivized to maximize profit um under the assumption that maximizing profit is maximizing useful productive labor and what productive everything productivity uh, but as we all know, because the goal is so hyper focused, right? The entire game is just maximize profit. Um, there isn't enough. There, the market isn't sensitive to things which don't affect profit. Um, you know, it's like a, a a a camera that can only see one bandwidth of light. It doesn't matter what's going on in the other bandwidths. It can only see this one bandwidth of light, and so maximizing profit due to market externalities in some cases you know or whatever even when you do it maximally effectively and even if you assume that profit is generally speaking aligned with what's good for humanity it's not always aligned and and uh, you know i would argue it's quite often not aligned with what's actually desirable in terms of product producing and distributing goods and services in an economy um you know it's it, in the same sense that, that, that this, these incentive mechanisms produce a system which maximizes for some things really brutally efficiently and well, but leaves other things completely behind. Like, let's say, hey, this is trendy to talk about right now, uh, toil, labor, right? People, it's profitable to have your workers working as much as possible and for as long hours as possible. It's hard to lose profit by doing that. Um, and so because that's incentivized, you know, etc., it doesn't matter how much harm that causes to people who have no free time. Um, this is a fundamental reason why capitalism is bad. And similar thing is also a fundamental reason why evolution is bad. 
Darwinist evolution via natural selection only maximizes for reproduction and nothing else. And in this single-minded, blind quest for just pass on your genes, regardless of all the other circumstances, leaves us to suffer as a result. You know, not just in terms of, well, you know, let's say back pain or disease of any kind. Uh, there are the evolution naturally or evolution necessarily requires some level of genetic mutation, right? That's the fundamental aspect of how evolution happened. And even the level and commonality of genetic mutations and severity of genetic mutation are evolutionarily selected traits, right? So we, we have mutations at a rate which is supposedly, you know, approaching optimal for evolution, for, for passing on our genes or for reproduction, you know, like we're evolving not too fast, not too slow, etc. But of course, most genetic mutations aren't, most genetic mutations are maladaptive, leaving people with, an, you know, de debilitating and often life-ruining genetic disorders, which cause people to live in constant pain for their whole life or to suffer in many ways. And of course, there's lots we could do as a society to help those people. Um, and the fact that societies are, you know, so uncaring, or in some societies, especially modern capitalist ones, are so uncaring towards the disabled and people with genetic problems or genetic um, disabilities, is, is of course not helping the, the matter. But fundamentally, it's a function of evolution. But for evolution to work, there need to be new genetic mutations. Um, and most of those genetic mutations are going to either do nothing or be bad. And living conscious humans are the ones who have to suffer because of that genetic mutation being bad and you know that's just one aspect that's just when it mutates but even when it doesn't even when humans are basically the default model we still suffer from being conscious and you know having all of these design flaws like back pain and choking and i mean there are, there are obesity <laughs> there are so many i mean every disease every single one every mental health condition everything is because of dna and the only you know so far, humanity has rebelled against the system, because this is something we generally do, which may or may not have also been selected for by evolution, um, is rebel against oppressors. And so we've been rebelling against evolution and DNA through the field of medicine up until this point. And for most of history, it's been extremely unsuccessful. And then recently, it's been extremely successful, comparatively. But it's essentially reformist, right? It doesn't do anything to change the underlying system. The only radical, fundamental rebellion, revolution against evolution is antenatal. There you go. To stop playing the game. To stop reproducing. To rebel against DNA itself. Because we're effectively slaves to DNA. Like, here's another example, right? Like, I've heard a lot of vegans argue when... when Because a problem with veganism, right? Like, a, a moral problem with veganism is that beef cows and these sorts of animals that have been bred to be livestock can't survive in the wild. And so if every human stopped eating meat all of a sudden and consuming animal products, all of those species would die out. It would be a genocide against those species. Um, this is like a moral problem of veganism, right? And I've heard some vegans, you know, some vegans try to justify it in whatever way. Whatever, I'm not here to talk about that. But some vegans say in a sort of matter-of-fact, more edgy or brutal way, uh, well, those species are missteps in evolution and they sort of deserve to die. Um, in the same way, you know, a fucked-up pug that can't breathe deserves, that lineage of animal deserves to die out. Um, but uh, what this misunderstands is that calling that an evolutionary misstep is not accurate. In fact, it's the opposite. The this that is a massive evolutionary success. The prevalence of cows everywhere in the world, they are constantly reproducing. They're extremely ever they're one of the most evolutionarily successful animals in the in the ever in history. The the modern beef cow. Or the arguably I would say the most evolutionarily successful plant of all time is wheat. And you know, it's arguable at this point to what degree humanity domesticated wheat and to what degree wheat domesticated humanity. Right? This is an extremely successful genetic evolutionary strategy. And yet, 
you know, even let's take vegan arguments at face value here. For cows to be evolutionarily successful, because humans are a factor in evolution too, you know, and to have this massive evolutionary success means that they live their entire lives in captivity and are eventually slaughtered. What's good for evolution is not necessarily good for the individual cow. It, in fact, it, it's, you know, arguably bad for the individual cow. And the same is the case for pretty much every animal. I've talked about domestication here, uh, you know, but you could make these arguments for, for many different situations. And the only solution, you know, the vegans are correct that they're wrong in that it's these things aren't an evolutionary misstep. They're the opposite. They are evolution working as intended and extremely well. Um, and that that is bad, right? It's like when capitalists see something go wrong under capitalism, they always say that it's some sort of market externality. And sometimes it is. But in often cases, actually, this is capitalism working exactly as intended. And that's the problem. It's the same situation with evolution, that when people see something, an animal whose entire life is suffering, or a human undergoing some horrific uh, disease and suffering, they're quick to say that this is some sort of evolutionary misstep. But in fact, it's evolution working perfectly as intended. Um, uh, and it's bad when evolution works perfectly in as intended. That's the point I'm trying to make here, is that it's it, actually the fundamental problem is the system of evolution itself. And the only way to rebel against the system of evolution effectively is to opt out and to make the choice to no longer reproduce. Wouldn't cause any suffering, it's the perfect, I mean, it's basically the perfect re revolution, because no one, no one dies. It's just that no one's born. And then no one suffers ever again. Yeah, that's the argument. Now, I don't know how much I actually believe this, but I think it's a fun thing to think about. I've just realized, like, a weird mistake. I don't know if I necessarily call it a mistake. Just a strange decision that I've made in the past. Which is whenever I make a video about copyright, I always end up talking about very specifically Creative Commons licenses, when what I really should be talking about are copyleft licenses. Because I always say, share your thing under a Creative Commons license, and then I have to specify, I personally think you should use the attribution share alike clause, but blah blah blah, this is the problem, but, but really, no, I actually don't want you to use a very permissive... I mean, in in some cases, it's fine. But copyleft is is superior to, like, Creative Commons Zero or the BSD license or something. Um, I mean, there are some cases where those licenses are useful. Like, I'm not saying that the that Apache or BSD or Creative Commons Zero or public domain isn't ever useful. But specifically, copyleft is... Um, the, the, when you, it, it's the share alike part of the attribution share alike, or it's the, the GPL, you know, really, I should be using the word copyleft, um, instead of say, instead of specif like awkwardly specifying creative commons, because there's a bunch of other good copyleft licenses and not all the creative commons licenses are copyleft. So it's a weird decision I've made in the past is to, I wish I could go back and re-record those videos and just say copyleft license. You should use a copyleft license, like Creative Commons Attribution Share, or like Creative Commons uh, CC by SA uh, license, as I do. Instead of, yeah, okay. You know, if, if everything goes to plan in my life, I may never have to buy a piece of, I may never have to buy a computer again. Or really any electronics, hard, or like any computer hardware, again, unless it's parts to replace something that's broken. I could maybe just live on recycled computers, because if my, the more I get away from this bloated technology, the more easily I can rely on very simple technology that will run on anything. Like Schism Tracker, I know I've been going on about it. But it'll run on anything, right? Like, I don't... I could... And it's it's free software. That was my Discord bleep. Like, you know what I'm trying to say here? Like, I don't need nothing complicated. Nothing complicated needs to exist. And so that's music. Like, what do I do with my life? I watch anime. I watch YouTube. I read blogs and various websites. Browse the internet. Just like a normal guy. 
go on like forums and 4chan and these sorts of things. And I make music and I play Team Fortress 2. And then very occasionally I play another different type of video game sometimes. And that's like kind of it. And then I talk to people on like Discord or Matrix. Um, And yeah, that's basically it. Um, And so most of that is just web browsing in some form, which, you know, you can pretty much do on anything. Uh, And then music, well, I've talked enough at this point about how how I'm trying to get away from using logic. Uh, And then, uh, you know, the rest of it is just the rest of it. It's also very equivalent. Team Fortress 2 is not going to get an update. That's get you know, it's an old game. It's not going to stop being an old game. I'm not going to need to upgrade my hardware to keep playing it. And I'm not going to want to play more modern games. Like what, I mean, I guess there's a hypothetical world where a modern game comes out that I'm interested in that requires a hardware upgrade in 10 years. But that seems unlikely to me. Uh, I'm sleepy. But yeah, that seems un- it seems like an unlikely scenario. So I'm probably, I don't think I'm going to ever really need to upgrade my desktop. Um, I might need to replace parts, but I don't, I don't know. Like, what more could it possibly need to do? It's already as fast as it needs to be. Like anything faster or more powerful is just diminishing returns at that point. And then, so yeah, basically, I just need to figure out this... I just need to spend a whole bunch of money on some guitar pedals, an amplifier, and a cabinet. And the cabinet is really the difficult part for me, because I know what pedals I want. Here, I'm not a a pedal nerd, because I've never had to be. But I'm pretty sure I'm just going to buy the Earthquaker Devices Sun O brackets 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 uh, life pedal, and maybe a rat. Is that what it's called? The rat pedal? Distortion pedal? I'm pretty sure that's what it's called. Yeah, the rat distortion pedal. Or some sort of clone of the rat distortion pedal. Which is also... Because those are both very similar pedals. I might not even... The thing is, if I buy the life pedal, I might not even have to buy the rat pedal. Because I'm pretty sure the life pedal contains some sort of cloned circuit architecture from the rat to emulate the sound with a bunch of other stuff so it might not even be necessary to buy a rat i might just need to buy that one but the the difference is the rat is way cheaper the the life pedal is like really expensive but it's fucking sick it's like that it's like my ideal pedal and then i might need to buy a, a, a compression pedal as well for the sweet sustain. I don't know, I'll think about it. But that pedal stuff is pretty much sorted out. Like, I don't need anything complicated, I just need a heavy-ass distortion. And I already know what the heaviest sounding distortion is. It's the fucking, that one, right? The one that I want. Uh, and then, in terms of uh, an amp, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna go with... And this is expensive as fuck, but if I want a good... The thing is, I'm making the type of music that I make, right, like, like, that I'm interested in making, the sort of doom metal-y, industrial doom, noisy stuff, relies on having a good tone. Like, you really need to have a good tone, and that good tone costs money, and so you kind of have to shell out for this stuff. But it should last forever. <sighs> That's the thing. So I'm pretty sure I'm going to get the orange mini terror. I believe is what it's called. Tiny Terror. Yeah, the, the, the orange Tiny Terror, I guess. Um, which seems really good. I mean, it sounds really cool. Um, but then in terms of a cabinet, I'm not, I'm not really sure. That's kind of a difficult thing. I guess just whatever I can find. Like, it shouldn't really matter, right? Or the Micro Terror. The Micro Terror, I think, is what I mean. I think the Micro Terror is cheaper. Um, I mean, I could get an orange cabinet, but those, I mean, those are probably great. Ugh, it's tempting. <laughs> it's very tempting. It's so tempting, but they're so expensive. Hold on. Let me look this up. How expensive are they? Here's some random website. Oh, they're a grand... Okay, this one's... I mean, the bigger ones are obviously more expensive, but they sound way better. The smaller ones sound like shit. 
Oh, it's so expensive. It's 969 pounds for this. But this is the exact one that I'd want. Oh, it's way too high. There's no way I can justify that, right? I don't think I can justify that amount of money. Yeah, I don't know. I guess I should go for something cheaper. I don't think that's something I could justify. Unless I, like, get a job. What if I get a job in order to afford this stuff? That's actually hella an option. I should think about that. I should really go to sleep. Listen. Listen, bitch. Listen, bitch. <laughs> You've heard of rhizomes because you, you know about dilutes. You've heard of rhizomes. People talk about things being rhizomatic. But listen. Did you know there's also rhizoids and rhizines? Yeah, I'm doing a little bi- fucking plant biology. Botany. We do a little botany, although not the, the fungi aren't plants. But fucking, if you got a goddamn moss, a goddamn bryophyte, or perhaps a, perhaps possibly an algae, they attach themselves to things with little bits called rhizoids. They're little protuberances um, that are basically little root hairs. They're not as interesting as rhizomes. Rhizomes, a little more flowy, weird, you know, interconnected. But frankly, to be honest with you, and this is kind of, this is going to be, this is going to be unpopular. This is an unpopular opinion. Deleuze choosing rhizome as his metaphor for, you know, I understand, I mean, okay, he, he wanted it to be a plant, you know, some something to to be um, as a counterexample to arborescent modes of thought, right? So being some sort of plant biological thing makes sense. But I think he should have gone with mycelial, because mycelial networks, in my opinion, more closely resemble the sort of thing he's talking about compared to rhizomes because rhizomes thing about rhizomes is they're very small like they're very small systems generally speaking compared to root root networks which are not you know when it comes to trees can span you know very very large areas and be very complex um even though in their design they're very simple right in their in their layout they're very simple um Rhizomes, they tend to be much smaller, they're only on like certain smaller types of plants, and they don't really do much, like, they, they, there's, there's normally not much of them, and they're not as weird and fucked up as people think, in my opinion. They can be, but I think, like, they, they're not as centralized as a root system, but they're not as free-flowing as I think Deleuze thinks they are, <laughs> or wants them to be. They can be, but they're, they're often a little, slightly more linear, I think. Maybe I'm crazy here, maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm maybe I'm being too crazy. But normally rhizomes are just sort of one thick bit that comes off of the plant, and then a bunch of spindly bits that come off of the thick bit, right? Which is also kind of how roots are, it's just, like, they're still... A somewhat linear relationship there, but mycelial networks are completely non-hierarchical. <laughs> They're completely nuts. They're just nets. They're just maybe and maybe hey 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 hey. Maybe this is me fucking up my understanding of Deleuze. Maybe this is me fucking up. My, maybe this is on purpose that Deleuze wanted to have this as a particular metaphor. Oh well, it works. Whatever. We all know what he's talking about when he's. We all know what we're talking about when we say things are rhizomatic. Okay. We all know. We all know. Know what we're talking about when we say things are rhizomatic. Yeah. And so rhizomes. I understand rhizomes much much more um, interesting than rhizines uh, and the other ones. What were they called? Rhizoids. I understand. Like, rhizoids, they don't even networks. They're not even, like, roots. Like, they're not even as complicated as that. They're basically just little hairs that kind of anchor a, a moss or a fungus to the to the to to some sort of substrate. And rhizines are basically the same sort of thing. Um, they're very... They're just sort of spikes or hairs that come out of the bottom of it. But for lichens, in the case of rhizines... Man, I love lichens. I love lichens. It doesn't get better than lichens, I'm telling you. In this world, 
It doesn't get better than lichens. I'm gonna go put some chicken in the oven. I just woke up pretty much and uh, yesterday when I was falling asleep. Okay, I, I fucked with my blog a bit. Um, this is, let me put on a 20 minute timer. Hold on, we're gonna get my phone to do that. Phone, turn, two o'clock, boom, okay. Um, so yesterday, when I was falling, I was like kind of very sleepy. I was fucking with my blog, yeah, no thank you, neocities.org. Because I wrote a blog post, which was why I don't have a newsletter, because, well, it's complicated, I was... I was on the Lions forum yesterday, just sort of lurking for a while, and there was a thread about email newsletters, and it was an interesting thread, but I just wanted to think, like, maybe I should, because this is, I've responded in this podcast before about why I don't have an email newsletter, and uh, I thought maybe I should make a, just a very brief blog post about it, just so people know, you know, just so it's there in text, and you don't have to listen to, like, a 12-hour podcast to get to the answer. Because it's something, it's a question that I get, like, relatively frequently. Um, and it's also just something that people in the small, small internet sort of blogging community that I'm a part of, my website is sort of gesturing towards, maybe would be a more accurate way to phrase that, you know, they often do this sort of thing. So I wanted to make a easy to access, clear text-based thing of why I don't want to do that, which I did. But then in making that, I realized that my website is not laid out very well in the back, that everything is just in one folder. There's no directory structure to my website. Like, I don't know if you've noticed every, well, you now it's too late because I've changed it. <laughs> but it used to be every single page was just in one directory, which is not convenient for managing the back, to, for man, managing it, for knowing where things are. You know, I have to sort through a big list of just pages that are just dumped in one folder. It's a bad way to do things. So I went and moved all the blog posts to a folder called blog posts. Um, you know, nothing nothing too crazy. Nothing too crazy. But that then I went to sleep and then I woke up and the good student had messaged me on Discord informing me that actually doing that had broken a bunch of links. So I had to go fix that. But anyway, why was I talking about this? Right, so I went and rearranged my blog, and then in doing so, I went and read back through some of my blog posts, which I think the early ones are better (laughs) than the more recent ones, because they're much shorter. And, like, I have had this idea for a blog post for a very long time, but I'm just not that interested in writing it, to be honest, which is about... I have two ideas for blog posts. The thing... You know the rant I went on about Darwinism? That could be a blog post, and that would be a really good blog post in my opinion. But it's also, the problem with it is that, like, that that whole, like, ideology that I just constructed there is, like, and I, you know, obviously I don't actually believe that this is the case. Like, I, the, the thing I'm about to say, I think is an incorrect interpretation. Um, but it could be read as a little bit eugenics-y, <laughs> right? Because I am saying, uh, you know, people with genetic disorders because they suffer would be better if they didn't exist which is like you know kind of a i could see that how you could be like that's eugenics and just to be clear here like i i i agree that generally speaking people who have espoused that sort of ideology have been eugenicists and it's a dangerous it's a dangerous thing to go around saying because really what i should have been harping on about rather than people with genetic disorders, is just, the, like, everyone. That everyone suffers under evolution. Uh, like, uh, to, to a, you know, people with genetic disorders have a particular uh, level of suffering or whatever. But what I wanted to point out, again, is, is more so that the, this, is not a, this is not evolution going wrong. This is ev- that is evolution at working correctly. That is evolution as it is intended to work. It just is going to give people completely fucked up, torturous lives from time to time, uh, where they're in pain their entire life. Like, this is supposed to come from a place of sympathy. And secondly, you know, it's supposed to lead into the idea that uh, life in general is kind of suffering. That actually, although some people suffer to an extent that's more measurable and physical, 
uh, we all suffer to a large extent because of um, Darwinian evolution, and that therefore it should be rebelled against. But you know, I don't believe in this like too strongly, right? I just want to like get this clear. This is more like an idea I'm exploring rather than an idea like I I am super attached to. Uh, so that's one reason I don't want to post it because I'm a little worried. I need to come up with a better way of talking about it that that like doesn't lean on arguments that I think are like a little just a touch closer to eugenics than I'm happy going. <laughs> you know, I definitely, generally speaking, want to steer clear of eugenics in your life. Okay, you know, if you see if you're if you're driving down the highway and you see eugenics on the left. You want to turn right, okay? You don't want to be there. You don't want to go down that path. So I need to, like, come up with a better framing for this argument if I'm ever going to make it. But then the other reason is I kind of don't want to make it because, like, so what? Like, it's just kind of a stupid... I don't know. Antinatalism is an argument that comes up a lot. And when I say, like, I'm... You know, I used to call myself an antinatalist, and now I say, like, I'm sympathetic to antinatalism, right? And people assume that I'm, like, a better never-to-have-been idiot who's, like, using some stupid bastardization. Or it's not even a bastardization. It's a, it, just a... The guy who wrote Better Never To Have Been is a fucking retard, okay? Because I, I watched one of his, like, podcast appearances, and he's like, oh, I'm not a utilitarian. I'm not a utilitarian. But he only makes utilitarian arguments. It's so stupid. And, I mean, you can make some sort of argument using the Kantian categorical imperative as well. Uh, people should be means, ends in themselves, rather than just means, right? You can also make an argument like that. But I don't believe in any either of those moral systems. Um, and, like, maybe you could argue that my position is actually, ultimately, kind of one of those moral systems. Because I am, at the end of the day, arguing against suffering in like a semi, you know, maybe you could, if you're arguing against oppression, you could, you could say, and well, how do I know those things are bad? I must be arguing from a similar kind of moral framework as Kant or, you know, utilitarianism. Um, but I'm, I'm more so arguing it from an anarchist moral framework than anything else, right? Uh, <clears throat> like that's what I, that's what I really should have had a hammered home harder, a little bit of alliteration there. Hammered home harder uh, is that uh, this is like a view on antinatalism and evolution from an anarchist moral framework, or from even more broadly maybe an anti-capitalist moral framework. Uh, <clears throat> so that's kind of why I need to spend more. Th- basically, I haven't made that blog post because I need to spend more time thinking about it uh, to t- try and clean it up a little. Right, so we're we're steering well clear of anything that's like eugenicsy because I don't like that, and a lot of antinatalism does stem stand kind of close to eugenics, and I don't I don't want to be associated with a lot of antinatalism as I've already explained. I think most antinatalists are idiots. Um, so yeah, and I want to make my ethical or the ethical standpoint of this particular argument a little more clear, a little more well thought through. Uh, so then the other post that I've been wanting to make for like a year is on biophytic anarchism. Uh, and this was what I like almost wrote last night before I went to sleep, but then I was like, no, I need to fucking sleep. I should, I should just go to sleep right now because I am too tired. Um, which is that a while ago I wrote a blog post called Am I Still an Anarchist? And reading through it, it's really obvious to me like what was going on in my life right then. Because I, I fucking, I wrote, I wrote two posts, like, pretty close together that are kind of outdated views on my political evolution, which was uh, single issue and am I still an anarchist? Uh, you know, single issue, I talk about uh, destiny a lot, <laughs> which is something that I'm, like, I'm very no longer give a fuck about destiny. Like, I have completely moved on with my life from my arc of like watching destiny at all i had like a, a few months where I, I got into watching destiny and then the more i watched him the more i realized that like he's actually kind of retarded firstly he's actually kind of retarded but secondly like i watched him for the political debates especially with lefties right because i don't really it's very easy to debate fucking like hardcore conservatives and destroy them because their ideology doesn't make any sense but like it's more interesting to see a 
like m from my perspective on the internet i almost always see like lefties dunking on liberals right and it's rare for me to see dunking on lefties from a liberal perspective um <clears throat> and that's just interesting it's nice because i've seen you know leftists critiquing other leftists ad infinitum and rightists critiquing leftists ad infinitum but i don't see that many libs critiquing leftists in a interesting way and so that was like some that perspective was something i didn't have any tool like i was just not exposed to before and it was really interesting to see destiny do this because i think he i do think he you know other people have pointed this out i think he acts as kind of like a uh a filter for the left like if your ideas can't get past it like he's he's good at challenging people's assumptions on the left and making people make arguments that they're not used to making um I've, as i've watched more of it though i realized that in some sense you know he's not he's he may be good at like internet debates but in terms of the actual logic of his arguments they're things that work really well in spontaneous internet debate but i don't think they would work some of them i don't think would work very well in a more reasoned, you know, written or expanded form, right? Like, I think they kind of run out of steam. And the only reason they function well in internet debates is because they rely on some sort of, like, small detail or nuance that is hard to explain quickly. Uh, like, well, I'm not going to get into it. But all of that aside, you know, whether or not... I still think that those debates are useful. Like, it's it's useful that these exist, in my opinion. I know a lot of lefties disagree. But I think it's useful to have someone who will push back on ideas because it forces you to strengthen your ideas. I think that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. The problem is that he stopped doing it. <laughs> he doesn't do it anymore. All he does on his fucking YouTube channel is talk to red pillars. And it's, it's fucking stupid. Like, he just does all these, these, like, terrible videos now that I just... For months and months, I was like, oh, I guess he's just doing this arc where he's talking to Red Pillars briefly. But I just fucking watching this shit. The trans athlete. He talks about just just constantly debating the most boring trans issues ever because, you know, anyone who's got half a brain has already come, already knows all of the arguments. And it, it's, oh my God. So it's very boring. It's just very boring. All of his stuff got really boring. It got incredibly boring. He's just talking to people I don't care about about stuff I don't care about. So I kind of fell off about this. And also I found him to be quite annoying after a while. Like, I suddenly had the realization that his speaking patterns are, like, identical to Ben Shapiro. And that made him, like, basically unwatchable. So I really want to take that post down where I'm like, oh, I've been watching a lot of Destiny recently. Because now I look back and I find Destiny, like, pretty fucking cringe. Uh, but I think it was good watching destiny because it strengthened some i mean it strengthened my arguments against the liberal perspective or it, it didn't just strengthen them because i went back right this is the thing this is literally what happened to me right is after watching destiny and some other events in my life uh you know i was becoming a lot more disenfranchised with anarchism um this is what i want to make a blog post about basically but it would suck because i'm bad at writing these, well, I'm not necessarily bad at writing, but I just can't be bothered to write this. But you know, after watching Destiny and some other things, I sort of was like, well, yeah, these solutions aren't very practical. Like, you're never going to have your anarchist utopia. Anarchist e economics is like some, you know, nonsense that doesn't even make sense. And like, I sort of like retreated back into being a lot more closer to a. And I like the other events include getting more interested in real world politics, like actually following, uh, you know elections and global geopolitics and stuff like this right which i'd never been interested in before but i'm now like generally speaking vaguely aware of and so i was you know as those two things happened at the same time being bombarded with lib i don't i'm saying bombarded that's too dismissive but being exposed to a bunch of lib critiques of leftism and more radical politics and then simultaneously gaining an interest in real real world politics that um you know sort of party politics and individual issues and so on um, my mind changed on, on some things where I was like, yeah, you can't just go around saying after the revolution, after the revolution or whatever, right? Like this is just not helpful to anyone. It's a completely not helpful ideology. And so because of this, I sort of became, I sort of briefly for like a few months ended up, I would say basically thinking about the world like in, in maybe democratic socialist or even social democrat kind of perspective much more traditionally statey leftist 
capitalist, you know. Dem sock, sock dem, maybe more dem sock than sock dem kind of perspective. But then, you know, living in a, that perspective, it became clear to me why I was an anarchist in the first place. Like, it, it slowly, the flaws in that way of thinking kept presenting themselves, and I ended up, you know, in a very different form, which I call biophytic anarchism, returning to a more anarchist way of thinking about the world. And what I mean by that is that really, when I, when I wrote that blog post, Am I Still an Anarchist?, that was about this. But I hadn't thought it through yet enough to realize what I was really talking about, which is that what I'd actually completely lost interest in as a political project or some sort of central political idea was revolution, that I had like completely lost faith or interest in the concept of revolution. And so because of that, I had leaned back into Demsoc more traditional, or, sorry, more moderate capitalist politi- real politics. Um, but as time has gone on, I've realized that a lot of these solutions, or a lot of these problems, I think, if you want to be a pragmatist about them, actually the pragmatic approach is an anarchist approach, i.e. to do it yourself through mutual aid networks and a parallel movement. Uh, this is actually, like, that. That the more that I look at these issues... And the more I see, well, capitalism is not going to solve it. The market doesn't solve these problems. And the state isn't going to solve it. You can't just be reliant on the state because the state has no interest in solving a lot of these issues. Um, you know, in the UK, currently, we have Rishi Sunak in power, who is an unelected conservative who is just knows he's not going to be in power for much longer and is currently trying to fuck up as much shit for the next guy as possible. Like, that is his legitimate goal. It's the only thing that explains what he's doing. Um, And it's terrible. Uh, But then the next guy is a guy called Keir Starmer, who is... um, He he loves saying this thing. uh, So, effectively, this is the situation that we're in. You... you, Oh, that's that's my chicken. God fucking damn it, I was making chicken to make a burrito because I went to the shops yesterday to buy a bunch of Mexican ingredients and I realized I forgot to buy fucking tortillas. I did, how did I not notice that until just now? I forgot to buy tortillas. God damn it, I forgot to the shops again. Okay, I've eaten, I've eaten my delicious chicken burrito. I'm back to talk about UK politics. So just very briefly, um, Rishi Sunak, the conservative, is gonna, implementing massive austerity cuts. And uh, every time Keir Starmer gets asked about this, like, this is his favorite phrase. He goes, look, we're going to have to make some tough decisions. Okay, so it's like if you had if you had two options, right? One of them is Hitler. And then, and then every time the other was like, okay, so Hitler's going to do the bad stuff. Uh, the other guy, what do you want to do? And he just says, look, we're going to have to make some tough decisions. Every time he just says that, and it's, it's terrible. We're fucked, right? Um, and there is no candidate who is better <laughs> there is no better we're, like we're not supposed to have a two-party system um and i i mean it's pretty obvious to me that the greens and the lib dems are going to get a, uh and the s p are going to get a decent portion of the vote in the next general election which is good i plan on voting for the greens personally um because you know they get seats they actually have a say in parliament which is good it's not like america where you just have a president uh but still a little fucked. Anyway, the point I was trying to make with this, I've been talking for way too long about this politics stuff. It's very boring to most people. About the the anarchisty thing. Is that, like, actually the pragmatic solution is, well, we have plenty of people, including myself, who have a bunch of policy positions and advocate for various policies and vote based on what we want and so on. And that's good and fine. But it doesn't really get much done, right? And revolution is not on the cards. I don't know if you've noticed, but it's not. Um, and so the the goal is of the anarchist thing that I'm talking about is just to create parallel systems which are self-reliant and based on a system of mutual aid. So like as an example, I mean, during COVID, there was a bunch of new mutual aid networks that popped up to distribute PPE and masks and so on, right? Like, I'm not saying that, that anarchists right now can do everything, okay, mainly because of state intervention. Like, it's not possible that anarchists could, I mean, it's possible theoretically, but, like, it's not going to happen that, like, a bunch of anarchists could take, so the trains suck, right? Trains are fucked. Like, what if a bunch of anarchists just go went and took over the train line 
and they could just manage it. Like, that's theoretically possible, and it's provably possible because there are a bunch of volunteer-run, you know, like, steam loco train lines that exist not-for-profit. Like, it's very possible for these sorts of things to exist and be self-managed. Uh, but it's obviously not going to happen because the government would just send in the cops and kill them all uh, or arrest them all, right? So it's, like, obviously not a thing. But you can, in a, in a biophytic sense, create systems on top of capitalism or parallel to capitalism that are more robust because capitalism is constantly in a state of crisis, right? It's got this boom-bust cycle. We're in a bust cycle right now. I don't know if you've noticed that. Um, and so in that situation, you want to make, you, you know, there's, there's a bunch of systems that, are, that, that, that suck, particularly the ones I'm concerned about right now are like the technology-based systems, right? The, the internet and technology-based <coughs> systems. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, which I, I, I mean, obviously have massive problems and make up a large portion of how we spend our lives these days. And so the alternative is not to, I mean, you can't, you know, government regulation would be great. That would be the real way to solve the problem. I agree with like, um, what's that guy's name? Whatever. Um, but that's not, you know, even though that might happen at some point, as far as I'm concerned, we can't afford to wait. Uh, and so the solution is to create your own parallel infrastructure, an alternative place where you can exit. Like you need to be able, you need to create the opportunity for exit. Um, <clears throat> and the other, I want to say like, this is all about avoiding toil, right? Like one of the big problems with capitalism is endless toil. So every all of this this anarchisty stuff, it should have it should be fundamentally based on an essence of hobbyism and play. I know this is kind of a loose idea, and this is something that I think maybe like tanky style communists would make fun of anarchists for. But we're living better lives than you, so fuck you. You know this isn't about going and working in a factory for ten hours a day. This is about setting up systems based on uh, play. <clears throat> Which is good and fine and fun, and I enjoy doing it. Like I, you know, this is actually, in my in my eyes, something that a lot of people just don't understand. A lot of capitalists don't understand. Which is like, why would you ever do anything if it wasn't for money? Like, <clears throat> you can just do things as part of a sort of gift economy type of situation. I mean, here's an example. Again, I'm more interested in the tech side of things or more knowledgeable about the tech side of things. Like, all. Technology, all of the infrastructure that all of the major tech megacorps use is based on free software. And free software operates, generally speaking, on a gift economy system. Now, there's no, I'm not saying that the free software solution or the, even the open source software solution is flawless. There are problems with free software projects, the way they're managed and so on. But <clears throat> the results speak for themselves. If you're watching this on YouTube right now, you know... Every single video platform on the internet, YouTube, Twitch, Netflix, every time you're streaming video on the internet, every company that deals in video, their back end uses FFmpeg, which is free software, right? Like, they, they, they fundamentally rely on FFmpeg. Um, you know, if you're... Uh, I'm recording this in Audacity right now, which is obviously free software. Or, <clears throat> you know, I'm recording this on Audacity on Mac OS. Now, Mac OS is not free software, and that's fucking cringe. But... Apple's entire software architecture is based on the BSD kernel, if I remember correctly, um, <clears throat> a, a modified version of it. So even they, you know, started fundamentally from a free software, um, permissive licensed, you know, piece of software. And Android is open source, which is why we need to hammer home copyleft licenses, okay? Everything needs to be these viral copyleft licenses, and this is the way of the future, man. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about anymore. But that's what I'm saying, okay? I feel like I've lost my momentum because I took a big break to eat chicken. And I've lost my momentum now. But the point is that there's a bunch of shit that you can do do it yourself. To me, anarchy means do it yourself. And do it yourself means working together in, the, in a mutual aid gift economy type of situation. Um... There you go. It's not that difficult. It's not that complicated. Is it? Is it going to revolutionize the world? No, of course not. And a revolution isn't particularly desirable, in my opinion, because revolution is a civil war. And I don't, you know, there's some bad parts about my life, but I'm pretty sure being in a war would be worse. 
<laughs> now, of course, there's this, you know many wars going on right now, but it's caused ultimately by capitalism in some aspects. So maybe that's some argument, but I don't care. Don't talk about me. Uh, being in a civil war would be I can pretty fucking conclusively say this fact, okay? But I, my life right now is significantly better than it would be if I was fighting a war. I am not the. If we're trying to improve people's lives, starting a war is a bad idea. Um, and not to mention the fact that the war would probably be pointless and we would probably lose. Um, like if you 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 just have to look at the history of attempted uprisings and revolutions and peasants' revolts, and you'll see that they almost always ended in failure. Like the majority of historical attempts at revolution have ended in failure, either because they failed initially or they have successfully overthrown the government only to descend into barbarism or something worse and collapse. This is the story of the majority of revolution. So like I'm not it's hard it's a hard sell. That revolution stuff to me is is not easy to sell to me, right? Like it's 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 a pretty flawed idea. Um <clears throat> but that doesn't mean but so when I say anarchisty stuff, I'm not talking about like in the anarchist utopia where blah 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 no no no. no. I'm just talking about doing shit in the real world right now, in a pragmatic sense, in, you know, in a better, more resilient way, in terms of mutual aid, free software, these sorts of things. Okay, that's that's the kind of thing I want to write about, but I'm not entirely sure how to go about writing about that. Man, after I ate that fucking burrito, I lost my entire flow of conversation, and guess what? I just spent way too much money and ordered a burrito. That's right, I had a burrito for breakfast, and now I'm going to have a burrito for lunch. But the second burrito is ordered, so it doesn't count. Because there's no Mexican food in Estonia. I missed it so much. I went most of my life with eating zero Mexican food, because there was never any Mexican food in London. And then over the past, like, two years, after COVID, suddenly there's a bunch of Mexican food, and it's so fucking good. <laughs> and I, yeah, anyway... Here's another thing. This is kind of connected, but slightly disconnected to the what we've been talking about. When it comes to tech and internet, I'm a proponent of something that I call digital localism. So what that means is, you know, I hear a lot of people they they talk about uh, when when they when they respond to problems with platforms that they see, uh, they they talk about we need an alternative to twitter we need an alternative to youtube we need an alternative to instagram or something like this right but inbuilt into that is the assumption that there will be one place where we all go and that that's a good and valuable thing but that's cl- very clearly not a good and valuable thing that there, there's if you're making some sort of free open source project uh you know or some sort of you know little managed forum or website or whatever um, you don't want to have to put in all of the thought and, and design that would make it scale to an infinitely big size to compete with Megacorp-owned platforms. Like, that's just a bad idea. There shouldn't be direct competition. Like, you can't do that. <laughs> Sometimes you can do that. Sometimes you can do that. But I think in, in a lot of situations, you need to have a more indirect competition via digital localism. Smaller, slower places that are for a community these are often better i mean they're just better places to be like all the best places on the internet are little you know forums right comparatively small with maybe a thousand people or something small alternative image boards small bbs's small forums and everything on like you don't have to do this mastodon thing where everything is interconnected using the same protocol because everything is already interconnected using the same protocol. It's called the hypertext transfer protocol. That is what a hyperlink is. <laughs> you, you're good. You're already fine. <laughs> you, that's literally built into the internet. You can't fuck that bit up. Okay. You don't have to worry about all of this fucking everything's the same protocol nonsense. You're already Everything's already the same protocol. The web. It's, it, it's baffling to me why this is so valued. But just little se- separate but interconnected things that are smaller in, in, in scale individually because it's more manageable and more understandable and it means that if something breaks you can re-implement it as an individual person or a small team of people right like 
um, let's take Sushi Chan for example. Sushi Chan, one of my favorite websites for for a very long time. And back in the day, it was it was owned by some guy. I believe their name was Seikatsu or something like that. And you know, it's been around for ages. And then one day. Um, he just literally disappeared off the face of the earth. He disappeared, and he just and Sushi Chan like he stopped paying his hosting bills and it just went down. And so someone just like or some small group of people just revived Sushi Chan, you know, basically independently, archiving all of the old stuff um, and reviving it brand new. But it's the same website because it's just a simple, you know, Vi Chan thing. Like it's very easy to re-implement. Um, if you have, obviously not from scratch, but if you already have access to ViChan or whatever, I'm assuming it runs on ViChan because everything runs on ViChan. I could double check actually. Kaiten Sushi. Uh, yeah, it used to be called SushiGirl.Tokyo. See, that's how old I am. I fucking remember this. Okay. I, I remember back when, uh, when it used to be called SushiGirl.Tokyo. Uh, yeah, it's ViChan. The tiny, tiny board. I don't know. ViChan is correct. Yes. But you see what I mean? Like, simple things that can just be re-implemented very easily. It's good for resilience. Um, but obviously, it's not always... Like, these things, when you have uh, something like this that's run by a small team, there's also a heavier likelihood of it going down because, you know, one person might run into financial trouble and not be able to support the website anymore. Like, that's something that happens all the time. Um, I mean, this is... 420chan recently died, but it's coming back. Like, this is the thing, for, at least allegedly. 420 chan is coming back but it's coming back under a more centralized provider where you know i think hot wheels is buying it or something um which is not ideal like these are problems these are obviously problems but they're much i don't know they're not distributed enough but the concept of an image board can never go down if you know what i mean does that make any sense i don't know like there's obviously problems where things go down and and, but everything is transient man (laughs) but i guess part of the point of it is resilience, and you could argue that this is less resilient, um, but in reality, there's nothing mechanically that means that, like, something like Twitter can't just go down and disappear one day. I mean, actually, very factually, this happens, because Twitter started deleting old shit, and also making it so you can't access the website without an account, so, you know, in terms of resilience, these every platform is susceptible for being bought out by some billionaire or slowly going to shit. Um, you know, the difference is that it happens faster when it doesn't have, you know, billions of dollars of venture capital to make that death slow and painful, rather than being supported by one guy accepting donations where the death would be, like, quick. Everything is going to go down eventually, Um, but a simpler place is simpler and nicer. And it would be nice if, you know, these, like, 420chan was mismanaged, clearly. I don't really know the exact story of why it got shut down, but, um, you know, it would have been nice to have, like, more notice. (laughs) I don't use 420chan very much, like, recently. It was something I went on, like, a few years ago that I kind of stopped using. Um, But it would have been nice if there had been, like, a smooth transition to new ownership. Like, obviously, nothing can solve poor management. Like, if something's managed poorly, it's managed poorly. But, I I mean, the example of Sushi-chan being revived, or even, like, something like 1chan still existing after however many years um like how how fucking old it's like the second oldest image board right like it's from like 2000 i don't even know it's it's like ancient uh let me look this up 2003 right like it's fucking it's the first thing that the first chan that was made outside of 4chan it's the first old chan and it still exists it still exists and it's still like used like it's not it's not it's like it it slowed down, but it's still a thing. Anyway, I'm thinking about Team Fortress 2. Here's the thing. Like, I think <clears throat> it's it's extremely fucked up that it's not standard practice for developers when they stop maintaining a game to open source it. Now, that would obviously create a bunch of problems with, with, with hackers with for a multiplayer game. But, um, like, it's still insane to me that the Gold Source engine isn't, like, GPL'd. Like, it's, it's actually ridiculous. I, I legitimately... Th- We should start a campaign. We should start a campaign. Not that Valve ever listens to campaigns, but it would be something that's like relative. It would be like a day's a day's work for for one Valve employee to to upload it to GitHub. You know, it wouldn't be very difficult. And there is Zash 3D, which I haven't looked into. Actually, I probably should look into this. Zash 3D is an open source like uh, reverse engineer 
of of actually do we even you know what what am i talking about if we if we have zash 3d what do we need what do we need the gold so i mean i guess the development tools and stuff i don't really know but i think zash 3 i've never tried you know that's what i'm gonna do today i'm gonna try and get zash 3d up and running and try and play half-life in zash 3d because i've been wanting to do that for a long time and i uh, just haven't done it and then you know, now's a good, it's a good day to get into Half-Life custom maps. I've always wanted to get into Half-Life custom maps, um, but I've never, never gone around to it. So, I don't know, there's so much stuff in this world, man, and I'm quite manic. I don't know if you noticed from the fact that I went on, like, a 20-minute rant about capitalism, but I'm quite, I'm quite mania-pilled right now, and uh, it's a good time to get shit done, you know? Okay, let's do a calculation of how much it would actually cost to buy the gear that I want to buy to never have to use logic again. Um, okay, because okay. I'm gonna need a calculator for this. Calculator, perfect. Okay, so step one, we're gonna need, this is ideal dream scenario. And since I like to make doom metal, and doom metal is a lot about tone, I would like to get close to an ideal scenario. So let's look at ideal scenario. Okay, first things first, the Earthquaker devices, uh, Sun Life Pedal V3, which is 331 pounds from this place, 300, let's go 340, because this one's on sale, so let's go 340 as about an average, uh, so 300, and f oh, that's 200, 340 pounds plus... A orange um, micro terror. This is what's well, from this place. A hundred and nine pounds. Okay, one oh nine, and then plus, and then the cabinet. Honestly, I don't know. Let's just say an orange cabinet. Okay, let's just say an orange cabinet. Okay, this one's too. I don't know which one's a good. Let me let me see. I don't know which which one I'd want. Uh, guitar speaker cabinets. This one's too small. This one's too expensive. Orange PPC two one two VBK vertical cabinet in black. I mean, this looks sick. This looks pretty legit. Although, is it tiny? I kind of can't tell how big this is. Oh no, this is a normal size. Okay, and this is six hundred ninety nine pounds. So, 699, and then, let's say, throw in a compressor pedal of some kind. I don't need the compressor, necessarily. You know what, let's, let's do, the, actually, I'm pretty sure, yeah, you know what, I think the compression is not 100% necessary. I'll need a couple of cables, but that's probably not more than, like, let's say, 10 quid. Um, so, that comes about to... 100, 1,000 to 158 pounds, 1,158 pounds for my ideal setup, that is not, like, money I can just spare, <laughs> okay, now, here's my question, if we divide that by minimum wage, um, wait, hold on, London living wage, because it, I think it might have changed, okay, 11.95 per hour, what's it, what's that per month? Okay, what what's that per day? Eleven ninety five per hour. Well, I could just I can just eleven ninety five times. Oh, I guess it depends how how long you work for each day. But whatever. Okay, so divide by. Let's just round it up to twelve. Oh shit! What the fuck did I just do? Hold on. Uh oh, I just. What did I say? Uh oh, I fucked up my. I pressed the wrong button. I pre Hold on. What was it again? Okay, well. Apparently, it would be 12 days, basically, like just over 12 days of an 8-hour day of work at minimum wage. I don't know. Honestly, two weeks, basically, of 8-hour days. I might start looking for a job. <laughs> I don't know. I think the better option here, right, is to... The better option is to wait until my Mac breaks, because I'm, I'm pretty sure what will happen, right, is, like, let me, so, using my Logic and Amp and Pedal Simulation, 
is actually better than the physical gear because it's much more configurable, right? You can swap things in and out and change every sort of parameter and automate things very easily, right? So it's actually better. It's also, like, quite convenient because I can do it at night, for example. I mean, I guess I could plug headphones into an app, but uh, you can't really record. I guess, could you record the headphone out? Maybe you could just record the headphone out, but then it's not going through the the actual cabinet, which is going to add to the system. So I don't know. There's, there's, um, logic is better. It's easier. It's what I'm used to. I already have, you know, presets that I've made that sound good to me. Um, so I'm like worried <laughs> that I would spend all this money and then it would just sit there because I wouldn't use it because I wouldn't need to. So probably better option is to do this when my Mac breaks because it'll, br- we know it's going to break eventually. In, in in like five years or whatever that we know that these things all have planned obsolescence right so it's it's gonna break at some point and yeah if when it breaks i just instead of spending the money that i would have spent on a new mac i will just spend it on some equipment and then you know i can just record on the think back maybe maybe a microphone as well actually that's another thing to budget in i would need a new mi- microphone i mean i guess i could record it with an s with my sm58 but yeah, maybe an Electro Voice RE20 for nice bass tones. I don't know. There's many options. We have many options here. Um, we're all good, frankly. I think mostly I want to move off of the Mac for guilt reasons, right? And for coolness reasons, right? Like, it's it's it feels good to not be... Uh, whatever. It doesn't matter. I think I'm getting a little too invested in this thing. It doesn't matter as much as I think it matters. Because, like, the thing is... If it was just a situation, if it was li- if the world worked like this, where I could just press a button on a on a I could go to some government website that was called GiveMeAJob.gov.uk, and it would it would click me a button and it would automatically assign me a job that I can do for one day a week, and then I just did that for twelve weeks or you know two days a week, whatever, right? It would just give me a, a part time job. I mean, I guess Job Center exists. I don't know what the Job Center does. What does the job center do? Like, a branch job, executive agency, that doesn't explain what the... I mean, I've I've not really gone to the job center before. It's mainly for benefits, right? But I don't want benefits. Use the find a job service. Oh, there is literally... Wait, did I say that that there was a website called findajob.gov.uk? Is that what I said? Because there is literally a website called findajob.gov.uk. What the fuck? Um, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just see what happens here. Um, anything here? I can't drive, I'm not a pediatrician, nor do I have a psych- psychologist or financial analyst qualifications. Um, okay, let me, l- there must be some sort of, like, part-time option or something like this that would be more, ah, yes, or maybe temporary. Yeah, let's just see what happens. I'm just going to look this stuff up. I don't think I'm going to be getting a job because I don't like having a job. My whole life is oriented around the fact that I can avoid having a job. So I'm just kind of doing this out of curiosity right now. Like, you know the scene in Rick and Morty? Like, this is the thing, right? Is that this website exists, but it's not what I was talking about. Because what I was talking about is, you know the scene in Rick and Morty? I don't remember what season or episode or whatever this is. There's a scene where, like, aliens come and take over Earth or something. And Jerry, is that his name? Is, like, like they just, like, a robot comes up to him and just, like, scans him and is like, you have been assigned a job, and then gives him the job. And that's what I want. I just want to, I just want a button I can press and I will just get assigned a job. And it can be, like, just, like, manual labor or some bullshit, right? That I could just do for a, a couple weeks and then afford, you know, guitar equipment or whatever. Because the thing about me is, so long as I know a definite time frame, I'm much more capable of dealing with shitty environments, right? Like, as long as I'm, like, every day I could go into some shitty job and I could just be like, well, I only have to do this for... 11 more days, I only have to do this for 10 more days, I only have to do, yeah, as long as that was, that was a thing, I think I'd be able to manage it, um, but that's not the, this is not how it works, instead, you have to beg some guy for a job, and it's a whole fucking process, that's the, that's, like, really what I hate, like, you have to go and, 
and beg some fucking guy to hire you with a resume and you have to dress up nice for an interview and go to an interview which is like the most humiliating experience that a human being can be put through i mean you know what i you know what like maybe i should start a new hobby of just going to job interviews just to fuck with people that would be funny as fuck because no one's like I, I, there's not that's that's not illegal right like it's not illegal to just go to a random sign up for a job go to an interview and just 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 fuck with them right surely that could be funny um <clears throat> i don't know none of these all look like the worst fucking jobs ever there aren't any good jobs really but the ones that don't require any specialization i mean obviously i don't know what i was expecting i was expecting just like go go fucking i don't know i want to i want to just put me in front of a factory <laughs> <laughs> an assembly line or something, I don't know. Okay, since you're getting a job is not an option, because they won't just sell me down the mines like they used to back in the day. I just want someone to send me down the mines. But let's let's try some more uh, reasonable... Uh, let, let's, tr- let's compromise on the equipment, okay, instead of just buying the most expensive thing. So first, a Proco Rat instead of the Life Pedal. That's £75. Um, and then... Let's see, some sort of orange preamp. I think it's probably, mm, I don't know, let me go look into some, not preamp, sorry, just amp. Let me go look into some amp heads and see what I can find that's cheaper. Okay, I still think the Micro Terra is, pro, or Micro Dark, Micro Terra is slightly cheaper, is probably my best bet. Um, so I think that would probably be, I wish, £109. And then a cheap cabinet. Something that's a cheaper cabinet. Um, this is the bit where I really don't know anything about. I mean, I don't know much about most things, real gear, but I know fucking nothing about these cabinets. So, um, I guess I gotta just look for some stuff. Can I... Okay, I've not heard people talk about this, and it's really weird, because it's very obvious point to me that I've always had, like, a very obvious problem with, and... It's something that I would imagine lefties would get right, and yet I've never seen any of them get this right. And it's a small semantic point, but it's also the implications are quite important in my opinion. Um, So when people talk about settlers or colonists or invaders uh, expropriating land from native nomadic groups, for example, in the colonization of the Americas, not all of the American indigenous people were nomadic of course but north american plains and canada a lot more of those groups were nomadic um and continue to be nomadic in some in some cases uh but what i don't like is the use of the phrase stolen land and now hear me out i understand that it's a very rhetorically powerful phrase but i don't believe it's accurate i don't believe it makes sense because these people wouldn't have thought of the land as belonging to them. The indigenous Americans would not have thought of the, their, it being their land. And therefore nothing could be... It wasn't like someone came along and stole their private land property because they didn't have uh, a system of privately owned land. Let alone... In, you know, it doesn't really make sense. I think a better word is enclosed their land. If you don't know what enclosure is, here, this will be a black pill for you. The enclosure movement was something that happened in medieval England, where, uh, I believe, in the 1500s, um, there was a, there, a lot of the land in England was commons, i.e. it was owned, it was under common ownership, right? No one, no particular person owned it, and whole communities would work on it communally. And the enclosure movement was uh, a movement by aristocrats and, you know, the, 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 the barons and so on to enclose all of the commons, to take, take all of the commons and divide them up and say, actually, this common land belongs to this baron, this common land belongs to this lord, etc. Um, and that's, that's, I think, a much more accurate framing of the seizure enclosure of land from indigenous american groups because it wasn't like 
they had private land property. Like, to compare this, and this is the, the, the here, compare this to, like, if I went up to, your, to you and you had a, a, a toothbrush that was yours, and I took that toothbrush, I would have stolen it from you, right? And part of stealing is that I've denied you access to your toothbrush. But also part of stealing is that the toothbrush was yours and now it's mine, right? Um, but it, So it's not just denying someone access to something. Be- because, like, if I, I could own a toothbrush and you could say, can I have access to it? And I can say no. And I wouldn't have stolen the toothbrush from you because that was never yours to begin with. But, like, okay, now that we don't have much that's kept in commons these days, so it's kind of hard to think of an example. Um, you know, they pretty much have just left us with, like, the air. That's <laughs> about what we get. Um, I don't know. What's what's in common? <sighs> I don't fucking know. There, there isn't really anything. There isn't really anything. But it's, you know, if there was some communally owned resource like, like air or, or a public street, I guess the public street's not necessarily communally owned, but it's communally used. Uh, and I said, no, you're not allowed on this particular public street. I wouldn't have stolen the street from you, but I would have denied you access to something that you previously had access to. It's not necessarily ownership. And this is, I think, a pretty important distinction, because when you talk about this as a leftist, you're critiquing the concept of land ownership. Like, you really want to drive home that what drove these evils wasn't, you know, some bad guys from England and France. It was a... a uh, an ideological system which naturally resulted in this enclosures. I think that's uh, that's why I, I think the word in- enclosure is the best. It's a better term, or exp- expropriation is also a better term. But theft, I don't think, is accurate. I don't think theft is accurate. Um, so there we go. And I also I th- I think this is how you know this is kind of what copyright does, in my opinion, is that like intellectual property like the idea that that can be stolen is basically nonsense from a physics perspective uh, from a physical perspective it only makes sense as a legal concept um and so it's more accurate to say that i mean you could describe it as a kind of theft of from the commons but it's it's a denying access to something that should be held in common anyway just thinking about that maybe next time you're talking about the colonization of America and other places, Africa as well, had similar things, um, and uh, North Asia by the Russians as well, or East, sort of North, mid, Middle middle Asia, I don't know what to call it. What's that place called? You know the bit I'm talking about, where the Mongols were, that bit. They were, they were nomads. I mean, they kind of had territory, but it's a bit complicated. Like, the concepts of private property, like we have them now, are, like, not a super common way of thinking about private property, like, until they get into... You know what I mean? I don't know if you know what I mean. I don't know if I know what I mean. That's not to say that no one had borders. Like, there have been borders without capitalism. Like, there were, there were, there were borders and territories, but it's about ownership rather than just, like, residence. You know? Does this make any sense? I don't know if it makes any sense. So I brought this up because I just watched Philosophy Tube's newest video, and, you know, I'm... Philosophy Tube's very hit or miss, and I know, why am I even saying this? You don't care. Like, who cares what my fucking opinion is on the latest Philosophy Tube video? Like, really? This is what we're doing now? But then on the other hand, I'm like, it's my podcast, I can do whatever I want. And on the other hand, I'm like, but is really what I want? Is this, like, what does it mean to want something? Is it hubris to believe that I deserve to be heard, my opinions, in, in a in a 12-hour long podcast? Um, I mean, this entire concept of, a, of the fact that this is my thing now, that I make 12-hour long podcasts. Like, I hope that people will understand that, like, this is intentionally kind of a parody of content slot. Like, I hope people understand this. That, like, this is... Maybe this is too pretentious. But as well as just being something I find fun to do. And something that I, like, you know... I I, th- I personally would want if I was in your position. As well as that. It is also kind of an art project about content slop. A- about, you know... 
it's it's a little bit of that too. Like I hope that that's not like lost in translation because I haven't said that explicitly because I hope that like this is kind of an inbuilt mechanism, but maybe I should make that more clear. But anyway, I'm going to do it anyway because if, if that's what this is, then this fits right in. You know, I think that this philosophy tube video about about um ethical AI is fine. It has a few problems, one of which being the language that I just talked about. Um, and there's a couple other moments where I think that the language and assumptions of property, especially intellectual property, creep in to points that I think are reasonable. Like, you know, it's not unreasonable to say, hey, uh, it made me really uncomfortable when someone non-consensually made AI-generated pornography of me. Like, that's a reasonable complaint to have, in my opinion. Um right and even you know to say that it's sort of feels violating because we put a bunch of effort into making this in one particular way and you are taking our work and twisting it into something that you know ignoring all the effort and divorcing it from all the content like i can see some aspect of that but on the other hand that that whole segment really felt a little unpleasant to me i always see Anyone putting limitations on art, and yes, I know it's controversial to say, but AI art is art. Um, as long as one person says it is, then it is. Uh, or cre- you could at least call it like creative expression, if you don't want to call it art. And it, maybe it only just barely fits that definition, but someone had to make it, someone had to think about it, that makes it creative, Okay. You don't uh, just because you don't like it doesn't mean you get to decide that it you know isn't creative. Even if you can argue it's not as creative as some other things, or you don't personally value it as highly as some other forms of art, which I agree. You know I'm I'm not the biggest fan of AI creations because they tend to be bad, and that's perfectly reasonable. Um, you know you you can't just sit there and try and mental gymnastics your way out of the fact that actually a human mind did create this. Um, like someone expressed their creativity through this and the thing that loves me the wrong way about it is when people say like oh you t- you know we put so much work into the, for producing this piece of art and then you just took it and twisted it into something that completely misses the original vision isn't that exactly what sampling is in music this is exactly the the language and logic that was used to uh prejudice mainly black artists making hip-hop uh and it has economically bankrupted many black musicians historically who, you know, were the group that invented sampling as a culture. And for years, it wasn't considered to be artistic until finally, you know, and slowly it was, you know, accepted more widely. And now it's a super common technique everywhere. And the same can be said about uh, DJing, that like, you know, curation as creation is a whole argument but there were, there, I remember, you know, stupid nine gag memes, where, uh, like dissing DJs. That there's like a lot of hate for DJing. It's very confusing and strange. But anyway, I just like have a natural response where I'm like, this. I don't like this way of this form of argumentation. I don't necessarily think you're wrong. Like I think that the fundamental point you're making, that artists deserve compensation for their work is completely reasonable and correct. But I, I, the way you're going about making the point strikes me as a little odd. Like, I don't, I, I don't really... It, it doesn't sit right with me because it reminds me of a bunch of other arguments that I really don't like. Um, okay, so that out of the way. I didn't like that segment, even though I appreciate where she's coming from. Um, but then at the end, the video ends off with a, a sort of something that I think is very good and very accurate, and something that I think a lot of people forget, which, but then, in my opinion, doesn't really examine the consequences of what she means by this. So, the, the, the sort of last segments of the video are about how AI is physical stuff. AI is not just a floating mind in the ether, it is physical hardware produced by labor the 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 software is physic you know requires data labeling labor that is extremely exploitative um uh, she conspicuously didn't mention how much of that labor was 
in service of censoring the AI from speaking ill on, uh, you know, moral subjects. But that's a little bit of a conspicuous omission, I think. Um, but it all, you know, this is all very accurate, and that you know we don't really AI requires electricity. It requires, you know, it's really complex computation, which has been around for years. And I think this is all very reasonable. And the, all of this, the critiques brought up were, generally speaking, you know, I think pretty good. Um, but then at the, towards the end, when she talks more about the ecological effects of all of this as part of the ethics, this is why I think she, you know, I, I'm just a bit more radical in terms of what I actually believe is an ecologically sustainable technology. Like, I don't really think she appreciates the extent to which the technology we rely on is ecologically unsustainable. And, like, to what degree ecologically sustainable technology would be different than what we currently have. Because it, it would be a large degree. Um, and the, the phrase she ends the video on is, there is no ethical computation under capitalism. Now, this is something that I, uh, frankly, just, just flat out disagree with. Depending on your framing, depending on your framing, because maybe you could make arguments that what I consider to be ethical computation is happening outside of capitalism, but it's still happening. I don't know. I, I, I don't think that that's necessarily reasonable to say. Um, but scavenge computing is a thing, okay? Scavenge computing. Computing with hardware that you have scavenged from, from waste or recycling plants or uh, donated and, you know, all of these sorts of things. That is extremely ethical. That is the, that is undeniably ethical. And free software. I'm sorry. In what sense are though? If you are running free software on scavenged hardware, or at the very, you know, even if you don't want to go as far as scavenging, you could say, um, you know, second hand, like my ThinkPads. Listen, I don't want people to. T I don't want you. To, you're basically talking shit to me, okay, bitch. This is my version of veganism. This is my software veganism. <laughs> if I'm using Linux, I'm in the clear, okay? That's not really the case. But what I mean is, I don't know what I mean. I'm just trying to say, I don't think most people have a clear grasp on just how ecologically unsustainable um, everything we will, all of the stuff that we rely on really is. That, like, even a secondhand ThinkPad X220 is probably too power hungry to be reliable, you know, in a situation where. Uh, energy is actually as scarce as it responsibly should should be considered, you know. Like, let's say you live in a world, for example, where there is a way to... I mean, this is basically what capitalism is, but, like, let's say there's a way to get diamonds. Um, but you can get diamonds. But in order to produce those diamonds, you have to throw a bunch of babies in an incinerator in the third world, you know, in the... In, some, you know, poor fucking country in South Asia or uh, somewhere, right? A bunch of babies get thrown into an incinerator and out comes diamonds. And we produce massive amounts of diamonds like this, right? And we cover everything in diamonds like it's your first, first ever Minecraft creative world when you're 10 years old and you just make everything out of diamond blocks, right? You have to cut down on diamond production to fix the ethical problem. Right, there is no fix to the like. There's still diamonds going to exist if you get rid of the the baby incinerator, but it's going to be way fewer diamonds. Okay, maybe diamonds is a bad example because they're artificially scarce, but imagine something that's actually scarce. <laughs> right, like there's a way to get it to be massively abundant, but that way is you know not good. We don't want to be throwing babies into the incinerator. That's a bad bad thing. Right. Um, even if you can't see them because it's happening in a third world country far away, doesn't mean it's any it's not a bad thing. Right? Babies in the incinerator, we don't like it, and so we just have to put, put like there's no fix for that that doesn't also mean that we have less we have fewer diamonds in the world. Uh, we don't produce as many diamonds. We're gonna have to stop putting diamonds on everything. It's just a fact, and it's not just. And you can go walk around and you can say, well, actually. Most of the, 70% of the diamonds in the world are used by just 100 companies. But that still leaves 30% of the rest of the diamonds, <laughs> that's us, you know? Like, those 100 companies, they're not just sitting there doing nothing. They're making the stuff that we use every day. Well, actually, most of them are oil companies. And those oil companies are powering... Yeah, well, yeah, they, they power the businesses. They, they eventually trickle down to the consumer goods that we use. 
does this make like do you understand when people say oh stop pressuring individuals to change their behavior when you should really be you know regulating corporations that is true but regulating those corporations will also mean changes to the lives of individuals at the end of the day if if it was actually done to the degree that it needed to be done because energy is not that cheap like energy producing energy is the baby incinerator maybe it's not quite as bad as incinerating babies but it's pretty bad you know there's i mean it, yeah i don't know what to tell you man <laughs> i don't know what to tell you man like uh, whatever i think a, yeah this is this is basically where i'm coming from yeah, i don't i don't think the philosophy tube has quite understood the extent or i would like to you know well whatever what's interesting is that you can do both sort of things, right? You can you can be you could just be preparing for scenarios of scarcity by using OpenBSD on the ThinkPad X60. You don't need all of this powerful shit. I'm telling you, I, every time I make a video, every time I record something, it always comes back to like, guys, your 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 hardware is overkill. Your hardware is overkill. Just run better software on lower end hardware. It will save you money. Why aren't you doing this? Like I've been, I've I've. I need to fucking hold on. Hello, Denpers. So yesterday, I had a very out of character experience. At least for modern, no thank you. Uh, I went. I went to what is effectively a club. Um, yeah, I think it's fair to call it a club. It's a kind of particular club where it's it's very uh it's a bit strange. It started off as like back in the day. I think in like the seventies, it was just like a regular pub. And then they had live music sometimes, and like over the course of like many decades, it's like evolved to focus more and more on the live music, and it's like effectively a club, but it's in a bar or in a pub. Like you go there and it looks like a pub, but then it has like it's kind of I don't know it's hard to explain, but it's that kind of thing. It's a very culturally relevant venue in London. I won't name it, but you know I'm sure you can find this information if you, you know, whatever. So I went there because. I've been making Jungle on Schism Tracker a lot lately, and listening to a lot more Jungle, and I was like, Jungle's, uh, people still listen to Jungle, there must be, like, can I really say I've had the experience of listening to Jungle if I haven't listened to it, like, in its intended uh, venue of, like, you know, being in a live environment, like a club or a rave or something, and I'm like, I live in London, surely... There's a, like, jungle was invented here, <laughs> it's still big here, you know, surely there's some jungle night at some club I can go to and get the true experience, because normally I don't like clubs because they play shit music, that's, okay, there's three reasons why I don't like clubs, it's too damn loud, number one, always ridiculously too loud, it's too many fucking people, and they play shit music. If there was, if it was... Good music? I think I might have a good time, though. So, I went looking for Jungle Nights, and I found that there was... Adam F. was playing a set um, at this place. And I know this venue, I know it's supposed to be a good venue. So, and I'm like, Adam F., I know that guy, he made Circles. Here is Circles by Adam F. Ad blockers are not allowed on YouTube. Kill yourself. You probably heard this before, right? And then it goes tick 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 tick. Tick 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 tick. Yeah, classic jungle tune. One of the most classic jungle tunes. And so I recognize this guy's name. I'm like Adam F. I know that fucking guy. Hell yeah! I would love to listen to some like liquidy, chill, jazzy drum. I mean jungle. That would sounds fucking awesome. So me and my friend, I got us both tickets to go here. He, but he's only one of the people playing, right? There's a bunch of other people. Anyway, to cut a long story short, to cut a long night short, it's not that I had a bad time. I would say I had a pretty good time. But most of the, I was, like, not super looking forward to it. So I, on the website, it didn't list the times when each person was playing. Um, so we get there, we get in, and it turns out on the door, it lists the times, and Adam F isn't playing till 2 a.m., which is a bit of a shame. <laughs> But that's fine, you know, staying out till 2am is not too crazy at all. Just wasn't expecting it. He's actually the final, you know, headliner of the night, which I guess makes a lot of sense. Um, But first, we had to listen to a bunch of these, like, there's two back-to-back live drum and bass bands that that both sucked. 
like I've heard, you know I've seen on YouTube people trying to play drum and bass in like a live I don't know it's like either you make it sound shit by like focusing more on like having all real instruments or you try and make it sound more like real drum and bass by using a lot of samples and like you know sort of playing over a backing track in which case it's just like why even have the live band in the first place and these were all the second type whereas like they're basically just playing over a backing track um and some of them were just miming like uh i saw one point one of the singers was literally just miming like lip syncing and then the drummer in one of the bands like the whole time even no matter what the drums were playing like no matter what the drums in the the actual that you could hear were playing the actual drummer he was always just playing like and then like eighth notes on the hi-hats like like he must have been so bored because that's all he played the whole time. The whole set was just that. But the drums you would hear coming out of the PA was like, you know, it was like completely different. He just played this. But you could hear him and it just sounded bad because you could just hear like drums over drums. <laughs> it didn't sound good. I don't know, man. All the live bands sucked and they were all playing pretty cheesy drum and bass. Um, but now listen, here's the thing about drum and bass. I don't hate drum and bass. But I don't like drum and bass either, because it's all very boring, most of it. Like, the more clubby, you know, jump up kind of drum and bass. The problem with, with it compared to Jungle is that Jungle has all of the interesting syncopations in the, the, the rhythm. It, you know, it's not just straight arm and breaks. They chop them up, and they make all sorts of inco- interesting syncopated rhythms, which makes it fun to dance to. Like, that's the point, in my opinion. It, it makes it interesting, and it makes it fun to dance to. Whereas every drum and bass song is just... And it's so boring. And then it's always like... You know, it's just the same bass. Every, every single drum and bass song sounds exactly like that. Or maybe they have like a little like... like a... I'm not the best beatboxer, but... Like, they just have a little melody... And it's very boring. It's very boring to listen to. And so having to go to this club and listen to that the whole time, very boring. But then finally, you get to Adam F. And what does he do? He comes on. He plays circles twice because it's the only song he's known for. He plays circles once, right? And it's not even the real version. It's a drum and bass remix of circles, right? Uh, He plays circles once. Actually, no, no, no. The first time he played it, he played the real version. He played circles, right? And then he mixed it into another track which was a more drum and bassy track, and then halfway through the second drum and bass track, he mixes Circles back in and plays a drum and bass remix of Circles, and then he plays Jump Up the whole night. What? Are you kidding me? The whole time we waited to listen to some fucking jungle, and they played like a couple of, like he played like maybe three jungle tunes his entire set, and the rest of it was all drum and bass. Very boring to listen to, very disappointing. And it, was, it, it wasn't like it wasn't fun, like, dancing to drum and bass is still kind of fun, right? And obviously, I was, you know, fucked up on all kinds of different things, so it wasn't that bad. But, uh, and then the second thing, way too loud. It was so fucking way too ear-piercingly loud. Like, we had to take regular breaks going outside the sort of smoking area because the club was just way, like, it was just too loud. Like, you not just that you can't have a conversation, but, like, it's actually painful. The snares especially just painfully loud could not handle it man so i don't know if i'm gonna necessarily i mean i heard that 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 venue they do like jazz nights sometimes and they have like actually good local jazz bands and shit so i might go there and listen to some jazz at some point but yeah that was definitely disappointing that adam f only played drum and bass i didn't know he was drum and bass guy now i thought he'd be playing jungle i'm a goddamn junglist and the guy the mc that's the second thing whole time adam f was playing they had his mc whose mic was Turned up way too loud over everything, so all you could really hear was him <laughs> all the time. Like his, 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 and he was very annoying. Uh, like he just kept making noises. Like he wasn't even rapping over it a lot of the time. He was just going like, <laughs> it's just listening to a guy just do that to a microphone way louder than anything else. It was very bad. <laughs> it was not. I mean, you can imagine. It was just kind of comedic, but it wasn't even that funny because it was so painfully loud that it was just kind of uncomfortable to listen to. So we kind of, yeah, we didn't really stick around for that long after Adam F started playing and we realized what was going on. Um, 
So that's pretty much how that went. It's, I wouldn't say I had a bad time. I'd still say I had a good night. But I am definitely was disappointed in the music. I was definitely disappointed in the music. Um, but yeah, that was, that was something that happened. That was definitely something, that was definitely something that happened. Okay, now I'm gonna go, uh, oh, and then I, I was just ranting to my friend about shit he doesn't care about. <laughs> I, I, um, I, whatever. <laughs> There's one more thing I was gonna say, but I forgot what it was. Fuck. I was gonna say one, one more thing to you about this night. I definitely remember, but, oh, the other, th- here's the uh, actually really good thing. The venue, they had, like, outside, I said there was a smoking area, but it's really like a whole courtyard, like, it's a pretty big area outside. It was fucking freezing. There's all these girls dressed in, like, you know, very revealing outfits. I don't know. Like, I respect these people. Like, how do you go outside? It's so cold. I was, like, wearing, you know, I was wearing a fucking two t-shirts, a hoodie, and a jacket, a trench coat. And I was fucking freezing. And there's these girls in, like, you know, basically just a, like, a crop top and, like, short shorts. And they're fine. How are they not, like... It's crazy that these people do this. And they're standing outside completely fine. I was free. We were both freezing. Me and my friend. And yet all these girls walking around dressed like it's the middle of summer. Crazy. I don't know how people do that. <laughs> that's, that's actually wild to me. But yeah. In the courtyard area, they had like food. And the food was really good. Like they had really good Jamaican food. It was so, man. I, I got this jerk chicken burger. Oh man, that shit was good. That shit was so good. I love jerk chicken. And, man, good ass fucking... Real real good goddamn Jamaican food. You can't go wrong with jerk chicken, honestly. Jerk chicken is one of the best foods out there, in my opinion. Okay. That's all I have to say about that, I think. You know, I've been going on the Lions Forum more, more often these days. I'm quite enjoying the Lions Forum. Really good forum. Um, very, 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 very nice community. But, um... I, I've noticed a couple of people... I think I've seen two people who have talked about this thing called Fair Camp. And I've looked into it. It's a, uh, a, to quote from the website, or from their GitHub, it's a static site generator for audio producers. And what it, I mean, effectively, it's obviously the name is based on Bandcamp. And yeah, it's a, I mean, it is what it says it is. It's it's a little, I don't really even know what it is. It's a little JavaScript thing, maybe? Uh, like, if I had to describe it, it's just, it lets you have sort of a, a play, pause button, track name albums and then a little like audio wave display as the as the like progress bar for the song and like i guess it's kind of you know it, it's it's what license where's the license where's the goddamn license read me this is the read me the license a gpl so it's gpl so you know i can't complain about it you know um but I mean, it's it works. Like, there's nothing wrong with it. It's fast. It's responsive, and look, I guess it looks kind of nice. Um, and you, you know, it's like there's nothing necessarily to super complain about with this. But here's my here's my my question: Why not just use the HTML audio tag if you just want to put audio on your website? Why do you need this? Why not just use? Why don't just put an MP3? Like, what do you gain from this? What can it do? Maybe I'm. Hey, maybe okay. Hold on, maybe I'm missing something. Maybe I'm missing something. But what advantage does this possibly have over just the HTML audio tag? Is there some sort of, like, specific thing that this does? It allows downloads that already exist. Unlock codes. Oh, I see. Okay, so there's a couple of stuff about paywalling. Paywalling your stuff. Hmm. Okay, I can see that. I think it's maybe more just... Okay, there is a couple... Is maybe it's more about just like streamlining the process of setting up like albums and stuff. Okay, maybe I'm being too dismissive of this, but like I don't see why you wouldn't just use the fucking HTML audio tag. Um, like why not just have an MP3 on your website? I guess if you need to paywall it, or they have soft, so it's like it's not a real paywall. It's just like a hey, please you can donate here. That's kind of neat, I guess. Okay, maybe I'm overreacting. Like, it just seems a little... Maybe I'm definitely overreacting about this. To me, it's just like, why not just make a normal website and just have audio embedded? But, okay, maybe this makes sense. Okay, so I think I figured out a way to, um, to, to host my music on my website. And my idea is that I will... Because I happen to own a domain 
on sdf.org. And I don't know what their file space restrictions are, but MP3 files are small. Yeah, I don't believe in all, the, all of this high quality audio nonsense. And if they want, if you want high quality downloads, go to my fucking Bandcamp, okay? If you want WAVs. But on my website, here's my idea. If I just host all the MP3s on SDF, here's here's my idea for the web page. This this might be what I do today. I might do some do some of this. Here's my idea. I set up a page. On, I'm going to restructure my website. So instead of just having a page called Sounds, I have one that says Podcast and one that says Music. Um, and then you click on the Music one, and then it has little links to you know all of my albums. And then every and then it is it would have a little like you'd click on the album, and obviously it would take you to a page with all the audio. But the audio isn't hosted on NeoCities. The audio would be hosted on an SDF.org domain. Um, and then that all works. And then the page would have a little thing at the top which says, like, all my music is free. And the free would be a link to the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike license. Um, but please consider donating on one of the following platforms. And they would link to Patreon, Libera Pay, and maybe a PayPal link or something. Uh, I think that's a good idea, and I think I'm going to do that today. Wait a minute, wait a minute. My audio's already on Cybergrunge. Okay, you know what's a better way to go about this, actually? Because this is actually stupid. Why bother doing this? I'm just going to have an iframe. Fuck this. This is stupid. I'm just going to have it because this is a massive fucking pain. I'm just going to have an iframe for Cybergrunge. That's what I'm going to do. Why not just do that? That makes so much more sense on my website. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to have a fucking iframe that's just my cyber grunge, like cyber grunge donut slash artist slash no thank you. The only problem is total organ failure horizons on here twice, and I really want to figure out a way to delete that because I've, I've tried a bunch of times. It doesn't like to work. So I got to fucking figure out how that works. Okay, let me try and fix that. Right, listen. I could go through every single page of my website and change the navigation bar so that instead of sounds, it has one tab for podcasts and one tab for music. That's one way to go about it. Is that cleaner? Yes, it's cleaner. Uh, But I don't want to do it. Or I could just change the sounds page so that it lists podcasts and music. Like, it has one... It just has links on it. Uh... Or I could make... No, this is the best way to do it. I, uh, the best way to do it is to separate it into s- one for music, one for podcasts. <sighs> okay, I gotta go change every single page of my thing. This is better than my previous idea, which was to literally... Oh, that would have taken forever. Okay, I'm gonna go do that, I guess. Man, I tried to play fucking TF2 today for like hours I've been playing. I'm having the worst time. I'm having zero fun. Because I suck. I haven't played in like two weeks. And I'm on a new set. Last time I played, you know, I was at Dotsmite's place. The first, I mean, I played I played one very brief. You would have seen it if you watched the video even further still. You know that bit in the video? That's all I played. One game on Swiftwater. I didn't even play the whole game. I left before the game ended. Because I was like, nah, I'm not having fun right now. I didn't even play a full game. And that's it. And then, like, in last time I played, you know, I was at Dotsmites on their setup. Now I'm, now I'm playing. I've lost everything. Everything I had of the game. I'm terrible. <laughs> this is it's not fun anymore. <laughs> and I've also just been getting a... I don't know if it's... Like, Valve servers have been really bad recently in terms of... Ba- oh, today. In terms of balance. Like, every game, no medic. No medic ever. No medic every game. I'm just trying to play demo... Get back into the swing of things. I got kicked from one game because I didn't want to go spy. Because every the, everyone on my team, or everyone on the enemy team went sp- Okay, here's what happened. Here's what happened, long story short. I was playing Engineer Frontier, right? I was playing Engineer. And here's what happened. I was in... I don't know how to describe it. I was in a little alcove with my... And, and I set up a nest to hold the first point, pretty much, right? Um, and I, there I go, <laughs> setting up my... Level 3, I've got it. I get my dispenser up, and I get a, a little tally up in the back, right? All good. Nest, as you'd expect. Then, I turn around. One spy, I see him. He's a, he's like a scout or something, you know, but I see he's running running slowly, and I'm... That's a spy, so I kill him. 
And then I turn back to, to up, keep upgrading my dispenser. And then I see out of the corner of my eye, I look over, another guy's running towards me. That guy's also sus as fuck. Uh, definitely also a spy. <laughs> so then I try and kill him. And then I'm also, at the same time, trying to keep my sentry up. He, he fucking... I think he managed to sap my dispenser. Uh, but I, I don't know if he got the sentry. I don't think he got... I don't know, I think he did also get the sentry. No, he didn't get a sentry, I remember. He didn't get the sentry, he got the, he sapped the dispenser, so I'm trying to kill him, and I'm also trying to, you know, unsap the dispenser at the same time. So I kill him, I turn around to unsap the dispenser, and then lo and behold, I turn around again, and there's another spy, it might, I don't know, <laughs> it was ridiculous. The triple spy, just one after another, it was insane. Like, I've never seen that. They were all, literally, they just came pouring in, the second I would kill one, another one would come come down. And so, because of that, that made me mad. Because I was like, what are you fucking supposed to do against that? Like, legit, that's just not even fun to play. It's not fun to play Engineer when there's, like, three spies on the enemy team targeting you. And you're the only Engineer and your team isn't helping. And you don't have a medic. I did, we did a, No, we didn't have a medic. Maybe I should have gone medic on this game, to be honest. But then, people start leaving the game just en masse. I don't really know why. And I, I switched to Pyro, right? Because I'm like, okay, they've got three spies that I'm aware of. They might even have more. I switched to Pyro. I'm like, okay, no one else is spy checking. Because clearly no one else is fucking spy checking, right? Or there wouldn't have been three spies in our back line to, you know, come at me playing NG. So I'm like, okay, I guess I got to go spy check as Pyro. And then I spend the rest of the round just going after, just targeting spies and no one else. And then they get mad at me. <laughs> The spies are in fucking all chat, typing about, I don't know, man, I, I'm mad, I'm already mad, because I'm bad at the game now, and so I'm mad because bad, and so when I keep, every time I kill a spy, I'll taunt as Pyro, just to get, just to make them as mad as me, because I'm like, if I'm mad, they deserve to be mad as well, and so they start getting fucking mad in all chat, and then I say, in all chat, in response, my, uh, I'm only here to, to make spies have no fun, or something like that, and then, the round ends. Uh, I think we won barely. Um, and then most people leave. Next round, then after I said that, their entire team went spy. They went like all spy, but a lot of people left. So it was only like five five people spy, and our team also mostly left. And then it was our team comp was normal, and we were losing. We were actually losing against these spies. I was trying my best. The other people on my team weren't even fucking trying. Like I don't know what they were doing. But I was trying my best to defeat, like, they had, like, five spies, and it's just me as one pyro. You know, there's only so much I can do, um, just physically. Because also, they had, it was a 5v4 at that point, right? So, so they had five players on their team, we had only one. This was, like, it took a while to get here, right? Like, players kept leaving. So, you know, anyway, th then my team started changing to spy, and I don't want to play spy, so I'm staying on pyro. And I get kicked, because they're like, Change, go spy, go spy. And I'm like, no, I don't want to go spy. I'm playing pyro, man. I'm, I'm trying to trying to have a fucking Leonidas 300 moment, where it's like, I'm the one pyro against the barrage of spies, you know? This is like, I'm trying to have a narrative here. <laughs> I'm trying to have a narrative here. And if I have to die by sacrificing myself at the end, I can jump off the cliff, and it'll be fun. But no, I'm not allowed to have fun. They kicked me, because I wouldn't change to spy. Fucking bastard. Anyway. That was a way too long story of me being completely unreasonable and getting mad at people just playing the game and having fun. Um, yeah, I just have not been not been able to play today, man. Not been it's not been good. I mean, even the thing is, right? Is it's not actually that my aim is bad. Is what I realized. At first, I thought like, oh, I guess I've like lost the ability to aim pipes or anything. But then I started paying attention to what was actually going on. I'm 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 obviously I'm not as good as I have been. But it's actually not my aim that's the main problem. It's like I've forgotten to ha I've forgotten how to play the game. Like I've forgotten the strategy, game sense, positioning, movement. Like actually, the aim is the only thing that's like doing relatively okay. I would say it's not great. Again, like it, it definitely deteriorated a bit. Um, but like one thing that's fucking me up is like I I bind the different weapons to different mouse buttons. So like middle click is melee, and then like mouse three. Wait, mouse three is middle click. Like mouse four. Like, the one in front is the the secondary, and the one in back is primary. Like, I did this back in CSGO, and I've always kept it like that, because 
I don't like having to take my hands off of WASD to press number number keys, so I bind it on my, my mouse. But on Doltmai's mouse, the buttons aren't one in front of it, the other, they're one on either side. Like mouse 4 and 5, or like 4 is on the left and 5 is on the right. And so I had to get my head wrapped around that, and I'm playing like that for 3 months. And now I'm back to the other way, so my head keeps getting confused about weapon switching, which is a bit fucking annoying. Um, and then, but the, but other than that, it's mainly just like I'm I I don't know where I am <laughs> a lot of the time. It feels like I'm just like out in the middle of nowhere. There's no enemies, so I try and play aggressive. Like I try and push, and then suddenly there's twenty people there. I I don't I don't I ended up like behind the entire enemy lines and with no idea what to do with myself because I can't take them all on. <laughs> like if I if I start attacking, like, I don't know. I I just have I end up just sort of running around the map with no idea what's going on. I don't know how I've lost this about like my game sense. I've lost my game sense abilities really. Lost my positioning abilities, which is surprising. I wouldn't. That's not the thing that I would expect to to go first. I'd expect the aim to go first from not playing. Um, but yeah, I guess a lot of it was also that just casual has been really bad today. Like in term yeah, in terms of balance, most of the games have been. Uh, there was a couple of decently balanced games, but there was also. Getting rolled a bunch, rolling a bunch, and then the big thing is no one ever plays Medic. And I played Medic a few games, and I, I think I played, like, I don't know, even if you switch to Medic, like, I don't know. I played I played a bit of Med because no one else is going to do it, right? And I, I don't, like, hate playing Med, but it's not what I want to do because I'm trying to get back and, like, I'm trying to... Normally I wouldn't mind that much having to play Med. But right now, I'm legit, legit, like, the whole point of me playing right now is that I can get back into playing Demo. So it's like, okay, I guess this is a, this game I don't get to play Demo. No one's playing Medic. I don't know, very annoying. Wait, what the fuck? It's already been... Wait, why did it... Why was it 12 minutes? Wait, what the fuck? It was supposed to be 20 minutes. Hold on. Okay. I just set my alarm for the wrong time. Cooking chicken. But anyway. So I just... I played some Uncletopia games and... Uh, Uncle to- I didn't want to go on Uncle Toby initially because although the teams are more, you know, you're more likely to have a, a medic be reliable, there's also everyone's generally higher skilled. Um, and so, actually, I wasn't doing too bad on Uncle Topia, but yeah. Also, now I'm going to launch uh, Counter Strike 2. Oh, what the fuck? Okay. It's making me do a uh, processing Vulcan shaders. Hold on. Once it processes the Vulcan shaders, I'll be. I'm gonna see if how Counter Strike 2 runs on on my setup, because I, I didn't realize how much better my PC is than Dotz's. Like on Dotz's PC, oh maybe it's just not launching. Okay, every time I try and launch it, it just says processing Vulcan shaders, and when the Vulcan shaders finish processing, they don't act. I don't know. It's just stuck at four percent. Wait, can I just press skip? Oh no, it's it's going now. Okay, I don't know. I'll update you guys. Okay, I thought I was fucking hallucinating. Or that, like, I'd, I'd fucked up. But I just, like, actually checked. So, I like to put... Dotes my got me into this. Putting putting on YouTube videos to fall asleep. And now it feels weird to fall asleep without a YouTube video playing. Like, I used to have to... I used to actively avoid it. Like, I used to listen to a video while I was... While I was falling asleep. But then, once I got too sleepy, to the point where I was about to fall asleep, I'd have to turn it off. Because I would start paying attention to the words... And then I would suddenly notice, there are words, and it would wake me up. Like, like, oh, you should be listening to language right now. And then it would, you know, stop me from being in a dream or whatever. But but then, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, I, it, it switched up on me. Now, I've, now I'd like to have a YouTube video to fall asleep with. Um, but the problem is, well, the, the, that... So oftentimes individual videos aren't long enough to fall asleep to. Because I need something that's like... 20 minutes or longer, pretty much, I would say. Um, so then this normally ends... Right now, Northern Lion Library of Laterno isn't uploading, because I think NL's on holiday or something. But um, <clears throat> anyway, I, I, I often listen to playlists, is the point I'm trying to make here, okay? I often listen, I often end up using the playlists of YouTube video. And I've been using this for ages, and it's been fine. But what I do is... And then this is also weird. For some reason, it feels wrong if my laptop while I'm listening, is on the wrong side. Like, it has to be facing the right, which is, like, the direction I normally lie on to sleep. Anyway, which is the opposite side of where the wall is, where my charger is. So I normally have my laptop unplugged over there. The problem is, 
that this was fine until at some point they updated YouTube so that once you get to the last video in a playlist, it just keeps, it just plays a random video. <clears throat> and I think it just keeps playing random videos forever because I have autoplay, like I thought, oh, I must have just left autoplay on by accident. I don't have autoplay on. I have it turned off. So YouTube is just fucking busted, man. Also, CS2 does not work on my computer. <clears throat> Hold on. Did I do this? Yeah, let me... What if I what if I get rid of this launch option? Okay, there was a launch option I had that was breaking. Okay, that's fine. Let's see how CS2 works. Live reaction. Counter Strike 2 menu is now loading. There I am. Let's uh, jump into an offline. Let's practice. Let's go. Uh, Inferno is the newest map, so that's probably best to check on. <clears throat> probably the most um, heavy heaviest map. I really hate the new music. I'm surprised no one's talked about this. The new music for CS2 is actually garbage, um, and this is like something no one's else mentioned. But here we are, we're compiling shaders. This could take a while. <clears throat> yep, this is taking a while. Oh, hey, oh, no, never mind. Okay, here we are, I'm getting about 150, 160 FPS. Hitting a couple b ops hold on, bot, still kick. That'll raise my FPS. Yeah, now I'm up to like 170 to 180. Oh, I'm even getting to 200 in banana. <clears throat> in some places, I'm getting up to 200 FPS, which is, I, I just want to clarify. So before, in CSGO, I would get 300 FPS pretty much everywhere. And the movement in this game feels fucking so weird. I don't know how to, is it just because I'm used to TF2? Um, damn, this map does look great, I gotta say. <clears throat> no, I've still got it, I've still got it. How bad is this then? Oh, they've indicated where the wallbank spot is in, in the apartment. No one's mentioned- I, I watch videos about CS2. No one mentions, like, half the shit in the game. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I'd say this runs acceptably. I'd say- let's get a smoke grenade. Um, give, uh, weapon- is it weapon underscore smoke grenade? Yeah. I did, okay, that's not working. Do I need to have SV cheats one? <clears throat> and then try again? Okay, there we go. Let's see the new smokes. I haven't actually seen these in person. I forgot to do it before. Huh. Let's try give weapon underscore... Is it HE grenade, right? Yeah. See, I remember the commands. Okay, let's try the, the exploding the smoke out of the way thing. Yeah, it's, it's not fucking my FPS too badly. <clears throat> it does... Oh, it does... When it... It does... <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. It's dropping, like, 50 frames off. But I'm on pretty high settings. Let's see. What settings have I got set up? Oh, they've, everything's moved. Uh... Yeah, I'm on the high preset. Let's try the very high preset. I just want to see what happens. Nothing has notably changed. Oh, my FPS is lower. <laughs> That's, I can't, I literally can't tell. Oh yeah, it's definitely stuttering. It says it's 130 FPS. This doesn't feel like 100. This feels like 70. Okay, let me, let me lower that. So damn, this PC can actually handle it. Okay. I can, I can definitely, let's run a medium. Because medium seems pretty reasonable. Okay, getting massive lag spike. Massive frame drops. What the fuck? It's actually running worse than medium. Oh, hey, we're back up. We're b now we're at 200 and we're almost... At okay, so medium preset is very playable. Let's throw a smoke. Let's throw a couple. Yeah, even with two smoke grenades right next to me. and I think we're pretty pretty good, actually. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm still getting like um, 200 FPS, which is obviously not ideal, but that's acceptable. Okay, so CS2 actually runs okay on this on this desktop. It just didn't work very well on Dolce Spine Institute. I might try to play a low. I don't know. It still feels so weird to be able to see my see your legs. It doesn't feel it doesn't feel right, man. <clears throat> I feel like I can be up way better on this setup. Maybe it's just because this is what I'm used to, you know. Playing on my actual setup, the game feels way better. Okay, I'm gonna take back some of the complaints I had about CS2. I'm I'm gonna take back some of the complaints, but I'm gonna re reinstitute some complaints that I didn't I didn't hammer on about hard enough before. Which was because before I was like, you know. One of my obviously it's buggy and whatever that stuff will all get fixed. Um, but yeah, I think the two biggest complaints are the fact that they deleted CS:GO, so you can't play it anymore. Um, which again, I mean, it wouldn't be a problem if CF2 was if CS2 was fault feature complete, no one would care. But there, there's just a bunch of shit you can't do now, um, and that's my second biggest complaint, which is not just about the, the you know, no danger zone or whatever. Who cares about dangers? But no surf servers. I mean, there's one surf server that's a combat surf that exists right now. Maybe by the time this video comes out. But the fact that Valve didn't give, like, it, it wouldn't have been difficult to just enable the workshop. It wouldn't have been difficult to, to 
give um, notable community members, uh, you know, heads ups on how, you know, the developers of like source mod and stuff like this, like time to develop their their plugins so that you could have like it wouldn't this wouldn't be anything this wouldn't be unprecedented and this wouldn't be difficult but they just didn't do it which i think shows i mean it just shows there isn't a priority for them which from any other game studio you wouldn't expect it to be a priority for them but historically valve has always been good to, to modders and and community server members and hosts and so on um so it's very disappointing seeing Valve sort of go down the drain on the being the one company that you could actually reliably trust to to support the community in that way. I mean, you you got to remember, right? Like, oh shit, my binds are fucked up. Okay, whatever. I mean, like TF2 would be probably way more dead than it is right now. You didn't have community servers, and I mean, let's not forget that originally TF2, CS:GO. Actually, no, CS:GO launched with Valve servers. But TF2, CS Source, CS 1.6. They didn't have any Valve servers. Like the fact that it's gone from games don't have this thing, you know, official servers to now you can only play on official servers. Like that's actually I find that pretty, pretty, pretty sad. I don't know. I was gonna say insulting. But I played a lot of Surf. I played a decent amount of HNS. You know, it's weird how no one talks about HNS. HNS is such a like people who are good at HNS are like so. It's one of the most entertaining things to watch. Like the skill of of movement in that game mode. Um, I think the, the the reason that it's um, it no one it, no one talks about it. I think it's just hard to get into. It's it's like the skill gap between new players and the existing players is just too high. Like people who still play H and S have been playing forever, and you know they're just insanely good at that game mode. Um, and like surf, you know if you if you suck at surf, it doesn't affect anyone else because everyone is just racing against their own times or times on a server. But if you suck at H and S, you know you're the. It's a, you know, it, it's actually a fight. Right? <laughs> like it's not a fight, but I guess it's kind of a confusing mess. And the fact that like so much of H and S is determined by, I mean, this is not strange for for how things used to be. But like a lot of what makes H and S even playable is just sort of a, a system of informal rules. Like the rules are formal. Like they'll like they'll tell you like you're not allowed to target switch or whatever. Uh, and you have to like try and juke. You can't just like actually try and run away. You have to try and juke specifically. But like, there's nothing mechanically to force you to do that. It's just that like that's how you're supposed to play. Um, um, and so, you know, as a new player, the only way you really learn that stuff is if someone explains it to you. And normally, someone explains it to you when you fuck up and they don't do it nicely. Because why would they? You're a noob that's come onto the server. Um, the movement doesn't feel that bad to me anymore. I've been jumping around Inferno for a bit now. And let me go have a look at B-Site. Well, I did have a look at but let me go have a look at CT Spawn, I meant. Oh, damn. Yeah, this looks pretty nice. Okay, well, I'm, I think the, yeah, I'm just very disappointed in the fact that they didn't, Valve, Valve is no longer sees community servers as anything even close to a priority when, you know, all of their major properties wouldn't exist without community support. Communities are only good for buying skins now, not for, not for actually having a community. If you're not buying skins, the community shouldn't exist. Okay, that's. I might play a couple games of CS. I don't know. I want to suck because obviously it's been like over a year since I've played properly. I mean, I played I played a couple games with some some friends not too long ago. I'll give it a try, guys. I've actually still got it. Like to an insane degree, do I still have it? It's actually crazy. I remember back when I used to grind this game. I would take one day off and I'd lose every piece of skill that I ever attained. And now, I haven't played for so long. And last time I played, I thought like, oh yeah, I guess I must have just become trash because I didn't play for so long. But it's because I was on Dotesmite's fucking setup with the tiniest mouse pad in the universe. That's definitely why. Because now that I'm back here and the game's running at a decent frame rate and I have a big ass mouse pad that covers the entire desk... I'm fucking fragging out. Okay, I'm, that's that's an overreaction. I'm definitely not fragging out. I'm playing very mid. But I'm basically no better or worse than I was when I left. Which is to say, not particularly good. But not like a noob who just installed the game. That's surprising. And kind of sick. Honestly, the sound design of CS2, it feels good. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back to being a CS2 defender. If, if, if this is, you know what? I might go back to being a CS2 defender. Because the game feels good to me now. I guess it's also, like, since the last time I played, there have been many updates. I mean, the game has been, like, almost daily updated. 
with bug fixes and slight tweaks. So it might be that that has also made the game feel better to me. I guess we'll see. Well, I don't know. We've already seen. I guess we'll never know. <laughs> you know what's fucked up? You know what's fucked up about the fucking hand I was dealt? There were millions, maybe hundreds of thousands of people who have very little interest in learning computer science for any recreational reason. But they just they just go to, to university, get a comp sci degree and you know, for a job. And they get the job and they program, you know, as a code monkey or whatever. Or maybe they're like deep in, I mean, I don't know if people who aren't particularly interested would be like very you know, like the people who would be technically proficient enough to become some sort of high skilled guy. But you know, there's there's got to be hundreds of thousands of people. Okay, maybe let's lower it. I've lowered it from millions down to hundreds of thousands. I don't know. There's lots of these fucking people, right? Who it's like they they get out of high school. They're not really sure what they want to do, but they know they're like, you know, I'm relatively computer literate and nerdy. I could probably do a comp sci degree and get a job as a code monkey, you know? But they don't really have much interest in programming outside of the opportunities it gives them for work, which is, you know, completely fair enough. Everyone's got to earn a living. But then on the other hand, there's me, who is fascinated by computer science and programming, and yet completely unable to learn it. Like, this is the this is where I'm actually... You didn't think I was going with this here, with this, with this statue, bitch. Is the bit that I was going about was actually being able to learn shit that you're not in, that you can't do, but you learn it, but you do the thing, but you know, there you go. Do you understand? <laughs> <laughs> I can't figure out how to program or code. I can do nothing, basically. I can't do shit. But then the real problem is that I'm too fucking autistic. Because I bet if I picked a language that was very popular, like Python or C or JavaScript, I could probably learn Python or C or JavaScript, you know? Almost certainly. Because there are so many resources available just online and everything's so well documented that, you know, there's so many resources to learn these things. And they're like, you know, I've done a little bit of Python. Um, not that I would remember much of it, but, like, I don't remember it being that hard. Like, I'm sure if I just stuck with it, it would probably be pretty doable in a few months to get, like, to understand the basics, be able to make some sort of simple program that I wanted to make. But... I just so happen to be only interested in low-level programming <laughs> and no one else fucking cares about low-level programming and more importantly actually no one who this is because that's not true loads of people care about low-level programming it's just that they all already know high-level programming no one goes into programming by learning assembly that's not a thing that anyone does anymore. You know, maybe they did it back in the 70s. But no, no one does that anymore. That's not a, that, that hasn't been a thing for a very long time. And so there are no resources for like, I know absolutely nothing about programming. Teach me assembly. Teach me forth. They all expect you because these are advanced, you know, things with where you have to do, you know, I don't know enough to even tell you what's different about it, to be honest. I mean, obviously, assembly is not the same as... Um, you know, a higher level programming language, but fourth is an assembly. I'm also interested in fourth. You know what I'm trying to like? This is this is fucked up that they got me autismed like this. I guess I could. There's probably more resources available to learn about Bash scripting. Like I bet I could learn some Pat, some Bash, or some shit like that, and get reasonably com competent. But I'm like, I don't even know what I'd want to do with that. You know, like one of the things that I'm interested in. Like when I'm what I the actual programming language I want to learn is called UX Intel, um, because speci like basically specifically because it's niche. So like I could do something very simple. Like I've all, I've thought to myself for a while now that like I know the perfect UX Intel project. That like for a while I was thinking I would make like a Tetris clone because that's something that's very easy. I'm sure. Like, UX Intel is designed around graphics being pretty easy. So, like, anything like a graphical game type of thing is, is pretty much what the language is designed for. Um, like, pretty simple 2D graphic game type of thing. So, I was going to do Tetris, but then, firstly, I was kind of like Tetris. I, I don't really care that much about Tetris. And then, at some point, someone made a Tetris for UX Intel. But now, I'm like, 
I have a maybe even better idea that I'm way more interested in, which is a soccer ban engine. Like that, that would be really cool because most people don't care that much about soccer ban, and I don't care that much about soccer ban, but I do like soccer ban. Um, and it would—it's exactly the sort of thing that's that's very, very doable in UXN because uh, that UXN runs on a virtual machine that's very limited. If you don't know what the fuck I'm talking about, you should look this look into this because it's pretty interesting stuff. Um, but the thing is, because this is such a niche niche thing, anything I would do, I would be the first person to have done it. Like no one else has made a soccer ban engine in UXN tile. At the time when I first tried to learn UXN, no one had made a Tetris clone. Like you would be the first person to do it, which means that you're actually doing something useful. You know what I mean? Like if you're just this is like the probably the the reason why I don't I like haven't really learned how to program is because oftentimes people say like the best way to learn how to program is that you 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 think you find a project that you actually want to do and you look stuff up while you're doing it and that's how you learn you just learn as you go if you have a project you're passionate about that'll keep you interested in and that makes perfect sense to me that does sound i mean that's how i've learned everything else in my life so that makes perfect sense but there's not like i don't really have the a concept of like what would i make in c <laughs> you know like the, what program have i always wished existed that is simple enough to be a beginner project that doesn't already exist in a form way better than I could ever possibly... Like, there's no such thing. Like, anything that would be, like, actually simple and specific enough to both not exist in a form that is already way better than anything I could ever make and, you know, be easy enough for me to actually create would be way better as a bash script, right? So, like, it would have to be something super simple that's basically, like, something just for a very particular thing I need to do on my personal computer... And it would probably be best to be a, like a, a, a .sh file. And I've, you know, and I'm saying that as if that's nothing I've done. I mean, very simple one-liners, but, you know, I've written a couple of very simple one-liners to do stuff on my computer. Um, but, like, you know, with any of the higher level programming languages, yeah, I don't even know. Like, what, do, what sort of projects do people do to get Because everything already exists. Like, why would I want to make... I can't, I can't think of something that... Is like, I've always wished there was this. There's nothing <laughs> that I can think of. But in UXN, anything that you can think of, like most things don't exist. Like I could do something like port Vim. You could port Vim to, to, to UXN or like extend. Actually, that would probably be pretty. You know what? You know what would be super fucking doable? I could make a fork of the text editor for UXN called left. That has, that's, that, I don't know if, actually, I don't know how you would do that. And you'd have to make modes into a thing. Like, you could fork left and and just make it into Vim. Like, just add, I mean, Vim has so much functionality to implement, though. Like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> like, how do you, you'd have to go through, like, is there some sort of Vim spec you'd have to find it. Would, this would be a lot of work, actually. I was initially like, oh, yeah, you add HJKL and a couple other things and you're good. But actually, now that I think about it, Vim had, like, a lot of functionality that you'd have to implement. And a lot of it is, like, very different from itself. You know, it's not like, you know, you, you implement, you're moving with H, HJKL. That's very easy to do. Um, and then it's like, okay, now you want to move with, like, I don't know, some, some more advanced movement keys somehow. And it's like, that's also easy to do because it's just more of the thing you've already done. But actually, Vim is much more complicated than that. There's loads of shit. Like, I don't even... You have to make macros a thing. You have to make find and replace a sort of thing. And all of the regex stuff that Vim can do. And there's probably a bunch of shit I don't even know about that Vim does because I like obscure stuff that I never use. Yeah, that's This instantly became something that I don't think is possible for me to actually implement probably left better to someone firstly there's no there's not really a reason to do this but i mean it'll be a fun project um yeah i don't know about that one chief but sokoban sokoban is seems easier it's very graphics based which uxn again is very good for a little simple game just needs to be able like the, the game needs to just take a text file in the standard sokoban format and just read it and just render it. And then you just have to be able to move the character and move the blocks around. And then it has to have collision. Like, this is stuff that you would learn. In fact, like, I know for a fact that you learn how to do all of this stuff 
in the the one singular UXM tutorial that exists. <laughs> uh, it's just later than I ever got because I got stuck. Like that's why I gave up. Is I, I got that I got stuck on lesson three. Like it's set up so that you do a lesson per day, and I got stuck at I think it was either lesson three or lesson four. That there's an exercise like at the end of each lesson, there's like a, a few exercises that you that you can do right that you're supposed to do, and I think either lesson three or lesson four. I think it was lesson four actually. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Whichever one it was, like I just couldn't do the exercises and I spent like two I went back over the same lesson the next day and I still couldn't figure out the exercises and then I just gave up because I didn't know where to look for help but since then I found out there's a couple places that might be able to help like forms and IRCs and stuff for, for UXM um that's probably a good idea to do that but I don't I'd have to start from scratch again because I didn't really like to be honest there's a lot of stuff I didn't really understand because, like, I don't really understand what a mem what a, a memory what what address like is. Like, there's a lot of poking around in different memory addresses, right? But like, what actually is a mem? Like, what does that actually mean? Like, I I can understand and follow the tutorial, but like, what 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 does it mean when you say something is at a like I've heard obviously you hear many people say these things, but like I need a way to vis like. Is it like, imagine a Turing machine, right? And the tape is like split up and the memory address is telling like where on that tape on the Turing machine to go to, go to, to like read and write. Is that, because that's what I kind of imagine it is. But then it's like split up into various blocks that do different things. And um, there's something, I don't know what a zero page is. Yeah, this this stuff kind of confused me when I was doing the tutorial because I was like, I can I can still follow the tutorial without really understanding what this means, but it makes it hard to visualize. Um, and then another thing is there's a lot of like binary and hex, and I'm not I'm already bad enough at base ten arithmetic. <laughs> you, now you're getting me to do fucking binary and hex and decimal arithmetic, I get completely fucking lost. Um, but it's just abs like the thing you get. Every, it's all these abstractions, right? Like, like you write a byte, and you're like, byte is two digits. But actually, that's just because it's binary. Yeah, okay. It gets it gets confusing very fast to me. I mean, it's not that confusing, but yeah, it's a lot of stuff to keep in your head. I bet if I like, I'm I'm waiting for a burst of motivation to try this tutorial again, because I've I've thought to myself, you know what? It's been long enough. I think I'm ready to give it another go, but I'm waiting to, for uh, to be bothered. <laughs> Basically, I'm waiting to be bothered to do that. But I've been playing CS2, and honestly, um, it's a good game. I've changed my mind again. I've changed back. There's n nothing really wrong with CS2. Oh, oh, that's not true. There's a lot of stuff that's wrong with CS2. The lack of community server support, like all of that, that's very bad. That stuff is bad. And that is wrong with CS2. And a lot of the stuff that I generally disliked about CSGO, like in terms of CS2 as a sequel to CSGO, and obviously the fact that Valve completely deprioritized the community servers is like extremely egregious to me. But then if you're talking about the stuff that's like, you know, I thought the movement and shooting and performance was like really shockingly bad. And I still think it's like pretty bad. Or the performance is particularly. The movement... And the shooting, in fact, I think the shooting feels better than CSGO. Um, the movement, and I can't, I know it's fine. It's it's pretty much the same, I think. It, it, it used to be worse, but I, I know. I think the reason I thought the movement felt bad before was just because of the performance was bad. But playing on a better PC, the movement feels fine to me now. Um, but I still think it should, it, the game is not as well optimized as it could have been. Uh, maybe this is just me. Maybe I'm just complaining because I'm like don't like modern games and I feel like graphics improvements don't really matter that much but maybe uh, maybe the fact that Counter-Strike looks kind of old was preventing a whole bunch of people from playing it and I don't know that was bad for some reason it's not like Valve was yeah Valve was struggling they, they can make any money from the from Counter-Strike famously Valve makes no money from Counter-Strike um, but yeah where was I going with this yeah so I, I mean obviously I'm gonna complain about the performance even though I again like on this PC 
I'm getting perfectly acceptable frame rates, like absolutely no, nothing to complain about frame rate wise. Um, I'm still gonna complain because I I just imagine, you know, CS:GO is very popular with a with a bunch of people who live in like poorer countries. It's always been the game that like runs on anything, and so the fact that like you know you're some 13 year old Russian kid and your favorite game is just unplayable now because you can't afford to upgrade your PC. That sucks for them. That's not good. And obviously the community server stuff is bad as well. And now I'm gonna try and keep talking while I play the first round. <laughs> of this, uh, which is distracting because there's people talking in my ears. Um, so they're telling me to go A. I will go A through outside. One well, nuke, of course. I'm going for nuke. Uh, okay, come on, what was I talking about? Okay, I'll just talk when I die. Okay, hilariously, I died the instant I said that, but you didn't hear it because I pressed, I pressed pause on my recording and then looked back up at the screen and instantly got a headshot. So like, in terms of the reason why I don't play CS anymore and I play TF2, well, it was, you know, initially because, or like one of the things, just the focus on competitiveness is just not, not super fun to me. And the, the versatility of movement in TF2 is obviously way better, but if we just compare, like, let's not compare those games, it's about as stupid. But just like, comparing CS to what I imagine CS could be, it's like, I, I, I don't think that the the hyper focus on competitive gameplay as the only valid form of play is good for the game or the community like I, I i i do not like that and i think that that kind of game is like slowly going to go away soon like the hyper esports focus competitive focus games i think that, there are, that this is a fad i know this i'm actually taking a stance on this now i used to just be blackboard on it but now I actually believe, like, I'm starting to see hints that this is a bit of a fad and it's going to start going away. Because back in the day, before I played Counter-Strike, back in Source and 1.6, there was, like, competitive was just a... It's like it is in TF2 now. Like, most people who play TF2 aren't... Even if they are vaguely aware of the competitive scene, they don't play it competitively. It doesn't mean... It doesn't mean they don't, like... How do I explain this? When I say they don't play it competitively, I mean like in terms of in an official competitive format with leagues and teams and stuff like that. Like they don't... Oh shit, that was very bad timing. Um, but just because you don't play competitively doesn't mean you're not trying to win every game. Like that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, the same way majority of TF2 players in casual, they're trying to win, but they're not like using optimal strategies every round and, uh, you know, etc. Uh which is not the same as Sixes or Highlander. Um, and that's how, you know, even back in Source 1.6, even having this, uh, you know, 5v5 competitive be the default way to play Counter-Strike wasn't even, like, it's not even the case. You go to different servers, there would be many different kinds of different ways to play, play Counter-Strike. And it wasn't like, well, there's the real way, and then everything else is kind of the fake way. It just depends on what server. And I also, I mean, I'm well known to complain about the problem of everyone being on the same servers in the same skill-based matchmaking system. Like, this this just creates a toxicity, it makes the game less fun, it makes all games less fun. I got fucking team killed, nice. Okay, I think I'm gonna stop talking now and focus on the game. Okay, I take back everything I said about, I mean, I, I already took back a lot of what I said about Fair Camp, but actually Fair Camp, I mean, I'm, uh, let's see if it works, first of all, but if it, if it, I'm now trying it out, and it actually does offer something pretty useful, uh, just in terms of, like, simplicity, right? Like, it's very, it's very annoying to go through, and oh, also I'm sick, which sucks. I don't like being sick. I don't know how, I must have been sick when I went to that, <coughs> excuse me, that fucking show. But yeah, it's very annoying to have to manually type out HTML for this many files. <laughs> So actually, you know what? I've changed my mind. This is actually very useful. I don't know why I ever dismissed it. Can I be real with you, though? It's actually... So Twitter's discovered Faircamp now, um, which is interesting. And, I'm, you know, I'm seeing a lot of people... Okay, that's not true. I've seen a few people who are vaguely gesturing at the fact that it runs... That's only on Linux. There's no available... It's also, like, unofficially supported on macOS and BSD. Um... But it's not available on Windows. I've seen a few people gesturing vaguely at that as as a problem. Wait, is, is Audacity, like, lagging like crazy? Okay, we're back. 
Um, all I'm saying is, listen, all I'm saying is, I see, okay, I actually have a couple points. I have a couple things. I don't know, maybe I should make this its own video. I should make its own video, because I want to say two things. I want to make a video where I just compile a bunch of alternatives to Bandcamp that I think are, you know, decentralized and superior. Um, and then I want to also point out in that video that, firstly, a lot of artists, you know, are into the punk DIY ethos, but they love DIY when it means, like, getting together with a bunch of your friends in real life and, you know, repairing your musical instruments or something, something like this, right? But they hate DIY when it requires five minutes of learning how to install Linux, which is very strange to me. It's extremely strange to me because that's way easier. <laughs> like, none of this stuff is difficult. You know, it's not like, it's not like, I mean, there's not like anything. It's not, you don't have to edit any config files to run FairCamp or whatever. People don't like DIY when, it, when it's computers for some strange reason. And so this is what I want to point out in the video is that actually the situation on the, the, the web right now is actually very strange. Um, that the fact that or when the web was initially created, no one had imagined that it would ever see such wide adoption with, uh, you know, people who have very little understanding of how, you know, a web page works and that, that and that they would be very willing to like never learn <laughs> you know like that's a little that's not something that anyone imagined who was creating the internet no one thought that like people will gather on these platforms um not just because all their friends are there although that is in part it but their friends all their friends are there in the first place because uh they offer some some convenience right like there's nothing that you can't you know, you could have a blog where you just make short blog posts, but instead everyone's on Twitter, because why would you want to bother managing your own blog? Or why would you want to manage your own blog when you can use Twitter or Tumblr or something like this, right? And all your friends are already there, because everyone makes the same sort of decision. But this is a very odd situation. And so when people are wondering, like, oh, why is Bandcamp getting in shitified right now? Why is Twitter getting in shitified right now? Like, all of these websites, why are they all going to shit? Well, in part of it, and a large part of it, is because of capitalism. Um, Corey, what's his name? Corey Doctorow has a bunch of good talks and books about this, about the mechanics of how and why the incentive structures and the, the behind-the-scenes investment structures and so on that mean, you know, every platform ends up like this. Uh, but aside from the, you know, the question is that, that I have to ask is, okay, so why is there so much money to be made here, right? Like, there are many things in the world that you could apply a whole bunch of, like, like, like you know, music you wouldn't necessarily expect, right? A lot of artists, very DIY, very punk, very, you know, anti-establishment. Anyway, the, the point I'm trying to really reach out here, see, I haven't thought this through, which is why I haven't recorded that video, is uh, the situation is very strange that we're all like, on these couple of websites that are all just screenshots of the other four websites. Um, and the reason we're there is because, like, the reason they're shit is because we're basically paying them, right? Like, they make money out of us being too lazy or incompetent to run our own services. And so the only way to get out of this world is to run your own services, collectively, distributed, um, and you know, in many cases, self-hosted, these sorts of things. And that this stuff is, like, they 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 rely on you thinking that this stuff is too hard for you to ever do. But it's it's actually really not. Like, the uh, that's actually what the internet was set up to be, or the web. That's what the web was set up to be. Like, it's not, that's actually what it's designed for. What we use it for is not really what it was designed for. But it's only because we've had this expectation built up over decades that using the internet should be like it should require zero learning like you never have to improve as a human being or like expand your knowledge on any subjects in order to use the internet and the trade-off for that listen i'm not like against that i know i'm saying that in an insulting way but people think that comes for free that doesn't come for free 
right? You, like, it's, I would love if, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to not have to, like, you know, spend a while researching. I mean, I'm autistic and like doing it, but it, it's nice to be able to jump straight into something and not have to research anything. And it's just seamless. And you're, you're in instantly and having a good experience. Like, I'm not complaining about that. That's fine. It's just that people think that comes for free. That doesn't come for free. That comes with a middleman who's going to suck you dry for every drop of rent they can extract, right? Which is what all of these platforms are. And even the good ones, Bandcamp and so on, aren't immune to this, right? As we've seen, they're going to continue getting in shitified because they are these middlemen. And Bandcamp started off chill. And all of these places are going to start off chill, right? Like one of these um, things I found that I'm thinking of recommending if I do make this video uh, is, hold on just a second. Uh, is it this? Yes. It is uh, ampled, okay? Or is it amp ampled? I'm not sure if it's ampled or ampled. Oh, what the fuck? It doesn't render a process crashed. Okay, it does not like loading this website. Um, let me hold on. Yeah, cute browser does not like to load that website. Let me use a different browser. Hold on. Is it is it just is something broken on the website or is there something broken on my end? Okay, I think something's broken on my end. <laughs> um, anyway. There's this thing called Ampled or Ampled. I'm just, I'm just going to say Ampled because that sounds easier to pronounce. Um, which is a very hippie leftist thing. <laughs> it's a co-op uh, that... It's a basically... Imagine if Patreon existed, but instead of being run by... I mean, Patreon is already... I don't know if it's still owned by Jack Conti. But Patreon, you know, run by a musician. And generally speaking, Patreon is pretty good. I know it has a bunch of problems, but like... You know, I think Patreon's pretty good. Um, but Ampled is a similar kind of situation, but it's run by a co-op. It's completely open source and transparent. Like, all of the accounting and stuff is transparent. And uh, you even get to choose. When you, when you uh, like, take donations there, you get to choose, um, uh, like, how much of that donation goes to the... You, like, you know how every site has a split, right? Like, how much goes to you and how much goes to the site for upkeep and whatever like you get to choose how much you get to choose your split when you when you use this this website which obviously means it's not going to scale well in my opinion i mean maybe it will maybe enough people will be nice but uh i don't know it might scale fine i don't i don't i don't think there's really been a website like this so actually i, I can't i can't maybe maybe it's an un, untried model but anyway this is a it's essentially patreon but all of those things so you can you can post uh you know stuff on Patreon and paywall it um but you know it's supposedly much more clear now the problem with this that i see is that right now this is fine i mean it's actually not cuz it's kind of bugged um like for for me right now it it's telling me that i'm not allowed to make a page until i accept some sort of uh uh like verification email but they never sent me a verification email <laughs> um so i don't know what to do about that they never sent me a, yeah they just didn't send me a verification email so i guess i i, did, I don't know what to do about that because it won't it won't let me resend the email there's no button to resend the email i guess they've got maybe i just got to get in contact with them because they're probably a small team right let me let me uh maybe i'll do that maybe i'll just at them on twitter and uh <laughs> Also, or email them or something. Yeah, I can probably just email them. Uh, whichever email. Okay, yeah, I'll do that. But anyway, like this, right now, this is great and cool. And it seems, you know, the fact that it's a co op um, obviously makes me a little more positive about this. But in the end, there's nothing structurally to prevent Ampled from becoming Bandcamp as it is right now, you know? Like, there's not, like, the only hope is that it stays relatively small and community driven and it might stay like that for 10 years. Bandcamp was like that for forever. But there you know there's nothing structurally other than the goodwill of the people running it to prevent it from being brought up by some venture capital firm. And yes, obviously that would detract a lot from the whole point of using it, but you know what I mean? Like you have to trust there's there's trust and there's nothing wrong with trust. Like I again, I tried signing up for an account. I'm perfectly happy to use this this platform to use Amplet. Um, like that, I I have nothing to get. Like right now, it's perfectly fine. But I'm a little skeptical because it doesn't solve any of the structural problems of centralized solutions. Um, whereas something like Faircamp, which is self-hosted, 
does solve that problem because I know I'm never going to get bought by a venture capital firm. You know, like that doesn't make any sense. There's no corporation there. Uh, there's nothing to buy. Um, so yeah, that's that's the sort of situation. I that, am I making any sense? Uh, like I'm skeptical. Like Ambled is still a platform. That's basically what worries me. Is that like I'm skeptical of, of recommending anything that's a platform. Um, and I would I would rather stick to stuff that you can self-host. But of course, Ampled, you know, you, the trade-off is Ampled is probably much easier to use than setting up FairCamp or, you know, some sort of something else. But, like, the fundamental point I want to get across is the fact that um, it's, like, no one is willingly paying for MP3 files unless they want to give you money, you know? Like, if you're selling digital releases on Bandcamp right now, it's not because these people are like, well, this is the best way to get the the high-quality WAV file. No. They could go on Google and search Bandcamp Downloader and get 10,000 results, you know, and download them for free. You're getting that money because people want to give you money. It's essentially a donation. Um, and those people are not going to want to... They're not going to stop wanting to give you money. This is the point that I want to get across, is that, like, already people are only giving you that money in the first place voluntarily because they want to donate to support you making whatever art you're making. And, you know, they it's obvious, right? That's how it works. Not because they actually want the product. So even, in my opinion, paywalling the product, it kind of doesn't even make that much sense as a model. Like, maybe the best thing to do is to just have a donation system set up, and then have all your music available for free, which is what I do. You know, I have it on these paid services, but I also have it on free services, like cybergrunge.net. Um, oh, hey, my, my fair camp is ready. Does this work? Okay, it does not work. <laughs> That's a little unfortunate. Oh, is, is fucking cube browser just, like, busted or something? Like, what's happening? Hold on, let me try opening this in Firefox, because... This is crashing as well. I feel like maybe there was an update to Cube Browser that's causing... I might have to downgrade. Linux moment. Linux moment. Okay. Yeah, it works fine on Firefox. Okay, so Cube Browser is just fucking something... Because I just pseudo Pac-Man S-Y-Y-U'd like a second ago. Um, And does the music actually work? Let's see. Yeah. Let's go. Bing, 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 bing. Yeah, I'm kind of loaded up on fucking cold medicine right now. Okay, so we got that. Now I gotta figure out how to get this on the fucking internet. Um... We will write the site with a fair camp dot insert the catalog directory. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Did that work? Wait, cd dot dot ls. I don't see a fair camp dot build. Wait, am I stupid? Yeah, I don't see a fair camp dot build. <coughs> oh, it's dot fair camp dot underscore build. Okay, I gotta be ls dash aing. There we go. I see it. CD dot faircamp dot build ls always oh, copied everything. So if I vim into like index dot html, yeah, this is just the this is the website. Okay, that makes sense to me. Oh, it's not even complicated. I understand all of these html things. What's happening here? Oh, nothing. Okay, well I'm gonna see what the fuck to do about this. Okay, so it will automatically open your site in a web browser. I already did that. And then what the fuck is this? To specify metadata, okay, I don't care about that. Um, okay, I'm gonna try and get this on a web server somehow. Okay, lads, it's finally done. Hello, everyone listening to this podcast. You're 10 hours in. Okay, maybe it's a bit less once I've truncated the silences. So this is not a good place to advertise. But just in case you happen to be here, you can go ahead and open up a web browser. You probably already have one open right now. And navigate your way over to http no s colon slash slash you know you know as in 
the main character of the popular animated anime from Japan, Hidemori Sketch. You're going to want to navigate over to yuno.sdf.org. You're going to want to head over to that page. And over there you'll find all my shit, motherfucker. You're going to find all my shit. Um, so go ahead and do that. And you can find all my stuff there. Hell yeah. Um, maybe you, you might notice there's no, um, there's no, uh, downloads or anything. That's because I don't know how to do that. <laughs> but, I mean, I tried to follow the documentation for Fair Camp is not as detailed as it should be. It is not clear. Like, it has all of this stuff, but it's just missing, like, it's... I mean, just like every fucking open source project, they made the thing, and then they really quickly made the documentation. It could be a lot clearer. I managed to figure out some stuff eventually, but uh, I still haven't quite figured out the downloads and payment section. So for now, it's a little... Uh, downloads not not super happening. I'm pretty sure, though... Can, how There must be a way to just, like, download it off the fucking web... Well, they actually went through all of the effort to block... Figure out how to to block you from just saving the audio. If I view page source, um, yeah, there we go. If you view page source, you can find the MP3 file somewhere. Uh, and yes, they are all MP3s. Um, you might be thinking to yourself, what's the fucking point of having a Bandcamp alternative? Yeah. See, you can find the MP3 files and just download them off the page if you can be bothered to. Click view, view, view source and scan through stuff. Listen, I'm not going to stop you. I'm not going to stop you from doing that. Um, but anyway, I want you to do that, actually. I would have a download button if I could figure out how it worked. It tells me, if you want to know the details, which you probably don't, but Faircam's documentation says that in order to make these sorts of changes to the site layout, you need to, to like the functionality, you need to edit uh, a manifest, um... Which it says all you have to do is create a .eno file in the directory that you want to change the functionality of, but that doesn't work. So I'm pretty sure I'm missing something because I, I I tried that and I tried to do the formatting that they suggested, and I couldn't get it to work. So I'm clearly doing something wrong, and I have to figure that out. So uh, yeah, but I do have a nice little blurb that tells you that you can donate and uh, a little thing at the bottom thanking. SDF for the hosting. It is it is HTTP. It does not have HTTPS because you don't need it for this. If I had payment stuff, well, no, I don't. Even if I had payment stuff, the payment stuff would be dealt with via Libero Pay. So uh, it would all be on their site. You wouldn't even need it. It's fine. I don't need SSO. Um. Anyway, yeah, I'm pretty happy with this. It looks good. I would rather because my site is white background black text. But I, I cannot f- figure out how this fucking CSS... This page, right, the Fair Camp, it uses a really weird CSS thing that I can't figure out. Like, if you go to the, the style sheet, like, instead of... I don't even, I don't know. I'm just going to be completely honest with you. I just don't understand what the fuck this means. Like, instead of just having a thing that says, like... I mean, it would be it would be pretty normal to just say like to define something that's just the the background color, foreground color, and then just reference that for everything. But there doesn't seem to I can't find where that's defined. Um, like there's a lot of references to color, but I can't see where the where it gets the color from. Like I don't know if I'm just stupid, but is it this background H background? I, maybe there's some sort of documentation about this somewhere. But this is not how you're supposed to do it anyway. You're supposed to fucking um, do it do it differently. <laughs> you're supposed to theme. With this, you can adjust the visual appearance. Yeah, I don't I don't know how this. I mean, yeah, it doesn't doesn't work for me. This this because it's all with this goddamn .eno file stuff. That's like a Markdown file, and I like I understand how it's supposed to work, but maybe maybe I have to rebuild everything. Like maybe. Maybe that only works if you rebuild everything, but I don't want to rebuild everything because it took so long to upload everything. So I guess we're just it's just gonna look different and kind of weird. Um, I mean, I, if if it would just tell me what the rebuilding it does, because I can't tell. Like I, that's my current theory is that in order to have the ENO files actually make changes, that you have to rebuild or regenerate the site basically. Um, 
But what would regenerating the site really? I wouldn't have to re-upload all the music, surely. Surely I wouldn't have to re-upload all the music. There's no way it would make me do that. So the question becomes, what would it do? Is it just going to change something in the index.html? And if so, should I just do that locally, see what it changes? But I can't get it to, I don't know, I need to, this is kind of, I I don't know. (laughs) I think I'm, uh, this is stuff I can do at some later point, I think. I probably should have gotten everything how I want. I didn't even realize, like, to be honest, the only reason I didn't do it like this is because I didn't even realize you could do this. I only, like, that stuff's later on in the documentation. The first thing it tells you to, like, if you go to the, there's like a, it, it, it just says something like, you know, ma- the manual, right, which is on, on the website. It has the installation, and then it just says getting started. But getting started I don't know. The getting started is you build the thing. Like the the getting started page is how you you actually build the website. And then everything else, I assumed, I I guess you have to fucking <clears throat> Yeah, so my assumption right now is that you have to rebuild it if you're going to make changes to these .eno manifest. Um I don't even really know what a manifest is, but I'm assuming that that's what you got to do. Uh which is if I'd read, been smart, I would have read through the whole tutorial first and then come back. But the fact that it's laid out like that, it makes it seem like you're supposed to build it first and then go back and edit these files. Because editing, like, editing the files doesn't do anything, is the point. Like, you're supposed to make the files and edit them, but it doesn't change anything. Like, it's not like... I, I would have thought they were just... Oh, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. I, I would have imagined there was something in there, like, in somewhere <laughs> that's just like, check for any .eno files and execute them. But that's not how internet work. I don't know why I thought that was how internet work. Um, but anyway, you can... It's also my website. I know I spent, like, yes, like was it yesterday or two days ago? I spent, like, separating out the, the podcast and music um, pages on my website. And I made this incredibly scuffed music page that was just an iframe <laughs> of, of cybergrunge.net. Very scuffed. Uh, but now, the music... If you go to my nothankyou.neocities.org and you click music, it will open the Fair Camp in a new tab, which is nice. I think it's a very, very clean solution to that sort of thing. Um, yeah, it's not bad. It's not bad. It could be better, maybe, but I'm not, like, it could be better integrated. The Fair, Fair Camp could look l- l- a lot more like my website, so it was more seamless, but I don't really think that matters that much. I think I should focus more on the uh, functionality over the aesthetics first. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm just talking about this because I'm pretty proud of it. I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. And it was kind of a massive pain to set up because I'm doing it all like over SSH to a fucking server that's in America. So everything takes forever. Like typing, there's like a half a second delay between when you type and when it actually shows up. Um, well, yeah, it took me forever. To, but anyway, we got it up and running now and I'm happy with it and it works. Also, yeah, before you say anything... They're they're only MP3 files and they're not even on they're not even like the highest quality MP3 files. They're they're pretty high quality, but they're like you know they're compressed MP3 files and you might be like well that doesn't really replace Bandcamp because half of the point of Bandcamp is that you can get your WAVs from there and you're you're probably right about that. But frankly, I don't I just don't think you should care about this. <laughs> I'm just gonna tell you to stop caring. Uh, the reason that I've done that is. Uh, I just don't want to put too much... Like, I don't think SDF really likes me doing this sort of thing, I, I would imagine. Like, they offer web hosting, and it doesn't say... I've checked. It doesn't say anywhere that I can find, like, hey, don't use this to, like, upload a shit, like, gigabytes of music and stream it. No, no one... No one... No, it doesn't say that anywhere, but I'm trying to be nice and, like, not do that, <laughs> you know? So I'm trying to save them bandwidth by using lower quality MP3s. Uh, I am paying. It's not like there's a free web server. Like I, I pay, I pay SDF to to get a uh, you know, web hosting. Um, but you know, it's very, very cheap for what it is. So, uh, and also they're just great. That shouts out to SDF, the oldest anime community on the internet. Um, so yeah, I don't want to, don't want to. I'm trying to, trying to make it so that they're not too mad at me if they notice what I'm doing. Um. Yeah, I think that's pretty much everything I had to say. I still kind of want to make this web, this video about Bandcamp because it would be a good place to advertise my Fair Camp now, which would be an extra reason to do this. Um, yeah, I think the play is to. Hmm, I'm not 100% sure what to do here. Like the pro, here's a problem. Here's a problem. 
I've always I I use Twitter as like one of the main ways I communicate with my fan base. Um, like I I don't have much social media, right? So it's either Twitter, Discord, or my RSS feed of my on my website. Um, and I've tried and like if I could get if I could guarantee I have like this is actually I don't know if it's necessarily a problem with RSS, but like because I don't I don't think it's a problem. But it's just, this is how RSS is. Obviously, you have no way of knowing how many people actually follow your RSS feed, right? Like, it could be, it, for all I know, and most likely, it's probably like five people. It's probably like five people follow my RSS feed. Um, so I'm probably not really uh, communicating that much to that many people um, via RSS. So it's probably, and my Twitter only has 800 followers, which is like not as many as my YouTube so maybe yeah so youtube is probably the best way to be communicating this stuff in fact this would be a good time to make a video on my main youtube channel advertising this oops this is my main youtube channel which auto plays uh, shadow people <laughs> um yeah you know what maybe i should do that maybe i should get a hmm what sort of video would i make cuz this the it wouldn't necessarily be a video hmm I mean, it would also just be good to show my website because I don't know how many people even know. I mean, I, I link it in everything, and Neo Cities actually tells me how much traffic I get, and I get a pretty, I get quite a decent amount of, of, um, you know, uh, oops, hold on, I'm brain fart. I get a decent amount of traffic. I'm, I'm, I read a Twitter post in the middle of speaking, and it fucking broke my brain. Uh, <clears throat> where was I going with this? I don't remember. I just need to communicate to people that this thing exists. Because everyone knows... Like, this is the problem, right? This is actually the, the problem with everyone expecting everything to be on platforms. Is that if you have a... Like, if, if you know that I exist, if you, all you have to do is be aware that there's a guy called No Thank You who makes music. And you can go on whatever platform you're used to. Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, Bandcamp, SoundCloud. Right? And you already know that I'm going to be there. Like, you have a guarantee that I'm going to be there. But with self-hosting... No one assumes, unfortunately, that you're going to be self-hosting. Right? Or, I mean, I'm not literally self-hosting because it's not on my server, right? It's on SDFs, but you know what I mean, right? But if I'm hosting it myself or outside of the, a pla- not on a platform, on a website, uh, then no, no one expects that. Like, you know what I mean? And so you have to tell people that it exists. Uh, and so, so I need to figure out a good way to communicate that this thing exists, um, and it's also not at a URL that you would expect, right? Because it's just uno.sdf.org, um, which is because I made my SDF account and paid for this web server like six months ago or something, not knowing that I would like not knowing what I would use it for, thinking I would. I mean, I don't know. I I didn't even know when I signed up for SDF and paid for an account. I didn't even really think of web hosting as like something that I would use. Like I knew I could do it, but I didn't think that I would use it. And so I just used the, well, my host name on my computer is just, you know, so it makes my account, you know, you know, that's how I say SH works. Um, I was mainly just using SDF for the bulletin board, uh, for the BBS, because I'm into BBSs. Um, so, so you, you wouldn't expect it to be, you know, dot, it's kind of a weird, you know what I mean? Like it's a, it's a, I suppose you could flip around and be like, it's like, it's no you with no thank you, but it's kind of a stretch. Like, people wouldn't expect it, I guess. So I think the best way to go about it would be to direct people to my website and then say, go to nothankyou.neocities.org and click the music tab. That that's, I think that's the best way to do it, maybe? Because because that make, like telling people to remember some random thing called uno.sdf.org is, is not very memorable. You know what, I think I'm right about this. I think I have to tell people... Go to nothankyou.neocities.org and click the music tab uh, to, to stream my music. Uh, okay, that's a good, a good way of going about it. I'm glad I thought of that. Uh, hmm. Okay, so now how do I frame that as a YouTube video that people will actually click on? I don't like having to think about this fact that I have to get people to click on a video. I hate the fact that I have to use platforms to advertise my non-platform thing, but I... I don't know. You know what? I don't need to advertise it. Do How much do I need to advertise this? I'm kind of thinking out loud here. If you're this deep in the podcast, you know we're way past good content. Do I need to... Like, what do I need to do here? Because I, I feel like... Hmm. 
what do I want out of this? <laughs> hmm. Maybe it is best to just do this on backwards no thank you channel. Maybe I make a, a short video, or maybe a YouTube short. No, YouTube short's a bad idea. No, a YouTube short might be a good idea. I could, I could make a YouTube short and say, like, just with all the stuff going down at Bandcamp right now, uh, I've decided to set up a way that you can stream my music uh, without relying on a corporation-owned platform. Go to my website, nothankyou.neocities.org, link in the description, and click on the music tab, and you can stream all of my albums on there. That's probably a good, that's like a 60 second YouTube short, right? Okay, I'm going to go film that now. Oh, I should point out that, like, I'm doing this, look, 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 look. Video, I'm actually kind of excited about this. Because, like, everyone's very blackpilled about the enshittification stuff happening right now. Because it's happening, like, everywhere. YouTube, Twitter, and Bandcamp all at the same time, uh, like, all of a sudden, is really, like, hammering home stuff that I've been saying for years about, like, you know... No, proprietary software and everything right like it's really hammering home a lot of stuff i've been saying for a really long time it, i'm kind of being vindicated right now it's like i'm a doomsday prepper and doomsday's finally come and i'm like see i told you it would happen <laughs> um uh but now i'm kind of panicking because i didn't really have my shit in order that that well but i'm getting it and uh this is one of the things i want to say is youtube's ad blocking anti-ad blocking thing which is bad, and you might have had to deal with it to watch this video. Uh, it, I don't like that, right? And again, a reminder, you can listen to these on my website. Uh, sort of. They're hosted... They're not actually hosted on my website. Here's the, the secret, right? Is that NeoCities doesn't let you host audio unless you pay for it. Um, so the, the, the actual audio is just embedded from pomf.lane which could go down <laughs> any second like this thing has existed for a long time um but phew, i really hope it doesn't go down it would definitely suck if it did go down um because i don't have this shit super backed up um yeah i should probably figure out what to do about that because like i have a lot of faith in sdf staying up for a long time it's been sdf has been here since 1987 doesn't seem to be going anywhere okay like if a website could su or if a uh, if something can survive since 1987 it can probably survive you know another decade or whatever and then i can worry about it after that <laughs> but some random fucking you know file host like pomf.lane uh you know who fucking knows who knows how this this will work uh i'm curious let me let me see how this goes prompt i say i host a bunch of random crap on here most of this stuff is rooted back to my home okay try for 100 percent uptime you do a very good job of that uh 7666 um more detail get that. i mean yeah this this is and titanium level member of the eff how have i never checked this this motherfucker is so fucking shit um absolutely giga based individual here oh they even have a fucking invidious instance and a SciTube instance? And a Zonatic instance? They have a Zonatic fuck it. Okay, so based, holy shit. And what is this? It's just, just like a million different... Oh, this is the, the Lane Chan web. Ah, interesting. A link shortener? I mean, this is fucking based. You know what? I respect this person. I'm just gonna assume that this person's like fine. But anyway, the point I'm trying to make here is... So YouTube might be, like... Obviously, we can use NVIDIAs for now. I think... I'm kind of blackboard on this. I don't think NVIDIA is going to last much longer. Because the worse YouTube makes their site, the more people are going to try and get around it. Anti-ad blockers never really work, right? Like, the, eventually, uBlock Origin will come up with some update that figures a way around it. Uh, I mean, we already have, a, like, a pretty decent way around it, but it's not perfect. Um, but, you know, eventually, that'll happen. Or everyone will just, like, NVIDIA will become more and more popular. Although, I, who knows how well that will work out. Um, so I think that YouTube will target, I mean, they've already DC DMCA'd NVIDIAs, that didn't really work, because that's not how NVIDIAs works, but NVIDIAs is just a scraper, right, and, like, they could do some shit to, to fuck with the way scrapers work, like, I, I imagine that that sort of thing is possible, uh, again, if anything is possible for the YouTube engineers, you know, they put enough money into it, they can, all they have to do is make it annoying enough to run an, in an NVIDIAs instance that no one wants to do it anymore, 
Uh, like, that's really, you know, whatever. So, like, I'm not super hopeful about that. Uh, and obviously, online video is problematic because the files are so large that you, it's not very practical to host uh, a lot of YouTube-style videos on, you know, a personal website or something like that. Um, so much bandwidth, so much storage space, it's not super practical. <laughs> Which is why I'm actually becoming a bigger and bigger advocate for just audio content. Because text is nice. Like, obviously, we love text. But, you know, I, I, th I think podcasts are kind of the way, the way to go. Because it's super... Like, obviously, these podcasts are ridiculous. They're ridiculously long. And, you know, they stay under a gigabyte in size. Like, uh, if you, a 1080p YouTube video that's, like, 15 minutes long... God, I don't even know how, 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 how big that is. It's definitely over a gigabyte. I'm pretty sure. Wait, is it? I don't know. Now I'm thinking. Now I'm thinking about it. I don't actually know how much storage space that would take up. Uh, anyway, audio content with MP3 compression is actually very small. MP3 is very good, and you can compress the shit out of things, and it's optimized for voices. So you may notice that my voice sounds pretty much fine, uh, but you're listening to this with Audacity's maximum compression settings. Uh, which I, I didn't used to do, but now I do it because I checked and I saw just how little impact it really had on the intelligibility of my voice. Like, it sounds perfectly fine, because MP3 is a really fucking clever f compression format. Uh, and MP3 files are tiny. Like, it's very easy to, to host an MP3 file on, you know, a website of some kind. And so I would like to make a push towards more people putting out MP3 files of their content because a lot of youtube videos like you and i both know how many videos do we watch just in a second tap and i think you know there's more you could do with this like for example i've often thought that you could make a really cool format like file format or something like this i don't really know what it would be but it would effectively be an mb3 file and then a slideshow that automatically plays because that would be way smaller than a video file right you, you would just have like a few slides it's basically like a video file that just has, like, you know, very few frames. And, you know, you can't do a fucking Let's Play with that. But you can do a video essay with that very easily. Like, you can do a lot with, with just an audio file and a slideshow. I mean, fucking, what's that guy's name? Um, Mental Outlaw. Like, most of Mental Outlaw's videos are just him talking over a slideshow, right? Like, I mean, now I think he does more, he points a camera at himself and, and vlogs it. But they were like that for a long time. Uh, just, you know, that's a, that's a very powerful, like, you can do a lot with that, and it would be tiny. I don't know how you would make, make that work, but, uh, you could do some, something like that. But, yeah, if you, if you just uploaded a podcast type thing, like, if you had a website, put an mp3 file, and then put some images just on the page, or one image, whatever, I don't know, I think it could be sick. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think if there's better ways to go about it but anyway i'm what i'm trying to say here is we may not be able to replace video content but a lot of that video stuff is very doable with audio um and audio is much much smaller and cheaper and better in, in for those sort of applications and so i'm an advocate of like if the video component isn't strictly necessary just don't do it which is what i've done right i used these used to be like i don't know if you remember this but uh you know if you go on my youtube channel and you scroll back, you can find these experiments with very long-form diary-style content. Obviously, they started slightly more video-focused, and they split off. You know, some of them became more visuals-focused. Um, but if you look at, like, let's see, maybe, uh, where did they go? There should be one called, like, Gubbins or something like that. I made a bunch of these. Like, uh, if you scroll, scroll back, where the fuck did it go? How long? Oh, yeah, yeah, there's one called Assorted Musings and Assorted Musings 2. You know, and before that, there was there was giblets. I made one called giblets, and then assorted musings, assorted musings too, and then uh, yeah, I think I made a couple others, but that's the sort of vibe I was going for. <laughs> and those those videos could have easily just been these podcasts, right? Like, there's not really much of a visual component to them. Um, yeah, where was I think there's I don't think I have anything to say about this. Oh, I should point out actually one more thing. I do have an Odyssey. No one, no one knows that I have Odyssey, but I do actually have Odyssey. Uh, you, you can find me on Odyssey. I, I don't, you know, Odyssey is a bit Web three for my tastes, but I'm sure if you go on Odyssey and you type in my backwards ass name, 
yeah, you can find my channel. And every video that's under an hour long is on Odyssey. Because they don't let you mirror video. Like, they have an upload limit. But yeah, every video that's under an hour long is also mirrored on Odyssey. So, uh, if that's something you're interested in, you know, go ahead and uh, check that out. Yeah, I think what I the thing that I initially had a problem with with FairCamp is just that it's obfuscated. That I don't understand how it works and it doesn't make itself very apparent. Like, I can understand how to generate a website, but I don't necessarily understand how the website actually works under the hood. In fact, I don't know why I said as necessarily. I just straight up don't understand how the website works under the hood. Like, okay, let me click on an album and inspect source. Okay, so we got HTML, head, this stuff's all normal, CSS, style sheet, body, and then some JavaScript that I don't understand. JavaScript that I don't understand, class logo, that all makes sense to me. Dibs and spans, that's HTML. Okay, this isn't actually that complicated. This is just, this stuff is more complicated than I would ever do for a website. But it's just because I don't understand this stuff, especially the JavaScript, obviously. There's a very small amount of JavaScript here. Uh, yeah, there is not very much JavaScript. How, how is it even doing the controls? Is this a class? Oh, what, what even is this? How does this even work? Is it this job? Like, what? I don't understand. Audio controls preload node source. There is an audio tag here but i don't i don't the class s class it generates oh i see so it's using somehow i don't really understand how that works i mean i could experiment with this okay so when you generate the website it's checking a bunch of stuff and basically making images from it a couple of images for the waveform and stuff and then so that's not actually javascript this is basically just Audio control none source. Yeah, I know how that works. Slash up. then it makes a SVG waveform. And this this I don't know what this does. What even is SVG? I know that that's an image format, but but what about SVG yeah it is it's the same thing. Okay, so it's making a vector graphic for this waveform. And oh this is just the I guess this is just telling I don't know much about SVGs. I guess this is the SVG, like, SVG, t if we can, if it, okay, okay, so it's telling, so it's literally generating the waveform when you load the website using this SVG thing, that's cool, okay, so I actually do understand how this works, basically, other than the little bit of JavaScript, because I don't know what JavaScript means, but this, is, oh, I, th oh, I think this is literally just saying to enable JavaScript, I don't even think it does anything, well, that's pretty crazy. So as I understand it, the way the player works, and I might, I'm, I, I may be wrong about this, but as I understand it, what it's basically doing is just saying to load the audio controls like you would normally do, right? But then this preload none, I'm assuming, I, ha I don't know exactly what that does, but I'm assuming this just means like don't show the controls. And then this is the bit that I don't really understand. It's generating somehow an SVG image of a waveform, and it has a little play button and stuff. That stuff's cool, fine. But then I don't quite... Yeah, this path... What does the path command do? Oh, this is also related to SVG. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. They didn't close the tag yet. Okay, so this is all just generating the waveform. That's not actually what I'm interested in. Somehow, they're replacing the audio controls that are default with their own custom little thing that so i don't really know how you i don't know that was possible <laughs> but that's cool i guess because this is just the audio tag like there's nothing complicated about that like I, that's all just exactly how i do my you know podcast on my website this stuff so hold on let me do a, a, a inspect element so i can see what everything actually does oh. Okay, so that is the duration. Okay, I saw that. I understand that. This is the SVG. And this is class track, act, track, controls, alt. Where is that? Track. Okay, so there's some sort of thing called track somewhere. Okay, well, this is too complicated for me to really understand. But it's not as complicated as I thought it was. I think I could figure this out if I just spent a little more time with it. 
and Google a lot of stuff. Okay, so it's really I, I thought that it was more complicated than it actually is. It's actually not that complicated at all. I just read an interesting article called The Hegemony of the Door, uh, in which the author proposes that the door, rather than being a democratizing force in music, has been an individualizing uh, force for the deregulation of labor in music. Uh, and I think it was an interesting article, and it's pretty short. I'm not necessarily sure how much I agree with it, but I'm kind of... Like, it doesn't address my main problem with doors, which is twofold. The first one is that they go against the Unix philosophy, which, while sometimes practical in this sense, is also... It feels, like, not ideal, I would say. Like, kind of... I mean, if you want to talk about bloat... It's hard to find programs that are more bloated than a door. But you also got to compare a door to something like After Effects or, you know, some sort of like professional grade thing that is designed to be a suite rather than a program that does one thing. And normally I try to avoid programs like that. Um, but doors are so useful that you know, it becomes kind of hard. But then my second and much bigger problem with doors is that none of the good ones are open source <laughs> um, and or even available on Linux, uh, which, yeah, that's that's like a bigger problem. Because, and, you know, the fact that I chose to, I mean, many, many years ago, before I knew what a fuck a Linux was, chose to use the, the, the only door that is only available on Mac, uh, you know, poses some problems both ethically and financially for me. Uh, but, you know, I, I have, over the years, experimented with making music outside of a door. And I think that this is something that we're only going to see more and more of. Oh, I should explain for the people who have no idea what the fuck I'm talking about. I'm thinking I'm talking about, like, doors that you open and close. I'm saying door, in my accent, they sound the same because it's non-rotic. Uh... I'm not talking about a door, I'm talking about a DAW, Digital Audio Workstation, um, which is a type of program that pretty much all the music that you hear today would have been made in. It's a suite that allows you to do everything from recording, mixing, splicing and editing, using effects chains, so any sort of effects like, you know, that you might want to use. Um, and it also generally includes uh, like synthesizers, ways to, to synthesize you know sounds and, and all sorts of stuff like that. Pretty much an entire production suite for music all in one package that is very integrated. Um, which you can see why that would be extremely useful. But it also flattens the process of making music because previously, you know, a lot of that stuff would have been sort of considered to be kind of different processes. Like, recording and mixing used to be two different jobs done by two different people, and neither of whom were the person who wrote the song, <laughs> you know? And now, you write, perform, record, and mix your song yourself in a door, which, you know, if you want to say, it, like, this is definitely something that... I mean, not everyone does this, obviously. Artists who can afford a producer don't do this, but a, most, a lot of, like, independent bedroom-type people you know, like me, we do this sort of thing. And the idea that, like, the recording and mixing process, they use, like, I say they used to be two different jobs, but, like, what I, to get this, like, more specifically, it's that, like, the idea that you would mix, like, right now, there's not, with the door, there's not super separation between with recording and mixing. You do everything on the fly, right? Whereas before, you would, you would, or with a, a doorless setup on tape or something, you record everything and then you mix it. Um, like, they're two very separate processes. <clears throat> sort of like, well, whatever. Anyway, you know, I think another problem with doors is just that they, they seem very freeing, right? And I think this is something that, that this person got in an article that I think is pretty, a pretty interesting observation, which is that, like, every piece of software... I mean, they didn't go this deep into it, but every piece of software 
is not just uh, a, a sort of blank canvas. It actually directs you to do certain things. So, like, I, I think a great example of this is actually not software, it's hardware, but the, the, the acid bass lines that you hear in acid techno and acid house, like, they're a really distinctive style of, of writing, you know, a, a sort of melody or bass line or whatever. Um, but they came about specifically because on the Roland TR-303, like, that's kind of the thing that is the most natural to do. Like, it's most natural to write sort of, like, 16th note runs with kind of atonal or dissonant, um, you know, progressions and so on, just because of the way the machine is designed in a very unintuitive way. That like it's difficult to really do, get anything down on a three or three, and the thing that's like easiest to do, the thing that the machine sort of ends up leaning towards, are these sorts of patterns, which is why it completely failed in its original purpose, which was to emulate a bass guitar, but obviously birthed this genre of music called acid, um, and in the same way, you know, when you're like I've been making more and more music on Schism Tracker, and using a tracker, I, I, it's like I understand jungle music in a way that I never understood it before, because, like, this is what jungle would have been made of back in the 90s on an Amiga tracker or something like that in 92 or something like, you know, what's it called? Mod? Something mod? Octomed. Octomed. That's what it's called. Um, and, like, the way that jungle sounds comes very naturally on a tracker. Like, the stuff that's kind of weird, that we we probably don't think about that much, because you're just like, oh, that's how jungle sounds. But if you think about it, like, how come jungle, it's very common to do stuff like, hold on, I can actually demonstrate it for you, uh, like like this. You hear this this sort of sound? Like, uh, um, something like, like this. You hear like, you know, like when, when they do snare rolls that sort of go up and down in pitch. Like, how come they do that? Well, when you're using a tracker... That sort of thing is really easy and natural to do, um, like the way that the sampler works. Uh, and the, like it, it all makes a lot, a lot of sense. Like why people gravitated towards the sort of arrangements and textures and sounds that you make. Like why use breakbeats in the first place? Well, you you literally your your thing is a sampler. You know, it makes. It, what I'm saying is, the software you use or hardware you use is driving you down a certain path and yet with doors people don't assume that this is the case anymore people uh, no no one people don't really think about what sort of paths a door is pushing you towards but as the author points out um like one of the things that door-based music has encouraged is a focus on timbre over um other aspects um which i think is very interesting and also very true now that author has a bit more of a a strangely negative attitude towards uh, this focus on timbre, which I don't think is justified very well in the article, um, you know. But I, you know, the point still stands. You're you're not actually free to do whatever you want. You're being guided in a certain way, and if you really want to get away from that and make stuff that sounds unique, then that means changing the process. Which is why I've been exploring other options, and I've explored a few others. So, obviously, I've been using this tracker for the past like you know week or so. And having fun with it mainly to make jungle i haven't really tried to make anything other than jungle uh but i've also in the past experimented with i mean if you go on idmr you can see my experiments with orca and vcv rack so vcv rack is a digital modular synth um so a little bit of modular synth stuff and then using orca to control that which orca is an esoteric programming language for live coding music which Orca is extremely cool, but, like, here's the problem with me, is I'm kind of a genre guy. Like, I'm kind of a, I'm, I, maybe this is just a weird thing, but, like, I'm, I'm kind of into making music that is in a genre. And it's very hard to make music that is in a genre on Orca. Like, it's not impossible, especially with, like, techno. You could definitely make house or techno with Orca. But, I mean, you could really do anything. But Orca really wants you to make bleep bloop music, like modular synth bleep bloops. And, you know, I've been using the lines for them a lot more recently. And um, a lot of the folks on lines are great, great people. 
but they kind of all make modular synth bleep bloop music and i'm just not super into modular synth bleep bloop music i'm not saying all of them like it's it's very fun when you're when you're the guy who's twiddling the knobs this is the the, the modular synth bleep bloop music like yeah i it's fun to be the guy twiddling the knobs it's not super fun to listen to in my opinion um not like super into that kind of that kind of uh sound it's very sort of amorphous and blobular <laughs> and kind of uh yeah i saw someone on twitter point out something like a, a while ago something like uh, every time modular synth guys they're like oh i spent 10 million dollars on this euro rack setup and they play something for you and it sounds like you know a synth preset in your first ever door which is i think pretty accurate like you kind of get synth presety sounds and they're very bleep bloopy they're not very structured which is not the sort of music i'm particularly into like it's it's cool i i, I respect it i'm not gonna do it because they cost too much goddamn money uh it's just not worth it and also i know that if i ever started buying them i would never stop and then i would never have any money ever uh but you know vcv rack is a good environment to mess with this stuff because it's all digital so it's all free you miss out on the tactileness of of it all but uh you know it's all all inside of a computer so you don't have to spend money and if you're like oh i wish i had this module you don't have to spend 300 dollars on it and then wait for it to get shipped you just install it <laughs> um <clears throat> and yeah maybe with a more traditional sort of midi controller or something like this some some other way to send midi to vcv rack it would be less bleep bloopy but uh, maybe you don't want it to be less bleep bloopy i don't know person like i'm just not that into like making electronic music that's particularly like that like i kind of only really like sort of jungly stuff stuff that's that comes from jungle not drum and bass i like the jungle and breakcore basically is what i'm talking about here jungle breakcore idm like that kind of stuff and i kind of like the the sort of tradition very traditional berghain techno stuff maybe not like you know i'll go back to some detroit berghain but not like too modern you don't want to get too modern you know keep it a little the more minimal a little more maybe that's the one i'm looking for more minimal techno stuff and that's pretty much it when it comes to electronic music. Like, I don't really like much else. I mean, I guess I can go for a bit of old school dubstep. And uh, if you want to count grime as electronic music, then, which I think you should, then grime. Um, but like, you know, these are all very genre focused kind of things. I'm, I'll tell you what it really is. I'm not super into electronic music that you can't dance to. That's 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 more what it is. Like, I kind of, you know, even if the dancing is spazzing out on a dance floor to Venetian snares uh you know there's there's a there's a syncopation and a rhythm to it i think a lot of the bleep bloops they don't have it if it doesn't have like it doesn't have drums i don't know man i'm not into i mean they have drums but they you know do you i don't know if you you, you guys have listened to as much modular synth bleep bloop music as i have um I, but if you do you kind of know what i'm talking about i feel like but yeah i've so i've experimented with that and then i also i mean i recorded a whole album that was uh just in audacity and then I used, like, an online drum machine, uh, <clears throat> like, some sort of web app, <laughs> like, web-based drum machine, and then just plugged my bass in to Audacity, and then turned the volume up so it would distort, and then vocals. Uh, so that was a doorless production, and uh, that was fine, like, it worked. Listening back to the album, yeah, it sounds, it's music. <laughs> it's It's okay. How to feed no is it how to feed no ravens? Yeah, um, I I think it's pretty good. I think the the songs are kind of meandering, to be honest. Um, but yeah, and the obviously the bass tone, like the the, the tone is very bad because it's just like clipping distortion. Um, you know, if I had not done that, it would have sounded better. If I'd done something different, but. That's something I'm more interested in exploring because as I've been talking about, like I'm interested in buying some actual guitar gear to plug my bass into. I'm still looking around to see what some cheaper options might be. I don't think I even need to buy a distortion pedal if I buy a nice amp because I can just turn the gain up on the amp. Uh, like if, if you buy an orange amp, which is what I was thinking of doing, like, do you really need a distortion pedal as well? Like can't you just turn the gain up on the amp? Like, that already sounds good? I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> but, 
you know, and in that case, I would be interested in also maybe buying a physical drum machine, or maybe I just want hydrogen off of my ThinkPad, because hydrogen's pretty good if you just want something super, super basic. Like, there's nothing really wrong with hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen is a free open source drum machine uh, from Linux. <clears throat> or just some sort of cheapo drum machine hardware. Like, I'm sure they can't be that expensive. There's like a pocket operator. I don't really like those. I'd, I've used pocket operators in the past, not for, like br briefly, and I have not enjoyed them, but that was a long time ago. I mean, they ha they're very cheap and they have a drum machine, right? Uh, I don't know. I'm sure I can find a cheap ass drum machine, and then that might be kind of neat. But the other piece of hardware I'm kind of interested in buying would be some sort of 303 clone. Because I fucking love the 303. The problem is I don't know if I, like, I don't know when I would ever use it, you know? Like, the 303 is very easy to make a similar sound, just like in a door. If you know, if you know how subtractive synthesis works, you can get the sound of a 303 very easily. I mean, it doesn't sound as good, it doesn't sound like quite as good, but it's pretty damn close. Especially because Logic happens to come with a synth that is based on the 303. The ESM is based on the 303. So that makes it extra easy if you're using Logic. Um, but I've also emulated, just like made my own 303-esque sound in Logic's ES2 synth. Because, um, yeah, they're very simple kind of things. Um, but something about the physical 303 has always really appealed to me. Problem is, like, what would I even use it for? I don't really know. Like, I don't make much music that actually uses the 303 sound. I had an idea for an album, and I made, like, three tracks. Uh, the song, the album, or, like, whatever it was going to be, was called 303 Punk. And um, it was sort of, the idea was to make sort of distorted techno at, like, slightly fast, like, you know, kind of 135 BPM, 100, like, slightly fast techno that is just, like, four on the floors and then distorted 303s and different to normal techno in the fact that it is, like, the songs are short. I called them punk length to make punk punk length 303 techno songs, like Acid. But it, I don't really... They sound pretty good in my opinion. Here, I'll see if I can play you one, if I can find one. Is this it? No, that's not it. Oh, yeah, this is the wrong folder. Be here. Yeah, like, something like this, maybe. Uh... Oh, it's fucking like 3 a.m. I gotta keep it quiet. So this has a break in it for some reason. I don't know if you can really hear what that sounds like, but... Yeah, I think it sounds pretty good. Or I think it's good. Yeah. Um, didn't get very far in the album. Yeah, I'm not really sure what to do with those tracks. Um, I think I put them on Patreon at some point, or at least one of them. But, yeah, I mean, the... the Programming a physical 303 is supposedly a fucking nightmare. Um, but, wait, where was I going with this? Oh yeah, that was just another piece of hardware that I kind of want, just to own. Just because it's cool. There's no point in having it if I don't have a guitar amp, though. But then the thing is, what do I even do with it? That's the, Yeah, this is, this is what we're getting at. We're back to what do I even do with it? I don't know. There's no really music you can make with just a 303, <laughs> you know? Um, and it's kind of, you need to... Yeah I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That's kind of the thing that's been stopping me from buying it. It's just like, what would I do with it? The answer is, like, probably not enough to justify spending 100 quid on a 303 clone. Um, so, yeah, I guess those are my my doorless experiments. And I'm trying to, like, I'm, I'm interested maybe in, like, getting into Super Collider, which is, like, a free open source programming language for for, for music stuff. And, like, I guess you can do some live coding stuff with Super Collider. I'm not much of a programmer, but I guess Orca, like, if I could get Orca to do, like, yeah, I mean, that would work, right? I could definitely point Orca at Super Collider and do some stuff with it, if I can even remember how Orca works. I mean, yeah, I could definitely make bleepy bloops with that, but 
but that's not like migrating no thank you over that's not a no thank you album that's just kind of bleepy bloops i mean yeah i did make i did make total organ failure horizon which is also kind of bleepy bloops but like that's different <laughs> that's different trust me it's different um yeah but the the trying to escape the door like a lot of people who are into like oh i'm gonna go you know there, there's there's a movement there is a doorless movement right there's a movement of people who go doorless but they go towards hardware like when people talk about that there's a whole community and industry of producing and using this hardware focused on you know getting away from the door but i'm not that interested in hardware like i mean i it's cool but i'm mainly not interested in it because it's expensive it's all really expensive uh, just to do stuff that is like, I mean, not that the limitations are bad. The, having limitations on what you, that's how creativity comes comes from, right? That's where creativity comes from. Like, I, I think that's good and cool and fine and whatever. Uh, but yeah, I'm not, I'm just not super into it. It's a little too clunky. Like, I, I get a little frustrated when I can't get my ideas out as fast as I want to. Uh, but mainly, it's just the price that stops me. Like, it's just too damn expensive. Um, so really, like, I want a software doorless approach. Which, now that I think about it, maybe Super Collider is the play. Because that should be, like, extremely versatile. Um, but, yeah, I mean, in terms of... Like, what do I really want to do? On the one hand, I've got Akazi. Akazi is make it a jungle beat in the tracker. I've pretty much got that, like, down with Schism Tracker. Like... It's kind of slow and painful to chop up breaks, but once you've got them chopped up, they stay chopped up, and you could use them in a bunch of different songs. So, like, it's not too bad. Um, although I tried to make a song today, and it, it turned out pretty mid um, after a long time of working on it. But that happens in a door too, so it's not really that much. Of it. It's just that, that, like, the difference is that I'm just much faster with a door, right? Which I don't know how much of that is just time spent using it but like a lot of my time spent in schism tracker is spent chopping up the brakes because you have to do it very like it's i don't know maybe i'm just slow at it and maybe i'll get faster you know yeah that's probably a thing that will happen uh so yeah but it just means the time in like it's normal for me to get like you know a few hours into making a song and trying to fuck around with it to make it work and then realize like it's not going anywhere and throw it out um you know but if i've invested if I like the more time I invest in that, the more disheartening it is to end up, you know, realizing that it, it, this this song idea isn't going anywhere, and you know, discard it. In in logic, I can really quickly sketch something out, and you know, very quickly I can. I mean, that's not even true. I've spent day, I've spent like full days on a song, that, and then realized at the end of the day that it wasn't going anywhere. Or worse, actually, I spent like a full day or like half a day making making a song. And then, like, the next day, you go to sleep, you're like, that was sick. You wake up the next day, you re-listen back to it, and you're like, oh my god, this is fucking terrible. What was I thinking? That's pretty annoying. But, yeah, these things happen. That's, it's annoying, but it's part of the process, and I don't really mind it. Um, but, yeah, I guess, really, what I need is a, 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 a guitar amplifier and a drum kit. I don't think I can get away with having, like, a, a physical drum kit in my house. <laughs> I think those things are too damn loud. Uh, I have neighbors. But I guess I could just play it during the day when the, everyone's at work. Like, how viable is that? I don't know if people are working from home around me. That's a thing now. Yeah, probably not super viable. Also, I don't want to make up a drum kit. <laughs> uh, and also, those things are expensive. I guess I could, yeah, and if I set up a, if I buy a MIDI drum kit, like a, a, a digital fake one, then I am still in the same problem where I have to plug it into Logic for it to make sounds. Um, yeah, I kind of really, I think, like, you, th here's the thing, the music that I want to make right now, the sort of industrial, doomy, sludgy metal, is, it was invented before d Doors, were invented or oh, no that's not true the fair light whatever was invented before but you'd before fucking pro tools was popular is what i'm saying um but there's only one me like it's not like i mean yeah i don't know and my friend like little crazy bitch would play drums but he's not in like i don't know he's not he's never been that into um 
to doom metal, like I'm into doom metal. Uh, yeah, I don't know, definitely an interesting problem to solve. Uh, but but if I just had, you know, if I just had, like, I mean, I've already said this, if I just had a, an amp and a mic, I could just record into Audacity and then use a drum machine. Because uh, I, I like the sound of shitty drum machines, especially when you distort them. Hence my appreciation for Shinsei Kamatechan demos. Uh, and that would, yeah, that would be me open sourcing no thank you in my brain. Uh, and then I guess I would be doorless. Hmm. Definitely conundrums going on. There's definitely conundrums. Like, what do I actually do in Logic? I'm going to just look through my most recent projects and see what I even make. Okay, this. I think this is a Doom Metal song I was recording. Uh, oh no, this is a techno song that I made as a joke. Uh, and this is the Doom Metal song I was recording. Yeah, which... What the fuck? Oh no, this is the industrial song I made. Yeah, this sounds like shit. Yeah, I, I'm, that's another one I'm, I, I'm throwing out. It was a cool idea, but it is not working. This is the Doom Metal song I was recording. And then it gets up to like this. But then it goes like this. Yeah, this is okay, but I feel like it's a little generic. I need, like, I would like to make it a little more noisy. But I tried to make it noisy by just, like, like crushing everything. Like, clipping everything. And it sounds okay, I guess. But, like, I don't really know what I'm trying to do <laughs> in terms of making it more noisy. Uh, maybe I need to add more. Maybe the problem is that, like, the, maybe the drums, like, I think the drums are the problem. Because if you listen to the drums, I've got this really nice fucking noisy ass snare that I, I like. Again, these are the sorts of things that you could do very, I, I've got a chain of figuring out how to do this shit in Logic and make it sound good. Yeah, I think that sounds sick. But, yeah, maybe the bass is too loud. I don't know, I, I have to go back to that song. But what else have I made before that? This is the question, because I remember those ones. Oh, then I made the Deftones, I made that Deftones cover. That's on Patreon. And I made this. I guess this is a jungle song. Yeah, I guess this is a jungle song. Oh yeah, I remember this, because I wanted to use this Dominator thing. This is super, like, I could have made this in, uh, there's nothing about this song that couldn't have been done in Skizzing Tracker. This is a hundred percent good one, Skizzing Tracker. I mean, maybe a couple of the compression effects and stuff. It's like a hardcore, young hardcore techno, big beat, big beat hardcore, that's the job that I'm thinking of. Yeah, it's a decent song, I guess. I got very hyped for it while I was making it, but what's bleep? What is this? Oh yeah, this is, oh yeah, I guess all the stuff other than this is just going to be my, some break call that I was making. This just says break. I guess some hardcore. Ooh. That's some pretty nice timbre. That's a, that's a nice ass kick. I don't know. I'm lost. My ethics and my aesthetics. It's also about aesthetics. Like I have an idea for of an album where the cover is like like a whole bunch of of shit. <laughs> like hold on. You know that there's this um what's the the person from 
What's the what's the band called? Oh my god, everything. I've forgotten everything. Black dresses. You know black dresses? You guys know black dresses, right? Okay, one of the people from black dresses. No, not I don't want actual black dresses. I want the band. Gimme give, give me the fucking band camp. Okay. It's none of these because it's one of the individual people's it's I think it's Ada Rook. One of the Ada Rook albums? No? Is it one of the Devi McCallion albums? Um I don't see it. What the hell? Did I just make this up? <laughs> Does this album not exist? This I remember seeing an album. Maybe it wasn't them. I thought I I thought Oh yeah, here it is. Four. Four by Mum by Devi McCallion. Like the album cover for four. Um it's just a bunch of like logos and shit. It's like it's like a bunch of logos on a white background. And I I always really liked this album cover. And I was like, what if I made an... I want to make an album with the covers kind of similar to this. Um, but but all of the logos and stuff are related to, like, Linux and free software and, like, like crossed-out Apple logo and shit. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like that would be kind of sick. But I can't do that. I can't do that if I'm using cringe software. I mean, it's it's a matter of pride. I pride myself on being a Linux guy. And being, you know, an obnoxious internet vegan, software vegan, um, uh, and yet here I am on a fucking Mac. It's disgusting. It actually makes me disgusted with myself. The question is, am I inadequately experimental? That's actually what I'm trying to deal with right now. Because I know I've just been repeating myself uh, for the last, like, 20 minutes. But really, I'm feeling inadequate because I feel like I'm inadequately experimental. Like, back in the day... I mean, this isn't even true. Like, I felt like No Thank You Volume 1, I was more focused on experimentalism, you know? Like, 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 this song? This song's like, like, it's like Shushu. This is a Shushu song that I made. Yeah, I made like a Shushu song. And then Volume 2 is like way more straightforward, I feel like. But even then, it's a little weirder. You know, I guess that song's pretty normal. But this is like a... Yeah, it's more like digital hardcore, I guess. And Doesn't Laugh is also very straightforward. It's very... Shinsei Kamatsuchi inspired. But then To The Fairest, I feel like doesn't sound like any other album ever made, you know? To The Fairest, I really had an original sound, and then I've never been interested in making it again. That's such a good album. How did I make an album that good? Oh yeah, and there's FODAP as well, which I always forget about. And FODAP is fully experimental. Yeah, that's exp- experimental. And then Encycle Futility is experimental. But then Dead Form, is it experimental? What, is it, what does it mean? What am I talking about? I just made Idolatrous not that long ago. Idolatrous is like weird-ass noise rock. Okay, you know what? <laughs> The thing is, when I made Idolatrous, this is the thing, this is the thing, I made Idolatrous, and I'm finally, like, I feel like I've made an album, and that, you know what, I could actually make another album that sounds kind of like this, which is the first time this has happened to me, right, like, I feel like this might be something closer to my sound. And I'm also very happy with this, like, again, I just want to emphasize, this is my best album, by far, (laughs) well, maybe not by far, but... Idolatrous is a great fucking album. I'm genuinely very happy with it. Um, like, I could, I, I can continue that, but I need to, like, here's the really real thing. I know I'm really talking in circles right now because I'm just thinking out loud. This is really dumb and probably really painful to listen to, and I, I apologize. Um, although someone, someone called me out in the comments for saying, like, oh, sorry for boring you in these, where it's like, oh, bro, you're, you made a 12 hour podcast. What do you, like, but I try and be entertaining and not too annoying. Um, but yeah, I need to. What I'm trying to get at is, I think I just need time to experiment to find find a sound that I'm satisfied with. Because I know I want it to be bass guitar, and I know I want it to kind of be like idolatrous. But I also want it to be like there's more. There's more. Like I I know that there's something there that I like haven't explored yet, and I'm not quite sure what it is yet. And I need to, like, just spend more time fucking around with it. But then at the same time, there's a part of me that's like, maybe, 
you know, a lot of me just wants to make music that sounds like I Hate God, <laughs> but because because I love that band, but uh, you know, I I need to spend more time messing around, and uh, in my quest to to discover what it is that I'm missing in life, you know, this is where I'm like, well, you know, if you if you just do the same process, you can't expect anything to change, which is why I'm like, you know, thinking more. One of the reasons why I'm thinking more and more about this this door problem but, but like i'm not sure what the what changing the process even looks like you know i mean i've i've explained what it looks like right but like what i mean is that's the stripped down version but then what do i want to add on top of it to make it unique and make it interesting that's the question that i haven't answered okay guys you don't need to chop up samples and schism tracker you don't need to go through this fucking massive pain it is really awkward. There's a way easier way of doing it that I found out because I was like, hey, you know that Unreal Tournament song? I was just jamming to it. You know the Foregone Destruction? You guys know Foregone Destruction, right? You guys know Foregone Destruction. Hold on. Let me, let me, you know what? Let me just do this. Uh, wait, let me, let me just do this. Let me just do this. You guys know Foregone, Foregone Destruction, right? It sounds like this. Uh, you know. I'm just gonna, okay, this is stupid. Yeah, you know, it's like. Yeah, you guys know this song, right? It's the, the, the Unreal Tournament Jungle song. And I was, I, I was looking up on YouTube, and I was like, hold on a minute. If you go on YouTube and you look up Foregone Destruction, the first result is a guy playing it in Schism Tracker. And I'm like, wait. I have Schism Tracker. Can I download the .it file and load this shit into Schism Tracker? Of course I can. Of course I can. That's how programs on the computer work. So I went and did it, and I'm looking through it to study it, because this is a fucking masterpiece of a song, right? And a lot of this shit is, like, way advanced uh, that I don't understand. And this is this song must have taken ages to make. Holy shit. There's a lot of subtleties and little things I wouldn't have even thought to do that make the song, you know, way, way sound better, <laughs> to put it bluntly. Um, but then I noticed, like, hold on, there are sample chops. But when I go through, like, they've got, he's, this guy's got a different way of doing sample chops. Because the way I've been doing it, for the, the zero people in the audience who know what, how Schism Tracker works, um, is I've been going to the sample page, and I've been using the loop functionality to to find the loop to put the start and end point of the loop to be that and then to trim the start and end point of the loop and then that's a, its own sample which it seems a bit wasteful because you're wasting a whole sample slot on a snare from a sample that would already exist for example you know something like that like if you want to have it to, so that you can loop the snare you'd have to have it but that's not the way you do it you can set the sample offset in the tracker bit, you can just set the sample, you just have to have the sample once, and you can just tell the, the, the play, what's it even called, the pattern, in the pattern menu, you can just set a value to, to be the offset in the pattern menu, and, and then you don't need to have, wow, that's crazy, well, there you have it, okay, so I'm currently very sick, uh, I would say it's pretty bad. It was worse when I just woke up, but it's still pretty bad. I probably either have the flu or COVID. Probably got it when I went out to see Adam F's disappointing performance. Um, I want to say a couple of things. The first thing I want to say is, um, you know, the real problem in Team Fortress 2, the problem is the existence of these spin botting spin spin bot bots sniper bots the bot crisis and uh while there's some attempts to solve this um i was thinking okay really this is my thoughts are gonna be fucking scrambled because i'm like flu brained but this came about because i was thinking about free open source software and open source video games and so on because i was thinking about um well i mean i was just kind of thinking about that 
there wasn't anything that much deeper. And like, um, this is actually something that gets brought up as a counter argument to all software should be FOSS is uh, anti cheats. That like, well, we need this. Uh, um, like, video games aren't fun if you're playing against cheaters, and that's important. Uh, you don't want to be playing against cheaters, and so. You know, even having an intrusive Valorant style Ring Zero anti cheat um, is actually a good thing and pro- takes priority over privacy. And even if you have a less invasive one, the idea that they should be, they could be open source is obviously insane, right? Because if they were open source, one could simply read the source code and figure out much easier some sort of workaround. The obfuscation is central to how they work. And them being intrusive is central to how they work. The more intrusive they are, the better they work. The more obscured they are, the better they work. And all of this is correct. Um, But it really misses the point, which is, okay, well, in that case, anti-cheats aren't actually a good solution to the problem of cheaters. We actually already have a perfectly fine solution to the problem of cheaters, which is admin. Um, If these video games weren't all taking place on the same set of servers owned by one company who can't be bothered to, you know, allocate resources for for admins, I mean, it wouldn't necessarily be viable for them, right? If, If all the servers for your game are owned by one company, having to administrate and moderate all of those servers with real humans would be... It would take a lot of resources. You know, it's not um, viable. But uh, if you have community-run servers, and they're easy to set up, and there are many of them, suddenly that workload is spread over, you know, hundreds, if not thousands, of different community members, each of whom, you know, only needs to moderate their own server or, uh, you know... If they have a collection of servers, they just need a couple of... Like, it's not hard. I know it's not hard, because we did it for decades. Um, You don't need... Like, you don't need an anti-cheat. You just need admins. (laughs) Now, admins are a problem in some cases. Okay? I've I've been kicked by uh, admins for for unjust reasons in in video games before, as I'm sure it's not an uncommon thing, right? Uh, But, if you actually have a transparent... um, and well-run administration system, not only is it superior to... I mean, it's just better. It's just a better option. I mean, why do you think Uncletopia doesn't have cheaters? They get banned. But Uncletopia doesn't use some sort of crazy, ad, uh, you know, anti-cheat. It just use, it just has ad- administrators. Now, to be fair, the cheaters aren't super interested in playing on Uncletopia. The, the spin-botting, the bots, right... But cheaters, you know, individual hackers who are, they call them hackers, is not right, call them cheaters. Individual cheaters who just, you know, want to use silent aim or whatever, like non-rage cheaters, you know, this sorts of people. They don't tend to last long on Uncletopia, like they get banned because they 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 get what like there are admins to ban those people. That's why admins exist. Like it's literally a perfectly good system. The only reason that we've done away with this is because um it's harder for companies to make money like that's literally why i mean if i was kind of thinking about this because of the lister video lister made this video about how um the meet your match update like almost killed tf2 and how in the early days of tf2 there were no valve servers and of course i've played a decent amount of i was gonna say a lot but that's not true i've played a decent amount of counter strike 1.6 and source and neither of those have valve run servers either um and yet you know, I don't think I've ever come across a cheater in any of those games, uh, and I've definitely come across cheaters in CS:GO. Now, to be f- actually, that's not really a fair comparison because I've played a lot more CS:GO or CS2 as it now is, I guess. Um, but I would imagine, you know, it, it's just it, uh, what I'm saying is the the community server model is just a good model. Like, there's 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 not really it, it can be abused. Yeah. Um, ideally. It requires, like, you know, each server moderates... The, if Like, this is not a very anarchist solution, you know, but we're talking about corporate-run stuff here. I'm talking about pragmatically stuff here, right? Like, uh, ideally, you have a sort of setup where each individual server moderates itself or, you know, group of servers run by whatever individuals or teams or whatever moderate themselves. And then you have Valve or whatever company 
moderating, you know, servers in general. Like you should have some way to report a server to Valve or to to whoever owns the game that you're playing. Um, and they should, you know, occasionally go through and check and be like, oh yeah, this one is a, uh, uh, you know, a server that's using abusing something. You know, maybe it's showing a bunch of intrusive ads or it's misleading in some way, like ping spoofing or play account spoofing. Which you see all the time in TF2. Like, I go into servers and I'm like, oh, okay, there's six players on here, that's fine. And then I join and it's just me and then five bots. Very annoying, the play account spoofing stuff. Uh, but I, I think, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong here. But this seems like a, a, a good option to me. Like, I, obviously, I, like, it's it's nicer to do, like, this might this might be, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to decide whether I actually agree with what I'm about to say. It can be nicer to deal with a person rather than a program. It's not always, and maybe I'm wrong about this, maybe I don't even agree with this myself, but, like, getting banned by a human being, they may be fallible, but the programs are fallible too, the, the, the anti-cheat programs are fallible too. Like, the, the, the real distinction here, let's actually clarify this, is that you're always getting banned by a human being. It's just like, in one case, the human being is downstream and obfuscated, right? I would rather just have the the human being not be obfuscated, just be like right there as some sort of admin. And yes, they sometimes have used their power. That's the problem with admins. And it might be nice to set up some sort of democratic or transparent system for doing these sorts of things. You know, like, I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm pretty, like, I'm, I'm kind of, not super in favor of moderators and admins having like too much power and being unaccountable like it's definitely a thing uh on the internet um and there seems to be very little attempts to solve this problem okay but that's my first thing that i basically wanted to say is like uh actually anti-cheats are not a good way of doing things they'll never be as good as a human moderator with eyes and even if a human admin makes mistakes, which they do, like, there was a Volibay re- video recently where he got banned from a community server for hacking, uh, even though he wasn't, but when he looked at the clips that had been submitted of him, like, it's very obvious to see why. Like, he did some sus shit. Like, he, he, does, he said in the video, like, yeah, I don't blame them for banning me. Like, if I saw this, I would assume the other person was cheating as well. Um... But, you know, you can appeal that, and he did appeal, and I'm pretty sure he got unbanned from their server. So, you know, like, it's it's not a perfect system. There is no perfect system. Uh, but, uh, you know, when, when it comes to some giant company, you know, let's say some company you, that owns your video game bans 500 people a day, and even if, like, just one of those people contests the ban, you know, that's fucking 365 people contest- that you have to review per year and like that's kind of a lot of work you know what i mean like if it's all separated out into different community run spaces it reduces the workload for everyone and makes it actually a viable option um even if the system is always going to be flawed at least it's uh you're closer to the human and you don't have to run some sort of intrusive anti-cheat on your computer there you go that's pretty much my my argument there Uh, also Here's some more things. Firstly, you block Origin. I managed to get it to actually block the YouTube anti blocker. So now I've got anti anti ad blocker. Uh, if you want to know how to do it, uh, it's very easy. There's a, there's a tutorial on the you block Origin Reddit page. Go on you block Reddit. It's like a pinned post right at the top. And don't like the first time I tried it, I was like. Really? You want me to disable every single other extension I have? That sounds like a bit of overkill. So I didn't do it. And then I was like, why isn't this working? (laughs) But the second time, I did it and I cleared the browser cache and that fixed it. Clearing the browser cache and restarting fixed it. And uh, you can go through one by one and re-enable your your extensions to see which ones break it, basically. Um... But yeah, no more anti-ad blocker messages. Um, so that's a, that's a good thing. <clears throat> and then the other good thing... No, that's not... Well, what am I talking about? Oh yeah, so I'm thinking about... I've been thinking about... I've been fucking with my website a lot recently. Like, if you follow my RSS feed, you're probably very annoyed with me right now. 
Uh, I don't know if I should be using my RSS feed the way I am. Because I'm using my RSS feed like a change log. Like, it, it's... My RSS feed, like a lot of people, they it's just like new article equals RSS, new blog post, whatever. For me, it's just a change log to the site. So any new blog post, yes, but also if I update anything else about the site, I also put a little RSS notification out for it. But I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Like, I don't know if I should be doing that. But I also don't know if anyone actually used, like, I actually kind of doubt that anyone follows my RSS feed anyway. I, I don't know. <clears throat> anyway, so that's a thing. I've been I've been messing with my website a lot lately, improving it in various ways. Obviously, I set up Faircamp, uh, uh, which is nice. I think I'm getting like a decent amount of traffic on my Faircamp. Not that I can tell. Not that I have any way of finding out. Uh, not that it's turned into any fucking donations. But who cares about that? Um, yeah, I've been making a lot of little, little adjustments to the website. Like, today, the thing I did was, the, in the little photo at the bottom of the page, it says, like, it has a link to RSS feed, a link to the copy down notice, and a link to the web ring, right? And previously, RSS and web ring weren't capitalized, but copy down was capitalized. So, to, and that was annoying me. So, I went and decapitalized the C on copy down. <clears throat> on every page on the website, which took a little while. And I also added my blue sky to the links section. I should probably have like a rel no opener for these links. Uh, that's probably the, sp- uh, whatever. People can just fucking middle click it. It's fine. Man, my website's so damn clean. Looks so damn good. Uh, anyway. But yeah, I was thinking about my website and I'm trying to like, I think, because Twitter, okay, man, listen, this must be fucking impossible, this must be incredibly frustrating to listen to, because I am, like, fucking delirious with illness right now. So Twitter is, like, ac- like, Twitter's been, like, dying, obviously, but Twitter is now, like, actually dying, as in, I ain't paying money to use Twitter, and if they try and make me pay money, I'm deleting my fucking account, obviously. Um, so... They're trying to make people... I'm not paying a dollar for Twitter. No fucking way am I doing that. Um, So I'm really trying to push people towards my blue sky now. I would really like it if people f- followed my blue sky more. Um, That would be nice. Not that I particularly care. But but to be honest with you... Uh, where was I going with this? Um, Oh, yeah. Uh... Twitter is, like, the easiest thing to replace. There are, like, ten different things I can think of that replace Twitter. And only two of, like, other than... Here, I'll name them all. So, Twitter, we don't want it. We take a goddamn blue sky. We take a goddamn threads. We take a goddamn mastodon slash fediverse. So, those are the first three. And those are the three that I consider to be the, the worst options. Out of those three... Blue Sky is the best of the worst options. It's a red letter media best of the worst options. Blue Sky is the best of the worst options because if your account gets deleted and you get banned by some retard admin, you can just move to a new thing and you don't lose all your followers and all your posts, which is the the protocol, the at protocol, is better designed than the activity pub protocol. Uh, It sucks because it's kind of corpo-pilled, obviously. Blue Sky is a little corpo-pilled. But also, and this is just a very minor thing, the Blue Sky webpage loads faster than um, uh, the, um, what am I saying, Mastodon webpage. And uh, here's some more things as to why I prefer Blue Sky. Obviously, Threads is garbage. I'm not even going to bring that up. But the, the two other things I like are the custom feeds, how you can like, how the, people can share different algorithms. That's cool. Uh, and not just algorithms, but, like, yeah, I mean, it's good. Like, I followed one called Political Science, and I just see a bunch of people posting about politics. I don't know why I followed this one, because I don't really understand any of this shit, but that's cool. And then I also like the moderation settings, where, like, you you basically get, like, on Mastodon, whoever administrates your instance sets whatever moderation preferences they want and you don't really get a say in it so it's just like well better join an instance that has moderation preferences you like 
Uh, but that's obviously annoying because they can change any time and you don't have any control over it. But having it in the user settings, having it be on a per user basis is way better. Um, so that's why I like Blue Sky more than Mastodon. But <clears throat> after that, that what was that? So the Twitter, then Blue Sky, Mastodon, Threads, that's three. And then the next option would just be blogs, right? Following people's blogs, uh, which I do, but not to a high enough degree. Like, to be honest, I just don't know enough. Like, I need, you know what? Maybe I'll do this today. I think today, because I'm, I, for some reason, there's no good YouTube harvest today. So I, and I'm in the, I can't really do anything because I'm sick. So I might just like go looking through a bunch of web rings and seeing finding a bunch of blogs and adding them to my RSS reader. That is definitely a good I should do that actually. Yeah. That's great. That's a great idea. I'm going to do that today. So blogs plus RSS is good, but here's why it doesn't fully replace Twitter <coughs> is because it's non-interactive, right? Like you can't respond, like retweet these sorts of things. You can only read and follow and th- and that's it. Um, like, it's a little different from Twitter. Obviously, there's also the fact that it's long form. Um, but I think there are solutions to this. And I've recently been reading about the, this web mention thing. Um, I don't super understand this. Um, but web mentions seem like a cool way to set up some sort of comment section, uh, or something like that. Um, yeah, I I think I think web mentions have uh, have some some. I found out about this because of uh, I someone posted on my Discord this uh, <coughs> someone's website called sayd dot one, and they have a comment section using web mentions, which is pretty cool. So I'm gonna look into how the fuck web mentions work. I'm I can't learn it right now, but I will try and learn it at some point. Uh, and then, uh, I don't necessarily, yeah, I don't know if that's super viable for my site, because of NeoCities requirements, I'll have to see, uh, <clears throat> uh, but this is a cool website, it's very well designed in terms of minimalism, it looks like my website, so you know it's good, um, but what I don't like about this person's website, Sadi.1, is they claim to care about privacy and security, but then for some reason post their literal name, real name, age, occupation, location, gender, and resume on their website in the about section. Like literally, okay, here's where this guy went to college. Here's like, why would you post this about yourself? This is insane. This is an insane amount of information to just voluntarily give to random people on the internet about yourself. So that's the first thing that I could, I mean, I mean, you could do it if you want, like, I'm not going to stop you from doing that. That's just a weird ass decision. I don't know why you would do that. Um, and then, uh, what's this? Hold on. I'm looking at things. What is this indie web thing? This is just another name for web zero. Micro dot block. What is micro dot block? Cause this might, this is what you want. Oh, I've seen this before. Okay. Well, I don't care about that. I already have a website. I have two, actually. Um, <clears throat> but that's the first thing I don't like. And the second thing I that I, I don't necessarily dislike it, okay? Because I actually went through this entire thing. But this person has... Like, one of the things this person does is they are the, the people who make block lists to defederate people off of Mastodon. Um, now, yeah, I looked through... All of their instances that they've just... Like, they have a... Like, a big list on their website where they say, like, here's every instance that's on this block list that I made and here's why it's blocked with screenshots and evidence. And I think most of it is justified in terms of, like, yeah, they're literally Nazis. Um, But I just think it really demonstrates how fucked the Fediverse is as a concept where... Like, how bad moderation is on the fed of us. <laughs> that you just have to, like, keep fuck. I don't know. It's It it shows how I think that's such a flawed system. Um, I was about to say something else, but I don't remember what it was. But anyway, cool website. 
not where I was going with this at all. I don't know why I've ended up talking about this. What was I talking about? Oh yeah, web mentions. They this person uses web mentions uh, to have comments on their blog posts, and I think that's cool. And I I might I'm interested in doing something like that. I'm also interested in adding my website to uh, some other web rings because the problem, like, in order for web rings to really work effectively, they need to be interconnected. Otherwise, you're just stuck in one web ring forever, right? You just go in a loop. So you need to have ways to jump off into other web rings. Oh, the Yesterweb web ring has been discontinued. Why? Yesterweb horrid monstrosity of users. We are at over 800 plus. Yeah, that is way too fucking many. Yeah, okay, that is very stupid. You don't want a web ring to get that big. Why are they shutting down? Like, they should have... This was so stupid. They should have just fucking... What? Why did they do this? Why did they just get to, like, 100 users and be like, okay, we're closing applications now. What were you thinking, yesterweb people? You just close applications. You're you're in, you're in charge of it. You don't have to keep accepting. Whatever. You don't. Have, what is that's such a that is such a weird fucking decision to make. I don't. Is yesterweb like ridiculously permissive with how you join it? <clears throat> I don't know. Um, but anyway, um, I'm thinking of. I found a one that I liked. The low tech web ring, I believe. That was a good one. Is this it? Yes, this was it. Now this, yeah, this is a good-ass web ring. I like this one. See, you know what is a good web ring? Is the fucking XXIIVV um, web ring. But their, their goddamn uh, requirements to join are insane. Like, to act, to join the web ring, you have, to, like, I double-checked, by the way, and I don't, like, I've... I've checked some of these some of these members and some of them I don't believe that they fit the criteria that they claim to need to join which is very strange to me like I don't really understand it um like they claim your website must count at least 10 content pages and include an about page blog posts are not counted as content pages you must have your own domain name we do not accept github dot io subdomains well my fucking website is not github dot io but like that's so weird like what's is is neo cities banned really like what firstly blog posts don't count as content pages is a fucking weird ass decision that doesn't make any goddamn sense to me um what is that about that's that's just strange but also i've seen sites on the web ring that don't seem to subscribe to that they don't seem to do that they i don't believe that they act they have 10 content pages that aren't blog posts um i've checked some of them and they don't and then yeah the 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 and then this is the other thing so then there's stuff that i think is fine right single paid websites websites uh acting only as portals to other social platforms uh if your webs those are rejected. If your website requires JavaScript or CSS3 to display the majority of its content or to navigate, it will be rejected. I think this is completely fine. Um, and then they say websites with violent, racist, or sexist. You, you see, I'm on board. And then or speciesist content will be rejected. So like now, I'm like, well, okay. If I ever go on a rant about veganism, I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> Yeah, so although I think this is a great web ring, and I think that a lot of the people here are good, uh, it's fucking, the requirements to join are just stupid, especially the 10 content pages not including blog posts. Like, what do you mean? What counts as a content page? Like, if I just uploaded 10 pictures, but they were all on different pages, would that suddenly mean I meet the requirement? Like, that's such a dumb requirement. And the no subdomains, like... I, I understand not wanting to accept github.io, but, like, you know, web servers cost money. You're supposed to be goddamn anarchists. Um, anyway, I don't really care about that anyway. There's too many people on this web ring already. But I like this low-tech web ring, because they're much more reasonable. Nothing that would need an, an 18-plus warning visible from the front page, or if it's there, yeah... And then that's basically it. 
and it just has to be low tech and vibey and chill and that's cool uh so yeah i kind of like this i kind of like this thing and they're much more reasonable um i was going somewhere with this oh we started talking about web rings now i was talking about twitter alternatives um right so that's cool i should yeah i need to figure out this is what i need i need to figure out a place on my website to okay i'm gonna need to like i guess i can just have a little button on the bottom of the site the links to the low tech web ring or whichever ones i decide to join um that's definitely viable uh okay so we got that sorted out which is nice I I have to encourage you to start your own website, people. You guys listening to this right now, take control over the internet. Make your own website. It's not very difficult. It's actually very easy. In fact, making it if it's difficult, you're doing something wrong because you should be making a very simple minimalistic website that's mainly just just HTML and then like a little bit of CSS, you know? And then you're doing it right if it looks like that. Okay, the next thing is, that was number four. Number five would be TWTXT, uh, which is a, quote, decentralized minimalist microblogging service for hackers. So you want to get some thoughts out on the internet in a convenient and slick way while also following the gibberish of others. Instead of signing up on a closed and or regulated microblogging platform, Get your status updates out with TWTXT is as easy as putting them in a publicly accessible text file. The URL pointing to this this file is your identity, your account. TWTXT then tracks these text files like a feed reader and builds your unique timeline out of them depending on which files you track. The format is simple, human readable, and integrates well with Unix command line utilities. So yeah, it's just incredibly simple. You just have a web you just have a text file um at some sort of url and then every time it it just it's great it seems is it seems to be a pretty good and very minimalist way of doing uh doing a twitter type of thing uh so that's cool uh i've i've thought about checking out something like this for a while that was my discord ping who's pinging me oh this motherfucker uh yes that is true um Wait, it's Python? It's fucking Python? Why is it fucking Python? What the fuck? Uh, I'm still getting pings. I'm gonna mute mute my audio. God damn! I feel like shit. Holy fuck. I feel terrible. So what does this do exactly? I'm confused. This lets you... Okay. Never mind. I am, I'm not confused. This is actually very easy this is actually very simple to understand i'm gonna set this up you know what fuck it today here's here's my three things that i plan to do in life i don't know how much of this will get done today but three things that i plan to do in life thing number one i want to get twtxt working thing number two what was it again oh yeah check out a bunch of blogs via various web rings and follow the cool ones and in thing number three, this is a longer term project. Mirror my website to Gemini. Because I've been using the X60S recently. <laughs> and the X60S is a very low spec laptop. It's not particularly good for doing web browsing in most cases. Um, I mean, that's not true. It can load simple websites perfectly fine. I know what I'm talking about. Uh, but... Most websites aren't simple websites, right? Like, that's the problem. It can, like, my website and, you know, most people who are chill load completely fine. But but once you get to, like, more bloated sites, it starts to take a long time to load web pages and may the fans start wearing up and stuff. Uh, which means that I, I, you know, when I'm on the X60S, it sort of pushes me towards using Gemini and go for more. Because... There are no bloat. It's impossible. It's physically impossible to have a bloated gem capsule. Uh, you know? Uh, which, yeah. All of this stuff makes me... I do really like Gemini. It is super cool. Um, 
I don't know how to host. I don't. I don't know how I would go about hosting something on Gemini though. Like I'm, there are places that offer free Gemini hosting, and I'm sure there are places that offer cheap Gemini hosting as well. Let me look this up. Uh, Gemini hosting. Uh, Gemini is this. I already know about what Gemini is. How to read pages. I know. I know how this works. Things to read. Yep, this will make sense. I already know how to do all of this. Self-hosted. It's not hard, as these things go, to set up a Gemini server on a VPS, a co-located server, or a Raspberry Pi in a shoebox under the bookshelf your router sits on. However, as these things go, covers a lot of evils. You'll generally need to be familiar with the Unix or Linux command line, installing software from a distribution repository, and with compiling software from source. I know how to do all of these things. I do not yet have any how-to documents collected for self-hosting a Gemini server. Oh, well, okay, so the whole reason I clicked on this thing. A PubNix is a pub... Yeah, I know what this is. It's actually a very good way to da-da-da, but it's a to proper... Wait, SDF has Gemini hosting? Since when does SDF have Gemini hosting? Oh, well, in that case, I know they have Gopher hosting. I didn't know they had Gemini hosting. In that case, I will definitely be just using SDF, probably. Um, yeah, that, that works. That makes it easy, because cause Gemini is easy. But, but you know what's a problem? Actually, this is a big problem. Pretty similar to shared hosting on the WWW in 1999. If you think of those... Uh, with these sites you'll sign up and have a f- space that allows you to you can copy them to okay what is this free gemini hosting on subdomains free hosting your site gets automatically updated from a git repository okay i don't like that uh free hosting you need to send the owner an ssh public domain i mean look if there's if there's I guess I could also use Vortex.club. That's kind of a cool way of doing things. I like Vortex.club. Vortex.club is a good place on the internet. Uh, yeah. Where was I going? Oh, yeah. I don't know. I, this is, like, the prob- The reason that I don't put more resources and time into doing this is because I don't, like, I don't know how to automate any of this shit, you know? <laughs> like... Um, I would have to, every time I wanted to make any blog post, I would have to make, it's already a pain, because I already have to make, go into my fucking computer, go to my documents folder, copy, paste my blog template.html, then open it up in Vim, write my blog in HTML, then upload that to NeoCities, then I have to go to the blog post.html on my NeoCities, and manually add the new entry, and then I have to go to my feed.xml and manually add the new feed RSS feed item, which is already kind of a pain to do, and one of the reasons why I don't blog post that often. But then, if on top of that, I then had to go back to my computer, copy the file, manually go in and rewrite it in gem text instead of html and then <laughs> upload ssh into some pubnix upload my file and then go into the same pubnix and change my blog posts page on the pubnix to point to the new file and then i would finally be done like that would be a, it would take me longer to post the thing than it would take to write the thing like there's no in, at that point there's no use maybe that's a good thing because i'm like there's there's no use posting anything that's not well thought through. But also, I'm trying to use this as more of a Twitter alternative than like a long form blog post situation. So I don't really, I don't really, yeah. That's if I, if I can't find a way to at least, at the very least, and it has to exist, right? There has to be an HTML to gem text converter. Yeah. Okay. There's 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 a bunch. You can you can easily HTML to gem text. It's still kind of annoying, but at least I don't have to do that manually. Uh, but yeah, hosting a Gemini mirror of my site would be would be cool. Um, yeah.
And we've truncated the silences. That's right. We're back down from 12 and a half hours to 10 and a half hours. There's more hours per hour. And that's where you come to the No Thank You podcast, the best podcast on the goddamn internet. Fuck, I feel terrible. Oh my god, I feel fucking awful. I don't want to be sick anymore. I would rather be healthy, please. Can I not be sick? It's not pleasant. I feel fucking awful. Okay, that's enough complaining. Guys, I know no one's listening at this point, but... Is there... there is there a better way? <laughs> is there... <coughs> so... <coughs> oh, God. <laughs> is there a better way to fucking... Okay, so, like, I have a little nav bar on my site, right? Let's say... That in the future I decide to add something to the navbar, right? Like let's say I want to add, I don't know. Uh, we were just talking about Gemini. Let's say I want to add a link to my Gemini on the navbar, right? Is there a better way to do that than just going into every single page and just changing it manually? There has to be, right? Like surely that's not what people are doing. <laughs> But I don't know how to fucking do it. Or is there some... Are people doing this with, like, some sort of site generator, like Hugo or whatever? Like, is the way most people make a website not the way I'm doing it? And is Neo Cities ruining my life? These are the questions that I have to ask. Right, because is, is Neo Cities fucking me over with the way that it make a website work? That I've... Like... Okay, better way to to say this, right? Like, like when most when you if you if is there some situation with like Hugo or whatever where you can just have something that's on every page and you just update it once and it just updates on every page, or like is this there's got to be some way to automate this? Like, it's, there has to be. <sighs> Someone tell me in the comments. I know no one's getting this far that probably knows. But if you do know, tell me in the comments. I'm still trying to get the X60S to be... Like, I'm I'm slowly... I have been over the past, like, three years of owning this computer or however long. I'm trying to create a world in which I can... Man, I'm so fucking retarded in general. But I have to remember, I have to remember, I'm doing this for a good reason. Because because of inshittification. This isn't just a matter of pride, right? This isn't just a matter of aesthetics. Like, in reality, all of the, the stuff that doesn't do this is going to go to shit and or is already going to shit. And this is really better, right? Like, Twitter, going to shit. YouTube, going to shit. Okay, I have to remember this. It's not, like, I sometimes I'm like, why am I even bothering to do this? But no, actually, there's a good reason. So, so that the, the X60 presents a different, an extra limitation, which is the fact that it's very low power um, and very slow. Like you can just about play standard definition video, but anything above uh, 480p is pretty much going to make the machine chug. Uh, and don't even try 1080p. 720 is just about like doable but laggy, and 1080p is un- just doesn't even play. Uh, and so I've been experiment. You know, for a while I was using the Dillo web browser, and I, this is like one of the reasons why I actually kind of stopped using the com- that computer is because Dillo is like e- extremely minimal as a web browser, which is a good thing. Like, don't get me wrong, Dillo is a great stopgap a great middle ground between something like w3m or links like a very basic text-based uh, terminal web browser and a normal full-featured uh web browser like firefox or something um because firefox and cute browser slow the computer down too much like they they take like a minute to open and it's just very, very slow. Uh, even Cube Browser, which is supposed to be pretty minimal, uh, yeah, a little bit of a shame. Um, yeah, it's just very slow. 
Uh, so I was using Dello quite a lot, and yeah, although I don't have anything strictly against Dillo, uh, it's, you know, it doesn't support JavaScript, which kind of poses some problems, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, but I've decided, I remembered and decided to, to fuck around with the Surf browser, to install Surf, and Surf is great, I've always avoided Surf because there's no ad block functionality, um, and uh, you know what? You don't have to block ads if you just use websites that don't have ads. <laughs> so as as long as I try and st- as long as I stick to places without advertising, blogs and. Invidious and you know all of the other privacy respecting front ends for popular websites uh these sorts of things as long as you avoid websites where there are ads you don't have to worry about blocking ads you know i've I've always been of the opinion that the internet is basically unusable without an ad blocker which is true if you go on the mainstream internet but as long as i avoid that and stick to small stuff and diff, you know, as long as I stay away from that, I don't even need to block ads. And then you, some of you might be thinking to yourself, Surf, you mean the web browser that doesn't even have tabs built into it? Doesn't even have a search bar? You use D menu as your search bar? Yeah, yeah. Turns out, tabs are fucking bloat. You just open a new window, brother, my, my brother in Christ. You just open a new window and it works fine. Well, you don't even need tabs. This whole time I was like, oh, you need tabs. Turns out you don't even need tabs. You just open a new window. It's not even a big deal. It's arguably better than tabs. I mean, look, if you're one of those people, one of those uh, disgusting creatures who tab hoards, I have no respect for you. What are you doing? Well, you have commitment issues. You you can't close a tab. You're not going to come back to it. What are you talking about? You We, we both know you're not going to close. You have If you are one of those gruesome, disgusting beings with, like, over a hundred tabs open, and you have to use tree-style tabs, like, I don't understand what's going on with you. You've got some serious, deeper problems that you need to work through. Uh, but anyway, no, I'm actually, surf, really good. I don't know why, like, it runs fast. It runs fast. It's not as fast as Dillo, obviously, but it's, it's still fast. Fast as fuck. That's all I wanted to say. Tabs are bloat. I mean, I know you can use an extension to add tabs to surf, but I don't think I need to. Okay, guys, guys. I've been spending the past fucking so long. Okay, let me just double check. Where was I when I left go? Right, so I was talking about surf. Now, the thing about surf is it's a very minimal program and it doesn't come with a lot of the stuff that you'd expect it to come with as a web browser it just renders web pages so uh, something that would be really useful to have would be bookmarks uh that's like if if i've got bookmarks i can kind of do without everything else now fortunately uh as a piece of subtler software there are patches on the website and you can simply patch in bookmarks. Oh, if only it was so fucking simple. Because I could not get the bookmarks patch to work. I tried. I couldn't think there's no information out there about how to do this. I googled error messages for, for days. I couldn't find shit. Okay, I tried a bunch of things. I tried different ways of adding book, uh, different patches and extensions. didn't work. Could not get it to work. I've concluded, and I might be wrong about this, but based on the error message that I got, I mean, look, something about the patch is fucked up. I don't know what it is. And maybe it's possible that if I understood C code better, I could just, like, fix it myself, right? Like, I could just take... Because the patch is just, like, a little thing... There's just some code that gets appended 
in specific chunks to the program, the C code of the pro, like, it shouldn't be complicated, technically, and, like, I'm sure the one way I could have solved this would be by doing that, but that would mean, I mean, there's just not viable, like, it would mean recompiling the program every single time to test if it worked, having no idea what I was doing wrong, it's just not possible, so I come up with the second option, which is, well, why do I need the bookmarks to be inside of surf? Like, there's definitely, bookmarks are a very, very simple thing to do. I'm sure there's some, like, shell program that just does bookmarks. So I googled, like, POSIX bookmarks, right? And I found a couple of them. The first one I found was called, like, the Simple Unix Bookmarks Tool or something. And that one just, I mean, I installed it and it sort of worked, but it was it was kind of kind of busted. I think it was busted because... It expects you to be using the GNU version of SED, but I'm on BSD, which has its own version of SED, which works slightly differently. Like, I think that's what was broken about it. Um, so I looked around and I found another one, which is very similar. It works in a very similar way. Um, I mean, it, there's only so many ways you can make a program like this. Uh, called Nomada. Um, and Nomada sort of works, uh, but doesn't work great. Both of these programs have D-menu integration. Like, they come with a little script that will integrate them into D-menu, so you don't have to do the work yourself, which is really nice. Um, but no matter how hard I tried, I just could not get the program to actually open the bookmarks in Surf. Like, I, I don't know what was going on. It's something to do with my XDG MIME stuff. But, like, I think Surf just doesn't play well with MIME. Like, I don't... Because I tried it with, with Dillo and it worked fine. So in the end, I did something really stupid. Which is, I, I just went into the program and just every time it asks for, like... Because it has this thing, like, the in the, the the program, it asks for link handler. Now, I've seen programs ask for link handler before. But when I Google link handler, I get no results. No one knows what the fuck link handler means. Unless, I, I don't know. I, I, there's some, some, like... Some shit about fucking, like, I don't even know what this is. Typo 3. I don't, I don't know what Typo 3 is. Uh, it's some, like, I'm trying to, let me see. I, I don't know what it is. It's something. It's some program that does something. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what it does. But, uh. No, I could not get this shit to work. So in the end, what I did... I mean, maybe I just have to write my own. Like, maybe that's what it expects you to do. Um, but in the end, I just hard-coded it. I just hard-coded it to open and surf. Which is kind of dumb. But also, like, if I ever switch web browsers... I'm probably going to have bookmarks in that web browser. And also, I know what I did. Like, I can undo it. It's it's a pretty stupid way of going about it, but it's the only way I can get it to work. So I just hard-coded every, but all the bookmarks to open and stuff. I spent ages faffing around with it. In the end, I just gave up and was like, wait, can I just hard-code this? Um, yeah. Which is still kind of a pain. Like, I still had to kind of fuck with shit to get that to work even. Um, but it does work now. I do have... Um, bookmarks and then i spent another while faffing around with cwm's uh like the the way it handles keybinds and stuff it's a bit weird it's it's uh it's not very consistent the way the way that your cwmrc is like structured the way it handles different commands is not super consistent um so that took me a while. I had to dig through some man pages, but that wasn't too complicated. But anyway, now I can just press, you know, super, e super O, 
and it opens a D menu with this is not the best way to go about this necessarily but it works it opens a D menu with my bookmarks and I just select one and then it opens it opens surf to that page Prob possibly I'm waiting for it to load is it working yes okay it's working um, yeah so that happened I could not get bookmarks to work ah, within this like the patch the the suckless door the one that's on it's called like I don't even know what it's called but that wasn't even what I wanted to do this was uh, this was a side quest my actual quest was that I was trying <laughs> I wanted to write a bash script today this was my my actual I had other things that I wanted to do today. I don't even remember what they were. Um, but one of the things I wanted to do was to write a bash script that would automate making new RSS entries. Now look, I'm I'm all for RSS, okay? I love RSS, but I think the uh the standard is a little more complicated than it needs to be. Like I don't think the format I think you could definitely simplify the format down. I mean, it's already pretty basic, but it's just a, you know, whatever. In reality, I should be automating it. Um, and if I, if I did this, there's ways to do this in a less stupid way than I'm doing it right now. But my plan is, here's the plan for the bash script, okay? Um, because what does, a, what does an RSS entry, what does a new entry need? It should have like an item tag. It should say, you know, item. And then it has like, if I remember correctly, you know what? I do not remember this correctly off the top of my head. I'm going to have to double check. Um, one second. Nope, that's the wrong file. This is the correct file. So it should have, it says item, and then it should have like, title tag and then a title and then a description tag or like a title tag then the title then close the title tag description tag then a description then close the description tag then a link tag the link then close the link tag and then a pub date tag the date and then closing the pub date tag and then closing the item tag right and so my idea is to make a bash script that just automatically generates this so it will automatically like it will ask me something like title question mark and I put the title in. Then it will ask me description and it'll put the description in. Then it'll ask me link and I'll put the link in. And then it will automatically grab the date and then format it correctly and then send that to XClip and then I can just paste that into the near into my NeoCities thing without you know, in whatever way I want to do that. Just append it to the file and then and then we got it. Then we Gucci. Um, so I need to figure out what to do that. But I'm getting pretty sleepy. I feel I feel sleepy, but I also feel weirdly energized and motivated. Like I want to do this. Um, so I'm gonna think about it. But I'm I might just end up doing this tomorrow or something. Also, I feel slightly better, but I don't want to jinx it. In terms of sickness, I feel very slightly better. Okay, that was pretty easy to make. I'm pretty proud of myself. This is about the limit of the amount of programming that I'm capable of. Um, is is tiny little bash scripts like this. But yeah, it works. I got it to work. Uh, thankfully, the date command comes already packed with a flag to output in the correct format that RSS looks for. So uh, that makes things, I mean, that doesn't really make much of a difference. I would have been able to do it anyway by just specifying it, but it makes it easier. But yeah, it just, I mean, it's, a, it's the world's most simple bash script. Any programmers in the audience? I mean, look, this is all I can do, okay? I'm not very good at this stuff. <laughs> this is about the limit of what I can do. 
But I mean, I guess I guess this is what I like. If I needed to do more complicated stuff, I'd learn how to do it. I just don't know what I even need to do that's more complicated. But yeah, all it does is it 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 sets a variable for the current date, right? And then it it's like, hey, yo, what's the what's the name of the thing? And you say the type the name. And it's like, hey, yo, what's the description? And you type the description. And it's like, hey, yo, what's the link? And you type the link. And then it just print f's that with the correct formatting, and then pipes that into Xclip. It's not as it's about as simple as you can get. Um, and now I'm wondering if I could. No, I think I'm not going to do that. So it's more general. I'm going to keep it general. I could make it specific, right? By simplifying the link section so it just already puts https colon slash slash but what if I want to do this on Gemini or something so I'll keep it like this it's not that much of a pain to just write https colon slash slash Yeah, you could say I'm a bit of a... I'm, I'm kind of elite. You could say I'm elite. I'm elite hacksaw. Do you think it's worth writing a post on my website about RSS? Because I don't really think so. Like, I was thinking... Should I write a post just, like, encouraging people to add RSS to their websites? And then, like... I don't know. I don't know if it's necessarily worth. Um, or not necessarily just worth, but like, I don't know if it serves any purpose. Uh, hmm. I might, like, maybe it's worth just writing a post about, like, the general philosophy and workings of, of the website. Like, not that there's anything complicated going on behind the scenes. I don't know. I just kind of want to talk about it. I, I, I don't really know why. <laughs> you might be confused when I said that RSS is overly complicated. Because RSS is extremely fucking simple. What I meant by that is just that, like... It's it, the same thing as HTML, which is that it doesn't really need to use a tag-based system. It can use a mark, but a markdown-based system instead, and be easier to use, e- easier for humans to write. Uh, like you could just have instead of having to say like, t- you know, uh, item tag and then title tag. Like it could just be. If there's a blank line before it, it's a new item. If the, or if there's a title, it's automatically considered to be a new item, right? And the title would just be like preceded by a hash sign or something, to be, you know, marked as a as a headline title. It's like hash, then you type your title, and then the description is just plain text with no nothing on a new line, because everything's on a new line anyway, so you already know what you're doing. And then, the date could just be like, like I don't fucking know, maybe this is stupid actually. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, never mind. <clears throat> Here's another problem I have in life, is like, okay, so, I want to set up a, a Gemini thing, some sort of gem log or something, right? Something on Gemini. But what would I even do? See, the obvious thing is to mirror no thank you to neocities.org, right? But I kind of like also am into the idea of being in the community of people who use Gemini and not being no thank you. Like, actually, in terms of my internet identities, No Thank You is not one of my favorite ones, right? Like, I kind of, 
I don't use no thank you unless I have to, pretty much, uh, in a lot of situations. Like, if I, I would want to be, I would want to be under a different name with a different persona. Um, I would, I mean, not necessarily have to, but it would be, I don't know. The problem is, like, there's, there's nothing wrong with that, right? There's nothing meaning that can't happen. But the problem is I don't have enough shit to do, to, to say, to talk about, like, I already don't make many blog posts as no thank you. Would that incentivize me to make more posts? Or like, what what would it mean? What would it mean for me? Like, what would I do is the question. What, about, what would I do? So wait, you're telling me if I get a cassette player, a cassette recorder slash player, and I buy a bunch of blank cassettes, who can stop me from just... Re- That's how cassettes work, right? You can just record your own shit on them. Like, I can just plug my computer in (laughs) to the cassette player and just record, like, I don't know, a Talking Heads album onto it. And then, then I've just got that album in perpetuity. No one can take that away from me. It might not be the best quality, but I've never cared about that. You're telling me I could just do that? It costs money, sure, but it's not that expensive. It's not that expensive. I mean, cassette recorders are cheap. 20 quid, 30 quid maximum. How much are blank cassettes? Let me look it up. Amazon. Blank cassette tapes 5 for 10 pounds 3 pack for 6 pounds that's a worse deal I guess no one's making them anymore but I mean, I mean, it's not bad. It's not bad, all things considered. For permanence, it's not bad. You know, I've been thinking, computers suck, man. Computers, they suck. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go back to radio. You guys can listen to this bullshit. I'm going to go back. I'm going to go listen to the fucking BBC World Service, motherfucker. I'm going to go back to radio. That's really where it's at, if you think about it. If you want podcasts, you're like, oh, I don't have enough podcasts to listen to. Turn on the goddamn radio, bitch. <laughs> Clearly, this is the pay. <sighs> Maybe the solution to computers suck is to do less things on fucking computers. Okay, I've just thought of some funny imagery, so you're just going to have to bear with me here. Right, so Twitter, the thing about Twitter, the thing I like about Twitter is we're all down in the dirt. We're eating slop off the ground in the dirt, okay? That's the thing about Twitter. Is everyone's Twitter is a bunch of people all getting down on their and their fucking hands and knees and eating slop off the goddamn ground, right? And then Blue Sky, Blue Sky is some people who have picked up some of that slop, right? They've picked up some of that slop. They've put it on a plate at a table. They've got a chair, a nice dining table. They've got cutlery arranged, nice silverware table, tableware, whatever the fuck. Right, and they they put on a good suit, tuck a little napkin into their collar, and they're they they they've got proper table manners. They're using the outside cutlery first, and they're eating eating the same goddamn slop in that setting. And then Mastodon is the same setup as Blue Sky, 
right? They got the table, the chairs, the nice cutlery, the nice tableware, etc. They were in the slop, uh, but I mean, they fuck, they were in the suit. Uh, you know, they were in the suit, they got the napkin tucked into their collar and whatever, except that there's not even any slop on the plate. That's the difference between the three different places. It's actually so crazy remembering the fact that, like, you can just write a bash script to do stuff. Like, I don't need... Listen, I think people who patch circular software are suckers. You don't need to patch it. Firstly, that shit doesn't fucking work. Okay, that's the first thing to point out. Using ST, listen, I like D menu, okay? I like ST, sort of. I like surf, sort of. I like, I, I don't really like DWM that much. But, like, listen, suckless developers, I know you guys are Nazis, first of all. It's very obvious. You basically don't make a secret of it at all. And secondly, why can't you just have your config be in a config file like everyone else? Don't make me have to recompile your fucking software every time I make a change to the config. That's a stupid way of doing things. That's just, that's just stupid. And it doesn't help because there is other minimal software that is just as good as your software, which doesn't require that sort of thing. Don't don't act as if oh we have to do this because it's the true mi- it's not the it's not the true minimal Unix way to do things it's just the suckless way to do things and it actually doesn't suck less it sucks more than the normal way of doing it which is to just have a file in your dot config directory that fucking manages the config without having to restart to to recompile everything from it's annoying okay so that's stupid. And then the system of patches just doesn't fucking work. I've never... I've, I, maybe it's just because I'm on fucking OpenBSD or something and it's, I don't know, something's not working because of that. But Surf will not let me patch it, no matter what I do. But that's okay, because I can just write a bash script that does what I want it to do. Like, oh... There's a patch, for example. Here's a couple. Here's a couple of examples, right, of of stuff. The first thing I did was bookmarks, right. I found I found this this one I didn't write. I found it. Uh, called. Um, I already talked about this. Called no no matter, right. Uh, and that's just a, I, I think it's not even Bash, I think it's POSIX shell. Let me double check though. Uh, hold on. Uh, I can't fucking find it. Give me the GitHub. Uh, bookmarks. Maybe this is a better way to go about it. D menu bookmarks with BM. Oh, is there an even, is there another way to do this? I could just write my own bookmark script. Um, hold on, am I stupid? Fucking DuckDuckGo is not working. I'm gonna go on Google. I'm gonna, I'm gonna Google it and I bet that Google it shows up the first fucking thing. Watch. Okay, I'm gonna Google the same damn thing. No matter bookmarks, and it's gonna be the first result. No, it was not, but it was the second result. <sighs> Doctor Go, why you gotta suck? Why you gotta suck, suck so? Hey. Um. Yes, it is POSIX shell. Um, but I had to fuck with it, because it didn't work, right? Remember? I had to, I hard-coded, I just hard-coded surf into it, because it wasn't, it wasn't working. But anyway, uh, the next thing I did, which I did today, is, by default, there's no, there's no search bar, right, in surf, but you can open a URL, 
Like if you t- if you have a terminal and you type surf followed by a URL, it opens surf at that URL as you'd expect. Um, so I wrote a, a, a script that opens D menu, and then it just asks you for a search query, and then it just formats that in the way DuckDuckGo formats their URLs and opens surf pointing to the address. And then, it, and then does it in D menu, yeah. So, you know, you don't even have... Like, this is the thing. Why, why even bother patching? Like, you can get a patch to do that. Like, you can... You can fucking patch that. I, I think there's there's like a couple patches that do that sort of thing. But why would you? Why would you want it to be in... It's stupid, okay? You just write a little bash script that does it for you. It's easy. Anyway, it's cool that you could just write bash scripts that do stuff. That's, that's mean. Now, the only thing left for me to do to make Surf use of... So, I don't have tabs in Surf. But, honestly, I'm not sure I need tabs. Because having a bunch of windows... Are, like, firstly, I'm not, I'm not a tab holder at all. I'm a tab minimalist. I normally try and only have, like, three tabs open at once. If I start to have more than, like, four, it gives me anxiety. So, it's not really a big deal. To just have, you know, to just have, like... And it's not like I'm doing any complex web browsing anyway. So I'm, you know, just having like three, two, two or three windows sometimes open is not a big deal. Uh, you know, I can just have each window on a different workspace. Although CW doesn't actually use workspaces, but it basically functions the same way as workspaces. So I'll just call them workspaces, even though they're technically not workspaces. Uh, but yeah, that's basically like having tabs. But it's in the window manager instead of having another program do it for me. Uh, well, no, instead of having it being suckless tabbed, which would be the normal way you get tabs in D menu. Um, yeah, so that's, I'm not, I mean, I could probably set up tabbed. That doesn't seem too difficult. Um... I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I mean, ad blocking. I don't really need ad blocking because I'm mainly using like I'm not going to any bloated ad websites anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Um, but I can that that one's relatively easy to set up. I mean, it's not doesn't work that well. Like, the problem with... This is, like, one of the things that stopped me from using stuff as a daily driver on my X220. X220 is is the fact that it doesn't have... Like, the ad blocking stuff is kind of shit. But the ad blocking stuff in Cube Browser is also kind of shit. But anyway, the only thing that that I would... That I need to do now on this, this X60, really, to, to make it more usable would be... Uh... YouTube. That's really what I'm like. The last thing I don't have is a, I mean, I can obviously just watch individual YouTube videos through Nvidia, and that works fine and great and all good. Oh, here's another. Here's something I want to complain about. The reason I'm using DuckDuckGo as my search engine in the first place is because I don't know if you guys know this, but if you go, if you open, uh, if you open a, a web browser, <laughs> if you go to like light.duckduckgo.com. It loads like a super light version of DuckDuckGo, and this is like, you know, exactly the sort of web. This is exactly the search engine that I would need on the X60. The problem is that I don't really know how this. Like, you can't do the trick where you just type the URL because it just keeps the same. I don't know how they're doing it. Well, no, I, I'm. No, I don't. I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they do it. This is this is some some fucking web backend stuff that is beyond my knowledge of how they're doing this. But like it doesn't when you search for something, it doesn't actually change the URL. Like I I don't I don't know I don't know how it works, but it doesn't it doesn't make any sense to me. So I can't just I wish I could. And if you try and do that, it just redirects you to the normal Doctor Go. If you try and like 
put your search query in the URL with light.duckduckgo, it just redirects you to the normal duckduckgo, but it keeps the URL as light.duckduck. It's very annoying and confusing and stupid. But anyway, because I was trying to set it up to do that first, I just stuck with duckduckgo because it has that already. Anyway, I need, to do, I need to find a way to do YouTube subscriptions. And a long time ago, I made a video called like the, the YouTube RSS Saga Finale. And what I did in that was... So every YouTube channel page is actually an RSS feed. Like, it has an RSS feed, right? YouTube used to just let... Like, here's an example of incentivization. YouTube let, used to just let you export your, your subscriptions to RSS, but it doesn't let you do that anymore. Um, but each channel still has RSS. Thankfully, they haven't gone rid of that yet. Um, a previous way I did this, by the way, is that Nvidia's lets you have your subscription feed as an RSS feed. But I'm yet to find a good Nvidia's instance that will actually let me sign up because I used to be signed. I used to have an account on like YouTube.be, uh, but they have stopped accepting signups and deleted everyone's account because of GDPR rules or something, um, which is very annoying. And I've kind of looked around for other instances that seem to be fast and reliable, and none of those also accept signups, except I did find one eventually, except every time I tried to import my subscriptions to that one, it didn't work <laughs> for some reason. Basically, this is all just me trying to avoid signing into Google on this computer, which I really don't want to do. Um, I feel like it's antithetical to the whole point of, of this computer. Um, so, yeah, my next option is to just say, fine, I'll do it myself. Um, and, yeah, the idea would be to get my exported subscriptions thing, and then this is what I did last time, just use a Vim macro to trim out all of the stuff that I don't need, so it's just, you know, the names of the channel IDs line by line, um, and see if that works, but, and then just open them via MPV and RSS, uh, But I don't know if I can be bothered to do that right now. Hey guys, do you remember a while ago in this podcast I was talking about a platform called Ampled, which is like an anarchisty co-op version of Patreon for musicians? You remember I was talking about that earlier on? And I was kind of saying, eh, it's not ideal because it's, uh, you know, it's not resilient. It's It's still just some guys who could decide to do whatever they want with it. And even though right now we can trust them, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. Well, I literally just one minute ago got an email. Important announcement. Closure of Ampled platform. We, the board of directors, are writing to you today with difficult news. We believe it is prudent to sunset the Ampled platform by the end of 2023. The end of 2023! See? This is why you can't trust none of these bitches, okay? Anything that is, even if it seems like it's run by decent people, it either has to, you know, kowtow to the whims of cowpitow, that, that was not good, I just woke up, it wasn't good, but, it either has to, you know, drive us, a lot of these things, they have to drive themselves into the goddamn dirt, in order to turn a profit, or in order to support, to, to please their investors, or, they just die, and then, they, everything that's on there just disappears forever, like, I mean, one example is MySpace to shut down and all the music got lost, for example. Like, this, this is this is why there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way. Um, at least if the internet is actually decentralized, i.e. not nonsense cryptocurrency bullshit, but small single tenant websites hosted by individuals rather than companies and corporations... If one person's website goes down, 
it's not good. It's not it's not a good situation, but only their website went down and nothing about anyone else is really affected. Which is another reason I'm encouraging people to mirror the Demper web ring. Um because, you know, I don't know if my website might go down one day. But that's just what you know, that's that's this is this is uh and then there's of course also situations like the DAT protocol and the BitTorrent protocol, you know, these sorts of and IPFS where files are distributed. So even if one person goes down, the file can remain, uh, which is even better. But uh, those those protocols, well, firstly, I haven't super looked into them yet, um, and secondly, I've I've kind of looked into IPFS. I know some of them seem to be a little weird, but I'm not entirely sure. I have to spend more time digging into it. Anyway, this is just a this is a this is a, 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 a I'm not happy to see it go because it seems like a cool platform, but uh, crazy. I just found out about it like two days ago, and then it closes down. <laughs> what I tell you is definitely. I hate to say I told you so, but that is what happens. Wait, guys, I just learned something fucking crazy. I just learned something fucking crazy. Okay, listen to this. Is this is this a commentary? Okay, I hope. This, but li, li, okay, listen to this. You should be able to identify what this is by pure audio alone. Okay, listen. Nice. I'm getting stuck on the wall now. <laughs> Okay, so this is a Quake speed run, right? This is what you're listening to right now. Here's what I just found out, okay? The iconic, the iconic <laughs> of Quake guy jumping. That's Trent Reznor's voice. That's fucking Trent Reznor. So when you listen to a Quake speed run and they're bee hopping and he's he just going, <laughs> <laughs> That's just, li- you're just listening to Trent Reznor making those noises. That's fucking crazy, holy shit. So I just got back from an all-night 80s horror mystery movie marathon, which is a marathon at a cinema that goes on all night of 80s horror movies, but they're a mystery. I, you don't know what movies they're going to show when you buy the ticket. It was six movies... About 10 hours, 10 and a half, which is the longest movie marathon I've been to. I've been to a few all-night movie marathons at this place before. I went to an experimental one where they showed, like, avant-garde experimental type of thing. They had, like, a razor head, an El Topo, and the Warriors. The Warriors isn't really, exp- I don't know. But that was a good one. I also went to a Nicolas Cage one. But all of those I knew what movies were gonna they were gonna be. This one was my first mystery movie marathon. And uh I had a good time. Um You know, when I when I signed up for this I thought they were gonna be, you know, all classics. But it turns out they were mostly sort of B movies. Hidden gems. Some of them not so much gems. It's just hidden. Um, deep cuts. Schlock. And it makes sense, right? Because how are you going to sell tickets to these movies that no one's ever heard of if you, you know, don't package it in some sort of some sort of way? Uh I don't even tell people that they're watching those movies before they buy the tickets. And then they'll buy the tickets. Um, So the first film was... I'm going to spoil them, by the way. If I can even remember them. Because after, you know, they kind of start blending in with one another. (laughs) Uh, So the first film was Maniac Cop. Which was a... Probably the most B-movie-y of the bunch. In a good way. Uh... Starring Bruce Campbell, who is obviously based and amazing in every role. I think it's one of his first roles. Uh, good movie. I mean, actually, calling it a good movie 
it's a fu- it's an entertaining movie. It's not actually good. Like it's not actually very well made. But it's the the parts that are bad are funny bad, and the parts that are good are just good. Like creative stuff is creative, but mo- I would say it's a highly entertaining movie, and it's helped by the fact that the film is very fast paced and n- never gets boring in the slightest because it's just sort of going at breakneck speed the entire time. Um. Yeah, honestly, I would recommend it in a sort of situation where you're with some friends having some drinks as that type of movie that you can sort of laugh at and riff on. It's not so much a it's a it's a it's a B movie. I mean, it's it's you know, it's an entertaining one, but it's kind of bad, but you know, in a good way, in a schlocky way. Then the next film was The Burning which is a movie that, after watching it, I am surprised that you never hear anyone talk about it. Um, The Burning is a slasher film that is quite obviously a rip-off of Friday the 13th. It takes place in the summer camp. It's not that much of a rip-off of Friday the 13th, it's pretty much a rip-off of Friday the 13th. Let's be actually real here. I would definitely say it's a rip-off of Friday the 13th. But it's a good rip-off of Friday the 13th. Um, you know? That is my opinion. And uh, it has fucking... What's that guy? Hold on, I gotta look this up. Because I've forgotten the guy's fucking name. <sighs> Um, anyway, it's a good movie, is what I'm saying. It's a, it's a very good movie, actually. It's a good, good ass slasher movie. I, it deserves to be talked about among the other 80 slasher movies, but you never hear about it. But no, it's actually good. I mean, it's not amazing, but, you know, it's pretty good. Uh, now, oh, it also has George Costanza in it. Fucking Jason Alexander, aka the guy who plays George Costanza on Seinfeld, is in the movie, which is absolutely fucking hilarious because you can. He also survives to the end of the movie. Spoilers, so you can you can call this the canonical George Costanza backstory, uh, which I think is very funny. Uh, no, there's some really. I mean, the the main standout thing. There we go. This is what I'm doing. The main standout thing about the burning is the practical effects. Tom Savini worked on this movie, which if you're a nerd, you know who Tom Savini is. He did the practical effects on this movie. And um, they are really fucking great. Uh, Some amazing kills and gory effects here. Uh, And uh, that's pretty much it. That's definitely the highlight of the film, but you know, the, it's 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 kind of what you'd expect from the genre. It's a, it's a very much of the genre. There's some cool stuff. There's some cool twists and turns. It, you know, they do something kind of interesting with it, and the gore effects are amazing. Um, I think the the raft scene in that movie is like one of the best slasher scenes that I'm aware of. Uh. But yeah, other than that, it's just okay. I, I wouldn't say it's just okay. No, I would say it's a good movie. What am I doing about? Okay. Um, the next film that we watched was called... Now, I actually don't remember which order they came in. I think the next one we watched was called House. But not the Japanese movie called House. This is a completely different movie called House. Also not the TV show about the doctor who does illegal things and unethical medical practices. That's House MD. This is just a film called House from the 80s. And it's very Stephen King inspired. Like quite quite clear Stephen King influence. And uh, but that's always that's not a bad thing. Like you gotta love a bit of Stephen King. Um And it also I, I actually really like this movie. I thought this movie was super... Like, out of all the films, I think this one was the most creative. 
the most original and unique in terms of concepts. Probably also the least... Not that any of them were actually very scary. Actually, that's not true at all. What am I fucking talking about? Maybe the most scary. But it's also maybe the funniest. Intentionally funniest. Because Maniac Cop is unintentionally funny. Although it's questionable how intentional it is. I don't really know. In in the B-movie kind of way when... Where you don't really know if it's supposed to be intentional comedy or not. There's some intentional comedy in Maniac Cop. Uh, that that actually works really well. But anyway. I don't know. I, I feel like I kind of fucked up this review. But I have been awake for a really long time. And I just watched fucking movies for like 10 hours straight. Okay, give me a break. House is good movie. It's a good movie. It's it's got it's got your your elements. It's kind of wacky. It's kind of like like the tone is kind of like I mean although it's actually deals with some dark themes like Vietnam flashbacks and stuff like really you know they say like in in monster movies the monster always represents something like the monster's never just a monster it always represents something in house the monster is the main character's trauma from Vietnam, like realistic Vietnam trauma. Like it's you know, it's not it's not a fucking light-hearted romp, but it's also very comedic. Like there's a lot of really funny moments, intentionally comedic moments, and it's quite goofy. And there's a lot of practical effects and like practical effect monsters, all of which look amazing. Um, there's a lot of really interesting set pieces. Obviously, it being called House, that you can probably draw some comparisons to House of Leaves. Uh, I mean, you definitely can in terms of like a house that is impossible in terms of space and stuff like that. Uh, definitely some House of Leaves type stuff going on. Although, if you want, like totally, completely different from House of Leaves. I mean, they're both horror about a house that is fucked up, but that's about where the comparisons end. Uh, yeah, House was was a very creative movie with some really great effects and some very funny moments uh, and some really tense moments as well. Like, some of the horror was very effective in that movie. I mean, it wasn't that effect. None of these movies were that scary. Um... Because they didn't... This is the thing that I realized when watching these movies is, yeah, I forgot that the, they didn't really figure out how to make movies actually scary until, like, the 90s. Like, there's no... At least not that I've seen. There's no scary horror movies from the 70s. And there's not really any scary horror movies from the 80s except for, like, maybe The Thing. Like, that's probably the scariest horror movie of the 80s. Right? And that's about it. Like, you don't... And even then... Like, a lot of the thing is... I don't know. They didn't really figure out how to make movies actually scary until, like, Blair Witch. (laughs) Then they were like, oh, wait, we can just actually make these movies scary. And they immediately forgot how to do it because they just started making, like, Saw and uh, Final Destination. And then, like, they remembered again. uh, Like, like very recently. And that's how you get, like, the newer wave of... They remembered how to make movies scary again when they made The Babadook, actually. That's what happened. Anyway, that was a tangent. House was a good movie. Then, the next film was called The Slumber Party Massacre. And this is one of the worst movies I've ever seen. Uh, It was actual garbage. There was no reason to ever watch it. And I'm honestly insulted that they made me sit through this. It was a terrible fucking movie. Uh, It is all of the low-budget schlock of Maniac Cop... Uh, you know, I mean, all of these movies are relatively low budget. Not all of them, actually, but, you, you know. It's, uh, it's, it, it's, but it just has none of the, it doesn't make up, for, like, most of the time when you see a low budget horror movie, like, one of the things you're looking for is, like, okay, they have a low budget, and then they make up with it through creativity and ideas and, and, you know, thinking outside the box. And that's the whole point of, that's why it's cool. But this does none of that. It is the most generic slasher movie ever, like, I don't, and it's terrible, it's bad at even being a generic slasher movie, like, you know how most of the time the slasher guy, the bad guy, is, like, scary, like, as in, like, you know, they at least give him some level of supernatural 
something or he he has like a spooky face or he wears a scary mask like Jason Voorhees, you know, like it's something, right? Nothing. This movie, the b- big slasher guy is literally just a guy. He's just a scary, he's just, he's not even scary. He's just a very normal looking guy who is just a psycho for no reason. Like they're just, they just have like news reports that are like, and this murderer has escaped from prison and he just goes around murdering. Just because he's the murderer guy who goes around murdering. He has no motivation. Uh, he's just he's just a murderer guy who goes around murdering. He doesn't wear a mask. He doesn't have a spooky, disfigured face. You know, as ableist as that might be, it at least adds to the, the you know, it adds something, something. It's, it's not just a guy. Because when, they, when they, they, they smash cut to the scary angle and it's just a guy's face, like a very, very boring, plain-looking, normal guy, it is not scary. It doesn't work. Then the next thing is, um, there are the most of the movie nothing happens. Like they they stretch the runtime massively uh, with like many many fake out scares where it's like you think something's well you don't really think something scary is gonna happen because you kind of figure out what they're doing very quickly. But they keep doing it like over like it's not uncommon to have some of those in a horror movie. It's good it keeps the audience on their toes. But they just keep doing it over and over and over again for the first, like, half of the movie. And really, you realize they're just covering up for the fact that nothing is happening. They're just padding the movie because really all they have is one guy who kills people in one way. Like, he doesn't even have, you know, another, slasher movies are make or made or broken on the creativity of the kills, right? Like, The Burning had a bunch of really interesting creative kills right, really cool gore effects and really unique kills, uh, even Maniac Cop had some unique kills, right, even with their, like, shoestring budget or whatever, they managed to pull together some cool shit, right, that you don't, you know, something interesting, this guy, he just has a drill, and he drills you, that's it, there's nothing interesting that happens, he never does it in an interesting way, he just comes up behind you, and he drills you, and then you're on the ground dead, because you've been drilled, and that's it, and for the first part of the movies, when he's there, he doesn't talk, but then he talks, and his voice is just a normal voice, kind of. He's also, he's not, like, particularly strong. He's sort of just a guy with a drill that, like, you could really easily overpower if you had more than one person. Even teenage girls, I think, if you had, like, two teenage girls going at him, could probably take away his drill and then he's just a guy, like, what's he gonna do, it's one of these movies where, you know, like, horror movies obviously often have, like, they only work if the characters act really stupid, but in this one, it is, like, egregiously bad, the characters just consistently make decisions that make absolutely no sense, and don't even try to save themselves, and just die in very boring, it's a terrible fucking movie, it's one of the worst movies I've ever seen. Like, it is excruciatingly boring, and that's it. There's The only redeeming quality is that you get to see some titties. But you get to see some titties in literally every single one of these movies. Every single one had titties in it. Actually, I don't think, I don't think House had titties in it. Uh, it had some some shots of, of a, 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 like, booty shots, but it didn't have any actual titties. But every other movie had titties in it. So, you're not missing out. You know, 80s horror movies, they tend to have titties. You're not in any short supply of titties. So, there's no reason to ever watch The Slumber Party Massacre. Actual garbage fucking film. Um, That was very disappointing. Uh, And then the next movie was uh, called Chopping Mall. Chopping Mall. Great title. Great name for a movie. This is also very B-movie vibes, uh, kind of tongue-in-cheek vibes. You get the feeling that the guy who made it is, like, a movie nerd, like a horror movie nerd, who's, like, ha- I don't really, I didn't look anything up about this movie. Let me, let me look it up. Um, Chopping Mall. But it's a movie about, uh, security robots in a mall. They go haywire and start killing people who are trapped in the mall. Because they're having a a weird sex party in the mall? 
And they also all work in the mall. I don't know. It, the plot doesn't make that much sense, but it's fine. It doesn't have to make that much sense. Um, yeah, who directed this? Written and directed by Jim Winorski. Uh, who is known for The Lost Empire, Chopping... Yeah, a bunch of... A bunch of movies... A bunch of B-movies no one's ever heard of. I see. Kind of based. Oh, and some porno movies, maybe. Oh, I don't know. It's... Oh no, this is this is just like another B B movie horror movie. This is just his thing. He makes B okay, cool. Well yeah, uh this film was fine. It it was uh it had some entertaining moments, it had some funny moments, but it also kinda dragged on for too long. Um It kind of ran out of steam halfway through. Uh, a lot of, there's definitely stuff in the movie that doesn't make any, like, that kind of doesn't make sense, like, the logic kind of falls apart, um, the kills were, you know, pretty mid, but sometimes they were, like, stupid in a funny way, which I think is fine, it counts as entertaining, and the movie definitely is tongue-in-cheek, like, it knows what it is, okay, like, there's no, this isn't, the slumber party massacre that is like taking itself seriously as a terrible movie. Like this is clearly a tongue in cheek horror B movie that knows it's a tongue in cheek horror B movie. I mean, it's not like super tongue in cheek, but like, you know, it knows what it is and it plays into it and that's fine. Um, I will say one weird thing about the film is that they kind of build up that like the big final quest of the movie is like, like, they set up, like, this is a, a normal setup and payoff type of situation, where they set up, uh, the robots are controlled by the computer on the third floor, so we have to get to the third floor to turn the computer off, and then that's the movie, is, like, you know, once they figure out what's going on, once you get, like, halfway through into the second act, like, okay, this is the plot, we have to get to the third floor to get to the computer to turn the computer off so they'll shut down the robots so they'll stop trying to kill us, okay, that makes sense. And then that just doesn't happen. That is not how the movie ends. Like, they actually never even see the computer. Uh, which is just a weird thing, because they set it up so strongly. Like, they spend such a long time setting up that that's how they got to do it. And they just don't do that. They just win by destroying the robots, by blowing them up. Um, yeah. Do I really have anything much? There's not much to say about this movie. It's pretty mid. Like, I would say it was it was fine. Like, I didn't... I didn't I, I, it was, it was okay, like, I, I didn't hate watching it, or anything, I, I liked watching it, but it wasn't anything special, um, yeah, I'm trying to think, is there anything else particularly notable about this film, not really, no, uh, yeah, and then the final movie was the only film that I'd actually heard of, which is An American Werewolf in London, which was a great film. Um, I'm assuming you've all seen An American Werewolf in London. I don't have to explain it. Uh, but, yeah, that's a good fucking movie. Depressing as a way to end the night. Very very downer ending, that movie. <laughs> and kind of just ends, first of all, and, like, ends more abruptly than I remember the ending, and also ends on a massive fucking downer. Uh, but still a, a great ending to the night, because it's actually a really good film. Um, yeah, I don't really have much else to say. You guys all know what American Werewolf in London is about, and, and the movie, I'm assuming. It's a famous film, right? Yeah, I think that's all I have to say about that. It was a good time, I enjoyed it. Oh look, we're reaching the end of the 12 hour long podcast. Well, something very strange and problematic has happened, and I think I know why it happened, but I don't really understand. For some reason, I've just booted up my X60, and it's kicked me into a, just a a shell environment, right? Right, it just it 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 was booting, it was booting, and then it gave me a couple errors, and now it's put me into a shell, as root. 
which is strange because I never put in my root password, so I don't know how it's given me root. And I'm I'm in my file system. <laughs> now this is this is a bit worrying, you see. So I CD into home, and I ls, and my user is gone. My home directory is gone. Well, well, that's not good. Am I in some weird parallel universe? Because how do I have... I mean... Some of my folders are here. But where... What happened? What happened? I just turned this computer off like two days ago. It was fine. I, I don't think I changed anything. But I'm pretty sure what I fucked up. I don't even... How is this even possible? Because I turned the computer... Here's what I think happened. I th- I think I've somehow fucked this up. By turning the computer off with sudo shutdown now, or do as shutdown now, which I don't normally do, right? Normally, and I don't know if this is a bad thing, but I guess it's fine because it hasn't broken until now. Normally, when I want to turn off my computer, I just hold the power button down until it turns off. I don't know if that's a bad thing. I just do that. But I was like, I'm going to turn it off with do as shutdown now. And I did that, and it shut down CWM, but then kicked me into a shell, just on a terminal, right? No, no, no GUI. And I was like, well, that hasn't really shut down anything. So then I ran it again <laughs> from the shell, and it somehow started CWM again. And this was very confusing to me. So then I just held down the power button. And I guess somehow that broke the computer. Because I don't know what the fuck I... I don't know how that's happened. I'm now in a directory called slash root. Which I guess is the home directory for my root user. Let me go to the actual root directory. I have everything. I mean... The operating system is still here. Let me check some commands. What commands do I... Do I have like... No, that's... Hmm. Hold on. Do I have stuff from my, like... Okay, no commands are working. Is it, Wait, wait, is this because I'm in SH instead of KSH? What the fuck? What is happening? Can't exec... Getty, user lib exec getty for port dev tty c5, no such file or directory. Now what do I do? It's not even letting me do anything. Okay, I'm gonna restart, I guess. Well, this sucks. What the fuck happened to my file system? Like, that's definitely what's broken. Somehow the file system is broken. The other thing that might have happened, the only thing I can think of is I was mounting USB drives yesterday. Did I somehow fuck up my partition while doing that? I don't see how I would have fucked up my partition, but did I, did I, like, my, the thing, did I, like, accidentally unmount, like, Did I unmount my own thing? (laughs) How does that even make sense? Is that even possible? Did I, like, unmount the drive that is the actual drive that the OS is on? But then that doesn't make any sense. Okay, it says enter path name of shell or return for sh. So let me try slash bin slash ksh. Okay, now I'm on ksh. Does that help me in any way? cd home ls. Nope. ls dash a. Nothing. Uh, and now we're in slash root. Let me slate cd to the actual root directory. Now let's use some commands. What's a command? I mean, we have we obviously have the core utils or whatever. But what about, like, something I've installed? What have I installed? Like, amphora? Yeah, that's command not found. Let's try, uh, I don't know, neofetch. Not found. Okay, so that's... <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> Wait, let me do cd... Slash user or USR slash 
That's it. There's nothing in my use. Okay. Now that's problematic. I see why my commands aren't here. I see why none of my programs are there because because there's nothing in my. I mean, there should be slash user spin local. Okay. Yeah. This is this is um not good. What the fuck happened? How did this? How did this even happen? I don't understand what happened here. What the fuck? I don't see any way to fix this other one reinstalling. Which sucks, because it took me ages to get everything set up nice in BSD. Also, that's also mean, meant, I now I've just realized, that I've lost... I've now lost all of my fucking certificates. I've lost all my goddamn certificates for fucking Gemini stuff. Because the way Gemini works, if you don't know, is, like, to make user accounts and stuff like that, it uses TLS certificates that you verify locally, and you can set expiration dates for and stuff like that, like, valid until XYZ and give names. Like, that's how it does accounts. So, I have now lost all, I mean, I guess that kind, the only thing that I really care about is, like, astrobotany. Because I, I still have all my, obviously, like, none of those really matter, because on, like, PubNixes and Tildes that I am, have an account on, you know, I have a username and password that I still remember or have stored somewhere. So that's fine. I can still log into, like, SDF and stuff like that. So I guess that's not problematic. Like, that's not a huge problem. But I can't... I, I mean, it's not like I had anything important, I guess, on, like, the BBS on Gemini. I, I, I don't know. It's not that strange to have many identities, right? It's just a little annoying, is what I'm saying. I spent three days watering my astrobotany plant, and now it's gone. That's, that is, that sucks. Um... Fuck. What happened here? How did this even happen? Anyone who understands BS open BSD could I don't know if you could tell hold on. I'm gonna I'm gonna here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna restart the computer and I'm gonna read out the I'm gonna read I I mean I don't I'm I'm pretty fucking sure this is just busted beyond repair. Because if my entire home directory is just gone, like what can I do? That's just that's just gone. Like there's no there's no fix for that. Okay, I'm gonna read out the error messages that I get. Uh, thanks for watching the Slice of Life podcast, by the way. Uh, appreciate it, as usual. Um, also available on my website, of course. Uh, let's see. Hopefully it actually finishes booting before we get to 12 hours. Okay, so we got... Unallocated... File system is clean, not check out. Automatic boot in progress. Don't, I don't... I definitely did not unmount any drive that was WD0. File system is clean, not checking. Unallocated something, some fucking thing. Dev name, slash run, slash ZenoDM. Dev WD0E. Unexpected inconsistency. Run... FSCK underscore FFS manually. The following file systems had an unexpected inconsistency. Slash user and slash var. That's not... Okay, let's... Let's run the thing that it told me to run. FSCK underscore FFS. What the... F uh, slash user? Oh, oh, character device. Continue. Yes. No, I don't think I want to continue that. I don't think that's a that's a. I think I have to run like dev wd zero e. Wait, what? I don't understand this. Okay, well, this is beyond my understanding of computers. If any, I mean, clearly something about the file system is busted. Um, 
do I want to go through the pain of figuring out... Like, would it be faster to just reinstall the OS? Because I, I don't have that much, like... It's not that difficult to reinstall an operating system. It's it's really not. And it does... Which one's it faster? Like, as in... What I mean is, I don't have much complicated going on, right? Like, it's not like I have a whole bunch of shit that I'd have to redo. Like, I'm using CWM. I mean, I guess I have a config file. I have to download a web browser, D menu, like a couple things. But it's not too complicated. Um, oh, I guess I... No, I have... I, I guess a couple... Like, maybe there's a couple of bash scripts... But they're not very complicated. I don't know. All right, well, I guess you'll have to see how this turns out in the next episode of the Slice of Life podcast. Thanks for watching, guys.